Awake, number one, 2024. What has happened to respect? Here we have on the cover this poorly photoshopped, bamboozled people just yelling at each other. Looks like a regular old traffic situation. Uh, If you've ever been stuck in city traffic, no one has any respect for each other. Like an endangered species, respect seems to be rarely seen and stands out when it is shown. For example, many people show little regard for one another, their parents, and the elderly, as well as for police, employers, and teachers. Meanwhile, on social media, rude remarks abound. According to an article in Harvard Business Review, disrespectful behavior is, indeed, on the rise. It adds that people are reporting more of it, and have been for a while now. In this issue, what has happened to respect? You got this angry jerk. He looks like he's yelling at some waiter who's probably just trying to get through the day. So it's entitled Respect for Others, Respect for Life. You got some hooligans going for a booze cruise, Respect for Family. This guy just wants to doom scroll through Twitter instead of talking to his wife, a real champion, people, man of the people. For self, you have someone sad about having some bangs, I suppose. Who really knows? Anyway, boom page down. What has happened to respect for others? Why respect for others matters. Respect for for others diffuses tension and keeps a bad situation from getting worse. A Bible proverb says, a mild answer turns away rage, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Disrespectful speech and actions only add fuel to the fire, often with disastrous results. Jesus stated, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. Disrespectful speech can reveal a deeper problem, how we truly feel about people whose race, tribe, nationality, or social background is different from our own. In a recent study of more than 32,000 residents in 28 countries, 69% said that the lack of civility and mutual respect today is the worst they have ever seen. What can you do? Whether at school or at work, respect all people, even if you don't share their views. Identify things that you can agree on. That will help you to avoid becoming critical or judgmental. The Bible says, stop judging that you may not be judged. Treat others the way you want to be treated. If you are considerate and fair with others, they will be more likely to return the favor. Just as you want men to do to you, do the same way to them. Be forgiving. Give others the benefit of the doubt by overlooking unkind words or actions. The inside of a man certainly slows down his anger, and it is beauty on his part to overlook an offense. Learn more? Is it difficult to respect others when you have been taught to hate them? Learn how two men from opposing nations were able to learn to respect each other. Search for the video, Can Love Conquer Hatred, on JW.org. What are we doing? In the communities in which they live and work, Jehovah's Witnesses promote respect for others. We offer free Bible instruction to all people, but we do not force our beliefs or opinions on others. (laughs) Rather, we try to apply the Bible's counsel by sharing our message with a mild temper and deep respect. We reject discrimination and welcome to our congregation meetings people from all backgrounds who want to learn what the Bible teaches. We strive to be tolerant and to show proper respect to everyone. We respect the authority of the government under which we live. (laughs) We obey the laws and pay taxes, and although we remain politically neutral, we respect the rights of others to make their own decisions on political matters. They got some picture here that's a real who's who of who's going to the Jehovah's Witness meetings. I guess whether you're black or white or... Asian, if you wear a tie or have a beard, everyone's welcome here. So, yippee, Uh, they don't really talk about all of the actual discrimination and misogyny that happens within their organization. Funny they left that part out. What has happened to respect for life? Why respect for life matters. Practices and actions that show disrespect for life can adversely affect the health and the safety of a community. Cigarette smoking not only causes cancer, but also interferes with the body's ability to fight it. All told, about 90% of lung cancer deaths can be attributed to smoking or to exposure to secondhand smoke. No sources for that. 
Mass shootings cause emotional trauma for many each year. A Stanford University report states, Research indicates that even those who escape school shootings without any visible physical harm carry scars that could impair their lives for many years to come. Interesting Watchtower has figured out that emotional damage might actually linger for years. Wow. People driving when under the influence of alcohol or drugs make roads and even pedestrian sidewalks unsafe. When people show a callous disregard for life, community members often become innocent victims. What you can do. Protect your health. It is never too late to give up harmful practices, such as smoking, vaping, over-drinking, or taking recreational drugs. Such practices harm your life and show disrespect for the life of those around you, including family members. Let us cleanse ourselves of every defilement of flesh. Be safety conscious. To prevent accidents, keep your home in good repair, drive safely, and keep your vehicle in safe condition. Do not let others pressure you into activities that can cause serious injury or death. If you build a new house, you must also make a parapet for your roof so that you may not bring blood guilt on your house because of someone falling from it. Parapets like a little tiny wall so people didn't fall off. And I think in ancient Israel, people used to hang out on their roofs a lot to escape the, escape the heat. Be kind to others. Respect for life includes how we view people from all racial, national, and social backgrounds. After all, prejudice and hatred are root causes of much of the world's violence and warfare. Put away from yourselves every kind of malicious bitterness, anger, wrath, screaming, and abusive speech, as well as everything inju injurious, but become kind to one another. There's a footnote here. In the ancient Middle East, these were requirements. Oh, they actually had a footnote, but I already explained that, so we'll just move right along. What are we doing? Yes, Jehovah's Witnesses, what are you guys up to? Jehovah's Witnesses promote a balanced, healthy lifestyle. Our Bible educational program has helped people to overcome addictions and destructive habits. It's also caused a lot of them. We adhere to strict safety standards in our construction projects. Volunteers who help build our meeting places and other facilities that are used to further our Bible educational work are trained to avoid injury. Our buildings are inspected on a regular basis so that they conform to local safety laws. We provide humanitarian assistance. Really? During a recent 12-month period, we responded to some 200 life-threatening disasters worldwide and spent nearly $12 million of donated funds to provide relief for victims. When Ebola outbreak began to devastate the population of West Africa and the Dominican Republic of Congo, we educated people on how to prevent the spread of the deadly disease. We sent representatives on a vacation to... Oh, sorry. We spent representatives to speak for groups on the subject, Obedience Saves Lives. We provided hand-washing stations at the entrance of each of our places of worship and stressed the importance of hand-washing and other practical safeguards. In Sierra Leone, our radio announcement commended Jehovah's Witnesses for helping witnesses and non-witnesses in the community to avoid the Ebola virus. You know, Watchtower, they're really out here doing God's work. And you just take our, don't just take our word for it. There was a radio announcement in Sierra Leone that praised Watchtower. So clearly, they must be doing a lot to actually protect people. I'm sure people will buy that, won't they, Jeff? Surely. What has happened to respect for family? Why respect for family matters? Respect for family me members creates a stable environment in which husbands, wives, and children feel secure. The book, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, says that when spouses have mutual respect, they express fondness for each other, not just in big ways, but in little ways, day in and day out. Research shows that children who learn to respect others have greater self-esteem, enjoy a better relationship with their parents, and suffer fewer psychological problems. What you can do. Create a plan together with your family. First, fix in mind what you mean by respect. Second, write down specific behaviors that are expected from everyone in the family as well as behaviors that should be avoided. Third, discuss the plan as a family so that your children and you have a common foundation on which to build. The plans of the diligent surely lead to success. Set the example. Do you 
criticize your family members for their faults, mock them for their opinions, or ignore or interrupt them when they are talking to you? Tip, try to view respect as something that you owe your spouse and children, not something that they need to earn. In showing honor to one another, take the lead. Disagree without being disagreeable. When expressing yourself, avoid sweeping assertions such as you always or you never. Such harsh criticisms attack the character of your family member and can turn a minor disagreement into a major conflict. A mild answer turns away rage, but a harsh word stirs up anger. That's uh, actually pretty good advice. Learn more. Uh, Joseph Arabogan was violent and addicted to drugs when he got married. To learn how studying the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses improved his life, search for the article, I Learned to Respect Women and Myself, on JW.org. What are we doing? Jehovah's Witnesses encourage family members to treat one another with respect, often making it a theme of the articles, books, brochures, and videos that we publish, which are made available free of charge. For married couples, the article series Help for the Family can help husbands and wives be to be good listeners, end the silent treatment, and stop arguing. For parents, the article series Help for the Family can help parents train their children to be obedient, assist with chores around the house, say please and thank you. Uh, in all of these, they say search for raising children, raising teenagers, blah, 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 on JW.org. For young people... The Teens and Young Adults section of JW.org has articles, videos, and worksheets that can help young ones to get along with parents and siblings, talk respectfully to parents about rules, gain their parents' trust. Use of the JW.org is free of charge. No fee, no subscription or membership is required, baby, and no personal information will be requested. It is insane that they actually use that as a selling point. Hey, our website is free of charge. I started this and didn't even grab a bottle of water. Off to a great start. What has happened to respect for self? While respect for self matters, people who have self-respect can face life's challenges with confidence. They do not give up easily. Research shows that those who do not think well of themselves are prone to anxiety, depression, and eating disorders, and they are more likely to abuse alcohol and drugs. Yeah, yeah. People who respect themselves avoid comparing themselves with others, which makes it easier for them to get along with people around them and to form strong friendships. On the other hand, those with little self-respect tend to be critical, which can damage relationships. Even when they face challenges, people with self-respect have resilience. They do not let setbacks keep them from reaching their goal. In contrast, those with a little self-respect often view small failings as huge obstacles, that can cause them to give up easily. That's actually pretty true. Watchtower spitting. What you can do. Choose upbuilding friends. Associate with people who are respectful, who are truly interested in you and your welfare, and who build you up. A true friend shows love at all times and is a brother who is born for times of distress. Help others. When you are kind and do things for others, including those who cannot return the favor, you will find genuine happiness that comes from giving. That will be true even if you do not seem to receive credit for your good works. There is more happiness in giving than there is in receiving. Help your children cultivate self-respect. One way to do that is to allow them to solve their own problems to the extent that they are able. That helps children learn how to cope with adversity and work through it. This lesson builds self-respect and it will serve them well in their adulthood. Train a child in the way he should go, even when he grows old, he will not depart from it. What are we doing? The meetings and Bible study program of Jehovah's Witnesses help people improve their life and thereby their self-respect. Our meetings. At our weekly meetings, we enjoy listening to Bible-based talks that often include suggestions on how to build self-respect. Our meetings are free and open to the public. For example, at our meetings, you will learn why you matter to God how to find real purpose in life, how to build strong and lasting friendships. You will also make true friends who are who have mutual concern for one another. To learn more about our meetings, search on jw.org for the short video, What Happens at a Kingdom Hall. Our Bible course, 
we offer a free interactive Bible course using the book Enjoy Life Forever. This book this study book features key scriptures, clear reasoning, effective questions, stirring videos, and beautiful artwork. Our Bible course helps people find dignity and improve their life. What has happened to respect? In this issue of Awake, why respect is important, how you can show respect, what Jehovah's Witnesses are doing to help the community. And thus concludes all of the information that you will get from the Awake magazine in 2024. The Watchtower, number one, 2024. Right and wrong, a guide you can trust. This looks like we got uh, a really fascinating billboard here in the background where it's saying, invest in something or another. Uh, that isn't going to age terribly. I'll have to remember that because uh, they just set up some interesting asset management companies over in Ireland, but that will be for a different video altogether. How do you decide what is right and what is wrong? Many people rely on their conscience and the values that they have learned. Some make bad, some make, wow, I just butchered that. Some make decisions based on what other people think. What guides your decisions about right and wrong? Can you be sure that the decisions you make will result in the best future for you and your family? I couldn't help but think of like Stephen Lett when he was like, bah. I was like, anyway. Right and wrong, a question we all face. If you wanted to travel somewhere that you have never been before, what would you do? One, head in the direction you think you should go. Two, follow others, hoping they know the way. Three, consult a reliable guide, such as a GPS, a map, or a trusted friend who knows the way. If we choose option one or two, we will get somewhere, but not necessarily where we want to go. If we choose option three, however, we can confidently expect to reach our destination. Our life is like a journey, one that we hope will lead to a happy future. Whether we get there or not depends greatly on where we look for guidance when making decisions. While most decisions we make will have little long-term effect on our life, some are more significant. They reflect our moral values, our view of right and wrong. Such decisions will affect us and those we love for a long time, either for good or for bad. These decisions involve matters such as sex and marriage, honesty, work, and money, how to raise children, how to treat others. How can you be certain that your choices in these areas will lead to a happy future for you and your family? The question each of us face faces is this, what will guide the moral decisions I make? This magazine will help explain why the Bible is a reliable moral guide and how it can help you. Got some pretty cool pictures here of uh, this guy looking super lost, but Ranger Sally knows the way and is trying to help him out. But it looks like he's come to a halt in the road here. Pictures kind of suck. Right and wrong, what guides many? Almost everyone agrees that some actions are clearly right or definitely wrong. For example, murder, rape, and child sexual abuse are widely condemned, while fairness, kindness, and empathy are widely praised. But in other areas of life, even situations involving sexuality, honesty, or parenting, many people believe that there is no right or wrong option. They think that almost any choice is acceptable. People often make their decisions based on how they feel and how those around them feel about the matter. Is that always a reliable approach? We are off how we feel. We are often guided by how we feel, our internal sense of right and wrong, which is commonly called our conscience. Even from a young age, children can recognize the difference between fair and unfair behavior and even feel guilt. Over time, our conscience is shaped by the values we learn from our family, peers, teachers, community, religion, and culture. When we make decisions, our conscience tells us whether our choice matches our values or not. Our sense of right and wrong can move us to show empathy, gratitude, fairness, and compassion towards others. It can also hold us back from doing things that could hurt those who we care about, or that might cause us embarrassment, shame, and guilt. Is how we feel always a reliable guide? As a young man, Garrick pursued a career, pursued a life where, as he said, I could establish my own standards. He found, however, that doing that, doing what he felt was right, did not lead to good results. He came to embrace a lifestyle that he later described as 
a very dark path of immorality, drug abuse, drunkenness, and a lot of violence. Garrick sounds like he kind of sucks. How other people feel. In addition to our own feelings, we, oft, we are often guided by how others will view our decisions. That can allow us to benefit from their experience and wisdom. We win the respect of our family and friends and community when we do what they think is right. Is how, the, is how other people feel always a reliable guide? As a young woman, Priscilla did what was popular among her peers and freely engaged in premarital sex. She found, though, that doing what others viewed as right did not make her happier. She said, Doing what everyone else was doing didn't make me feel good. It led me to make unwise and careless risks. Tisk tisk, Priscilla. Is there a better way? When we decide between right and wrong, our feelings and the feelings of others play a valuable role. But that guidance alone does not always lead to a good outcome. We become victims of our own short-sightedness, failing to see the harm that our choices may cause us or others. And there is no guarantee that our values or the values of those around us are truly good for us and will not need to change. After all, certain behavior once viewed as wrong is now commonly accepted, while conduct previously thought of as acceptable is now viewed as improper. When they say this, it's so frustrating because Watchtower does literally the exact same thing. They will change their standards just like the world changes their standards. When they made that beard change, they predicated it literally on, well, in Satan's world, it's more acceptable, so I guess it's more acceptable for us now. It's such a bizarre thing that they're trying to argue. <clears throat> is there a better guide for deciding what is right and what is wrong? Is there a moral standard we can follow today that will not leave us disappointed years from now? <sighs> Thankfully... There is a source of consistent and reliable moral guidance that works for everyone, everywhere. The next article will discuss where we can find the most reliable guide for determining right and wrong. Boy, howdy, I can't wait to see. Right and wrong. The Bible, a reliable guide. Yeah, jeez. We cannot be sure that our moral choices will turn out well if we base them only on how we or other people feel. The Bible reveals why, but it also does more. It contains reliable moral guidance, the key to enjoying a happy and fulfilling life. Guidance we need. In the Bible, Jehovah God explains that he intended for humans to look to him for guidance, not to guide or direct themselves. That is why he has provided the moral guidelines found in the Bible, including slavery. Oh, sorry. He loves the human family and he wants to spare us from experiencing the harmful consequences and frustration of making important life decisions based on trial and error. More than that, as our creator, he has the wisdom and knowledge needed to give us the best possible moral advice. Yet God never forces people to live by his standards. Uh, it's funny when they say, yet God never forces people to live by his standards. They don't cite a scripture for that one because he quite literally forces people. He threatens them with some of the most heinous things. You better listen to me or they're going to rip the babies out of your belly. They're going to take your wives and violate them in front of your eyeballs. They're going to grab your children by the ankles and dash them against rocks right in front of you. Yet God never forces people to live by his standards. It says someone that maybe has never read the Bible ever. A book for all people. We would expect a wise and loving creator to make his moral guidance available to everyone. Consider these facts about the Bible. 3,500 plus the number of languages in which at least a portion of the Bible is available, making it the most widely translated book ever. 5 billion the number of copies of the Bible that have been produced, making it the most widely distributed book in history. Jehovah gave the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, everything they needed to be truly happy. He also gave them simple instructions that he expected them to obey. However, he let them choose for themselves whether they would follow those instructions or not. Sadly, Adam and Eve chose to live by their own standards rather than God's standards. What has been the result? Is the human family better off deciding for themselves what is right and wrong? No. 
History proves that ignoring God's standards does not bring lasting peace and happiness. The Bible provides the guidance we need in order to make wise moral choices, regardless of our background. Consider how the Bible does this. Learn more about why the Bible can really be called God's Word. Watch the video, Who is the Author of the Bible? The Bible does not exalt one race, <laughs> nation, tribe, or culture over another. It is truly a book for all people. Uh, sure. Why some dismiss the Bible? Well, this will be good. Some people claim that the Bible cannot be a good source of moral guidance. They may raise the following objections. Objection. The Bible contradicts itself. Fact. The relatively few patches, passages that may appear contradictory can be resolved by taking into account the context, historical facts, and customs, the writer's viewpoint, and other factors. Yet, yeah, also you can use that same principle for everything said in the Bible. You have to take into account the context, the historical facts, the customs, the writer's viewpoint, and whatever other factors. I don't even know what that means. That is how you do form criticism. That is how you can look at things objectively. And when you do that and try and compare that to what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach, uh, you immediately find out that they're just a bunch of hogwash. Objection. People who claim to follow the Bible do bad things, so it must not be a good moral guide. Fact. The Bible is not to blame for the bad conduct of those who do not apply its teachings. It foretold that many people including us, oh, sorry, including religious leaders who claim to follow the Bible, would act contrary to what it says. It also says that as a result, Bible teachings would be spoken of abusively. Objection. The Bible promotes an intolerant view of others. Fact. The Bible encourages treating other people with respect. It does not condone considering oneself superior to others disrespecting people who have different beliefs or values, forcing others to adopt one's view. This is so disingenuous to even, like, say that, because Jehovah's Witnesses consider themselves as the only people that will survive Armageddon and the only people to have truth while the whole entire world is blindly following Satan, disrespecting people who have different values or beliefs. They absolutely do this uh, overtly and inadvertently, uh, talk to anyone that has spends time with Jehovah's Witnesses, and you will immediately find out that whether they know it or not, they are disrespecting other people's values and beliefs and forcing others to adopt one's views. Yes, because you will, they will shun people or tell them they will die at Armageddon if they don't adopt their views. That is absolutely forcing. This is a load of rubbish. The Bible shows that God always treats people kindly and fairly and that God wants us to do the same. How the Bible Reveals God's Guidance The Bible is an accurate record of Jehovah's dealings with humankind. What it contains helps us to discern what God views as right and wrong, beneficial and harmful. We learn timeless principles that help us make wise moral choices in our daily lives. For example, consider the advice found at Proverbs 13, 20. The one walking with the wise will become wise, but the one who has dealings with the stupid will fare badly. That principle is just as applicable in our modern times as it was in ancient times. The Bible is full of such practical, valuable principles. See the box, the Bible's timeless wisdom. Okay. Although the Bible was completed almost 2,000 years ago, it continues to be relevant today. Basic human nature has not changed. We still seek fulfillment and happiness in life. The Bible's timeless wisdom can help us reach that goal. If we wish to conduct ourselves honestly in all things, oh, uh, let the one who steals steal no more, swipe or no swiping. Relationships. Let each one keep seeking not his own advantage, but that of the other person. Continue putting up with one, one another and freely forgiving one another. Making decisions. The naive person believes every word, but the shrewd one ponders each step. The shrewd one sees the danger and conceals himself, but the inexperienced keeps right on going and suffer the consequences. I need to make a minor adjustment here because it would be nice to know without having to look if 
my recording's about to run out. Because I don't want it to run out and then I'm reading and it's not recording me anymore. But I guess I'll just have to make make uh, sure I'm cognizant of it. And it's fine. Production issues, it's fine. We'll, we'll keep going. Right and wrong, a guidance that works. Consider four areas of life in which millions have learned that the Bible's guidance works and can be trusted. 1. Marriage. People have different views about marriage and about what makes or what it takes to have a happy marriage. The Bible says, Each one of you must love his wife as he does himself. On the other hand, the wife should have deep respect for her husband. Meaning, marriage is an arrangement that God originated, so he knows what is needed for a couple to be happy. Happiness results when marriage mates focus not on what each one gets, but on what each one can give to strengthen their marriage. A husband who loves his wife will show it by the way he treats her and cares for her, and a wife who respects her husband will show it by the way she speaks and acts. Bible Guidance Works Quang and T from Vietnam felt trapped in their unhappy marriage. Quang, who was often unkind, he says, I didn't care about T's feelings and often humiliated her. T wanted a divorce. She said, I felt that I could no longer trust or respect my husband. Eventually, Quang and T learned what the Bible teaches and how to apply Ephesians 5.35 in their marriage. This verse helped me to see the need to be kind, says Quang, and to make T feel loved and cared for materially, physically, and emotionally. When I act that way, I gain her love and respect. And T says, the more I apply Ephesians 5.33 and show my husband respect, the more he makes me feel loved, protected, and at peace. So there you go. If you're in an unhappy marriage, read Ephesians 5.33 and it will solve all of your problems. This picture's, uh, what is going on here? We got these people with the tattoos, black lipstick, leather, looking like some, some, some hooligans, I guess, in Jehovah's Witness eyes. And they're looking at their shopping list. And the, this lady must be a Jehovah's Witness, and she's letting them go by, or she's telling them what product they're looking for, how to be helpful, something like that. I, I really don't get this picture at all. It makes, huh. It's like, hey, here's the Tide Pods. Now go and smoke them. And they're like, oh, thanks, lady. We really needed to cook up some Tide Pod meth. I have no idea what is going on in this picture. Anyway. Uh, two, how to treat others. People often mistreat others because of their race, nationality, appearance, religion, or sexual orientation. Yeah, like Jehovah's Witnesses do all of that. Meaning, the Bible does not condone racism, homophobia, or xenophobia. Instead, it encourages us to be respectful of all people, regardless of their race, nationality, or social standing. Even if we disagree with what others believe or how they act, we can still treat them with kindness and respect. Daniel was taught to view people from Asia as a threat to his own country. He came to hate anyone from an Asian background and would often insult them in public. I justified my behavior as patriotism, says Daniel. I didn't even consider that the way I thought or acted was wrong. Daniel eventually learned what the Bible teaches. I had to change my thinking totally, says Daniel. I had to see people the way God does, that we are all the same no matter where we come from. Daniel describes how he feels now when he meets people. He says, I often don't even think about where they are from. I love people of all sorts now and have close friends from all over the world. Well, at least Daniel's not an insufferable piece of shit anymore, so I guess I guess there's that. Uh, I'm still not entirely sure why this picture is, is here. There's no real explanation. Am I missing something? That is, it looks like this picture is just taking up space. They don't really comment on that. Huh, fascinating. Uh, this next picture here is this guy selling waffle pies and takoyaki. So he's working at a stand and selling some food. Looks like he's got a little food truck. He's service with a smile. There's napkins. That's about all I got for you. Uh, money. People, many people pursue wealth in order to be happy and have a better future. The Bible says, Wisdom is a protection just as money is a protection. 
But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves the life of its owner. Meaning, uh, meaning, we need money, but it cannot guarantee our happiness or our future. Instead, genuine happiness and a secure future depend on applying wisdom from God as found in the Bible. Biblical guidance works. Cardo, a man in Indonesia, focusing on acquiring wealth. I enjoyed what most people dream of, he said. I was able to travel and buy luxury cars and goods and houses. Such prosperity did not last. I was defrauded and the money I had worked so hard for all those years was gone in the blink of an eye, says Cardo. I had spent my life pursuing wealth, but in the end, all I got were feelings of emptiness, worthlessness, and disappointment. Cardo began to apply the Bible's advice on money. He no longer focuses all his energy on building wealth, but chooses to lead a simpler life. The true and lasting treasures is a spirit of a spiritual nature, he says. I can sleep well every night, and I am truly happy. Good for you, Cardo. Six. Ooh, time to get spicy. Yeehaw. Hope you're not listening to this late at night. Am I right? People have a wide variety of opinions on what is sexually acceptable. The Bible says, Abstain from sexual immorality. Each one of you should know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not with greedy, uncontrolled sexual passions like the nations have to do, have that do not know God. Now remember, the Bible's not judgmental. It doesn't, uh, you know, it's not racial or partial. <laughs> and they literally are like, oh, uncontrolled sexual passions like the nations do. The uh, Bible's not xenophobic, though. Meaning, the Bible limits how we are to express... The Bible limits how we are to express our sexual desires. The term sexual immorality includes adultery, prostitution, sexual relations between unmarried individuals, homosexuality, and bestiality. Sexual relations are a gift from God that he intended exclusively for a man and woman who are married to each other. Bible Guidance Works A woman in Australia named Kylie says, As a single person, I thought that if I had sex, I would then feel loved and secure. But the opposite happened. I felt insecure and heartbroken. Later, Kylie learned and applied what the Bible teaches about sex. I can see that God's standards are there to prevent pain and hurt, she says. I now feel secure and loved because of doing things in the way Jehovah wants us to. Applying the Bible's guidance has saved me from so much heartache. Got this picture of someone that looks like they're... I think all of their pictures are just AI generated now. It's crazy. They used to have like actual artists and do some interesting artwork, but now it's just... Yeah, I guess I just go into Canva and type in a prompt and bada bing bada boom. Our creator helps us to know what is right and wrong. Although sticking to his moral guidelines is not always easy, it is worth the effort. We can trust that it will always result in our long-term happiness. Right and wrong, a choice you must make. The moral standards we choose to live by will greatly affect how our life turns out. Jehovah God knows that. This is why he wants us to live by his standards. Jehovah wants us to enjoy a peaceful and happy life. I, Jehovah, am your God, the one teaching you to benefit yourself, the one guiding you in the way you should walk. If only you would pay attention to my commandments, then your peace would become just like a river, like a river, and your righteousness like the waves of a sea. As our creator, God knows the best way we should live. He invites us to follow his guidance because it will be for our good. When we follow God's commandments, we will not we will not have to wonder whether our choice will result in good. We will always be making the right choice, the one that leads to peace and happiness. Jehovah does not, does not ask us to do the impossible. This commandment that I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it beyond your reach. I like when the person giving the command is the one telling you, this is not the one that is too ridiculous. Living by God's moral standards may require changes in how we think and act. However, Jehovah is not asking too much of us. After all, as our creator, he knows what we are capable of. 
and as we come to know Jehovah, we will find that his commandments are not burdensome. Jehovah promises to help those who choose to live by his standards. I, Jehovah, your God, am grasping your right hand, the one saying to you, Do not be afraid, I will help you. We can measure up to Jehovah's moral standards because he will help us. He can assist us through his word, the Bible, which gives us encouragement and hope. Millions of people around the world have found that living by Bible principles has improved their lives. Why not learn more about the good advice the Bible has to offer? You can begin by considering Bible-based brochure Enjoy Life Forever, available free of charge on JW.org. It contains these lessons. How can the Bible help you? The Bible gives hope. Can you trust the Bible? As you investigate God's word, the Bible, you will discover that it is not out of date. It is always reliable, now and forever. Following the moral standards found in the Bible is the best way for us to live. However, God will not force us to do so. It is a choice that we, that each of us must make. Where can you find reliable guidance today in our rapidly changing world? How can you be certain that the choices you make will result in good? How can you be sure that what is considered right today won't be considered wrong tomorrow? The Bible can help you make choices that you will never regret. How is this possible? The Bible is from our creator and he knows what will make us truly happy. He has told you what is good. That is just a completely butchered scripture they just took. He has told you dot 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 what is good. That's crazy. We can trust the practical wisdom found in the Bible. It is always reliable now and forever. Why not examine for yourself how the Bible can help you in this ever-changing world? Thus completes all of the information you will get for the public versions of The Watchtower and Awake in 2024. It all took about 40 minutes to read. Now, because they haven't released the December edition for 2024, we're just going to slide in the 2023 one because that's what we're doing. So here we go. The Watchtower, December 2023, Study Article 50. Faith and works can lead to righteousness. Walk orderly in the footsteps of faith that our father Abraham had. Although many people have heard of Abraham, most know little about him. However, you know a lot about Abraham. You know, for example, that Abraham has been called the father of all those having faith. You may wonder, though, can I walk in the footsteps of Abraham and have the kind of faith he had? Yes, you can. One way we can develop faith like that of Abraham is by studying his example. At God's command, Abraham moved to a distant land, lived in tents for decades, and attempted to sacrifice his beloved son Isaac. Those actions reflected strong faith. Abraham's faith and works resulted in his having God's approval and friendship. Jehovah wants us, wants you, to enjoy these same blessings. For that reason, he inspired the Bible writers Paul and James to refer to Abraham's example. Let us focus on his example as it is discussed in Romans chapter 4 and James chapter 2. Both chapters refer to a rem remarkable statement that was made concerning Abraham. Both Paul and James quoted from Genesis 15:6, which states, Abraham put faith in Jehovah, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Righteousness basically refers to the state in which a person is viewed by God as acceptable, even guiltless. How incredible that an imperfect, sinful human can be viewed as guiltless. Likely you want to be true in likely you want that to be true in your case, and it is possible. To find out how that can be said of us, we need to understand why that could be said of Abraham. Faith Essentials for Righteousness. In his letter to the Romans, Paul stated that all humans are sinners. How can how then can anyone be viewed as righteous or blameless and thus gain God's approval? To help all sincere Christians answer that question, Paul pointed to Abraham. Man, it seems like they just keep saying the same thing. Like, they're four paragraphs in, and they're like, okay, we're really going to tell you about how Paul and Luke or James, whoever it was, are, are going to talk about Paul. We're really going to say it now. Like, just get on with it. Jehovah declared Abraham righteous while he was dwelling in the land of Canaan. Why could Jehovah declare Abraham righteous? Was it because Abraham perfectly kept the Mosaic law? Certainly not. That law was delivered to the nation of Israel more than 400 years after God declared Abraham righteous. Essentially then, on what basis did God declare Abraham righteous? 
In his undeserved kindness, Jehovah declared Abraham righteous because of his faith. Paul reasoned further that when a person puts faith in God, his faith is counted as righteousness. Paul added, Just as David also speaks of the happiness of a man to whom God counts righteousness, apart from works, happy are those whose lawless deeds have been pardoned and whose sins have been covered. Happy is the man whose sin Jehovah will by no means take into account. God pardons or covers over the sins of those who put faith in him. He forgives them completely and no longer takes their sins into account. He views such individuals as guiltless and righteous on the basis of faith. Although they were declared righteous, Abraham, David, and other faithful worshippers of Jehovah God were still imperfect sinners. Because, But because of their faith, God viewed them as blameless, especially when compared with those who had no standing with him. As Paul makes clear in his letter, faith is, a, is central to having a personal relationship with God. And that was true in the case of both Abraham and David, and it is true of us as well. How are faith and works related? For centuries, the relationship between faith and works has been hotly debated in Christendom. Some clergymen teach that all you have to do to be saved is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You may have heard them say, Accept Jesus and be saved. I don't know why they literally put it in quotation marks. Accept Jesus and be saved. (laughs) Clergymen may even quote Paul's words, God counts righteousness apart from works. However, others contend that you can save yourself by going on religious pilgrimages and by performing other duties, as outlined by the church. They perhaps quote James 2.24, A man is to be declared righteous by works and not by faith alone. Yet the reason it's been debated is because it's just a contradiction. There's our scriptures that say you can be proven righteous by your works and not by just faith. And there are scriptures that say you can be proven the, the opposite of it, essentially. So that's why the debate exists. But let's see how these brain-rotted individuals work out this issue. As a result of such positions, some religious writers have concluded that Paul and James disagreed on the subject of faith and works. Clergymen may claim that while Paul believed that man is declared righteous by faith apart from works, James taught that works are essential in order to have God's approvals. A professor of divinity put it this way, James did not understand Paul's motive for insisting that being declared righteous is by faith alone and not by works. But Jehovah inspired both Paul and James to write what they did. So there must be a simple way to harmonize these statements. There is, by considering their writings in context. Uh, The simpler way to do it is actually to understand that maybe these men actually did disagree, and that is what eventually how the Bible was formed. You had two different groups of people. James and John were saying, you know, one thing, and Paul was saying something different than that. I mean, the entire story of Paul is that he is an outsider uh, that is helping to spread Christianity, and he was involved with debates between other people that had differing views. There is historic significance. There are things, clues that you could look at instead of just saying like, well, let's just harmonize this and call it good. What works did Paul focus on in Romans 3 and 4? He was primarily referring to works of law, the law of Moses given at Mount Sinai. It seems that in Paul's day, some Jewish Christians were having a hard time accepting that the Mosaic law and the works required by the law had been done away with. Consequently, Paul pointed to Abraham's example to prove that a righteous standing with God does not result from works of law. It comes from faith. That is encouraging because knowing this gives confidence gives us confidence that a good standing with God is within our reach. It means that we can develop faith in God and in Christ, which can actually lead to divine approval. On the other hand, the works discussed in James chapter 2 are not the works of law mentioned by Paul. James is referring to the works or activities that Christians do in their daily life. Such works indicate whether a Christian has genuine faith in God or not. Consider two examples that James used. In the first example, James spoke of the need for Christians to be impartial in their dealings with others. 
He illustrated this point with the case of a man who showed favor to a wealthy person, but looked down on a poor person. James pointed out that such a man might claim to have faith, but where are his corresponding works? As a second example, James mentioned someone who saw a brother or sister lacking clothing or food, but did not provide practical help. Even if that one claimed to have faith, it was not backed up by actions, therefore it was useless. As James wrote, faith by itself, without works, is dead. James referred to Rahab as a positive example of faith in action. She had heard about Jehovah and recognized that he was supporting the Israelites. She showed her faith by her actions. She protected two Israelite spies when their lives were in danger. As a result, this imperfect non-Israelite woman was declared righteous just as Abraham had been. The example she set emphasizes the importance of having faith backed up by works. The two Bible writers, Paul and James, were simply approaching the subject of faith and works from different angles. Paul was telling the Jewish Christians that they would never be able to obtain Jehovah's approval simply by performing works of the Mosaic Law. James was emphasizing the need for all Christians to show their faith by doing good to others. We got a little boxed picture here where someone's writing some letters with a generic plant. Uh, someone's at a kingdom hall shaking the hands of a guy in a wheelchair, and people are standing by a brick wall with a cart. And they ask a question, does your faith move you to do works that Jehovah approves of? Like standing by a brick wall or shaking the hands with someone or writing a letter? Uh -huh. You better buckle up because it says see paragraph 15. Jehovah does not say if we want to be declared righteous, we must do exactly what Abraham did. Oh, thank God. We don't have to move and go wander around in tents and try and trick an Egyptian or pharaoh, try and tell him, hey, why don't you have sex with my wife so you don't kill me? <laughs> I'm, I'm sure glad we don't all have to do that. Now, don't we? <laughs> in fact, there are many ways in which we can manifest faith through our works. We can welcome new ones in the congregation help brothers and sisters who are in genuine need, and to do good to our family members, all of which are things that God will approve of and bless. An especially fine work that gives evidence of our zealously sharing, an especially fine work that gives evidence of our faith is our zealously sharing the good news with others. All of us can show by our deeds that we have faith, that Jehovah's promises will come true, and his ways are best. And if we do, we have the firm assurance that God will count us as righteous and will call us his friends. Hope essential to faith. Romans chapter 4 highlights another vital lesson that we can learn from Abraham, the importance of hope. Jehovah promised that through Abraham many nations would be blessed. Imagine what a wonderful hope Abraham had. However, even when Abraham was a hundred years old and Sarah was ninety, the promised son had not yet appeared. From a human standpoint, it seemed impossible for Abraham and Sarah to have a son. What was a real test for Abraham? Yet, based on our hope, he had faith that he would become the father of many nations. And sure enough, that hope was realized. He did become father to Isaac, the long-hoped-for son. We can have God's approval and be counted righteous as God's friends, as Abraham was. In fact, Paul touched on that writing. The words it was counted to him were not written for Abraham's sake only, but also for our sake, to whom it will be counted, because we believe in him who raised Jesus. Like Abraham, we need to have both faith and works, as well as hope. Paul goes on to discuss our hope in Romans chapter 5, which we will consider in the following article. Sometimes whenever they have quotes from the Bible, it's disorienting because my memory is of their older Bible, and the new Bible that they have just says things differently, and it's like, uh, it doesn't connect in, in ye old head. But anyway, study article 51. Enjoy a hope without disappointment. Jehovah promised his friend Abraham that all nations of the earth would be... Ugh. Jehovah promised his friend Abraham that all nations of the earth would be blessed by means of his offspring. Wow, I, my nose is so itchy. I picked up Zizi, 
And now it's like I just feel his hair on my face. Oh, okay. Jehovah promises friend Abraham that all nations of the earth would be blessed by means of his offspring. Because Abraham had deep faith in God, he was convinced that God's promise would come true. Even so, when Abraham was a hundred years of age and his wife was ninety, that faithful couple still did not have a son. Yet, the Bible says, based on our hope, Abraham had faith that he would become the father of many nations according to what had been said. You know that Abraham's hope was realized. He did become father to the son he had long hoped for, Isaac. What was the basis for Abraham's confidence? Because of his close personal relationship with Jehovah, Abraham was fully convinced that what God had promised would come true. Jehovah approved of Abraham and declared him righteous because of his faith. As indicated at Romans 4.18, Abraham's faith and his hope were connected. Let us now consider what the Apostle Paul says about hope, as recorded in chapter 5 of Romans. Paul explains why we can be sure that our hope does not lead to disappointment. He also helps us to understand how our Christian hope can grow. As we examine the process Paul outlines at Romans 5, 1-5, consider your own experience. In doing so, you will likely recognize that over time, your Christian hope has become more certain. Our discussion will reveal how you can make your own hope grow even stronger than it is now. Let us first consider a glorious hope that Paul says will not lead to disappointment. And we've got a picture here of Brother uh, Franz. Well express the confidence that anointed Christians have in their hope. I think they've pointed to Brother Franz before. I think I even talked about this in a recent video where they kind of use him as the gold standard of someone that uh, was part of a generation. So, And he lived about as long as anyone that they could possibly point to. I think, well, it was like almost 100 years old or something like that. So whenever they're talking about their generation doctrine, they use Brother Franz. So I think that's why he keeps popping up. Our glorious hope. Paul wrote those words to the congregation in Rome. The brothers and sisters there had learned about Jehovah and Jesus, had exercised faith, and had become Christians. God thus declared them righteous as a result of faith, and he anointed them with Holy Spirit. Yes, they gained a valid, wonderful hope. Paul later wrote to anointed Christians in Ephesus about the hope to which they were called the hope including receiving an inheritance for the holy ones. And Paul also indicated to the Colossians where their hope would be realized. He called it the hope that is being re re reserved for you in the heavens. The hope of the anointed Christians then is that they be resurrected to everlasting life in heaven, where they will reign with Christ. Hallelujah. Anointed Christians cherish that hope. One of them, Brother Frederick Franz, said from his heart. I'm pretty sure he said it from his mouth. Our hope is a sure thing, and it will be fulfilled fully to every last one of the 144,000 members of the little flock to a degree beyond what we have even imagined. After serving God faithfully for decades in 1991, Brother Franz affirmed, We have not lost our sense of value of that hope. We are appreciating it all the more the longer we have to wait for it. It is something worth waiting for, even if it required a million years. I evaluate our hope more highly than ever before. It's called the sunk cost fallacy. Most who worship Jehovah today have a different hope. It is the hope that Abraham had, everlasting life on earth under God's kingdom. Paul wrote about the glorious outcome awaiting those who have that hope. When you first learned of the Bible's promise for the future, what did you find most appealing about it? Uh, not dying. Was it the fact that one day you will be perfect, no longer prone to sin? That and not dying. Or were you thrilled to learn about your dead loved ones will live again on a paradise earth? Yes, they wouldn't be dead. This gave you much to look forward to on the basis of hope. Whether we expect to enjoy everlasting life in heaven or on earth, we have a glorious hope that gives us reason to rejoice, and our joyful hope can grow even stronger. What Paul writes next explains how that can happen. Let us consider what he wrote concerning our hope 
Doing so will make us even more confident that our hope will keep growing and will never let us down. We've got a picture here. All Christians can expect some sort of tribulation. This little girl's, they're gossiping, saying, oh, look at this milk-drinking nerd with her ham sandwich praying. <laughs> and then this wife uh, looks like her husband's yelling at her. No doubt she's a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, he's not too fond of it, but hey, he's got tan pants, so he's well on his way to becoming a Jehovah's Witness. I got a construction worker, someone offering him a promotion, or maybe he's taking a bribe of some kind. Uh, witnesses absolutely took, uh, have been documented to uh, have taken bribes and uh, said that it's okay to bribe certain officials uh, in their history. Yeah, not super great. And this guy's just sitting in prison, super sad. How Hope Grows Note that tribulation may be involved in developing a stronger hope. That may surprise us. In reality, all followers of Christ can expect tribulation. Consider Paul's example. He said to those in Thessalonica, When we were with you, we used to tell you in advance that we would suffer tribulation, and that is what has happened. And to the Corinthians he wrote, We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the tribulation we experienced. We are very uncertain even of our lives. Christians today, too, can expect tribulation of some sort. What about you? As you put faith in Jesus and follow him, has tribulation come your way? Friends and relatives may have ridiculed you. They may even have been hostile. Has your determination to be honest in all things created problems for you at work? Have you faced governmental opposition because you shared your hope with others? No matter what type of tribulation we may encounter, though, Paul says we should rejoice. Why? We can rejoice when undergoing tribulation because of what it produces. At Romans 5.3, as Romans 5.3 says, tribulation produces endurance. All Christians will face tribulation, so all Christians must have endurance. We need to be determined to endure whatever trials we may face. Only then will we be able to see the fulfillment of our hope. We do not want to be like those whom Jesus had in mind when speaking about seeds that fell on rocky soil. <laughs> they accepted the word with joy at first, but after tribulation or persecution arose, they were stumbled. Granted, facing opposition or trials is not easy or pleasant, but enduring them brings definite benefits. In what way? The disciple James highlighted the benefits of enduring trials. He wrote, Let endurance complete its work so that you may complete it you may be complete and sound in all respects not lacking in anything james describes endurance as if it had a task a work to perform what work is endurance assigned to accomplish it can help you develop to a greater degree such qualities as patience faith and reliance on god however we gain another significant benefit from enduring you get to run farther. Paul mentions that endurance results in an approved condition. Your endurance brings Jehovah's approval. This does not mean that Jehovah is pleased that you are experiencing trials or problems. What God approves of is you. Your endurance results in an approved condition. What an amazing blessing. Recall that Abraham endured test and enjoyed divine approval. Jehovah viewed him as a friend and counted him as righteous. The same can be true of us. God does not base his approval on the amount of work we do in his service or on the privileges we enjoy. He grants his favor, he grants his approval because of our faithful endurance. And no matter what our age, circumstances, or ability is, all of us can endure. Are you faithfully enduring a trial right now? If so, take comfort in knowing that you have God's approval. Realizing that we have God's approval can have a powerful effect on us. It can strengthen our hope. We get a little uh, uh, update on all of our protagonists here from the last picture. The girl's now studying with someone. That's never going to happen. This woman's just reading the Bible, but there's some oranges behind her, so maybe she doesn't have scurvy anymore, so she's happy about that. Uh, this guy didn't take the bribe so he's just giving a comment at a meeting that he probably doesn't want to be at so congrats to him and this guy is uh, still in prison so yeah clearly the, the even watchtower in watchtower's fantasies 
uh, believing in what they have to say will absolutely improve your life because your situation literally will not change. As Paul explained, we gain Jehovah's approval by enduring trials successfully. Note how Paul continues his discussion. The approved condition, in turn, leads to hope, and the hope does not lead to disappointment. This might puzzle some. Why? Because earlier, as recorded at Romans 5.2, Paul mentioned that those Christians in Rome already had a hope, the hope of the glory of God. Consequently, someone might ask, if those Christians already had a hope, why does Paul list hope later in his discussion? We can understand what Paul meant by keeping in mind that hope is something that grows. Oh, well, we need an illustration now. Do you recall when you first heard of the marvelous hope contained in God's word? Nope. At that point, you may have thought that the idea of living forever on a paradise earth was mere wishful thinking. Yup. However, as you got better acquainted with Jehovah and the Bible's promises, you became more convinced that his hope would become a reality. Quite the opposite. The more familiar I became with the Bible, the less convinced I was in Jehovah's Witness propaganda. Even after your dedication and baptism, your hope continued to grow as you learned more and matured spiritually. You have likely experienced what is mentioned at Romans 5, 2-4. You had various tribulations, but have endured them and sensed God's approval. Confident of God's favor, you now have even greater reason to expect to receive the things he has promised. Your hope has become stronger than what you had initially. It is more real to you, more personal. It affects you more intensely, influencing every aspect of your life and changing how you treat your family, how you make decisions, and even how you use your time. The Apostle adds a very important point regarding the hope that you possess after receiving God's approval. He assures you that your hope will be fulfilled. Why can you be sure? Paul indicates this inspired guarantee to Christians. The hope does not lead to disappointment because the love God has been poor... The Wow, the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which was given to us. You have every reason to be certain of the hope, your hope. Reflect on Jehovah's promise to Abraham and how God's approved, how God approved of him and viewed him as a friend. Abraham did not hope in vain. The Bible states, after Abraham had shown patience, he obtained this promise. He was definitely not disappointed. You can be just as certain. If you remain faithful, your hope will be rewarded. Your hope is real. It is a cause for joy, not disappointment. Paul wrote, May the God who gives hope fill you with all joy and peace by your trusting in him so that you may abound in hope with power of Holy Spirit. Amen. Be guided by God's view of alcohol. You no doubt treasure Jehovah's varied gifts, including your free will to decide how you might enjoy these gifts. Interestingly, the Bible identifies wine as a gift from God. Even saying bread is made for laughter and wine makes life enjoyable. You have likely seen, though, that some people have developed problems with alcohol. Yes, sir. Uh, furthermore, there are differing opinions and standards around the globe and among cultures. What then is the wise course for Christians? No matter where we live or in what culture we are raised, allowing God's view to guide our thinking and decisions will definitely benefit us and lead to our lasting good. As you have probably noticed, many people in the world drink often and heavily. Some may use alcohol because of the relaxed feeling that it can offer. Others drink to cope with problems, and in some places, drinking large amounts of alcohol is viewed as sophisticated or manly. I don't know if you see someone pounding a whole case of Budweiser if you're going to think, wow, this is look at that sophisticated man over there. As Christians, though, have wise guidance from their loving creator. For example, he has alerted us to the sad consequences of overdrinking. We may have read Proverbs 23, 29 through 35, the graphic description of a drunk person and some of the resulting problems. Daniel, a Christian elder in Europe, recalls that his life was like before he became a true Christian. Excessive drinking led to poor decisions and to painful experiences that have left me emotionally scarred. How can Christians exercise free will and avoid problems that excessive alcohol can cause? The key is to allow God's view to guide our thinking and actions. 
let us take a look at what the Bible says about alcohol and the motives some have for drinking. The Bible's standards. God's word does not condemn the moderate use of alcoholic beverages. Why does it say like the moderate use of alcoholic beverages? Why can't you just say drinking? It sounds, it's such a bizarre turn of expression. In fact, the Bible acknowledges that drinking wine can be an enjoyable experience. We read, eat your food with rejoicing and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. Jesus drank wine on occasion, and so did other faithful servants of Jehovah. However, God's word draws a clear distinction between, I pet Zizi, I left to go pee, and I pet Zizi, and now all of his hair is all over my face. Oh, oh and then I get so itchy. Sorry. However, God's word draws a clear distinction between drinking some alcohol and getting drunk. It plainly states, do not get drunk with wine. And it even indicates that drunkards will not inherit God's kingdom. Yes, Jehovah strongly condemns over drinking and drunkenness. Rather than simply follow a course molded by our culture, we appreciate having God's view. Some view that they can drink large amounts of alcohol without getting drunk. That, however, is very dangerous. The scriptures make clear that being enslaved to a lot of wine can lead a man or a woman astray morally and spiritually. Jesus even cautioned that heavy drinking could prevent someone from entering into God's new world. What then can help Christians to avoid the pitfalls that are easily linked to drinking alcohol? Check your motives and habits. It is dangerous for someone to allow the culture in which he grew up to determine his view of drinking. Christians wisely do what pleases Jehovah when it concerns such matters as food and drink. I like how they say food and drink. Because are they going to talk about being gluttonous as well? (laughs) Whether you are eating or drinking or doing anything, do all things for God's glory. Here are some questions and Bible principles to consider. Do I drink alcohol so that I can fit in with others? Exodus 23.2 says, you must not follow after the crowd. Jehovah was here warning the Israelites against following after people who were not pleasing him. That admonition is also valid for Christians today. If we allow peers to mold our thinking and decisions regarding alcohol, we could end up distancing ourselves from Jehovah and his standards. Do I drink alcohol to show how strong I am? In some cultures, drinking alcohol often and heavily is common and accepted. But note the insight reflected at 1 Corinthians 16.13. Stay awake, stand firm in the faith, carry on in a manly way, grow mighty. Can alcohol really... (laughs) That's an old Jehovah's Witness song for anyone that doesn't know. Can alcohol really help a person to grow mighty? Quite the opposite. Alcohol can easily numb the senses and impair a person's thinking and actions. Consequently, instead of being a sign of strength, drinking large amounts of alcohol shows weakness. Isaiah 28, 7 describes the one who goes astray because of alcohol as staggering and stumbling. True strength comes from Jehovah and involves staying away and standing firm in place. A sincere Christian can do this by remaining alert and acting decisively to protect himself from spiritual harm. Jesus showed such strength when he was on earth and many respected him as a true man of fortitude and courage. Do I use alcohol as a way to escape my problems? Uh, I think this is probably the most common one, especially amongst Jehovah's Witnesses who are, have a drinking problem. A psalmist was inspired to write, When anxieties overwhelm me, you, Jehovah, comforted and soothed me. If troubles weigh you down, look to Jehovah for relief, not to alcohol. An effective means to do so is by praying more often to Jehovah. Also, many have found that seeking practical advice from a mature friend in the congregation is beneficial. Actually, drinking alcohol to cope with difficulties can undermine a person's moral defenses and weaken his resolve to do what is right. Daniel mentioned earlier, admired, I struggled with anxiety and feelings of guilt. I drank to deal with the situation, but problems mounted and I lost friendships and self-respect. What finally helped Daniel? I realized that I needed Jehovah by my side, not alcohol. I was at last able to cope with my problems and overcome them. He acknowledged the fact 
is that Jehovah is always there to provide relief, even if our situation seems hopeless. If you at times drink alcohol, why not analyze your drinking in the light of these questions? Has a family member or a dear friend expressed concern about my drinking habits? If so, this could be an indication that you are developing a habit or a problem that you are not aware of. Am I drinking more than I used to? That may be the situation when someone who, though not addicted to alcohol, could be heading in that direction. Do I find it hard to go without alcohol for a few days or longer? If so, drinking may have become an ingrained habit or an addiction. It may mean that professional help will be needed to overcome the problem. Hey, Watchtower actually giving advice and saying professional help uh, may be needed to overcome the problem. So I guess this isn't the worst article ever. Given the potential for dangers or problems linked to drinking, some Christians have chosen to avoid drinking alcohol. Others may choose not drinking because they simply do not like the taste. If one of your associates makes such a choice, you can show kindness by respecting his decision without criticizing him. Come on, buddy. Remember when we used to go grab beers? What happened to that guy? That guy was my best friend. Who's this goofball that doesn't drink with me anymore? Where's my drinking, buddy? Or you may have the seen the wisdom in setting some personal limits. A Christian might put a limit on how much he will drink. Or he may set a personal rule about how often he will drink, perhaps once a week or moderately during meals. Others have put boundaries on the kind of alcohol they will consume, such as drinking wine or beer in moderation, but no hard liquor or even in mixed drinks. Once a person has clearly set his limits on drinking, it will be easier for him to stick to them, and there is no need for a mature Christian to be embarrassed if he has made such a choice and resolutely holds to it. Considering consideration for others is another factor to keep in mind. Romans 14.21 states, It is best not to eat meat or drink red wine or do anything over which your brother stumbles. You can apply this counsel. Show brotherly love. If you feel having an alcoholic drink might offend someone, would love not move you to forego your rights? You thus show concern and respect for the feelings of others seeking the advantage, not to your own. Furthermore, the government may have laws that should guide a Christian's decisions. These laws may set the minimum age for drinking alcohol or establish a prohibition against drinking and driving and operating certain machines. Jehovah has dignified us with freedom to enjoy many gifts he has given us. That includes the gift of exercising free will, when choosing what we will eat and what we will drink. May our choices show that we treasure this freedom by using it to please our Heavenly Father. Choices that others make. Not all Christians make the same choices. Some may decide to drink alcoholic beverages in moderation when that seems appropriate. Others choose to abstain from alcohol. And as noted, many set some personal limits. Individuals are not obliged to explain or justify their choices. On the other hand, we should not impose our choices on others, nor should we condemn those whose decisions differ from ours if Bible principles are not violated. Let us bear in mind that true Christians endeavor to promote peace and unity. Study Article 55. I think uh, ZZ is just keep scratching at the door, so I'm going to let him in, and it's ultimately going to be uh, really annoying and frustrating, but it is what it is. That's just the situation. Hey, buddy. Mic check, one, two, one, two. Mic check, one, two, one, two. Young sisters become mature Christian women. Women should likewise be moderate in habits, faithful in all things. We are amazed at how quickly a child grows into an adult. This growth seems to take place automatically. However, growing to Christian maturity is by no means automatic. To reach that goal, we need deep personal, a deep personal relationship with Jehovah. We also need his Holy Spirit as we cultivate godly qualities, develop practical skills, and prepare for future responsibilities. Jehovah made humans to be male or female. Obviously, men and women are physically different, but they are different in other ways as well. 
For example, Jehovah made men and women to fulfill specific roles, so they need to qual- they need qualities and skills that will help them carry out their respective assignments. In this article, we will consider what a young sister can do to become a Christian, a mature Christian woman. The following article, we will consider what young brothers can do. A neighbor has an Audi R8, and it is so loud whenever he starts it up. Sorry if you can hear it rumbling in the background. The Bible mentions or cultivate godly qualities. The Bible mentions many remarkable women who loved Jehovah and served him. See an article on JW.org, Women in the Bible, what we can learn from them. Well, that was interesting. Uh, I didn't get any indication that my battery was dying, and then my camera just turned off. So that'll be a fun game to play. Yippee! Why were, as our theme text advises, moderate in habits and faithful in all things? They were, sorry. In addition, sisters can find in their own congregation examples of mature Christian women who are worthy of imitation. Young sisters, why not identify a few mature Christian women you know whose example you can imitate? Note their appealing qualities, then consider how you can manifest them. In the following paragraphs, we will discuss three important qualities needed by mature women. I wonder, like, if you're a young sister in the congregation and you're looking at some crabby, patty eaten Karen that is a pioneer and is jaded and angry at everything, you're like, well... I guess that's the mature Christian I have to follow. I guess i got to grow up to be just like her. Sounds so miserable. Humility is an important aspect of Christian maturity. If a woman is humble, she will enjoy a good relationship with Jehovah and with others. For example, a woman who loves Jehovah humbly chooses to support the principle of headship that her Heavenly Father has established. Of course she does. That principle has specific applications in the congregation and in the family arrangement. Consider the example of Rebecca. She was an intelligent and decisive woman who took the initiative in appropriate ways throughout her life. Yet, she was respectful and submissive. If you humbly support Jehovah's arrangement, as Rebecca did, you will be a positive influence on your family and on the congregation. Modesty is another quality that all mature Christians need. Oh, I didn't talk about the picture. Uh, Imitating the qualities of faithful women such as Rebecca, Esther, and Abigail will help you become a mature Christian woman. Uh, Sure. The Bible says, The wisdom is with modest ones. Esther was a modest, godly woman. Her modesty protected her from acting presumptuously. She listened to the advice of her older cousin Mordecai and followed it. You can demonstrate similar modesty by seeking out and applying good advice. Esther showed modesty in another way. She was beautifully formed and attractive in appearance. Yet she did not draw undue attention to herself. How can a Christian woman benefit from Esther's example? One way is highlighted at 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10. The Apostle Paul instructed Christian women to dress with modesty and soundness of mind. The Greek word used here, this is our first time of the Greek word used here in this whole shenanigan, yippee. Uh, suggests that a Christian woman's dress would be respectable and would show consideration for the feelings or opinions of others. How does a Greek word suggest those things? They don't even attempt to draw that connection or anything. They just said, yeah, this is what it is. How we admire our mature Christian sisters for dressing modestly. Discernment is another quality that all Christian sisters demonstrate. What is discernment? It is good judgment, the ability to tell right from wrong, and then to choose the wise course. Constance, consider the example of Abigail. Her husband had made a bad decision that he was going to have a serious impact on his entire household. Abigail took immediate action. Her good judgment saved lives. Discernment also helps us to know when to speak and when to keep silent, and it helps us to maintain balance when showing personal interest in others. Develop practical skills. A Christian woman needs to develop practical skills. Some skills that a girl learns in childhood will continue to benefit her throughout her life. Consider a few examples. Learn to read and, read and write well. I am a clear demonstration here that uh, I suppose you don't need to learn how to read very well. In some cultures, Reading and writing are not considered to be important skills for women to learn. However, they are essential skills for every Christian. 
So do not allow any obstacle to stop you from learning to read and write well. How will you be rewarded? Such skills may help you to find and keep a job. You will become a better student and teacher of God's word. Best of all, you will draw closer to Jehovah as you read his word and meditate on it. Develop good communication skills. Christians need to communicate effectively. In this regard, the disciple James provides practical counsel for us, saying, Everyone must be quick to listen, slow to speak. When you listen carefully as others speak, you show empathy or fellow feeling for them. If you are not sure that you understand what a person is saying or how he feels, ask appropriate questions. Then take a moment to think before you speak. Ask yourself, is what I am about to say true and upbuilding? Is it, a tactful, is it tactful and kind? Learn from mature sisters who are good communicators. Pay attention to the way they speak. The better you learn this skill, the better your relationships with others will be. Learn to manage a home. In many places, women carry much of the load of running a household. Your mother or other capable sister may be able to help you learn the needed skills. A sister named Sydney says, One of the most valuable gifts my mom gave me was teaching me the joy that comes from hard work. Hard work. Learning such skills as cooking, cleaning, sewing, and shopping made my life easier and opened the way for me to do more in Jehovah's service. Wow, what a fascinating thing. Hey, you know what? We need to help young sisters learn some valuable life skills. Skills that all women need to know. Like cleaning and cooking, sewing, and shopping. Oh boy. Mom also taught me how to be hospitable. This allowed me to meet wonderful brothers and sisters whose examples I could imitate. A diligent, hospitable woman who has learned to manage a home is a powerful force for good in her family and in the congregation. Learn to be self-sufficient. This is good advice. Now, being self-sufficient is an important goal for all mature Christians. A sister named Crystal says, My parents were involved in choosing which courses I would take in high school so that I would learn practical skills. My father urged me to take accounting classes, which proved to be invaluable. In addition to learning skills needed to obtain secular work, try to learn how to make a budget and stick to it. Keep your focus on spiritual goals by avoiding unnecessary debt and by being content with the simple lifestyle. I got a good little hubba hubba picture cooking up here. This younger sister is looking at some guy. Uh, Jehovah's Witness build. <laughs> <laughs> classic jehovah's witness build here and uh, he's mopping and sweeping so the caption says if you are considering marriage you should choose your mate very carefully so this will be exciting prepare your future for future roles when you develop spiritual qualities and valuable skills you will be better equipped for future roles consider a few examples of what you could do you could remain single for a time. In harmony with Jesus' words, some women choose not to marry, even if singleness is discouraged in their culture. Others may remain single because of circumstances. Be assured that Jehovah and Jesus do not look down on single Christians. Around the world, single sisters are a positive influence on the congregation. Their love for and sincere interest in others motivates these Christian women to become spiritual sisters and spiritual mothers to many. You could become a full-time servant. A Christian woman Christian women have a tremendous impact on the worldwide preaching work. Can you plan now to enter the full-time ministry? You might serve as a pioneer, a construction volunteer, or a Bethelite. Pray about your goal, talk to others who have reached such a goal, and find out what you need to do to qualify. Then make a realistic plan. Reaching your goal will open up many exciting opportunities for you in Jehovah's service. You may choose to get married. The qualities and skills. Oh boy, that is my first yawn. I have a little chart of keeping track of different things. Yawn was not on my bingo card, and I think we should. Boom. That is one water, one chapstick, one pee, and one yawn. We are up there. Okay, uh, the qualities and skills that we have discussed will help you to become a capable wife. Of course, if you are considering marriage, you should choose your mate very carefully. It is one of the most important decisions you will ever make 
Yeah. Remember, you will come under the headship of the man you marry. Perfect. So ask yourself, is he a mature Christian? Is he putting spiritual interests first in his life? Does he make wise decisions? Can he admit his mistakes? Does he respect women? Does he have the skills needed to support me spiritually, materially, and emotionally? Does he handle responsibility well? For example, what congregation assignments does he have, and how does he handle them? Of course, if you want to find a good prospective husband, you will need to be a good prospective wife. The Bible says that a good wife is a helper for her husband and a compliment of him. That's incredibly dumb. Is this a demeaning description? Yes. <laughs> No, a wife's role as a helper is a dignified one. In fact, the Bible often describes Jehovah as a helper. Yeah, sure, the all-powerful almighty of the universe. Hey, I, even Jehovah was a helper. Am I right? A wife is a true helper to her husband when she supports him and helps him to implement decisions that affect the family. And because she loves Jehovah, she works to enhance her husband's reputation. <laughs> you can prepare for this possible future role by deepening your love for Jehovah and by being a helper to those at home and in the congregation. You could become a mother. After you marry, you and your husband might have children. Thus, it is wise to think ahead. The qualities and skills that we have discussed in this article will help you become a wife and a mother. Your love, kindness, and patience will contribute to warm home environment where your children will feel secure and are likely to flourish. We love you, sisters, for all that you do for Jehovah and his people. You work hard to cultivate spiritual qualities, to develop skills that enrich your life and the lives of those around you, and to prepare well for possible future roles. You are a real asset to Jehovah's organization. So if you're a young sister, your prospects are you could become a mother, you can get married, you can be a pioneer, or you can stay single. That, that is your prospects. How grim is that? Young brothers become mature Christian men. King David instructed Solomon, Be strong and prove yourself a man. All Christian men today do well to apply that advice. To be successful, they must learn to obey God's laws and apply Bible principles in all aspects of their life. Why is it so important for young brothers to become mature Christian men? A Christian man fulfills vital roles in the family and in the congregation. Young brothers, no doubt, young brothers, no doubt you have thought about the responsibilities that you could have in the future. You might have the goal of being a full-time minister. So immediately that the first goal is the actual pinnacle for sisters, a ministerial servant, and later a congregation elder. You might also want to get married and have children. To reach these goals and be successful, you need Christian maturity. What can help you to reach Christian maturity? There are important skills that you need to develop. What then can you do now to prepare for and make a successful success of any future roles you may have to fulfill? Choose good examples to imitate. The Bible is filled with good examples for young men to imitate. Those men from the past loved God and handled various responsibilities in caring for his people. You can also find good examples among the mature Christian men in your own family and in your congregation, and you have the perfect example of Jesus Christ. As you carefully study these examples, consider their outstanding qualities, then decide how you will imitate these men. Develop and safeguard thinking. Oh wait, we got a picture here. Uh, so this guy is to look at Jesus as his example, whereas the women, they were to look at Esther and Someone else, I don't know. Anyway, uh, Rebecca, that's right. A man with thinking ability considers his options carefully before acting. So hard work to gain and maintain that. So work hard to gain and maintain that ability. Why? This world is full of young men who are guided by their own ideas or who allow emotions to control their actions. The media can also exert a strong influence on you. But how can you acquire thinking ability? Begin by learning Bible principles and thinking about why these are beneficial. Then though, use those principles to help you make decisions that will please Jehovah. If you develop this important skill, you will have taken a major step toward becoming a Christ mature Christian man. Consider how thinking ability will benefit you in two situations. 
in dealing with sisters, and in making decisions about your personal appearance. Thinking ability will help you show respect for women. It is normal and proper for a young brother to be interested in developing a relationship with a Christian sister. However, a young man with thinking ability would not say, write, or do anything that would signal romantic interest unless he is sincerely considering the sister as a potential marriage mate. If he is dating a sister, he would protect her good reputation by never being alone with her unless properly chaperoned. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. You're to scope out your prospective partners, and if they aren't marriage material, then bah humbug, you best be shunning them. And also, if you're dating, never be alone. You could be a two, like, 40, 50-year-old Christians, but nope, 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 you're never going to ruin anyone's reputation. So you, as a grown adult, still needs a chaperone. What the... What a prospect. Another way a young man shows that he has developed sound thinking ability is to make, is by making good choices in dress and grooming. Often fashion trends are designed and promoted by people who have no regard for Jehovah or who lead immoral lives. Their immoral thinking is reflected in clothing styles that are tight-fitted or tend to make men look like women. When choosing what to wear, a young man who is growing who is growing to Christian maturity will be guided by Bible principles and by good examples in the congregation. He can ask himself, do my choices show that I am sound in mind and considerate of others? Does the way I dress make it easy for others to believe I am devoted to serving God? A young man with thinking ability will gain the respect of not only his brothers and sisters, but his heavenly father. Be reliable. A young man who is reliable, diligently cares for all his responsibilities. Consider the example of Jesus. He was never careless or irresponsible. Instead, he fulfilled his assignments that Jehovah gave him, even when it was difficult to do so. He loved people, especially, in his, dis especially his disciples, and he willingly gave his life for them. In imitation of Jesus, work hard to fulfill any assignment that you are given. If you are not certain how to do it, be humble and ask for help from mature brothers. Never settle for doing the bare minimum. Instead, complete your assignment, doing it for Jehovah and not for men. Of course, you are not perfect, so be modest and admit any mistakes you make. I wonder what my voice is going to be like in like 50 hours from now. I'm about to find out. To become a mature Christian man, you will need to develop practical skills. These will help you to shoulder responsibility in the congregation, to hold a secular job to support yourself or a family, and to have healthy relationships with others. Consider a few of these essential skills. Learn to read and write well. The Bible says that a happy and successful man spends time each day reading God's word and meditating on it. By reading the Bible daily, he will get to know Jehovah's way of thinking, which will help him to think clearly and to reason well. Such men are needed in the congregation. Why? Our brothers and sisters look to capable men for Bible-based instruction and advice. If you can read and write well, you will be able to prepare inform informative, faith-strengthening talks and comments. You will also be able to take meaningful notes as you study and as you listen to talks at congregation meetings, assemblies, and conventions. These notes will help you to build your own faith and to encourage others. But then they want you to immediately throw all of those notes away, just throw them in the trash and be like, uh, you need to really just focus and do exactly what you're told. Oh, that's what's up. My face detection tracking isn't on this whole time. Was it turned off? Why is it off? Face detection, eye tracking, autofocus. Has that been off this whole time? What in tarnation? I'll have to look at that next time I stop. Okay. A Christian man must learn to communicate well. A man who is go a good communicator listens to and acknowledges the thoughts and feelings of others. He can also learn to read another person's tone of voice, facial expressions, and body language. You cannot learn to do this without spending time with people. If you construct constantly use electronic tools to communicate, such as email and texting, your ability to communicate with people in person could weaken. 
Therefore, create opportunities to talk with others in person. Hey, actual good advice from Watchtower. Learn to support yourself. A mature Christian man must be able to support himself and his household. In some countries, young brothers may learn a secular skill from their father or another relative. In other lands, a young man may learn a trade or some other vocational skill in high school. Whatever the case, it is good to learn a skill that will help you to find employment. Gain the reputation of being someone who works hard and who sticks to a task until it is completed. If you do, you will be more likely to get a job and keep it. The qualities and skills that we have discussed are also important for a Christian man so that he can fulfill future roles. Let us consider some of those. <clears throat> full-time servant. Many mature Christian men began the full-time ministry at a young age. Pioneering helps a young man to learn how to work effectively with a variety of people. It also helps him to make a reasonable budget and live by it. A good stepping stone to full-time service is auxiliary pioneering. Many serve as an auxiliary pioneer for some time, which helps them to be ready to take up regular pioneering. Pioneering may open the door to other forms of full-time service, including serving as a construction volunteer or a Bethelite. Ministerial Servant or Elder Christian men should have the goal of qualifying to serve their brothers and sisters as congregation elders. The Bible says that men who are reaching out for th this role are desirous of a fine work. Before serving as an elder, a brother must qualify to serve as a ministerial servant. Ministerial servants assist the elders in many practical ways. Both elders and ministerial servants humbly serve their brothers and sisters and share zealously in the ministry. Young brothers can qualify to serve as ministerial servants even when they are still in their late teens, and a well-qualified ministerial servant in his early 20s may be appointed as an elder. In his early 20s may be appointed as an elder. Yikes. Take random screenshots of things I want to remember for later. How can you qualify for these roles? There is no formula. However, the needed qualification are all based on the Bible and on love for Jehovah, your family, and the congregation. Strive to understand each qualification. Pray for Jehovah's help to meet these qualifications. Husband and family head. As Jesus indicated, some occur, <laughs> occur <laughs> combined mature and Christian. Some mature men <laughs> remain single. However, if you choose to marry, you will take on the additional roles of husband and family head. Jehovah expects a husband to love his wife and care for her physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. The qualities and skills discussed in this article, such as developing thinking ability, having respect for women, and being reliable, will help you as a marriage mate. You will be prepared to fulfill your role as a husband and family head. Father. After you have married, you may become a father. What can you learn from Jehovah about being a good father? There are many lessons. Jehovah openly told his son, Jesus, that he loved him and approved of him. If you become a father, make sure that you regularly uh, assure your children that you love them. Generously commend them for the good things that they do. Fathers that imitate Jehovah's example help their children to develop into mature Christian men and women. You can prepare for this new role by lovingly caring for others in your family and in congregation and by learning to express your love and appreciation for them. This will help you to fulfill your possible future roles as a husband and a father. In the meantime, you will be a valuable asset to Jehovah, your family, and the congregation. Young brothers, you will not automatically become a mature Christian man. You need to choose good examples to imitate, developing, develop thinking ability, be reliable, acquire practical life skills, and prepare for future roles. You may at times feel overwhelmed when you contemplate the work ahead. But you can be, you can succeed. Remember that Jehovah is eager to help you. Of course, your brothers and sisters in the congregation will help you too. When you reach your full potential as a mature Christian man, your life will be rich and satisfying. We love you, young brothers. 
May Jehovah richly bless you as you work now to become mature Christian men. Do you remember, have you ever, have you carefully read this year's issues of the Watchtower? Uh, I'm just going to skip this, and then there's a subject index here for the last couple of pages. There concludes our first study edition of the Watchtower. Yes, we had to go to 2023, but let's jump to January 2024 and get this party a rockin'. The Watchtower, January 2024. Year text for 2024, when I am afraid I put trust in you, hallowed be thy name. Study article number one. Conquer fear by trusting in Jehovah. Everyone feels afraid at times. Of course, our study of the Bible has freed us from the fear of the dead, fear of the supernatural, and fear of the future. I would disagree with that. I think it's given you fear of all of those things. But we still live in a time that is marked by fearful sights, such as war, crime, and disease. We may also fear men, including governments that oppress us or even family members who oppose true worship. Some worry that they will not be able to endure either a current trial or one that they may face in the future. David experienced fear. For instance, when King Saul was trying to hunt him down, David decided to flee to the Philistine city of Gath. The king of Gath, Achish, soon learned that David was the mighty warrior who was celebrated in songs as having struck down tens of thousands of Philistines. David became very much afraid. He worried about what Achish would do to him. How did David conquer his fears? If I could. This. able to do that. Yeah. In Psalm 56, David expresses his feelings while he was in Gath. That psalm lays bare David's fears, but it also reveals how he conquered those fears. When he felt afraid, David trusted Jehovah. His trust was not misplaced. With Jehovah's blessing, David devised an unusual but effective strategy. He pretended to be crazy. Achish now viewed David more as an irritant than a threat, so David was able to escape. Okay. Do it. Oh, that doesn't work. Let's do that. That's like that Hey Arnold episode where he's like, don't slap me, don't hit me, I'll hit me. <laughs> I'm just acting insane and people won't, people won't hurt you. We too can conquer fear by trusting in Jehovah. But how do we strengthen our trust in Jehovah, especially when we are afraid? Consider an illustration. If you learn that you have an illness, you may at first feel afraid. However, you can ease your fears if you trust your doctor. You may have an outstanding record of treating patients with that illness. He may listen attentively, convincing you that he really understands your feelings, and he may propose a treatment that has worked well for others. Similarly, if we strengthen our trust in Jehovah by considering what he has already done, what he is doing now, and what he will do for us, and what he will yet do for us. That is what David did. As we consider some of his inspired words found in Psalm 56, think about how you too can strengthen your trust in Jehovah and conquer your fears. What has Jehovah already done? While David's life was still at risk, he focused his attention on what Jehovah had already done. That was David's pattern of thinking throughout his life. For example, at times he meditated on Jehovah's creative works, which reminded him of Jehovah's almighty power and keen interest in humankind. David also meditated on what Jehovah had done for others, and he especially meditated on what Jehovah had already done for him personally. Jehovah had supported and protected David from infancy. Imagine how such meditations must have bolstered David's trust in Jehovah. When you feel afraid, ask yourself, what has Jehovah already done? Reflect on what he has created. For example, when we observe intently how Jehovah cares for the birds and the flowers, which were not created in his image and are not capable of worshiping him, we will build up trust that he will care for us too. Consider also what Jehovah has done for his worshipers. 
You might study a Bible character who showed outstanding faith, or who might read the experience of a modern-day servant of Jehovah. Additionally, meditate on how Jehovah has already cared for you. How did he draw you to the truth? How has he answered your prayers? How are you benefiting every day from the sacrifice of his beloved son? Vanessa, a sister in Haiti, faced a frightening situation. A man in her community called her and sent her messages every day, pressuring her to have have a relationship with him. Vanessa flatly refused. But the man became more aggressive and even threatened her. I was scared, she says. How did Vanessa conquer her fear? She took practical steps to protect herself. An elder helped her to contact the authorities, but she also focused on how Jehovah had protected his servants in the past. The first person I thought of was the prophet Daniel, Vanessa relates. He has thrown into a den with hungry lions, even though he was innocent. Yet Jehovah cared for him. I asked Jehovah to take charge of the whole situation. After that, I wasn't afraid anymore. What is Jehovah doing now? Though David was in mortal danger when he was in Gath, he refused to give in to his fears. Instead, he chose to consider what Jehovah was doing for him at that time. David could sense that Jehovah was guiding and protecting him and that he understood his feelings. David also had friends such as Jonathan and high priest Ahimelech, of the Heimlich Maneuver, who gave him loyal support and practical help. And despite being a target of King Saul, it's Easy's hair. David could sense that Jehovah was guiding and protecting him and that he understood his feelings. David also had friends, such as Jonathan and, oh yeah, the Heimlich Maneuver. And despite being a target of King Saul, David escaped with his life. He was convinced that Jehovah was keenly aware of his trial and how the trial was affecting him emotionally. When you face a trial that makes you afraid, remember that Jehovah takes note of the trial and of how that trial makes you feel. For example, Jehovah noticed not only the mistreatment of the Israelites in Egypt, but also the pains they suffered. David sang that Jehovah saw his affliction and his deep distress. When God's people suffered, even as a result of their own foolish decisions, it was distressing to him. When you are afraid, Jehovah understands how you feel and he is eager to help you conquer your fears. Got a funny little picture of this guy in prison. Now he's in paradise some canyon or fjord again all of this looks completely ai generated it is wild you may wonder though how jehovah is supporting you while you face a frightening trial so ask him to help you to see his support (laughs) that's funny can you help me just understand how exactly it is you're helping me there big guy Then consider, has a talk or comment at a congregation meeting strengthened you? Has a publication, a video, or an original song encouraged you? Has someone shared a reassuring thought or scripture with you? We might easily take for granted our loving brotherhood and the spiritual food we receive, yet they are extraordinary gifts from Jehovah. They prove that he cares about you, and they prove that he is worthy of your trust. Imagine being, like, saying to someone, Yo, I sent you a birthday gift. Why don't you just really think about it? <laughs> uh, I think I would just know if you if you gave me a gift. I, I don't think I would have to like think about it. <laughs> I'd have to like find it. Ada, who lives in Senegal, took note of how Jehovah supported her during a trial. Since she is the eldest child, her parents expected her to make enough money to care for both herself and them. But after she simplified her life in order to pioneer, Ada struggled financially. Her family now resented her and criticized her. I was afraid that I would not be able to help my parents and that everyone would reject me, she says. I even blamed Jehovah for letting things get so bad. When she heard a talk at the meeting, then she heard a talk at the meeting, the speaker reminded us that whatever the wounds of our heart, Jehovah knows them. Little by little, through advice from the elders and others, 
I was reassured of Jehovah's love. I began to pray to Jehovah with renewed confidence, and I felt a profound peace as I saw my prayers answered. In time, Ada found employment that helped her not only support herself as a pioneer, but also give financial aid to her parents and others. I have learned to trust in Jehovah completely, she says. Now after I pray, my fears often vanish. What will Jehovah yet do? This verse reveals another way that David conquered his fears. Even though his life was still in jeopardy, he meditated on what Jehovah would yet do for him. David knew that Jehovah would rescue him at the right time. After all, Jehovah had declared that David would be the next king of Israel. To David, whatever Jehovah promised was as good as fulfilled. What has Jehovah promised to do for you? We do not expect him to shield us from all our problems. Still, whatever trials you may face in the system of things, Jehovah will do away with them in the coming new world. Our creator is surely strong enough to raise the dead, to heal us, and to remove all opposers. When you feel afraid, meditate on what Jehovah will do in the future. Think about how you will feel when Satan is gone, when wicked people are replaced by righteous people, and when imperfection fades away a little more each day. That's a fun little rhyme. A demonstration on the 2014 Regional Convention program depicted how we might meditate on our hope. A father discussed that his family, with his family, how 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 might be worded differently if those verses foretold what it would be like in paradise. In the new world, the happiest of times will be here, for men will be lovers of others, lovers of spiritual treasures. I actually remember this. Modest, humble, praises of God, obedient to parents, thankful, loyal, having great affection for their families, open to agreement, always speaking well of others, self-controlled, mild, lovers of goodness, trustworthy, yielding, lowly in mind, lovers of God rather than lovers of pleasures, motivated by genuine godly devotion, and to these people stick closely. Do you discuss with your family or fellow believers what life will be like in the new world? A sister in North Macedonia named Tanja, Tanya, conquered her fears by meditating on future blessings. Her parents strongly opposed her study of the Bible. She relates, Some of the things that I feared would happen did happen. My mother beat me after every meeting. My parents threatened to kill me if I became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Finally, Tanya was thrown out of her home. How did she react? She says, I focused on how happy I, I focused on how happy I would be for all eternity for choosing to keep my integrity. I also thought about how Jehovah would reward me in the new world for anything I might lose in this system and how bad all things would be forgotten. Tanya did keep her integrity, and with Jehovah's help, she found a place to live. Today Tanya is married to a faithful brother and they serve happily together in the full-time ministry. During the Great Tribulation, people in general will become faint out of fear, but God's people will remain steadfast and courageous. Why will we not give in to fear? Because he, because we will have already learned to trust Jehovah. Tanya, quoted earlier, says that her past experiences are helping her to face other unsettling situations. I have learned that there is no situation that Jehovah cannot work out for our good, she observed. Sometimes it may seem that others are controlling things, but the reality is that they have only so much con- as much control as Jehovah allows. And though a trial may be hard, it will end. Fear is normal today, but like David, we can refuse to be trapped by fear. Our 2024 year text, text is David's prayer to Jehovah. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. As one Bible reference stated about these verses, David neither feeds his fear nor stares at his problems, but looks to his Redeemer who will deliver him. Think about our year text in the coming months, especially when you are facing frightening situations. Take time to reflect on Jehovah's actions in the past, present, and future. Then, like David, you can declare, In God I put my trust, I am not afraid. Study Article 2. Are you ready for the most important day of the year? For Jehovah's people, the memorial of Christ's death is the most important day of the year. It is the only event that Jesus specifically commanded his followers to observe. We look forward to the memorial for a number of reasons. Let us consider some of them. The memorial helps us to reflect on the value of the ransom. 
It reminds us of ways we can show appreciation for Jesus' sacrifice. It also gives us an opportunity to enjoy an interchange of encouragement with our brothers and sisters. Each year, a number of inactive ones attend. Some are even moved to return to Jehovah because of the warm welcome they receive. And many interested people are motivated to start on the road to life by what they see and hear. No wonder the memorial holds such a special place in our heart. Think, too, of how the memorial unites our global brotherhood. Jehovah's Witnesses gather as the sun sets progressively around the world. We all hear a talk that emphasizes the importance of the ransom. We sing two songs of praise, count them, two songs of praise, pass the emblems, and wholeheartedly say amen to four prayers. Within about 24 hours, all congregations will have followed the same pattern. Can you imagine the joy that Jehovah and Jesus must feel when they see us unitedly honoring them in this way? <laughs> in this article, we will discuss these questions. How can we prepare our heart for the memorial? How can we help others to benefit from it? And how can we assist those who are inactive? The answers to these questions will help us to be ready for this sacred occasion. How can we prepare our heart for the memorial? One of the most important ways we can prepare our heart for the memorial is by reflecting on the value of the ransom sacrifice of Jesus Christ. On our own, we could never redeem ourselves from sin and death. So, at great cost to himself and to his dear son, Jehovah reigns for Jesus to give his life in our behalf. The more we meditate on what Jehovah and Jesus sacrificed for us, the more we will appreciate the ransom. We will consider just a few of the things that the ransom cost Jehovah and Jesus. But at first, what did the ransom involve? A ransom is a price that is paid to buy something back. The first man, Adam, was perfect when he was created. When he sinned, he fortified the prospect of everlasting life, not only for himself, but also for his children, in order to buy back what Adam lost. Jesus offered his own perfect life as a sacrifice. During his entire life on earth, Jesus committed no sin, nor was deception found in his mouth. At the time of his death, Jesus' perfect life corresponded exactly to the life Adam lost. Jesus remind, remained perfectly obedient to his heavenly Father, despite the many tests that he faced while on earth. As a child, Jesus had to submit to the authority of his imperfect human parents, even though he was born perfect. As a teenager, he needed to resist any pressure he may have faced to be disobedient or unfaithful. As an adult, Jesus had to stand up to temptations from Satan the devil, including direct attacks on his loyalty to God. Satan, has, and his, Satan was determined to make Jesus sin so that he would not be able to pay the ransom. During his earthly ministry, Jesus endured further tests. He faced persecution and threats to his life. He had to deal with the imperfections of his followers. When he was on trial for his life, he was tortured and ridiculed. Then he was executed in an extremely painful and humiliating way. I'm not laughing specifically at, uh, at the, the torture that he was experiencing. I just laughed at just how miserable of an experience this is going to be reading for 48 hours straight. And uh, yeah, it uh, it got me giggling. And I also thought I should put something else on the bingo card. Something to the tune of like a Mitch McConnell moment where my brain literally just shuts off. <laughs> I'm actually going to put that on my on my counter. The Mitch McConnell moments. <laughs> the Mitch moments. <laughs> I felt like I read that entire page and have no clue what it said. Oh, God. It begins. For anyone keeping track, it is now 1220 a.m. And I have been at this uh, for about... Uh, I guess I think the actual reading is probably like oh, I'm getting close to two hours now. But it's taking longer because I'm editing it as I go. Anyway, I'm going to stop talking and get back to it. Had to endure the final part of his trial on his own without Jehovah's protection. Clearly, the ransom cost Jesus a great deal. Do we not feel deep love for Jesus when we reflect on how he willingly sacrificed so much in our behalf? What about Jehovah? Did he willingly sacrifice so that Jesus could pay the ransom? Jehovah and Jesus have the closest bond that can exist between a father and a son. Just think, then, 
how Jehovah was affected as he observed Jesus enduring so many trials while on earth. No doubt it greatly pained Jehovah to see his son mistreated, rejected, and tested. Any parent who has lost a child in death knows all too well the intense feelings of grief that such a loss brings. We have strong faith in the resurrection, but that does not erase the pain we feel when a loved one dies. This example helps us to understand how Jehovah must have felt when he watched his beloved son suffer and die on that spring day in 33 CE. Between now and the memorial, why not do a personal study project or family worship project that focuses on the ransom? Use the research guide for Jehovah's Witnesses, if available in your language, or other Bible study aids to explore the topic in depth. Also be sure to follow the memorial Bible reading schedule provided in our Christian Life and Ministry Meeting Workbook. And on the day of the memorial, do not forget to watch the special morning worship program. When we prepare our heart for the memorial, we will be in a good position to help others benefit from it too. Help others to benefit. How can we help others? Oh wait, there's a picture here. This guy looks kind of hesitant. Oh, he has an old Bible, so he has been away from the watchtower for quite some time. But thank God you still have the exact same fashion sense, so he's going to blend right in no problem. Because, uh, yeah, it looks exactly the same. I like the idea of people that are out, like, hiding behind this random brick wall. It's, again, Photoshop so bad. Like, what? Where is this wall? <laughs> it's weird. Oh, sorry. Hope others benefit. How can we help others to benefit from the memorial? A first step, of course, is to invite them. Obviously, in addition to contacting those we meet in our regular ministry, we can make a list of people to invite. These could include our relatives, workmates, schoolmates, and others. Even if we do not have enough printed copies of the invitation, we can share a link to the electronic version. Who knows how many will respond? Uh, I can tell you from doing this myself, no one. Never underestimate the power of a personal invitation. One day, a sister who lived in a religiously divided household was surprised when her husband proudly told her that he was planning to join her for the memorial. Why was she surprised? Because many times in the past she had encouraged him to attend, but he never did. What made the difference this time? I got a personal invitation, he said, explaining that a local elder with whom he was acquainted had invited him. The husband attended that year and for many years thereafter. Well, that's kind of rude. He's like, yeah, when you invited me, I didn't want to show up to that crap. But hey, some local elder invited me and I was like, yeah, sure, I'll check it out. Poor his poor wife. Keep in mind that those we invite may have questions, especially if they have never attended one of our meetings. We do well to anticipate their questions and prepare an answer to them. For example, some may wonder, what will happen at the event? How long will it last? Is there a dress code? Is there any? Is there an admittance fee? Will collections be taken? When inviting someone to the memorial, we could simply ask, do you have any questions? And then address any concerns the person may have. We can also use the videos Remember Jesus' Death and What Happens at the Kingdom Hall to help the individual understand how our meetings are conducted. And Lesson 28 of the Enjoy Life Forever book gives us a number of fine points we can share. A little box here. How did the congregation react? I was embarrassed to return to the Kingdom Hall. I wondered how the friends would treat me. One of the elderly sisters who was there 30 years ago said to me, Welcome home, son. That really touched my heart. I was truly home. Oh, thanks, Javier. I went to the Kingdom Hall and sat in the last row so that no one would notice me. However, many began to recognize me from the days when I had attended as a child. They welcomed me and embraced me so affectionately. I felt an overwhelming peace. It was as if I had come home. I have a sneaking suspicion that if I went to a memorial, I wouldn't be welcomed in the exact same way. After they attend the memorial, newly interested ones may have further questions. They may wonder why only a few, if any, partook of the emblems. Haha. <laughs> they may also wonder how often we observe the memorial. They may want to know if all of Jehovah's meetings are held in the same way. Even though many of those points are discussed during the memorial talk, newcomers may need a more detailed explanation. The article on JW.org entitled, Why Do Jehovah's Witnesses Observe the Lord's Supper? 
differently from the way other religions do can help us answer some questions some of their questions we want to do whatever we can before during and after the memorial to help those rightly disposed of to benefit from this observance why is there like a trend with it's like before during and after it was like what can you expect when you're growing to christian maturity what is jehovah doing for you uh, in the past now like everything is like this three-tiered system Assist in active ones. During the memorial season, how can elders assist those who are inactive? Give them loving attention. Before the memorial, be sure to call on as many as possible. Assure them of your affection and your desire to help them in any way you can. Invite them to attend the memorial. If they do attend, welcome them warmly. After the memorial, keep in touch with these dear brothers and sisters and provide whatever spiritual assistance they need to return to Jehovah. All and the congregation can help inactive ones who attend the memorial. How? by treating them with love, kindness, and respect. Remember that these dear sheep may have hesitated to return to a meeting. Perhaps they were afraid they would not be well received. So avoid putting them on the spot by asking embarrassing questions or by making comments that could be hurtful. These brothers and sisters are our fellow believers. We are happy to worship with them once again. Is it any wonder that Jesus arranged for us to observe the memorial of his death each year? When we do, we benefit ourselves and others in many ways. We grow in our love for Jehovah and Jesus. We show how much we appreciate what they have done for us. We strengthen our bonds with our fellow believers, and we may help others learn how they can enjoy the blessing that the ransom makes possible. Let us do all we can then to be ready for this year's memorial, the most important of the year. Do you treat women as Jehovah does? We have the privilege of serving alongside many faithful women, and we love and appreciate each one of these loyal, hardworking sisters. So, brothers, strive to treat them kindly, fairly, and respectfully. But because we are imperfect, we may at times struggle to do that. Certain brothers face an additional challenge. Some grew up in cultures in which many men treat women as inferior. For example, Hans, a circuit officer in Bolivia, says... Some men were raised in a very macho culture, causing them to develop a deep-rooted feeling that men are superior to women. Uh, Sheng Qin, an elder in Taiwan, says, Where I live, many men feel that women should not meddle in their business. If a man mentions a woman's opinion about something, his peers may look down on him. Other men show their prejudice against women in less obvious ways. For example, they may tell demeaning jokes about women. Thankfully, no man is bound to the culture in which he grew up. Unless you're a Jehovah's Witness and you grew up in that culture, and then you're quite literally bound to it. He can overcome the feeling that men are superior to women. This can be done by imitating Jehovah's example. In this article, we will discuss how Jehovah treats women, how brothers can learn to treat women as Jehovah does, and how elders can take the lead in showing respect for sisters. How does Jehovah treat women? Jehovah sets the perfect example in how to treat women. As a compassionate father, he loves his human family, and faithful sisters are like precious daughters to him. Consider the following ways in which Jehovah dignifies women. He treats them impartially. Jehovah created men and women in his image. He did not make men more intelligent or talented than women, nor does he prefer men to women. He created, he created men and women with the same mental capacity to grasp Bible truths and to reflect his beautiful qualities. Jehovah also regards the faithful men and, e and women equally, whether their hope is to live forever on a paradise earth or to serve as kings and priests in heaven. Clearly, Jehovah is not prejudiced against women. He listens to them. Jehovah is interested in the feelings and concerns of women. For instance, he listened to and acted on the prayers of Rachel and Hannah. Jehovah also inspired Bible writers to include accounts of men who listened to women. For example, Abraham followed Jehovah's instruction to listen to his wife, Sarah. 
King David listened to Abigail. In fact, he felt that Jehovah had sent her to speak to him. Jesus, who perfectly reflected his father's qualities, listened to his mother, Mary. These examples highlight that one that one way in which Jehovah shows respect for women is by listening to them. He trusts them. For example, Jehovah trusted Eve to help care for the entire earth. In doing so, he showed that he viewed her not as inferior to her husband, Adam, but as a compliment to him. Jehovah also trusted the prophetess Deborah and Hulda to advise his people, including a judge and a king. This actually sounds like a video I put together in response to Watchtower's articles about women. Huh, it's funny. Today, Jehovah entrusts Christian women to carry out his work. These faithful sisters serve as pioneers, publishers, and missionaries. They help design, construct, and maintain kingdom halls and branch facilities. Some of them serve at Bethel. Others serve in remote translation offices. These sisters are like a large army that Jehovah mobilizes to accomplish his will. Clearly, Jehovah does not view women as weak or incapable. How can brothers to learn to treat women as Jehovah does? Brothers, to determine whether we are treating Christian sisters as Jehovah does, we need to make an honest examination of our thinking and actions. To do that, we need help. Just as an x-ray machine can detect the medical issues in a person's literal heart, a good friend in God's word can help us detect any negative feelings about women that we may be harboring deep inside. And we can do, and what, and wow, yikes. What can we do to receive that help? Ask a good friend. We do well to turn to a trusted friend who is known to be kind and balanced and ask him such questions. How do you think I treat sisters? Can they tell that I respect them? Can I improve my interactions with them in any way? If your friend highlights some ways you can improve, avoid becoming defensive. Instead, be eager to make the needed adjustments. Study God's Word. The best way for us to know if we are treating sisters well is to examine our attitude and actions in the light of God's Word. As we study the Bible, we learn about men who treated women well and men who did not. We can then compare their actions with our own. Additionally, comparing Bible verses can prevent us from unknowingly taking scriptures out of context to support a mistaken view we have of women. For example, according to 1 Peter 3.7, a wife is to be assigned honor as to a weaker vessel. Does this mean that she is inferior, less intelligent, or capable than a man? By no means. Compare Paul's words with what Galatians 3.26.29 says. Uh, indicates namely that Jehovah has chosen women as well as men to be co-rulers with Jesus in heaven. When we study God's word and ask a good friend for his or her comments about how we treat women, we can learn to show the proper respect for our sisters. How do elders show respect for sisters? Looks like it's commend, train, and listen. Um, brothers in the congregation can also learn to treat sisters respectfully by following the example of loving elders. How do elders take the lead in showing respect for sisters? Consider some specific ways. They commend sisters. The Apostle Paul set a good example for elders to imitate. He publicly commended several sisters in the letter he wrote to the congregation in Rome. Can you imagine the joy those sisters must have felt when Paul's letter was read to the congregation? Similarly, Elders generously commended sisters for their fine qualities and for the work they do for Jehovah. This makes sisters aware of how deeply they are respected and appreciated. The encouraging words of an elder may be exactly what these sisters, sisters need as they keep serving Jehovah faithfully. When commending sisters, elders make their comments genuine and specific. Why? A sister named Jessica says, It is nice when a brother says to a sister, Good job! We especially appreciate it when it come when brothers commend us for something specific, such as teaching our children to sit quietly at the meetings, or going out of our way to pick up a Bible student to bring her to the meeting. When elders commend sisters on something specific, they make sisters feel needed and valued in the congregation. <sighs> this is... it just keeps going. They listened to sisters. Humble elders recognize that they do not have the monopoly on good ideas. <laughs> Such elders invite sisters to share their suggestions, and they listen carefully when sisters speak. In doing so, 
Elders encourage sisters and benefit themselves. How? An elder named Gerardo, who serves at Bethel, says, I have found that asking sisters for their input helps me to do my work more efficiently. Often they have done the job longer than most brothers. In the congregation, many sisters serve as pioneers, so they know a lot about the people who live in the local area. An elder named Brian says, our sisters have much to offer the organization, so benefit from their experience. Thanks, Brian. Wise elders are not quick to dismiss the suggestion of sisters. Why? A sister's opinion and experience can help a brother see the entire scope of a matter, and it can help to develop empathy, says an elder named Edward. Even if an elder cannot implement a sister's suggestion, he can still thank her for her observations and acknowledge her insight. They train sisters. Discerning elders look for opportunities to train sisters. For example, they can teach sisters how to conduct meetings for field service in the event that a baptized brother is not available. They can train them to operate tools or machinery that they can assist with theocratic maintenance and construction projects. At Bethel, overshares have trained sisters to care for a variety of assignments, including maintenance, purchasing, accounting, computer programming, and so forth. When elders train sisters, they show that they view sisters as capable and trustworthy. Many sisters use the training they receive from elders to benefit others. For example, some sisters use construction training to help others rebuild their homes after a natural disaster. Other sisters use the skills they were taught in public witnessing to help train more sisters in the aspect of the ministry. How do sisters feel about elders who train them? A sister named Jennifer says, when I worked on one Kingdom Hall construction project, an overseer took the time to train me. He noticed the work I did, and he commended me for it. I loved working with him because I felt valued and trusted. Yeah, also, they are doing that because they're trying to find someone to marry. We love our faithful sisters as Jehovah does, so we treat them like family. We are honored and proud to serve alongside them. We are happy when they sense our love and support. A sister named Vanessa says, I am so thankful to Jehovah for being part of his organization, which is filled with brothers who have refreshed my spirit. A sister in Taiwan says, I am thankful that Jehovah and his organization place such a high value on women and on our feelings. This strengthens my faith and makes me appreciate even more the privilege I have of being a part of Jehovah's organization. How proud Jehovah must be when we, when he sees faithful Christian men endeavoring to view and treat women as he does. The world's view of women can be very demeaning, says an elder in Scotland named Benjamin. So when women talk into a, walk into a kingdom hall, we want them to feel the difference. May we all do our best to imitate Jehovah by treating our dear sisters with the love and respect they deserve. Did you know... What type of vehicle was the Ethiopian eunuch riding when Philip approached him? Trying to tell you what kind of vehicle the eunuch wasn't riding, am I right? The original language... <laughs> oh, God. Ugh. The, orig <laughs> the original language word rendered chariot in the New World Translation, can refer to any one of several vehicles. However, it seems the Ethiopian was riding a vehicle larger than a simple military or racing chariot. Consider some of the reasons for this conclusion. The Ethiopian was a high official who had traveled a great distance. He was a man who had authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, and who was in charge of all of her treasures. Ancient Ethiopia, including modern-day Sudan and the southernmost part of the modern-day Egypt. Although the man probably did not ride the same vehicle for the entire trip, he must have had luggage for the long journey. Among the vehicles used in the first century CE to transport passengers were four-wheeled covered carriages. Such a carriage would allow for more luggage, make travel more comfortable, and perhaps increase the distance one could travel, states the book Acts in exegetical commentary. The Ethiopian was reading when Philip approached him. The account states that Philip ran alongside and heard the eunuch reading aloud Isaiah the prophet. Traveling carriages were not built for fast travel. This slower rate of travel would not, on, would not only allow the eunuch to read, but also 
enabled Philip to catch up to the chariot on foot. E the Ethiopian urged Philip to get on and sit down with him. In a typical racing chariot, the riders would stand. In a traveling carriage, however, there would have been room for the eunuch and Philip to sit down. Hubba, hubba. In harmony with the inspired record in Acts 8, chapter 8, and the available historical evidence, our publications have recently depicted the Ethiopian eunuch as riding in a larger, a vehicle larger than a simple military or racing chariot. Not going to lie, that was actually kind of interesting, especially if you're a Bible nerd or something. You know, at least it's something semi-stimulating. That hogwash about how they treat women, that was... Whew. Okay. I mean, it wasn't hogwash. The message was fine. It's just the implementation and reality of the situation. <laughs> okay. Jehovah will help you during difficult times. Tragic events can change our life overnight. For example, a faithful brother named Louise was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. The doctor told him that he only had a few months to live. Monica and her husband were busy in spiritual activities. Then one day, Monica learned that her husband, an elder, had living had been living a double life for years. Olivia, a single sister, was forced to evacuate her home because of a devastating hurricane was approaching. When she returned, she found that the storm had destroyed her house. In one brief moment, the lives of these individuals changed dr drastically. Can you relate to what they experienced? Have you faced an event that suddenly turned your world upside down? As faithful servants of Jehovah, we face difficulties and infirmities that are common to all mankind. We may also have to endure opposition or persecution from those who hate God's people. Jehovah, Though Jehovah does not shield us from such hardships, he does promise to help us. With his assistance, we can maintain our joy, make good decisions, and stay loyal to him, even though through the most difficult situations. In this article, we will examine four ways that Jehovah helps us during the dark times in our life. We will also consider what we need to do to benefit from the help that he provides. This guy has got... Looks like he's sick in bed. Something's going on with this bloke. I don't know. Not a lot to say about this picture, so I'm just going to go on. doesn't look like it was totally AI-generated, so I guess that's about it. The challenge. When we experience a tragic event, we may find it difficult to think clearly and make decisions. Why? Our heart may be in extreme pain. Our mind may feel weighed down by anxiety. We could feel as if we were wandering through a fog, uncertain which direction to take. Note how the two sisters mentioned earlier felt during their trials. Olivia says, After the hurricane demolished my home, I felt lost and completely overwhelmed. Monica says regarding her husband's betrayal, I felt more than disappointed. I felt a pain that truly crushed me from within. I didn't know how to function normally anymore. What seemed unbelievable had happened to me. How does Jehovah promise to help us when we feel overwhelmed? What Jehovah does. He promises to give us what the Bible calls the peace of God. This peace refers to the calmness and tranquility of mind and heart that result from our precious relationships with him. This peace surpasses all understanding. It is more wonderful than we can imagine. Have you ever felt surprisingly calm after praying fervently to Jehovah? That feeling is the peace of God. The same passage Pa the same passage states that the peace of God will guard or protect your hearts and your mental powers. The original word for guard was a military expression and was used to refer to soldiers who guarded a city and kept it safe from attack. The inhabitants of a guarded city slept in peace knowing that troops were posted at the gates. Similarly, when the peace of God guards our heart and minds, we feel calm knowing that we are safe. As in the case of Hannah, even if our situation does not change immediately, we can still feel a measure of peace. And when we feel calm, we often find it easier to think clearly and make wise decisions. What we need to do. When you are a jet, you're a jet. Uh, when you are troubled, summon the guard, so to speak. How? Pray until you feel the peace of God. 
Louise mentioned earlier explained how he and his wife, Anna, were able to cope when they learned that they only had a few months left to live. He said, in a moment like this, it is extremely difficult to make decisions about health care and other matters, but prayer has been indispensable in bringing us peace during this process. Louise and his wife said that they prayed intensely and repeatedly, asking Jehovah to give them peace of mind, a calm heart, and the wisdom to make good decisions, and they felt his help. If you are facing a crisis, persevere in prayer, and you will experience Jehovah's peace as it guards your heart and mind. Jehovah will stabilize you. The challenge. When we go through a difficult trial, our feelings, thoughts, and reactions may not be as balanced as they normally are. We could feel as we were being tossed from one strong emotion to the next. Anna mentioned earlier stated that she went through a wide range of emotions after Louis's death. She said, when feelings of emptiness set in, I would start feeling sorry for myself. I would also get angry that he was gone. Furthermore, Anna felt lonely and was frustrated at having to make decisions on matters that Lewis had cared for so well. At times, she felt that she was in a storm at sea. How does Jehovah help us when such emotions begin flooding over us? What Jehovah does. He assures us that he will stabilize us. See, this is like what he does. What? It's all, uh, anyway, I'm getting very formulaic, or at least I'm noticing it now. When a ship encounters a storm, it may begin to rock dangerously from side to side. To counteract this movement, many ships have stabilizers that extend from each side of the ship under the water. These stabilizers can significantly reduce the rocking of the ship, making the situation safer and more bearable for passengers. However, many stabilization systems work best when the ship is moving forward. Similarly, Jehovah will stabilize us as we move forward faithfully in times of trial. It's inspirational. What we need to do. When you are in the midst of an emotional storm, do your best to keep up with your spiritual routine. Granted, you may not be as able to do as much as you could before, but remember Jehovah is reasonable. As part of your spiritual routine, set aside time for personal study and meditation. Why? Through his organization, Jehovah has provided outstanding scriptural information that can help us maintain our balance. To find what you need, you can use research tools available in your language, such as the JW Library app, Watch Our Publications Index, and Research Guide for Jehovah's Witnesses. Monica mentioned earlier stated that she turned to the research tools for advice when she felt an emotional storm coming. For example, she searched the word anger. At other times, she searched the world, the, she searched betrayal or loyalty. Then she would read until she felt better. She said, what started as frantic keystrokes turned into a hug from Jehovah. As I read, I came to realize that Jehovah understood all my different feelings, and he was helping me. Such assistance from Jehovah can also help you maintain your balance until you reach calmer waters. The Challenge after a traumatic event, there may be days when we feel weak physically and emotionally. We might feel like an injured athlete who used to run fast but now walks with a limp. We may struggle with tasks as we, uh, uh, that we could previously do with ease, or we may have little motivation to engage in activities we once enjoyed. Like Elijah, we could feel that it is too hard to get up. We just want to sleep. How does Jehovah's promise to do what does Jehovah promise to do when we feel weak? What Jehovah does. He promises to support us. Just as an injured athlete needs support to move about, we may need help to keep activity active in Jehovah's service. In those moments, Jehovah assures us, I, Jehovah your God, am grasping your right hand, the one saying to you, Do not be afraid, I will help you. King David experienced a sneeze. King David experienced this help. When faced with trials and enemies, he said to Jehovah, your right hand supports me. But how does Jehovah provide support? Jehovah often supports us by motivating others to help us. For example, once when David felt weak, his friend Jonathan visited him to provide emotional support and words of encouragement. Similarly, Jehovah chose Elisha to provide practical help to Elijah. Today, Jehovah may use family, friends, or the elders to support us. However, when we are hurt, we may be inclined to withdraw. We just want to be left alone. 
that is a normal reaction. What can we do to receive Jehovah's support? Fight the urge to isolate ourselves. When we isolate ourselves, our focus often narrows and we begin to think only about ourselves and the problems we are going through. This type of thinking can affect the decisions we make. Of course, we all need moments to be alone, especially when confronted with tragic situations. However, if we were to isolate ourselves for an extended period of time, we could push away the very means that Jehovah is using to support us. So as hard as it may be, during difficult times, welcome the help of your family, friends, and elders. View them for what they are, Jehovah's means of supporting you. The challenge, or Jehovah will come for you, the challenge. We may go through moments when we feel frightened. Oh, I forgot about a yawn too. We go through moments when we feel frightened. In the Bible, faithful servants of God speak of times when they were in distress and trembling because of the enemies or other pressures. Similarly, we could be facing opposition at school, at work, from our family, or from the government. We could even be facing death because of a medical problem. During such times, we may feel as helpless as a small child. How does Jehovah help us in moments like these? What Jehovah does, he comforts and soothes us. The psalm may make us think of a little girl who is scared and unable to sleep because of a bad thunderstorm. We can picture her father coming in, picking her up and holding her in his arms until she falls asleep. Although the storm is still raging, her father's comforting embrace makes her feel safe. When we face frightening trials, we may need our Heavenly Father to hold us figuratively until the intense feelings pass away. How can we receive such comfort from Jehovah? What we need to do. Regularly spend time with Jehovah, praying to him and reading his word. When, Then, when you are under stress, your first thought will likely be to turn to your Heavenly Father. Share your fears and concerns with Jehovah. Let him talk to you and counsel you through the scriptures. You may find that the specific portions of the Bible can be particularly comforting when you are afraid. For example, you may find encouragement in the books of Job, Psalms, and Proverbs, as well as in Jesus' words found in Matthew chapter 6. As you pray to Jehovah and read his word, you will feel his comfort. We can have the confidence that Jehovah will be there for us in dark times in our life. We will never be alone. Jehovah promises to guard, stabilize, support, comfort us. Regarding Jehovah, Isaiah 26 3 says, you will safeguard those who fully lean on you. You will give them continuous peace because it is in you that they trust. So trust in Jehovah and take advantage of the means he uses to help you. If you do, you will regain strength even during difficult times. Study Article 4. Jehovah has tender affection for you. Have you ever tried to imagine what Jehovah is like? When you speak to him in prayer, what comes to your mind? Although Jehovah is invisible... The Bible describes him in various ways. Jehovah is called a sun and a shield and a consuming fire. The song of fire and ice. His presence is described as being similar to a sapphire stone, a glowing metal, and a brilliant rainbow. Some of these descriptions of Jehovah may fill us with awe or e may even intimidate us. Because we cannot see Jehovah, we may find it difficult to believe that he loves us. Some might think Jehovah could never love them because of their past experiences in life. Perhaps they never had a father who loved them. Jehovah understands such feelings and how they affect us. To help us, he reveals his beautiful personality in his word. The one word that best describes Jehovah is love. Love defines him. It influences everything he does. God's love is so warm and powerful that he even extends it to those who do not love him. In this article, we will take a close look at Jehovah and his love. The more we learn about our God, the more we will love him. Jehovah is very tender in affection. In the Bible, he compares himself to an affectionate mother. Just imagine a mother who lovingly cares for her little child. She tenderly bounces him on her knees and speaks to him in a gentle, soothing voice. When he cries or is in pain, 
She makes sure that he has what he needs. When we are in pain, we can count on Jehovah's love. The psalmist wrote, when anxieties overwhelmed me, you comforted and soothed me. Jehovah is loyal. He does not give up on us when we do something wrong. The nation of Israel disappointed Jehovah several, disappointed Jehovah time and again. Yet he expressed his unfailing love to his repentant people with these words. You became precious in my eyes. You were honored, and I have loved you. God's love has not changed. We can always rely on it. Even if we had made serious mistakes, Jehovah does not abandon us. When we repent and return to Jehovah, we will find his love for us intact. His promises that he will forgive in a large way? He promises, yeah. The Bible describes this forgiveness as bringing seasons of refreshing from Jehovah himself. Because he loved us, Jehovah is sensitive to our feelings and is eager to protect us. He feels hurt when we are hurt. As a result, we can rightly pray, Guard me like the pupil of your eye. The eye is a sensitive and precious part of the body. So when Jehovah compares us to the pupil of his eye, it is as if he were saying, Anyone who harms you, my people, harms what is precious to me. Jehovah wants us to be convinced that he loves us personally. He knows He knows that because of past experiences, we may wonder whether he could love us, or we may be facing situations right now that test our confidence in Jehovah's love. What will strengthen our confidence? Learning how Jehovah expresses his love towards Jesus, the anointed, and all of us. For untold ages, Jehovah and his beloved son forged a close bond of deep love and affection. Their relationship is the oldest in the universe. Jehovah clearly expressed his love for Jesus, as we read in Matthew 17, 5. Jehovah could have simply said, This is the one whom I have approved. However, he wanted to know how much love, how much he loves Jehovah, so he called him my son, the beloved. Cool. <laughs> Jehovah was proud of who Jesus was and what he was about to do, and Jesus had no doubt about his father's feelings for him. Sorry, Winston's been dreaming and it's disorienting. And Jesus had no doubt about his father's feeling for him. Jehovah's love was so real to Jesus that he could feel it deep inside. He repeatedly expressed with confidence that the father loved him. Jehovah also confirms his love for the anointed. Notice the expression poured out. One reference work describes it as come upon us like a stream. What a powerful image to highlight the abundance of Jehovah's love for the anointed. The anointed know that they are loved by God. The Apostle John expressed their feelings when he wrote, See what sort of love the Father has given us, and we should be called children of God. Is Jehovah's love limited to the anointed? No. Jehovah has proved his love for all of us. What is the greatest confirmation of Jehovah's love? The ransom, the most extraordinary act of love in the universe. Jehovah gave his precious son, allowing him to die for all humans, so that our sins can be forgiven and we can be his friends. The more we meditate on the price Jehovah and Jesus paid, the more we can understand how much they love every one of us. The ransom was not paid to satisfy a cold legal contract. It is a gift of love. Jehovah has proved his love for us by sacrificing what was most precious to him, Jesus. Jehovah allowed his son to suffer and die in our behalf. As we have seen, Jehovah does not keep his feelings to himself but he warmly expresses his love. Jehovah has drawn us to him because he loves us. Nothing and no one can separate us from that love. How does this love make you feel? Read Psalm 23 and see the effect that Jehovah's love and tender care had on David and the effect it can have on all of us. How does Jehovah's love make you feel? Psalm 23 is a song that expresses confidence in Jehovah's love and tender care. David, the writer of this psalm, describes the bond that existed between him and his shepherd, Jehovah. David felt safe after letting Jehovah direct him, and he was totally dependent on him. David knew that Jehovah's love would pursue him all the days of his life. What made him so confident? I will lack nothing. David felt 
David felt well cared for because Jehovah's pres per oh boy. hot dog actually just a short circuit there and david felt well cared for because jehovah's provisions had been constant david also enjoyed jehovah's friendship and favor that is why he was sure that no matter what the future would bring jehovah would continue to care for all his needs david tr david's trust in jehovah's tender love was more powerful than any of his worries and gave him deep happiness and satisfaction Je okay what's this picture Oh, okay, it's uh, the guy's, what is, what is it? It starts with a G. Wait, how can I get, think of the name of this Bible account? Oh, wait, even while David was a fugitive, Jehovah's tender love and care refreshed him. Oh, no, okay, so yeah, that's David. I thought this was the old classic from the uh, Bible story book, where they're like, you gotta leak, look up, get Eliah, get, 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 get Gomorrah. Yeah, it was Gomorrah, story of Gomorrah in the Bible. Jehovah lovingly cares for us, especially when bad things happen in our life. Claire, who has served at Bethel for over 20 years, felt helpless when her family faced one devastating blow after another. Her father suffered a debilitating stroke, one of her sisters was disfellowshipped, and her family lost their small business and their home. How did Jehovah show his loving care to them? Claire says, Jehovah saw to it that my family always had whatever they needed for each day. Time and again, what Jehovah provided was beyond anything I could have ever imagined. I often think about the moments when I experienced Jehovah's tender love, and I treasure them. These memories have helped me to keep going through trials. He refreshes me. At times, David felt distressed because of all the problems and trials he was facing. Yet Jehovah's tender love and care refreshed him. Jehovah led his exhausted friend to grassy pastures and well-watered resting places. As a result, David recovered his strength and was able to keep going. Similarly today, it is because of Jehovah's loyal love that we have come to our finish when faced with life's struggles, trials and struggles. Consider the example of Rachel. She was devastated when her husband left both her and Jehovah during the COVID-19 pandemic. What did Jehovah do for her? She says, Jehovah made sure that I felt love. He surrounded me with friends who spent time with me, brought me meals, sent thoughtful messages and scriptures, smiled at me, and kept reminding me that Jehovah was caring for me. I constantly thank Jehovah for giving me a big, loving family. I fear no harm, for you are with me. David's life was often in danger, and he had many powerful enemies. However, Jehovah's love made him feel safe and protected. David could feel that Jehovah was with him in every situation that reassured him. Thus, he could sing, Jehovah rescued me from all my fears. David's fears were real, but Jehovah's love was stronger than his fears. How does the assurance of Jehovah's love strengthen us when we face frightening situations? A pioneer named Susie describes how she and her husband felt when their son took his own life. Oh, that's awful. Sudden tragedy is, a traumatic, is traumatic and can leave one feeling vulnerable and helpless. But Jehovah's tender affection has made us feel safe and protected. Rachel, mentioned earlier, recalls one night when my heart ached terribly and I was very worried and scared. I groaned out loud to Jehovah. Right then, I felt that he soothed my heart and calmed me down, as a mother does for her baby, and I fell asleep. I'll never forget that moment. An elder named Tassus uh, spent four years in prison for refusing to join the army. How did he experience Jehovah's love and care? He says, Jehovah took care of all my needs and more. This strengthened my confidence that I can fully trust him. Although, also, through his spirit, Jehovah gave me joy despite being in a depressing environment. This assured me that the closer I work with him, the more I will benefit from his goodness. So I began serving him as a regular pioneer while in prison. 
The experiences we have discussed all prove that Jehovah, the God of love, is with us. He is interested in us personally. We are convinced that we are surrounded by his loyal love. The more we meditate on how he has shown us his love, the more real he becomes and the closer we feel to him. We can approach him freely and tell him how much we need his love. We can share all our worries with him, confident that he understands and that he is eager to help us. Just as we are drawn to a warm fire on a cold day, we are drawn to Jehovah's warm love. Although Jehovah's love is powerful, it is also tender. So welcome Jehovah's warm love in your life. And may we all respond to his love by exclaiming, I love Jehovah. I also like being done with another magazine. Bada bing, bada boom. February 2024, Watchtower. Study Article 5, I Will Never Abandon You. Years ago, Jehovah's people wondered, when will the last of the anointed Christians be taken to heaven? We once thought that we once thought that possibly some of the anointed might remain in the earthly paradise for some time after the War of Armageddon. But in the July 15, 2013 issue of The Watchtower, we learned that all anointed ones who are still on earth will be raised to heaven before the outbreak of Armageddon. However, a question arises. What will happen to Christ's other sheep who will be serving Jehovah's, Jehovah faithfully on earth during the Great Tribulation. Some today may worry that they will feel lost or abandoned when their beloved anointed brothers and sisters are taken to heaven. Let us examine two scriptural accounts that might come to their mind. Then we will discuss reasons why there is no need to worry. What will not happen? Some might wonder if the other sheep will stray from the truth when they, are no, when they no longer have the anointed brothers of the governing body to guide them. Perhaps some scriptural accounts bring such fears to mind. Let us consider two examples. The first involves high priest Jehoiada. He was an outstanding man of God. He and his wife Jehoshabeth Jehosh protected a young boy named Jehosh, Jehoash and helped him to become a good and faithful king. As long as elderly Jehoiada was alive, Jehoash did well, but after Jehoiada died, Jehoash t- soon turned bad. He listened to wicked princes and left Jehovah. The next example is that of 2nd century Christians. The Apostle John, the last surviving apostle, was a good influence on many Christians, helping them to endure in their service to Jehovah. Along with Jesus, other faithful apostles, John had some, for some time, been fighting hard against the apostasy that was spreading. After John died, though, apostasy spread like wildfire. Within a few decades, the Christian congregation became thoroughly corrupted. Do those two scriptural accounts indicate that something similar will happen to Christ's other sheep when the anointed are taken to heaven? At that time, will faithful Christians on earth stray from their training, as did Jehoash, or drift into apostasy, as did many Christians during the 2nd century CE? The answer is absolutely not. We can be sure that when the anointed leave the earthly scene, the other sheep will be well cared for and will thrive spiritually. Why can we be confident? Pure worship will not be corrupted. Why can we be confident that pure worship will not be corrupted? Even during the difficult times that are ahead, because of what we have learned from the Bible about the time period in which we live. This time period differs greatly from the time of ancient Israel and the time of the second century Christians, so let us look more closely at these three time periods. The time of ancient Israel, the time period after the apostles died, and our times. See, they are so consistent with this like three-tiered system, with everyone that they've had. It's something I never noticed before, but it's here. The time of ancient Israel. Shortly before his death, Moses told the Israelites. That was like three yawns. Moses also warned that if Israel rebelled, the nation would be sent into exile. Did those words come true? Yes. Over the centuries, many kings chose a wicked course that led God's people astray. 
This caused Jehovah to cast off wicked people and to end their line of earthly kings. But faithful Israelites took courage when they saw that God's word had come true. The time period after the apostles died. Should we be surprised that the second century Christians became corrupted? Not at all. Jesus foretold that a great apostasy would take place. The apostle Paul, Peter, and John had all confirmed that Jesus' prophecy was already beginning to be fulfilled in the first century CE. In the second century CE, the Christian congregation became corrupted. Apostate Christianity arose and became a prominent part of Babylon the Great, the world empire of false religion. Again, inspired prophecy was being fulfilled. The times of restoration of all things. Our time differs from the time of ancient Israel and from the time of the great apostasy, apostasy that set in during the 2nd century CE. What is our time period called? We might initially refer to it as the last days of the wicked system of things, but the Bible shows that a greater and longer era began in the same time. It will continue until the messianic kingdom has restored mankind to perfection and has earth into a paradise. This era is called the Times of Restoration of All Things. This period began in 1914. What was then restored? Well, Jesus was enthroned as king in heaven, so Jehovah once again had a ruler to represent him, an era of faithful King David. However, the kingship is not all Jehovah restored. Soon after that, pure worship began to be restored at last. Will it be corrupted again? Think about the prophecy. No weapon formed against you will have any success. Those inspired words are being fulfilled today. The following comforting words also apply to our time. All our sons will be taught by Jehovah, and the peace of your sons will be abundant. You will be firmly established in righteousness. You will fear nothing, and you will have no cause for terror, for it will not come near you. Even the God of this system of things, Satan himself, is powerless to stop the educational work that Jehovah's people are carrying out. Pure worship has been restored, and it will never be corrupted again. It is here to stay for all eternity. No weapon formed against us will succeed. What will happen? What will happen when the anointed are taken to heaven? Remember, Jesus is our shepherd. He is the head of the Christian congregation. Jesus clearly stated, Your leader is one, the Christ. Our reigning king will never fail to do his job. With Christ in charge, his followers here on earth will have nothing to fear. Of course, we do not know every detail about how Christ will lead his people at that time. So let us consider some Bible examples that may reassure us. Before Israel entered the promised land, Moses died. What happened to God's people? Without that faithful man, they were they left in the lurch? No. As long as they were faithful, Jehovah provided for them. Before Moses died, Jehovah told him to commission Joseph or Joshua to lead the people. Moses had been training Joshua for decades. In addition, there were many capable men taking the lead, chiefs of thousands, hundreds, fifties, and even tens. God's people were well cared for. We find a similar example in Elijah. We find he had been taking the lead in pure worship among the Israelites for decades, but the time came when Jehovah transferred him to a different assignment down in Judah. Were faithful people in the ten-tribe kingdom of Israel abandoned? No, Elijah had been training Elisha for years. There were also the sons of the prophets who were evidently organized into schools of some kind. Thus, many faithful men were available to help lead God's people. Jehovah's purpose kept advancing, and he cared for his spirit faithful worshipers. And even at times, he used faithful women to care for his people by the way. <laughs> like literally a judge. With those examples in mind, what do you think will happen when the last of the anointed are taken to heaven? We do not need... Oh, God. It's going to be way too much to keep track of. We do not need to wonder. The Bible reveals a simple, reassuring truth. Jehovah will never abandon his people on earth. 
like Moses and Elijah, the small group of anointed Christians who take the lead today understand the importance of training others. For decades, the brothers of the governing body have been training men from among the other sheep to take the lead. For example, they have organized many schools to train elders, traveling overseers, branch committee members, overseers at Bethel, and others. The governing body has personally been training helpers to the various committees of the governing body. These helpers are right now faithfully carrying a heavy load of responsibility. They are well prepared to continue the work of caring for Christ's sheep. Here's the key point for our discussion. When the last of the anointed are taken to heaven near the end of the Great Tribulation, pure worship will keep right on going here on earth. Thanks to the leadership of Jesus Christ, God's worshipers will not miss a beat. True, at that time we will be under attack by Gog of Magog, a hostile coalition of nations, but that brief attack will fail will not stop God's people from worshiping Jehovah. He will surely rescue them. In a vision, the Apostle John saw the great crowd of Christ's other sheep. John was told that his great crowd, that this great crowd comes out of the Great Tribulation. Yes, they will be kept safe. Still, some might wonder, what about the anointed? What will they do after they depart from the earthly scene? The Bible answers that question directly. It reveals that the political elements of this world will battle with the Lamb. They will lose, of course. We read, the Lamb will conquer them. And who will be with him? The verse answers, those who are called, chosen, those who are called, chosen and faithful. Who are these? The resurrected anointed ones. So when the last of the anointed on earth are taken to heaven near the end of the great tribulation, one of their first assignments will be to fight. Yeah. What a remarkable assignment. Some anointed Christians were fighters before they became Jehovah's Witnesses. Some even served in the armed forces of this world. But later, they became true Christians and learned the way of peace. They put aside all physical warfare. However, after being raised to heaven, they will serve along with Christ and his holy angels, waging the final war against God's enemies. Think of it. On earth, some anointed Christians are elderly, even frail, but once resurrected to life in heaven, they will be mighty and immortal spirit creatures assigned to fight alongside their warrior king, Jesus Christ. After the war of Armageddon has been fought, they will share in guiding mankind to perfection. Without a doubt, they will then do their beloved brothers and sisters on earth a lot more good in heaven than they ever could as mere imperfect humans. Are you of the other sheep? Then what will you need to do when the climactic war of Armageddon begins, simply this, trust in Jehovah and follow his direction. What might that include? The Bible comfortingly says, enter your inner rooms and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself for a brief moment until the wrath has passed by. All of God's faithful servants in heaven and on earth will be safe during that time. Like the Apostle Paul, we are convinced that neither governments nor things now here nor things to come will be able to separate us from God's love. Always remember, Jehovah loves you, and he will never abandon you. Study 6. Praise the name of Jehovah. <clears throat> Imagine this. Someone you care about says something terrible about you. You know that it is a lie. Yet some believe it. Even worse, they begin repeating the lie, and many others believe it too. How would you feel? If you care about people and your good reputation, the slander would make you feel bad, would it not? This scenario can lead us to understand how Jehovah felt when his reputation was tarnished. One of his spirit sons lied about him to the first woman, Eve. She believed that lie. That lie led our first parents to rebel against Jehovah. As a result, sin and death entered the human family. All the problems we see in the world, the deaths, the wars, the misery, have come because of the lies of Satan that Satan began to spread in the Garden of Eden. Does Jehovah feel pain because of such slander and its results? Without a doubt. Yet Jehovah is not bitter or resentful. 
In fact, he remains the happy God. We have the privilege of contributing to the vindication of Jehovah's name by obeying this simple command. Praise the name of Jehovah. We do so by speaking well of the one represented by the holy name. Will you let us will you? Let us consider three powerful motives that will help us to praise the name of our God wholeheartedly. We please Jehovah when we praise his name. We please our Heavenly Father when we praise his name. Does this mean, though, that the Almighty God is like imperfect humans who crave praise because they are needy or insecure? No. Consider an illustration. A little girl affectionately throws her arms around her father's neck and says, You're the best daddy in the whole world. The father is pleased, even when touched by her spontaneous act. Or even touched by her spontaneous act. Why? Should we assume that he is an insecure man who craves, even depends on, praise from his children? No. Rather, we trust that he is a strong father who is delighted to see his daughter showing love and appreciation. He knows that such qualities will contribute to her happiness as she grows up. For similar reasons, Jehovah, the greatest father, is pleased when we praise him. When we praise our Heavenly Father, we help to refute a lie that involves us personally. Satan claims that no human will loyally defend God's name. None of us have integrity according to him. He says that all of us would turn against God if we thought we would benefit by doing so. But faithful Job Job proved Satan a liar. What about you? Each of us has the privilege of loyally standing up for our Father's name and of pleasing him by serving him with integrity. It is truly an honor to do so. Love for God moves people to praise his name wholeheartedly. King David wrote, Let me praise Jehovah. Let everything within me praise his holy name. David understood that to praise Jehovah's name is to praise Jehovah himself. Jehovah's name involves his reputation, so it brings to mind all his beautiful qualities and his marvelous deeds. David wanted to treat his father's name as holy and to praise it. He wanted to do so with everything within him, that is, wholeheartedly. Similarly, the Levites took the lead in praising Jehovah. They humbly admitted that their words could never fully express the praise that Jehovah's sacred name deserves. Today, we can please Jehovah by speaking about him with warmth, gratitude, and love. When we are in the ministry, we keep in mind that our main objective is to draw people to Jehovah, to help them see our beloved Father as we do. We are delighted to show people how the Bible describes Jehovah, revealing his love, justice, wisdom, power, and other appealing qualities. We also praise Jehovah and please him by striving to imitate him. When we do so, we stand out in this wicked world. People may notice that we are different and may wonder why. As we interact with them in our day-to-day life, we may be able to explain why we act as we do. As a result, sincere ones feel drawn to our God. When we praise Jehovah in these ways, we bring delight to his heart. Of all the intelligent creatures in heaven and on earth, No one knows the Father better than the Son. Jesus loves his Father, and he has taken the time in praising Jehovah's name. In a prayer to his Father on the night before he died, he summarized his ministry on earth in in this way, I I have made your name known. What did he mean? Jehovah did more than just perform... uh, I combined inform and people. Jesus did more than just inform people that God's name is Jehovah. The Jews whom Jesus taught already knew God's name, but Jesus took the lead in being the one who explained him. For example, it's so weird how they just add a scripture in, and it's five words, and they just combine two different scriptures to just get five words to make it sound like this is what the Bible said. But Jesus took the lead in being the one who explained to him. For example, the Hebrew scriptures reveal that Jehovah is merciful and compassionate. Jesus made that truth clearer than ever when he related the parable of the the wayward son and his father. 
When we read about that father catching sight of his repentant son while he was still a long way off, running to meet him, embracing him, and forgiving him wholeheartedly, we see a most vivid picture of Jehovah's mercy and compassion. Jesus revealed his father as he truly is. Did Jesus also want others to use his father's personal name? Certainly, some pious religious leaders of the day may have held that God's name was too sacred to pronounce, but Jesus never allowed such unscriptural traditions to prevent him from honoring his father's name. Consider the time when he cured a demonized man in the region of the garrisons. The people became fearful and begged Jesus to leave, so he did not stay in that region. Still, Jesus wanted Jehovah's name to be known there, so he commissioned the man he had cured to tell people not what, not what Jesus had done, but what Jehovah had done. He wants the same today, that we make known his Father's name known throughout the whole world. When we do our part, we please our King Jesus. Jesus knew that Jehovah's purpose is to sanctify his name, to clear it of all reproach. That is why our Master taught his followers to pray, Our Father in the heavens, let your name be sanctified. Jesus understood that this is the greatest issue facing all creation. No intelligent creature in the universe has ever done more to sanctify Jehovah's name than Jesus has. Yet, when Jesus was arrested, what sin did his enemies accuse him of? Blasphemy! Jesus surely felt that to abuse or slander his father's holy name was the most repugnant of sins. He was deeply disturbed that he would be charged and convicted of this crime. That may have been the main reason why Jesus was in such agony in the hours leading up to his arrest, or the fact he was about to get mollywopped. To sanctify his father's name, Jesus endured every torment, insult, and slander heaped on him. He knew that he had obeyed his father in all things. He had nothing to be ashamed of. He also knew that Satan was directly attacking him in those dark hours. Satan surely hoped to break Jesus' integrity, yet... Satan failed miserably. Jesus proved conclusively that Satan is a vicious liar and that Jehovah does have loyal servants who keep their integrity even under the most severe tests. Do you want to please your reigning king? Keep praising Jehovah's name, helping others to know your God as he truly is. When you do, you are following in Jesus' footsteps. Like Jesus, you are making Jehovah rejoice and are proving his adversary, Satan, to be a debased liar. When we praise Jehovah's name, we hope to save lives. How so? Well, Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers. As a result, they have come to believe such satanic lies as these. God does not exist. God is remote, and he does not care about mankind. God is cruel and tortures wrongdoers forever. Such lies only serve to obscure or to tarnish Jehovah's name, and reputation, so that people who have no desire to draw close to him. But our work defeats Satan's purpose. We teach people the truth about our Father, praising the holy name of our God. With what result? The truths of God's word have enormous power. By teaching people about Jehovah and what he truly is like, we get to see something wonderful. The blindfold of satanic lies gradually comes off, and these individuals begin to see our beloved Father as we do. They are filled with an awe at his limitless power. They are assured by his perfect justice. They are enlightened by his profound wisdom, and they are comforted to learn that he is the personification of love. As they draw close to Jehovah, their hope of living forever as his children becomes sure. What a marvelous privilege! We have to help people draw close to their Father. When we do so, Jehovah considers us his fellow workers. At the outset, we may simply teach people that God's name is Jehovah. That in, an, that in, an, in itself can have a lasting impact on an honest-hearted person. For example, a young woman named Aaliyah 
was raised in a non-Christian household, but she felt no con real connection to her religion or to God. Oh, okay. That changed after she began to study with the witnesses. She started to see God as her friend, and she was amazed to learn that God's name was has been removed from many miles and replaced with more titles, such as Lord. Learning Jehovah's name was a turning point in her life. She exclaimed, My best friend has a name. The result, she says, I have so much peace in my heart now. I feel very honored. A man named Steve was a musician who came from a con conservative Jewish background. He distanced himself from organized religion because he had seen so much hypocrisy. However, during a time of grief, he agreed to sit in on a Bible study conducted by one of Jehovah's Witnesses. He was deeply touched to learn God's name. He says, I had never learned God's name. He adds, For the first time, I understood that God is real. I saw him as a person. I knew then that I had found a friend. <laughs> These are so generic. <laughs> in our preaching and teaching work, do you share the sacred name Jehovah with people? Do you help them see what our God is really like? In doing so, you praise God's name. May you keep on praising Jehovah's holy name by helping people know the person behind the name. And that way, you will save lives. You will follow the lead of your king, Christ Jesus, and above all, you will please your loving Father, Jehovah. May you praise his name forever and ever. Lessons we can learn from the Nazarites. Do you treasure your relationship with Jehovah? No doubt you do. And you are not alone. Since ancient times, untold multitudes have felt that the same way as you. Many have made sacrifices to worship Jehovah. There was certainly the case with those in ancient Israel, known as Nazarites. Who were they, and why can we learn from their example? The word Nazarite comes from the Hebrew term that means one singled out, a separated one, or dedicated one. This term aptly describes the zealous Israelites who made certain personal sacrifices to serve Jehovah in a special way. The Mosaic law allowed for a man or woman to make a special vow to Jehovah by choosing to live as a Nazarite for a period of time. That vow or solemn promise involved following guidelines that the rest of the Israelites did not have to observe. Why then would an Israelite choose to take the Nazarite vow? Such an Israelite was likely motivated by deep love for Jehovah and sincere gratitude for his rich blessing. The Nazarite arrangement ended when the Mosaic Law was replaced by the Law of Christ. However, like the Nazarites, Jehovah's people today continue to show an intense desire to serve him with their whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. We willingly make a vow to do so when we dedicate ourselves to Jehovah. Living up to that vow involves submitting to Jehovah's will and making sacrifices. As we examine how the Nazarites lived up to their vow, we can learn valuable lessons about how we can live up to ours. Let us consider some examples. <laughs> Nazarites had to avoid all alcohol and products of the grapevine, such as grapes and raisins. People around them would have regularly enjoyed such foods, and rightly so, since there was nothing wrong with these items. The Bible describes wine that makes man's heart rejoice as a gift from God, yet the Nazarites willingly sacrificed their right to enjoy such things. Like the Nazarites, we too make sacrifices to worship Jehovah more fully. Consider the example of Median and Marcella. This Christian couple enjoyed a comfortable life. Median had good had a good job that allowed them to live in a beautiful apartment. However, they wanted to do more in the service to Jehovah. To achieve that goal, they decided to make some adjustments. We started reducing our expenses, they say. We moved to a smaller apartment and sold our car. M&M did not have to make these sacrifices. They chose to make them because doing so allowed them to expand their ministry. They feel satisfied and happy about their decisions. 
Jehovah appointed some Israelites as Nazarites for life. These Nazarites took no vows, and there was no time limit set for their service as Nazarites. Only three divinely appointed Nazarites are mentioned in the Bible, Samson, Samuel, and John the Baptizer. However, this study article discusses volunteer Nazarites who were who are considered at Numbers chapter 6. Christians today find joy in making personal sacrifices in order to dedicate more time to theocratic activities. Jehovah does not require us to make these sacrifices, nor are things given up, nor are the things given up wrong in themselves. For example, some forgo a preferred job, a home, or even a pet. Well, that was a terrible circumstance. particularly well. Our pet's heads are falling off. Many have decided to postpone getting married or starting a family. Others have chosen to serve where the need is greater, even though that means living far away from loved ones. Many of us willingly make sacrifices because we want to give Jehovah our best. Be assured that Jehovah greatly values any sacrifices, large or small, that you choose to make in order to serve him. Nazarites vowed not to cut their hair. That was a way to show their complete submission to Jehovah. Depending on the length of his Nazarite ship, an, Israelite un an Israelite's uncut hair may have become noticeable to others. If those around him supported his desire to stick to his Nazarite vow, this may not have posed a challenge. Sadly, however, there were times in Israel's history when Nazarites were not appreciated or supported. During the time of the prophet Amos, apostate Israelites kept giving the Nazarites wine to drink, likely in an attempt to cause them to violate their vow to abstinence from wine. At times, it must have taken real courage for a Nazarite to stick to his vow and stand out as different. With Jehovah's help, we too courageously stand out as different, even if we are shy or timid by nature. Consider the example of Benjamin, a 10-year-old witness in Norway. His school held an event in support of war-torn Ukraine. The children were asked to sing a song while dressed in Ukraine's national colors. Benjamin planned to avoid this nationalistic event by remaining a discreet distance away from it where, he, where it would take place. However, a teacher saw him and loudly called out, You must come and join us now. We're all waiting. Benjamin, Benjamin courageously approached the teacher and said, I am neutral, and I do not join in political demonstrations. In fact, many of Jehovah's Witnesses are in prison because they refuse to go to war. The teacher accepted this explanation and excused Benjamin from the event. However, his classmates began to ask why he did not join them. Benjamin was so nervous that he almost started to cry, yet he bravely repeated to the whole class what he had said to the teacher. Afterward, Benjamin told his parents that he felt that Jehovah had helped him to stand up for his faith. Because we choose to submit to Jehovah's will, we stand out as different from the people around us. We need courage to identify ourselves as Jehovah's Witnesses at work or at school. And as this world's attitudes and conduct go from bad to worse, we will likely find it more difficult to live according to Bible principles and share the good news with others. Always remember, though, that we make Jehovah's heart rejoice when we courageously stand out 
as different from those who do not serve him. Nazarites could not go near a dead body. At first glance, this might not seem like a big sacrifice. In Bible times, though, a Nazarite would have found this requirement to be a real challenge when a close relation, when a close relative died. Funeral customs of the day involved being near the body of the deceased. A Nazarite vow would very much limit his ability to follow such customs. Even when dealing with family situations during times of great grief, Nazarites showed strong faith by sticking to their vow. Jehovah surely strengthened these devoted worshippers of his to deal with the challenges that they had to face. As Christians, we take our dedication vow seriously, to Jehovah seriously. This affects our decisions and actions regarding family matters. We diligently care for our scriptural family responsibilities, and we never put the desires of our family members ahead of what Jehovah requires of us. Sometimes that may mean sacrificing a measure of peace with relatives in order to please Jehovah. Consider the example of Alejandro and his wife, Darina. After the couple studied the Bible for a year, Darina decided to stop, and she wanted Alejandro to stop too. However, he claimed and tactfully told her that he would continue. Darina was not pleased and forced, and tried to force him to stop studying. Alejandro says that he tried to understand her reaction, but it was not easy for him. At times, when Darina criticized him and replied harshly, he felt like giving up the Bible study. Still, Alejandro persevered in putting Jehovah first, all the while showing great love and respect to his wife. In the end, his fine example motivated her to resume her Bible study, and she eventually embraced the truth. See JW.org, a video about these two people. Jova created the family arrangement, and he wants us to have a happy family. If we want to be truly happy, we need to do things Jehovah's way. Never doubt that Jehovah cherishes your self-sacrificing efforts to worship him as you care for your family and treat them with love and respect. All who chose to worship Jehovah today need to be willing to make sacrifices motivated by love. At times, doing so is not easy. How can we help one another to show such an attitude by being encouraging with our words are there some in your congregation who are trying to simplify their life in order to have a greater share in theocratic activities do you know young ones who are bravely standing out as different from others in school even though it is difficult for them to do so what about bible students and fellow believers who may be struggling to remain faithful because of family opposition Let us seize every opportunity to speak reassuringly to such dear fellow worshipers, expressing our appreciation for their self-sacrificing spirit and courage. Sometimes we may be able to offer practical help to fellow Christians who are in full-time service. This was the sincere desire of a faithful elderly sister who lived in Sri Lanka. She received an increase in her pension and wanted to help two young pioneers to continue in their ministry despite economic difficulties. So she decided to contribute a specific amount each month toward their telephone expenses. What a beautiful spirit that sister shows. We can certainly learn much from the fine example set by the volunteer Nazarites of old. However, this arrangement also reveals something about our Heavenly Father Jehovah. He is confident that we sincerely desire to please Him and that we are willing to make sacrifices to live up to our dedication vow. He dignifies us by letting us express our love for Him in a personal way. The Nazarite arrangement shows that Jehovah notices and treasures the sacrifices we make to serve Him. May we, then, be determined to continue serving Jehovah Willingly offering him our very best. Study Article 8. Keep following Jehovah's guidance. Imagine that you are lost in a forest. Danger lurks around you. Wild animals, disease-carrying insects, poisonous plants, and rocky terrain. How grateful you would be for an experienced guide who knows where the danger is and how to steer you away from it. 
This world is like that forest. It is filled with danger that especially threatens our spiritual health. We have a perfect guide, Jehovah. He leads us away from the danger and toward our destination, everlasting life and the new world. How does Jehovah guide us? Primarily by means of his written word, the Bible. However, he also uses human representatives. For example, he uses the faithful and discreet slave to provide spiritual food that helps us make wise decisions. Jehovah also uses other capable men to guide us. For example, circuit overseers and congregation elders provide encouragement and instruction that can help us get through difficult times. And speaking of difficult times, you might be wondering why I changed shirts. Well, I had a little bit of an issue with the timing. I My math wasn't mathing. Uh, I was recording everything on 4K, and it was taking, uh, for every hour I was recording, it was taking about 40 minutes just to download and uh, another maybe 15 minutes just to splice and everything in and get the mat audio to match. So basically, if this was going to take me 48 hours uh, to a of actual reading time, it was going to take me something like 96 to 100 hours to actually finish the thing. And I don't think I can stay awake for that long. So I made a few adjustments. I lowered it down to 1080p instead of 4K and uh, made a few other adjustments. Uh, so hopefully I can download a lot faster. And uh, I should be, I think I shaved off about three to 400% percent, percent, uh, as far as the back end stuff goes. So hopefully that all keeps going. But because of that, uh, I did take a nap. So I started at 8 p.m. yesterday and I stopped at 3 a.m. and now I'm back at it again today. So uh, yeah, if I do end up uh, needing to take a break or go to sleep, I don't think I will. I'm going to try and really power through this thing, but I will always let you guys know so that way uh, you don't think I'm cheating this bad boy. Anyway, uh, something about difficult times. How grateful we are for reliable guidance during these critical last days. It helps us maintain Jehovah's approval and keeps us on the road to life. Even so, we might occasionally find it a challenge to follow Jehovah's guidance, especially when it is conveyed by imperfect men. Why? The council may conflict with our likes or dislikes, or we may feel that the direction we receive is unwise and conclude the, that the council must be from Jehovah. At such times, we especially need confidence that Jehovah is the one leading his people and that following his guidance results in blessings. To help strengthen our confidence, this article will consider how Jehovah guided his people in Bible times, how he is guiding us today, and how we can benefit when we keep following his guidance. How Jehovah guided Israel. Jehovah appointed Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, and he gave the Israelites visible evidence that he was guiding them by means of Moses. For example, he provided a pillar of cloud by day and one of fire by night. Moses followed the pillar which led him and the Israelites to the Red Sea. The people panicked when they thought that they were trapped between the sea and the pursuing Egyptian army. They concluded that Moses was mistaken in bringing them to the Red Sea, but it was no mistake. Jesus had intentionally led his people there by means of Moses. God then delivered them in an astonishing way. For 40 years thereafter, Moses continued to depend on the pillar of cloud to guide God's people through the wilderness. For a time, Jehovah placed the pillar of Moses above Moses' tent, where all Israel could see it. From the pillar, Jehovah spoke to Moses, who in turn conveyed his instruction to his people. The Israelites had ample evidence that Jehovah was using Moses to guide them. Oh, boy. Sadly, most of the Israelites rejected the clear proof that Jesus was using Moses as his representative. Repeatedly, they refused to recognize Moses' role as a result. That generation of Israelites was denied entry into the Promised Land. I wonder how long that generation was. Was that generation, I don't know, 120 years? Questions <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses ask, answers the governing body will never give. However, some Israelites did follow Jehovah's guidance. For example, Jehovah noted, Caleb kept following me wholeheartedly. God rewarded Caleb, even granting him his perfect choice of land in Canaan. The next generation of Israelites also set a good example in following Jehovah's guidance. When Joshua succeeded Moses as the appointed leader of the Israelites, they deeply respected him all the days of his life. As a result, Jehovah blessed them by bringing them into the land that he had promised. Years later, Jehovah raised up judges to guide his people. Afterward, during the time of the kings, Jehovah appointed prophets to guide his people. 
Faithful kings heeded the counsel of the prophets. For example, King David humbly accepted correction from the prophet Nathan. King Jehoshaphat, jumping Jehoshaphat, relied on the prophet Jehaziel for guidance and encouraged the people of Judah to put faith in God's prophets. When in distress, King Hezekiah turned to the prophet Isaiah. Each time the kings followed Jehovah's guidance, they were blessed and the nation protected. It should have been obvious to all that Jehovah was using his prophets to guide his people. Yet, the majority of the kings, as well as the people, rejected Jehovah's prophets. It's kind of funny. It's kind of like how it is nowadays. More people leave the witnesses than er, join the witnesses. Or do they leave? I mean, I should say more children are leaving than the ones that actually stay. Because uh, they just can't accept this evidence. Why can't people just accept this evidence? Maybe because it's not real. Uh, we got a little picture here. Moses and his successor, Joshua. King Hezekiah and the prophet Isaiah. Yippee, yeehaw, not interesting. In the first century CE, Jehovah formed the Christian congregation. How did he guide those early Christians? He appointed Jesus as the head of the congregation. But Jesus did not personally direct each individual disciple. He used the apostles and the older men in Jerusalem to take the lead. Also, the elders were appointed to guide the congregations. How did first century Christians respond? The majority were glad to follow the instructions they received. In fact, they rejoice over the encouragement they were given. How, though, has Jehovah been guiding his people in more recent times, you say? Well, I've got the answer for you. Jehovah continues to lead his people today. He has been doing so by means of his word and his son, the head of the congregation. Can we see evidence that God has also continued to use human representatives? Oh, this is the picture. Is this the picture that Toni Morris was in and they photoshopped him out? I think this one, like they photo or they photoshopped in the new governing body members. Yeah, I, I, I think someone, I think I saw someone mention this. I don't know if I ever talked about it in a video, but I think this is the infamous photoshopped picture. I mean, everything is so photoshopped and AI generated these days, but yeah. Anyway, yes, consider, for example, certain developments that took place in the late 1800s. Charles Taze Russell and his associates began to discern that the year 1914 would mark a turning point regarding the establishment of God's kingdom. In reaching that conclusion, they depended on Bible prophecy. Was Jehovah guiding their Bible research? He clearly was. In 1914, world events confirmed God's kingdom had begun to rule. World War I broke out, followed by pestilences, earthquakes, and food shortages. Jehovah was indeed using those sincere Christian men to help his people. See, this is such a stupid way to argue. It's really frustrating because it's like, they asked the question, was Jehovah guiding their Bible research? And you can't say yes if all of their Bible research is now considered by Jehovah's Witnesses to be wrong. Then what was Jehovah guiding? Jehovah was guiding them to wrong conclusions? Can you point to a single example where he used like lies in order to teach people truth? It's, it's just the most inefficient way possible. It's like, hey, I sent you an email. Didn't you see it? I sent it under a fake account. That no doubt ended up in your spam. What do you mean you didn't receive it? I, was, I thought that was the most efficient way to get a hold of you. Consider, too, what happened during World War II. After a study of Revelation 17.8, responsible brothers at World Headquarters discerned that the world, that the war would lead not to Armageddon, but to a period of relative peace that would open opportunities for increased preaching activity. So even the move may have seemed impractical at the time, the Watchtower Bible College School of Gilead was established by Jehovah's organization to train missionaries to preach and teach in lands throughout the earth. Missionaries were sent out even during the war. Additionally, the faithful slave arranged for the course in theocratic ministry, uh, known as the Theocratic Ministry School, to train all congregations to become better preachers and teachers. In these ways, God's people were being prepared for the work ahead. Looking back, we can clearly see Jehovah was guiding his people during that difficult time. Since World War II, Jehovah's people in many lands have enjoyed a measure of peace and freedom while carrying out the preaching work. In fact, the work has flourished. Today, the members of the governing body continue to look to Christ for guidance. They want the instructions they give to brothers to reflect heaven's view of matters. In turn, circuit overseers and elders provide direction to congregations. Anointed elders are in Christ's right hand. Of course, the elder, these elders are imperfect and make mistakes. Moses and Joshua erred at times, as did the apostles. 
Still, Christ is clear, carefully guiding the faithful slave and the anointed elders, as he will continue to do so all the days until the conclusion of the system of things. We therefore have every reason to trust the guidance that he is providing through those appointed to take the lead. But in the past, when Moses made mistakes, God literally like speaks from heaven, or he makes a visible sign correcting the matter. It, it wasn't a case of like Moses saying something, it not coming true, and then... He later says, oh, it looks like I was wrong about this thing. And they get no confirmation or anything from God. If, if, if Moses misspoke, he was punished for it. If, if Moses did something out of character, didn't you know, give, do what was Jehovah's will, it was made evidence that he was in error. The, the governing body is the complete opposite, where they quite literally say, we don't even have to apologize when we get stuff wrong. Ugh. Why some have rejected clear evidence? Oh, I guess I should have read this box and that would have converted me quicker. Why have some rejected clear evidence that Jehovah is using human representatives to guide his people? In many cases, it has been because of selfish motives. For example, some Israelites refused to accept Moses as a divinely appointed guide because they were only concerned with their own status. For similar reasons, many reject Jesus despite the miracles he performed. On the other hand, humble ones with heartfelt love of truth have seen the powerful evidence that Jehovah is using appointed men to guide his people. Following that guidance always leads to blessings. They didn't... <laughs> oh, God. When we keep following Jehovah's guidance, we enjoy blessings even now. For example, Andy and Robin heeded the encouragement to keep their life simple. As a result, they were able to volunteer to work on theocratic construction projects. Robin says, We have lived in some very small spaces, often with no kitchen, and I had to sell a lot of equipment that I use for photography, a hobby I love. That brought me to tears. But like Abraham's wife, Sarah, I was determined to look ahead, not back. What did this couple gain from the experience? Robin says, We have the deep satisfaction of knowing that we have wasted our entire... Oh, sorry. We have the deep satisfaction of knowing that we are giving Jehovah everything we have. When working on theocratic assignments, we get a glimpse of how life will be in the new world. Andy, he agrees, saying, We have the satisfaction of being completely spent in support of the kingdom. How else do we benefit when we keep following Jehovah's guidance? After graduating from high school, Mauricia took, uh, took to heart the encouragement to pursue a career in Jehovah's service. She says, I was offered a four-year scholarship at a university, but I wanted to pursue spiritual goals. So I chose to attend a technical training school to learn a trade that would support me in my ministry. It was one of the best decisions I have ever made. I now enjoy regular pioneering, and my flexible work schedule has allowed me to serve as a commuter at Bethel and to enjoy special privileges. At times, we receive counsel that safeguards us from such things as materialism and activities that can put us in danger of breaking God's law. Here, too, we are blessed by following the guidance Jehovah provides. We maintain a clean conscience and spare ourselves unnecessary stress. As a result, we can work wholeheartedly we can wholeheartedly pursue the worship of Jehovah, which brings the deepest joy, peace, and satisfaction. No doubt Jehovah will continue to use human representatives to provide guidance during the Great Tribulation and on into the thousand-year reign. Will we keep following that direction, even when doing so requires setting aside our personal preferences? Much may depend on how we respond to the guidance that Jehovah is providing now. Therefore, let us always follow Jehovah's guidance, including that which is provided by men who are appointed to watch over us. Amen. And as we do, we have every reason to trust in our guide, Jehovah, who leads us away from spiritual danger and toward our destination, everlasting life in the new world. So, main takeaway, don't think about anything, just believe. Cool. Find... <laughs> I always say that, and then the next article is immediately, find happiness while waiting patiently for Jehovah. Do you look forward to the time when Jehovah will do away with all the wickedness and make all things new? No doubt you do. However, it is not always easy to keep waiting patiently for Jehovah, especially when we are facing difficulties. Hope delayed can make us feel sick at heart. Still, Jehovah expects us to wait patiently for him to act at his appointed time. Why does he expect that of us? What can help us to be happy while we wait? The Bible says, Jehovah is waiting patiently to show us favor, and he will rise up to show you mercy. For Jehovah is a God of justice. Happy are all those keeping an expectation of him. 
these words of Isaiah were originally directed to the stubborn Jews, but there were some faithful ones among the Jews, and these words offered them hope. These same words offer hope to Jehovah's faithful servants today. So we must wait patiently because Jehovah is waiting patiently. He has an appointed time for when he will bring the system to an end, and he is waiting for that day and hour to arrive. At that time, it will be absolutely clear that the devil's charges against Jehovah and those who serve him are false. He will then remove Satan and any who side with him, but he will show us mercy. In the meantime, Jehovah may not remove our trials, but he assures that we can be happy while waiting. As I say, as stated, we can be happy while we long or hope for something good. How can we gain that happiness? Four steps can help us. Focus on the positive. King David had seen much wickedness throughout his life, yet he wrote, Keep silent before Jehovah and wait patiently for him. Do not be upset by the man who succeeds in carrying out his schemes. A picture of David looking longingly at a nasty-looking green pashmina. It doesn't look very cozy. David himself took the advice to heart by fixing his attention on his hope of salvation. He also took note of every blessing he received from Jehovah. If we too focus on the positive aspects of our situation without being consumed by the negative things that are happening around us, we will find it easier to wait for Jehovah. Stay busy praising Jehovah. The writer of Psalm 71, apparently David, said to Jehovah, I will continue to wait. I will add to your praise. How would he praise Jehovah? He would tell others about Jehovah and sing praises to him. Like David, we can find joy while waiting for Jehovah. We praise him through our ministry, our daily conversations, and our songs for worship. The next time you sing a kingdom song, why not pay careful attention to his uplifting message? I like that they have to put that in there, operating under the assumption that no one's paying attention to the actual words, <laughs> which is actually true. When David faced challenges, he said to Jehovah, In the presence of your loyal ones, I will hope in your name. We too can draw encouragement from the loyal fellow worshipers, not only at our meetings and in the ministry, but also during social occasions. Strengthen your hope. Psalm 62.5 says, I will wait silently for God because my hope comes from him. Strong hope includes confident expectation, which is crucial if we have to endure this system longer than we imagined. We must be convinced that Jehovah's promises will become realities, no matter how long we may have to wait for them. We can strengthen our hope by studying God's word, the prophecies, the internal harmony, and the details of Jehovah, the details Jehovah reveals about himself. Also, we need to continue to pray with Holy Spirit to keep our good relationship with Jehovah while we wait for his promises of everlasting life to be fulfilled. Like King David, be confident that Jehovah watches over those waiting for him and expresses his loyal love to him. Keep waiting patiently for Jehovah by focusing on the positive things in your life, by praising him, by drawing encouragement from fellow witnesses, and by keeping your precious hope strong. Well, not like the worst advice of like actually trying to keep a positive attitude about uh, things in general. Uh, it can be actually super helpful. But uh, the positive things in your life when you're a Jehovah's Witness are waiting for everyone else to die. So, bad advice. Two new governing body members! Yeah! Let's read their life story. I don't... On Wednesday, January 18th, 2023, a special announcement appeared on JW.org stating that Brothers Gage Flegel and Jeffrey Winder had been appointed to serve as members of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses. Both brothers have a long history of faithful service to Jehovah. Brother uh, Kegel was raised in western Pennsylvania, U.S. of A., by his God-fearing parents. When he was a teenager, his family moved to a small rural town where the need was great. Shortly thereafter, he got baptized on November 20th, 1988. He was baptized in 1988. Interesting. Brother Fiegel's parents always encouraged him to enter the full-time service. They often hosted circuit overseers and Bethelites in their home, and Brother Fliegel could see how happy these brothers and sisters were. Not long after baptism, he began regular pioneering on September 1st, 1989, one year before I was born. Two years later, he fulfilled a goal that he had set at the age of 12, the goal of serving at Bethel. 
He began his service at Brooklyn Bethel in 1991. At Bethel, Brother Flegel worked in the binary department for eight years, after which he was assigned to the service department. During that time, he served in a Russian-language congregation for a few years. In 2006, he married his wife, Nadia, who joined him in Bethel service. Nadia, all right, together they have served in the Portuguese field and for over 10 years in the Spanish field. After many years in the service department, Brother Flegel was assigned to work in the teaching committee office and later the service committee office. In March 2022, he was appointed as helper to the service committee of the governing body. Brother Winder was raised in Murrieta, California, USA. He was brought up in the truth by his parents and he got baptized in 1986. The very next month, he decided to auxiliary pioneer. Like, how mundane is this? You got baptized March 29th, and then you decided to auxiliary pioneer. <laughs> People just to be like, oohing and on and gasping at the intrigue. He enjoyed it so much that he wanted it to continue. After several months of auxiliary pioneering, he began regular pioneering on October 1st. Oh, it's hardy to the party. As a teenager, Brother Winder uh, visited his two older brothers who... We're serving at Bethel at the time. That visit kindled his desire to apply for Bethel service when he was older. In May 1990, he was invited to serve at the Bethel facility in Walkill. At Bethel, Brother Winder worked in various departments, including cleaning, farm, Bethel office. He married his wife, Angela, in 97, and he was served, and they've been serving together at Bethel ever since. In 2014, they transferred to Warwick, where Brother Winder assisted with the construction of the World Headquarters facility. 2016, they moved to the Washington, the Washington Watchtower Educational Center in Patterson, where Brother Winder worked in audio-video services. Four years later, they moved back to Warwick, and Brother Winder was assigned to work in the Personnel Committee office. In 2022, he was appointed as a helper of the Personnel Committee of the Governing Body of Jehovah's Witnesses. We pray that Jehovah richly bless these gifts and men as they continue to work their hands. <sighs> The governing body consists of Kenneth Cook, uh, Jr., Gage Flegel, Samuel Hurd, Jeffrey Jackson, Stephen Lett, Garrett Loesch, Mark Sanderson, David Splain, and Jeff. Questions from readers. What does the Bible say about Jehovah's ability to foretell the future? The Bible makes clear that Jehovah can foretell the future. It does not spell out every detail about how or when he does so or even how much he chooses to know. So, we cannot be dogmatic about such matters. Matters, Nonetheless, consider a few factors. Jehovah has no limitations except those he sets for himself. With his infinite wisdom, he can foretell anything he chooses. Because he has perfect self-control, he can also choose to not know what will happen. Jehovah causes his will to be done. How does that fact relate to his ability to foretell the future? Isaiah 46.10 explains, from the beginning, I foretell the outcome, and from long ago, the things that have not yet been done. I say, my decision will stand, and I will do whatever I please. So, one reason why Jehovah can foretell the future is that he has the power to make things happen. He does not need to fast forward, so to speak, to see what the future will bring. As if all future events have already happened in some form, and Jehovah merely reviews them in advance. I like how they say they can't know, and then they go to a very specific example. I was like, okay, now we can't be dogmatic about this, but let me lay out like the exact mechanics of how his ability to see the future. It's not like things have already happened and he's just reviewing them. Like, how do you know that? Ugh. Rather, Jehovah can decide something will happen at a specific time and then cause it to happen when the time arrives. It's just predestination then. For this reason, the Bible uses such terms as prepared, formed, and purpose to describe what Jehovah does concerning some future events. These terms are translated from the original language word that is related to a word meaning potter. Just as a skillful potter can shape a lump of clay into a beautiful vase, Jehovah can shape or maneuver things to accomplish as well. That is just, that's more confusing. He does not set a destiny for each person, nor does he cause honest-hearted people to do something that he would to do something that would lead to their destruction. Except when he does, there's literally a scripture in the Bible that says, "I gave you commandments that were not good for you, commandments to sacrifice your own children, so that you may know that I am powerful." It's in Ezekiel. He allows us to choose their own course, and he urges them to choose the right one. Consider two examples. 
For example, the first example involves the inhabitants of Nineveh. Jehovah foretold that the city would be overthrown because of its wickedness, but when its inhabitants repented, Jehovah reconsidered the calamity that he said he would bring on them, and he did not bring it. Jehovah changed his mind about what he had foretold because the Ninevites used their free will to respond with repentance to the warning message that Jehovah had sent. The second example is the prophecy about a conqueror named Cyrus who would release the Jews from captivity and order the rebuilding of Jehovah's temple. King Cyrus of Persia fulfilled that prophecy. However, Jehovah Cyrus did not worship the true God. Jehovah used Cyrus to fulfill the prophecy without interfering with Cyrus' free will to choose whom he would worship. This is so bafflingly strange. So I'm going to make you my pawn, literally make you do something that I want so my will can be accomplished, but you're going to be doing my will with your own free will. So I'm going to force you to do it, but you still have the free will to choose who you're going to worship, even though it literally just said he doesn't force people to do something. What? Who wrote this? Like, who? What? You have to, like, have had severe brain, a severe brain injury to write this and think that it makes any kind of sense. Holy Moses. This is weird. Let's screenshot this. This is so strange. Okay, of course, these are not all the factors involved in Jehovah's use of foreknowledge. Realistically, no human can fully understand Jehovah's ways. But <laughs> yet, what Jehovah has revealed strengthens our faith that he always has does what is right, including what he foretells in the future. Why does the Bible repeat itself? The Bible writers occasionally repeated the same phrases word for word. Consider three factors that might have influenced writers to do so. The time period when it was written. In ancient Israel, most people did not have personal copies of the law. They primarily heard the law read when the nation gathered together at the tabernacle. Very likely, these were there were distractions as they listened and stood for hours in the large crowd. Who would ever listen to them read the law for hours? On such occasions, repeating key phrases would have made it easier for people to remember the scriptures and apply them. Repeating certain words would have especially helped them to remember details, such as God's regulations and judicial decisions. The type of writing. About 10% of the Bible is composed of songs, including the book of Psalms, Song of Solomon, and Lamentations. Sometimes songs contain a refrain which unified the composition and helped the listeners to memorize the words. For example, note the words found at Psalms 115, 9 through 11. O Israel, trust in Jehovah, he is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in Jehovah, he is their help and their shield. O you who fear Jehovah, trust in Jehovah, he is their help and their shield. Bum, ba, dum. Can you see how repeating these words would have helped them sound down precious truths into the mind and the heart of the singers? Nope. Bible writers sometimes repeated crucial phrases. For example, when Jehovah instructed the Israelites not to eat blood, he had Moses repeat the reason multiple times. God wanted to emphasize that the life of the flesh is in the blood, that is, blood represents life. Later, when the apostles and the elders in Jerusalem listed the essential ways to avoid displeasing God, they emphasized again the need to abstain from blood. Jehovah did not intend for the repeating of scriptural phrases to become a ritual. For instance, Jesus said, when praying, do not say the same things over and over again. He then went on to provide us with the appropriate subjects for prayer that are in harmony with God's will. So while we avoid repeating the same words over and over again in our prayers, we are free to return to the same topics again and again. For good reason, God's inspired word repeats certain words and phrases. It is one of the many ways our grand instructor teaches us to benefit ourselves. March 2024. Study Article 9. Are you ready to dedicate yourself to Jehovah? During the past five years, more than a million people have been baptized as Jehovah's Witnesses. Many of these, like the first century disciple Timothy, were taught the truth from infancy. I don't know why I said that like that. Others learned about Jehovah as adults, some later in life, but not many. A while back, a woman who studied the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses got baptized at the age of 97. If you are a Bible student or if you are being raised by parents or Jehovah's Witnesses, are you thinking about getting baptized? This is commendable. This is a commendable goal. Before getting baptized, though, you will need to dedicate yourself to Jehovah. 
This article will explain what dedication involves. It will also help you to see why there is no reason to hold back from taking that step, along with baptism, when you are ready to do so. In the Bible, dedication signifies a setting apart for a sacred purpose. The Israelites were a nation dedicated to Jehovah, but some individuals in the nation were dedicated to Jehovah in a special way. For example, Aaron wore a holy sign of dedication, a shining gold plate on the front of his turban. That gold plate indicated that he was set apart to serve in a special capacity as Israel's high priest. The Nazarites, too, were dedicated to Jehovah in a special way. The word Nazarite, which comes from the Hebrew word Nazir, means separated one or dedicated one. Nazarites were to live by the restrictions that were set out from them in the Mosaic Law. Got a picture here. Jehovah's Witness, do you view Jehovah's Standards like the bars of a prison that keep you from doing what you want to, or like the bars of a lion cage that protect you from danger? Did you guys see that video of that woman who was like, I really want to go pet the lion? And the fence on it was just easily circumnavigatable, so she went and at a zoo and went on the other side, and she was petting a lion, and it, it was crazy. Anyway, when you dedicate yourself to Jehovah, you choose to become a disciple of Jesus Christ and make the doing of God's will the most important thing in your life. What will Christian dedication require of you? Jesus said, If anyone wants to come after me, let him disown himself. The Greek phrase translated, let him disown himself, can also be rendered, he must now, he, whoa, there's a, I put one down for the Mitch McConnell moment. <laughs> Maybe I should have a Joe Biden and a Mitch McConnell where I just start like scatting all over the place and then one where my brain shuts down. Maybe what we should do, a sleepy Joe. That was more of a sleepy Joe. Sleepy Joe. Boom, that'll be one. The Greek phrase translated, let him disown himself, can also be rendered, he must say no to himself. As a dedicated servant of Jehovah, you will need to say no to anything that conflicts with his will. That includes saying no to the works of the flesh, such as sexual immorality. Will such restrictions make your life difficult? Yes. Not if you love Jehovah and are convinced that his laws are good for your, or for your own good. A brother named Nicholas put it this way, you can view Jehovah's standards like the bars of a prison that keep you from doing what you want to do, or like the bars of a lion cage that protect you from the danger. How do you dedicate yourself to Jehovah? You promise him in prayer that you will worship only him, and that you will put his will first in your life. Really, you are promising Jehovah that you will continue to love him with your whole heart, with your whole soul, and with your whole mind, and with your whole strength. Your dedication is made in private between you and Jehovah. In contrast, baptism is public. It shows onlookers that you have made a dedication. Your dedication is a sacred vow that Jehovah expects you to live up to, just as you expect that of yourself. It's funny because when people go through this process, you'd be shocked at how many people don't even know the the dedication part. They're like, because you go over those in the baptism questions with the elders, and people will be, they the elders will ask you, and like, so did you dedicate yourself to Jehovah? And you're like, what the heck does that even mean? <laughs> so people don't even like people literally don't even know what they're getting themselves into i, I didn't i was like uh yes what, what, what the heck does that even mean the main reason you dedicate yourself to jehovah is that you love him your love is not based on emotion alone rather it is rooted in accurate knowledge and spiritual comprehension clearly <laughs> the things that you learned about jehovah that caused you your love for him to grow your study of the scriptures has convinced you, one, that Jehovah is real, two, the Bible is his inspired word, and three, that he uses his organization to accomplish his will. Those who dedicate themselves to Jehovah should know the basic teachings found in God's word and be living in harmony with its standards. They share their faith with others to the extent that their circumstances allow. Their love for Jehovah has grown and their heartfelt desire is to give him exclusive devotion. Is that not so of you? Having this kind of love, you will not view dedication and baptism as something you do just because you want to please your Bible teacher or your parent. You, nor do you view it as something you do to fit in with your friends. It's funny how they tell people all of the reasons that they're not doing it when those are the reasons that most people are doing it. The decision to dedicate yourself to Jehovah is only natural when you think of all that he has done for you. The Bible rightly calls Jehovah the giver of every good gift and perfect present. 
the greatest gift of those is the the greatest gift is the greatest of those gifts is the sacrifice of his son Jesus. Just think, the ransom has made it possible for you to have a close relationship with Jehovah, and he has given you the prospect of living forever. Dedicating yourself to Jehovah is a way to show your appreciation for the greatest expression of love ever made, along with all the other blessings Jehovah has given you. Such appreciation is highlighted in Lesson 46.4 of the Enjoy Life Forever book, which includes the three-minute video, Presenting Your Gifts to God. You may feel that you are not ready for dedication and baptism. Perhaps you still need to make changes in your life to conform to Jehovah's standards, or perhaps you need more time to strengthen your faith. Not all students progress at the same pace, and not all young ones are ready for dedication and baptism at the same age. Try to evaluate your spiritual progress according to what you are able to do, and not in comparison with someone else. Even if you realize that you are not ready to dedicate yourself to Jehovah, keep that step before you as a goal. Pray for Jehovah's blessing for your efforts to make whatever changes are necessary. You can be certain that, you, that he will hear your prayer and respond. Some who are ready for dedication and baptism still hold back. They may wonder, what if outward what if outward I commit a serious oh, outward? What if afterward I commit a serious sin and get disfellowshipped? If you have that fear, be assured that Jehovah will give you everything you need to walk worthily of him in order to please him fully. He will also give you the strength to do what is right. He has also proved that he can do that by how he has dealt with many others. That is one reason why relatively few people are expelled from the Christian congregation. Jehovah equips his people to remain faithful. Um, relatively few. I mean, I guess maybe that's the case. I don't know. I feel like most people go through at least a judicial committee. And it might be a roll of the dice if you get treated nicely or not nicely. I don't know about relatively few people, though. Eh, that seems like a bit of a stretch. I mean, relatively, what if half, peop, half the people have been reproved or disfellowshipped or flat out leave, which I reckon is the case, then you can't say relatively few people are expelled from the congregation. I just, yeah, I don't buy it. Every imperfect human is tempted to do wrong things. However, whether you act on temptation is a choice, your choice. The fact is that ultimately you are the one who is in control of how you will live. Some may, some people may make claims to the contrary. You can learn to control your impulses. Oh wait, sorry. Though some may claim, make claims to the contrary, you can learn to control your impulses. And even if some improper impulses surface, you can refrain from acting on them. To that end, pray every day and pray the gay away. Maintain a good routine of personal study of God's word. Attend Christian meetings. Share your faith with others. Take these steps consistently. Taking these steps consistently will give you the strength to live up to your dedication vow. And never forget that Jehovah will help you to do so. For those being raised in the truth, young ones who are being raised in the truth by parents who are serving God will be greatly helped by the three-part series on JW.org entitled... Young people ask, why I shouldn't get baptized? You can find additional valuable information in two study articles in the March 2016 issue of the Watchtower. The articles are, Young Ones, Are You Ready to Get Baptized? And Young Ones, How Can You Prepare for Baptism? You will enjoy the lasting benefits by making time to examine and to think deeply about these the, the material in those articles. You will find it easier to live up to your dedication if you decide beforehand that you will what you will do if you face with temptation. The Bible tells us of a number of people who evidently did that, even though they were, they too were imperfect humans. For example, Potiphar's wife repeatedly tried to seduce Joseph, but he did not have any doubts about the stand he would take. The Bible tells us that he refused, and he stated, How could I commit this great badness and actually sin against God? Clearly, Joseph ha knew how... Clearly, Joseph knew how he would react before she tried to tempt him. That made it easier for him when he was actually faced with temptation. What if Joseph was gay? And we've been just reading the story wrong the whole time. Alternate universe. How can you show a similar resolve to that of Joseph? You can decide now that you will what you will do if a temptation arises. 
Learn to say no immediately to things that Jehovah hates, even refusing to dwell on them. That way, you will not waver when tempted. You will already know how you will respond. You will already have settled on your course. So, brainwashing. In your case, you may know that you have found the truth and that you want to serve Jehovah with all your heart, but something still holds you back from dedication and baptism. You can take heart. The example of King David. You can beg Jehovah, search through me, O God, and you know my heart. Examine me and know my anxious thoughts. See whether there is in me any harmful way and lead me in the way of eternity. Jehovah blesses those who are earnestly seeking him. Your working toward the goal of dedication and baptism shows him you are doing just that. Jesus said that his disciples are drawn by Jehovah. Consider what a profound thought that is and how it applies to you. Jehovah sees good in each person he draws to himself. He views the individual as his special property or treasured possession. That is true in your case too. It may be, though, that you are a young person who is being raised in the truth. You might feel that you are simply being carried or towed along. Nevertheless, the Bible says, draw close to God and he will draw close to you. When you take the initiative to draw close to Jehovah, he responds by drawing close to you. Jehovah does not view you as being part of a group. He draws each individual, including each individual who is being raised in the truth. When such a person takes the initiative to draw close to Jehovah, he responds, as we noted in James 4, 8. If that's really the case, and he doesn't view people as a group, then why is it that 90% of Jehovah's current Jehovah's Witnesses were raised in the truth? Why would that be, the, by a wide factor, the biggest uh, reason that someone, or, or the big, biggest historical reason someone is a Jehovah's Witness is that their parents are a Jehovah's Witness? If it's 90%, can you really be saying he's just drawing some random person from Sri Lanka and some random person from Iraq and some random person from Brazil and from Kentucky? Uh, that seems like a bunch of hogwash. When you dedicate yourself to Jehovah and get baptized, you reflect the attitude of Jesus. He willingly presented himself to his father to do whatever was asked of him. In the next article, we will discuss what will help you to keep serving Jehovah faithfully after your baptism. Article 10. It is a joy to get baptized and become part of Jehovah's family. Those who are in that privileged position would agree with the words of the psalmist David who said, Happy is the one whom you, Jehovah, chooses, chose, and bring it near to reside in your courtyards. Jehovah does not bring just anyone into his courtyards. As discussed in the preceding article, he chooses to draw close to those who prove that they want to have a close relationship with him. When you dedicate yourself to Jehovah and get baptized, you draw closer to Jehovah in a special way. You can be sure that thereafter he will pour out or he will pour on out on you a blessing until there is nothing lacking. Baptism, of course, is just the beginning. After you take the, that step, you will want to do your best to live up to your dedication vow, even in the face of temptations or tests of faith. As a disciple of Jesus, you will follow Jesus' example and commands as closely as possible. This article will help you to do that. Man, it's just that easy. All we have to do is read this article. Boys and girls, sports fans, ladies and gentlemen. <coughs> it's just that simple. After baptism, your life will not be problem-free. In fact, Jesus made it clear that his disciples would carry a torture stake. <laughs> Actually... They would do so day after day. Was Jesus saying that his followers would always be suffering? Not at all. He was simply emphasizing that in addition to the blessings they would experience, they would face challenges. Some of these challenges might even be painful. Perhaps you have already faced opposition from family members, or perhaps you have sacrificed certain material pursuits to put kingdom interests first. If so, you can be certain that Jehovah has noticed your faithful works. Likely, you have experienced the truthfulness of Jesus' words. No one has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for the sake of my name, for the sake of the good news, who will not get a hundred times more now in this period of time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields, with persecutions and in the coming system of things, everlasting life. 
The blessings that you have received are truly greater than any sacrifices that you have made. You will still need to fight the desire of the flesh after baptism. After all, you will stand, you will still be a sinful descendant of Adam. At times, your feelings might be similar to those of the Apostle Paul. He wrote, I really delight in the law of God according to the man I am within. But I see in my body another law warring against the law of my mind and leading me captive to sin's law that is in my body. You may feel discouraged by your sinful tendencies. However, thinking about the promise you made to Jehovah when you dedicated yourself to him will strengthen your resolve to fight against temptation. The reality is that when you face temptations, your dedication vow will simplify your life. How? When you make a dedication to Jehovah, you disown yourself. This means that you say no to personal desires and ambitions that would displease Jehovah. So when you face a test, you will not need to spend time debating what to do. You will have already shut the door on all ec- all options except one, faithfulness to Jehovah. You will remain firmly resolved to please Jehovah. You will, in the sense, be like Job. Even though he faced extreme difficult trials, he resolutely stated, I will not renounce my faith. I feel like this article is is like an actual like mind washing brainwashing like exercise okay everyone chant along with us you will not be tempted you will stand for jehovah you will not waver say it with me by reflecting on your prayer of dedication to jehovah you will find the strength to resist any temptation for example would you start flirting with another person's mate certainly not you will have already said no to that You will thus spare yourself the anguish of having to deal with improper feelings after they have taken root. You will turn away from the path of the wicked. A picture here of some lady who's doing some electrical work. She's preaching to someone who's gardening and she is going to pioneer school. Super exciting stuff. (laughs) What if you are offered employment that will interfere with your regular attendance at Christian meetings? Your reaction is not in doubt. Long before the offer was made, you already said no to such a job proposal. Thus, you will not need to figure out whether you can make a bad decision succeed. Recalling Jehovah Jesus' determination to please his Father, you will quickly and firmly reject anything that you know would displease the God to whom you are dedicated. The fact is that trials and temptations give an opportunity to show that you are determined to keep following Jesus. As you do, you can be assured that Jehovah will help you. The Bible says God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but along with the temptation, he will also make the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Jesus was zealous and he remained close to Jehovah in prayer. In fact, one of the best ways for you to keep following Jesus after your baptism is to develop a pattern of doing things that will draw close you closer to Jehovah. The Bible says, To the extent we have made progress, let us go walking orderly in the same course. From time to time, you will hear the experiences of brothers and sisters who have reached out to expand their sacred service. Perhaps they attended the School for Kingdom Evangelizers or moved to where there is a greater need. If you can set such a goal, by all means do so. Jehovah's people are eager to expand their ministry. What though, if right now you are unable to do that? Womp womp. Do not think that you are inferior to those who can. The Christian race is one of endurance. Do not underestimate the value of serving Jehovah according to your abilities and circumstances. That is an important way that you can keep following Jesus after baptism. Well, I suppose I guess I'm in the clear because I am just following, you know, my Christian responsibilities to the to the best of my ability and my circumstances. I happen to have the circumstances of a functional brain, and uh, I have the ability to think for myself. So, I guess I'm on par. Well, this whole brainwashing thing isn't even working on me. I can do this all day. What if, for a time, you feel that your prayers have become mechanical, or that your we should do this in uh, Al Gore. What if, for a time, you feel your prayers have become mechanical, or that your ministry is in a rut? What if your Bible reading does not seem as rewarding as it did in the past? If such situations develop after your baptism, 
do not conclude that you have lost Jehovah's Spirit. You are an imperfect human, and your feelings can fluctuate. If your zeal starts to diminish, reflect on the example of the Apostle Paul. Although he tried to imitate Jesus, he knew that at times he might not feel as motivated as at other times. He said, Even if I do it against my will, I still have a stewardship entrusted to me. In other words, Paul was determined to accomplish his ministry despite how he might feel at the moment. Similarly, do not let your imperfect feelings make your decisions for you. Resolve that you will do the right thing despite how you feel. Your actions should in time affect your feelings for the better. At any rate, maintaining a good spiritual routine will help you keep following Jesus after baptism. Your consistency will also be an encouragement to your fellow believers. Yippee! It is also it will also be of help to you if after baptism you examine yourself regularly. From time to time take a close look at your life and habits and see if you are praying daily, reading and studying the Bible, attending meetings and participating in the ministry. Try to find ways to make these aspects of your worship even more meaningful. For example, ask yourself such questions as can I explain basic Bible teachings to others? Are there ways that I can make my ministry more enjoyable? How specific are my prayers? And do they show that I completely rely on Jehovah? Do I attend Christian meetings? How can I improve my concentration and participation at meetings? You would also do well to examine yourself honestly regarding your weaknesses. A brother named Robert relates an experience that illustrates the point. When I was about 20 years old, I had a part-time job. One day after work, a co-worker invited me to her home. She said we'd be alone and we'd have a good time. At first, I gave a few weak excuses, but I finally said no and explained why. Robert resisted the temptation, and that is commendable. Later, though, he looked back on the incident and saw that he could have handled the situation better. What could have Robert possibly done better? <laughs> you offer some weak excuses so it's not awkward, and then you're like, yeah, I'm just actually going to go home. It seems like, <laughs> where are they going with this? He admits, I didn't reject the offer as firmly or as quickly as Joseph resisted Potiphar's wife. In fact, I was surprised at how difficult it was for me to refuse. This incident helped me to see that I needed to strengthen my friendship with Jehovah. Golly gee willikers, what a sad life. You may benefit from making a self-examination similar to what Robert made. Even when you succeed in resisting temptation, ask yourself, how long did it take me to say no? If you see room for improvement, do not condemn yourself. <laughs> Hey, do this mental exercise where you're literally going to be condemning yourself, even if you're doing the right thing. And then immediately remind yourself, hey, don't condemn yourself, though. <laughs> be glad that you are now aware of this weakness. Make it a matter of prayer and take steps to strengthen your determination to live by Jehovah's moral standards. There is more to Robert's experience. He continues, after I refused my co-worker's invitation, she said, you passed the test. I asked her what she meant. She explained that a friend of hers, a former witness, had told her that all young witnesses lead a double life and they would jump at the opportunity to compromise. So she told her friend that she, should, she would test that out with me. I realized then how glad I was that I had honored Jehovah's name. This story is so cooked up. Okay, so if, if you didn't really know the person whatsoever, it's like, hey, do you want to come back to my house and jump into bed? <laughs> Yep, that was a good test, because that's exactly what everyone would do. They wouldn't be like, uh, I don't know who you are, lady, get away from me. That was one of the dumbest stories. Oh my god, maybe we should screenshot that one. That one, does, uh... that one seems like it has classic potential. An El Clasico. Uh, boom, I think we're done with that article. Uh, you can persevere despite disappointment. Study Article 11. We are truly blessed to be part of Jehovah's organization during these turbulent last days. As world conditions deteriorate, Jehovah provides us with a united spiritual family of brothers and sisters. He helps us to have strong family bonds, and he gives us the insight and wisdom we need to have true inner peace. 
We must, however, work hard to keep serving Jehovah faithfully. Why? Because we may at times be offended by the imperfections of others. We may also find it difficult to put up with our own shortcomings, especially if we make the same mistakes time and again. We need to persevere in Jehovah's service. One, when a fellow believer offends us. Two, when our spouse disappoints us. And three, when we are disappointed with ourselves. In this article, we will consider each of these situations. We will also consider what we can learn from a faithful Bible character. The challenge. Some fellow believers have personality traits that irritate us. Others may let us, may let us down or treat us in a thoughtless or unkind way. Those taking the lead can make mistakes. These realities could cause some to doubt that this is God's organization. Rather than continue serving God shoulder to shoulder with brothers and sisters, they may stop associating with those who have offended them or even stop going to meetings. Is that wise? Consider what we can learn from a Bible character who experienced similar problems. The Apostle Paul knew that his Christian brothers and sisters were imperfect. For example, he was misjudged soon after he started to associate with the congregation. Later, some spoke about him behind his back to damage his reputation. Paul saw a responsible brother make a wrong decision that may have stumbled others. It feels like so in my face. It was like slightly more comfortable, I guess. And one of Paul's close companions, Mark, greatly disappointed him. Paul could have allowed any one of these situations to cause him to refuse to associate with the offenders. Actually, I should check if the mic is humming though, because if I move it. Yet he maintained a positive view of his brothers and sisters and remained active in Jehovah's service. What helped Paul to persevere? Paul loved his brothers and sisters. Paul's love for others helped him to focus not on their imperfections, but on their fine qualities. Love also helped Paul to do what he himself wrote as recorded at Colossians 3, 13, and 14. Consider how this proved true regarding Mark. Although Mark abandoned Paul during his first missionary journey, Paul did not remain upset. Later, when Paul wrote a warm letter to the congregation in Colossae, he praised Mark as a valued co-worker, a source of great comfort. While imprisoned in Rome, Paul specifically requested that Mark come to him. Clearly, Paul did not give up on his brothers. What can we learn from Paul? Jehovah wants us to persevere in showing love to our brothers and sisters. If someone fails to show tr some Christian quality, we can assume that he wants to follow doop, Bible principles and that he simply acted thoughtlessly. God loves his faithful servants despite their shortcomings. He does not cut us off when we make mistakes, nor does he stay resentful. How important it is for us to imitate our forgiving father. Remember, too, that as the end draws near, we need to remain close to our brothers and sisters. We can expect persecution to intensify. We may even find ourselves in prison for our faith. If that happens, we will need our brothers and sisters more than ever. Consider what happened to Joseph, in an elder in Spain. He and other brothers were in prison together for their neutrality. He says, in prison, the risk of becoming irritated with a fellow believer was high because we had no privacy. We had to put up with one another and forgive one another freely. This helped us stay united and protected. We were surrounded by inmates who did not serve Jehovah. On one occasion I was injured and my arm was in a cast, so I was not able to do things for myself. But one of my brothers washed my clothes and cared for me in other practical ways. I experienced sincere love when I needed it most. What good reasons we have to resolve problems with one another now. All marriages have difficulties. The Bible frankly acknowledges the married people will have tribulation in their flesh. Why? Because marriage brings two imperfect people together, each with different characteristics, likes, and dislikes. Mates may, mates may come from different cultures or backgrounds. They may, in time, display traits that were not too noticeable before the wedding. Any of those things can cause friction. Instead of recognizing that each has a part in the problem and therefore should work to resolve it, they may blame their mate. They may even come to see separation or divorce as a solution. But is giving up on the marriage the answer? I guess we'll read one of these footnotes. God's word discourages separation and makes clear that separation does not give either mate the right to remarry. 
However, there are serious situations in which some Christians have considered separation. Uh, see and note in the Enjoy Life Forever book. Blah, blah, blah. Let us learn from a Bible character who persevered in extremely difficult marriage. Abigail was married to Nabal, who the Bible says was harsh and behaved badly. It must have been difficult for Abigail to live with such a man. Could Abigail have found an easy way out of her marriage? She was given the opportunity when David, Israel's future king, came to kill her husband for insulting him and his men. Oh, that David, you little rascal, just murdering people for insults. Abigail could have fled, allowing David to carry out his plan. Yet she intervened and convinced David to let Nabal live. What could have motivated her? Abigail loved Jehovah and respected his standards for marriage. Okay, no doubt she was aware of what God said to Adam and Eve when he performed the first marriage. Abigail knew that Jehovah viewed marriage as a sacred arrangement. She wanted to please God, and that would have motivated her to do whatever she could to save her household, including her husband. She acted quickly to prevent David from murdering Nabal. She was also willing to apologize for a wrong that she did not commit. Clearly, Jehovah loved this brave, unselfish woman. Can wives and husbands learn from Abigail's example? I like how they have this entire section and not a single, like, scripture. Like, this is just insane o style. Jehovah directs that married people respect the marriage arrangement even if their mate is difficult to live with. Oh, what do we got up here? Oh, this guy has a goatee. Yeah, we're still in the arc of uh, if you have facial hair, that's not just a mustache, then you must not be a, a good little Jehovah's Witness. Because I don't think they, had, they hadn't had the new light quite yet. Or if they did, then it was still... Um, the pictures and everything wouldn't have represented that quite yet. That's kind of funny. Jehovah directs that married people respect the marriage arrangement even if their mate is difficult to live with. How pleased God must be when he sees married people working hard to resolve problems and to show each other unselfish love and respect. Consider the example of Carmen. About six years after getting married, Carmen began to studying with Jehovah's Witnesses and later got baptized. My husband did not take it well, says Carmen. He became jealous of Jehovah. <laughs> Yeah, that's what was happening. He would insult me and threaten to leave me. Even so, Carmen persevered in her marriage. For 50 years, she worked hard to have a marriage based on love and respect. As the years went by, I learned to be more discerning and to speak tactfully to my husband. Knowing that marriage is sacred in Jehovah's eyes, I did everything in my power to safeguard it. I never gave up on my marriage because I love Jehovah. If difficulties arise in your marriage, you can trust that Jehovah will support you and preserve you. Oh. We may feel like giving up on ourselves if we commit a serious sin. The Bible acknowledges that our sins can leave us feeling broken. One brother named Robert had worked hard for years to qualify as a ministerial servant. However, he committed a serious sin that made him realize that he had betrayed Jehovah. My conscience came down on me like a ton of bricks, he said. Afterward, I felt sick to my stomach. I sobbed and prayed to Jehovah. I remember thinking that God would never again bother to listen to me. Why would he? I had to let him down. Wait, I, ha I had let him down. <laughs> if we succumb to sin, we may feel like giving up on ourselves because our crushed heart believes that Jehovah has given up on us. If you felt this way, consider a faithful Bible character who persevered in serving Jehovah despite committing a serious sin. The Bible example of the night before Jesus' execution, the Apostle Peter made a serious mistake that led to the worst failure of his life. First Peter displayed overconfidence, boasting that he would prove faithful even if the other apostles abandoned Jesus. Next, while in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter repeatedly failed to make to keep on the watch. Then Peter abandoned Jesus to a mob. Finally, Peter denied knowing Jesus three times, even swearing to this lie with an oath. How did Peter react when he realized the gravity of his sin? He broke down and wept bitterly, because feeling dev perhaps feeling devastated by guilt. Just imagine Peter's anguish when hours later his friend Jesus was executed. How unworthy Peter must have felt. 
Peter was able to persevere in serving Jehovah for several reasons. He did not isolate himself. He went to his spiritual brothers and no doubt was comforted by them. In addition, the resurrected Jesus appeared to, oh, I had a voice crack there, appeared, uh, likely to encourage him. Later, instead of rebuking Peter for his failings, Jesus told his friend that he would receive greater responsibilities. Peter knew that he had sinned gravely, but he did not give up on himself. Why? Because he was convinced that his master Jesus had not given up on him, and Peter's spiritual brothers continued to support him. What can we learn from Peter's example? Jehovah wants us to be convinced of his love. When we sin, we feel guilty. That is normal and appropriate. However, we must not think that we are unlovable or unforgivable. Instead, we should immediately get help. Robert, mentioned earlier, says, I fell into sin because I relied on my own strength to resist a temptation. He realized that he had to talk to the elders. He says, once I took that step, I immediately felt Jehovah's loving hand expressed through them. The elders did not give up on me. They helped me to believe that Jehovah had not abandoned me. You too can be convinced that Jehovah loves us deeply and forgives us if we repent our sins, seek needed help, and earnestly try not to repeat our mistakes. That conviction prevents us from giving up on ourselves when we stumble or fall. Jehovah greatly appreciates our efforts to serve him during these difficult last days. With Jehovah's help, we can persevere despite disappointments. We can cultivate love for our brothers and sisters and forgive them even if they offend us. We can show the depth of our love for God and our respect for his arrangements by doing whatever we can to resolve problems that may arise in our marriage. And if we commit a sin, we seek Jehovah's help, accept his love and forgiveness moving forward in his service. We can be sure that he will reap, we will reap rich blessings if we do not give up in doing what is fine. Number 12. Avoid the darkness, remain in the light. I gotta be honest. My stomach is really starting to hurt. While he was under house arrest in Rome, the Apostle Paul wanted to encourage his fellow believers he could not visit them in person, so he wrote letters. He wrote one of these in 60 60 or 61 CE to the Ephesians. Almost ten years earlier, Paul had spent quite some time in Ephesus preaching and teaching the good news. He loved his brothers very much and wanted to help them to remain faithful to Jehovah. But why did he write to anointed Christians about darkness and light? And what lessons can Christians learn from this council? Let us consider the answers to these questions. Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians, You were once you were once darkness, but now you are light. They they changed these scriptures to just like it sounds weird now. Paul here used the metaphors of darkness and light to explain contrasting or opposing conditions. Let us consider why Paul could say the Ephesians were once darkness. Before learning the truth and becoming Christians, the Ephesians to whom Paul wrote were enslaved to false religious ideas and superstitions. The city of Ephesus was home to the famous temple of Artemis, which the ancients considered one of the seven wonders of the world. This is ter- taken like directly from the Bearing Thorough Witness uh, to the Good News book. The people who worshipped there were steeped in idolatry. The fabrication and sale of false religious shrines and the goddess of Artemis was a lucrative business. In addition, the city was well known for magical arts. Ephesus was famous for its gross immorality and brazen conduct. Obscene talk was commonly heard in the city's theater and even at religious festivals. Ugh. Many of its inhabitants were past all moral sense, an expression that literally means having ceased to feel pain. Before learning what was truly right or truly wrong, the Ephesians did not feel pangs of conscience or think that they had any accountability to Jehovah. Paul could thus describe them as being in darkness mentally and alienated from the life that belongs to God. Some of the Ephesians, though, did not remain in darkness. Paul wrote that they are now light in connection with the Lord. They had embraced the light of scriptural truth. These Ephesians had abandoned their false religious practices and immoral conduct. They had become imitators of God and were doing their best to worship Jehovah and to please him. In a similar way, before we
Before we learned the truth, we were in religious and moral darkness. Some of us celebrated false religious holidays. Other of us pursued an immoral lifestyle. But once we learned about Jehovah's standards of right and wrong, we made changes. We began to bring our life in harmony with his righteous requirements, and as a result, we have enjoyed many benefits. Now, though, we face ongoing challenges. We need to stay away from the darkness that we left behind and go on walking as children of the light. How can we do so? In order to stay far away from the moral darkness, the Ephesian Christians had to continue rejecting practices that displeased Jehovah. That included not only sexually immoral conduct, but also obscene talk. Paul reminded the Ephesians that they had to avoid such things if they were to have any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. We too must continue to fight against becoming entangled in the unfruitful works that belong to darkness. Time and again, experience has shown that the more a person looks at, listens to, or talks about unclean and moral things, the easier it will be for him to fall into wrongdoing. In one country, several dozen brothers became friends in an online chat group. Many of them started out in their chats talking about spiritual things. In the course of time, however, the chats became unwholesome. They began to revolve around sex. Several of these individuals later admitted that this unclean talk led them to commit sexual immorality. See, that is such a bizarre story. Like, hey, these guys had a Discord server where they were talking about spiritual truths, and then out of the blue, out of nowhere, they are going to just talk about sex. Then they did sex. <laughs> they just I think they just make stuff up. Satan's world tries to deceive us, to make us believe that Jehovah calls what Jehovah calls immoral and unclean is not wrong at all. This is no coincidence. One of the devil's long-used tactics is to confuse people so that they are unable to discern what is right and wrong. It is no wonder that many movies, television shows, and websites promote ideas that go against Jehovah's righteous standards. Satan is trying to deceive us into thinking that unclean practices and lifestyles are not only acceptable, but also enjoyable and harmless. Picture whoever's writing this, like, crying in their pain and suffering as their life is so boring. Satan wants us to associate with people who make it harder for us to stick to Jehovah's standards. Accordingly, Paul urged the Ephesians, Do not be shares with them, that is, with those who practice what is wrong in God's eyes. We need to remember that our association is not limited to those who spend time with in person. It includes those we interact with on social media, a danger that the ancient Ephesians were not exposed to. Why does that sentence need to be in there? Angela, who lives in Asia, found out how dangerous social media can be. She admits, it can be a trap, subtly numbing our senses. I reached the point where it did not bother me to have friends who did not respect Bible principles. Eventually, I started to think it was okay to pursue a lifestyle that displeased Jehovah. Thankfully, loving elders helped Angela to make needed changes. She says, now I fill my mind with spiritual things rather than with social media. Yeah, as someone that doesn't really uh, think social media is like the greatest idea ever, just, just, just in general, I don't know how just healthy it is for people's minds. Like, I get what they're saying, but it discards all of the benefits uh, of it and actual useful applications of it and like providing people with community is is super important if i live in the middle of nowhere in montana and i like renaissance art or something and there's not a place where or people around me that i can talk about renaissance art with you know i can get on social media and you know join other people to have things to talk about like there are a lot so many i mean xjw community a perfect example of you know people that have things in common and stuff to talk about but i think for Jehovah's Witnesses specifically, it seems like it would just be hell. Like, any social media would be, A, you're sharing your ideas, which Watchtower doesn't want you talking about your ideas or to have opinions. Uh, you know, you're sharing your dice, likes and dislikes of, like, entertainment things. Uh, basically, Watchtower wants you to be a drone, and when you talk to people, especially that aren't drones, and you can flesh out ideas on your own it kind of snowballs so i see why they're so like hyper 
focused on it. But I feel like they're focusing on the negatives of social media in the wrong ways, but they do everything wrong. So I'm just talking to myself at this point. I don't even know where that came from. Yikes. Winston, will you listen to me? Hi, buddy. We must fight against the world's thinking that immoral conduct is acceptable. We know better. We do well to ask ourselves, do I make it a point to avoid all unnecessary association with workmates, classmates, or others who do not respect Jehovah's standards? Do I courageously uphold Jehovah's standards, even though some may call me intolerant for doing so? As indicated at 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 22, it's a lot of twos, we may also need to be careful when choosing our close associates within the Christian congregation. We bear in mind that some may not help us to remain faithful in our service to Jehovah. And that's the tough thing, though, is like it's so isolating. Like You can't be friends with people on the outside. You have to have limited contact. You can't get and talk to people uh, even within the congregation. It, it's just such an isolating existence that it doesn't allow people the opportunity to challenge their beliefs in any meaningful ways. And if you cannot challenge your beliefs, then you are hindering a child's development. You are hindering their ability to function in the new in, in the world. You are it is a form of abuse in my opinion, like it just is. You're just locking them in a closet, maybe not physically, but absolutely mentally and by their rules. And that person is just going to struggle. Yeah, anyway. Paul encouraged the Ephesian Christians not only to continue rejecting the darkness, but also to go walking as children of the light. What does that mean? Simply put, it means to conduct ourselves as true Christians at all times. One way to achieve this goal is by diligently reading and studying the Bible along with our Bible-based publications. It is especially important to pay close attention to the example and teachings of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. We also need to help we also need the help of Jehovah's Holy Spirit so that we can keep conducting ourselves as children of the light. Why? Because it is a definite challenge to remain clean in this immoral world. Holy Spirit can help us to combat the thinking of the world, including its philosophies and viewpoints that conflict with God's thinking. Holy Spirit can help us, also help us to reduce every sort of goodness and righteousness. One way to receive Holy Spirit is by praying for it. Jesus said that Jehovah will give Holy Spirit to those asking him. And when we praise Jehovah together at Christian meetings, we also receive Holy Spirit. The wholesome influence of God's Holy Spirit will help us to live in a way that pleases God. When we have important decisions to make, we need to perceive what the will of Jehovah is and then act in harmony with it. By identifying Bible principles that apply to our situation, we are actually seeking God's thinking on the matter. Then, as we apply his principles, we will more likely make good decisions. Also, Paul also counseled the Ephesian Christians to use their time wisely. The wicked one, our enemy Satan, would like to keep us busy with the world pursuits that we have no time for our service to God. It's also like the exact opposite. Like, you can keep your time so busy with <laughs> Jehovah's Witness activities that you don't have any time for anything else that might challenge those beliefs. It would all be too easy for a Christian to put material possessions, secular education, or his career ahead of opportunities to work for Watchtower for free. Were that to happen, it would indicate that it is being affected, that he is being affected by the world's thinking. Of course, these things are not wrong in themselves, but they should never take first place in our life. To walk as children of light, we need to be making the best use of our time, focusing on what is truly important. Be alert to any opportunities to serve Jehovah more fully. This is what Donald, who lives in South Africa, did. Cool, Donald, what did you have to say? I looked at my situation and supplicated Jehovah to help me be more productive in the ministry. I prayed for work that would allow me to have more time for preaching. With Jehovah's help, I find it. I did find appropriate work. My wife and I then started our journey of full-time service together. Paul's letter to the Ephesians must really have helped them in their Christian course, and that inspired counsel can help us too. As noted, it can aid us in choosing our entertainment and our associates wisely, can motivate us to continue immersing ourselves in the truth, the light of truth, by having a consistent program of Bible study, and it emphasizes the importance of holy 
spirit, which can produce fine qualities in us. Applying what Paul wrote can help us make wise decisions that are in harmony with Jehovah's thinking. By doing these things, we'll be able to avoid the darkness of this world and remain in the light. Amen, brother. How reassuring it is to know that Jehovah approves of his people as a group. The Bible says Jehovah takes pleasure in his people. At times, however, some get discouraged that they may wonder, does Jehovah approve of me personally? A number of Jehovah's faithful worshippers in Bible times had moments when they struggled with such thoughts. The Bible clearly shows that imperfect humans can gain Jehovah's approval or goodwill. How? We must exercise faith in Jesus Christ and get baptized. We thus demonstrate publicly that we have repented of our sins and made a promise to God to do his will. Jehovah is delighted when we take these steps to cultivate a relationship with him. As long as we continue to do our best to live up to our dedication vow, Jehovah approves of us and considers us his close friends. Why, though, might some at times feel that God does not approve of them? How does Jehovah express his approval, and how can a Christian strengthen his confidence that Jehovah does have God's approval? That a Christian, that he... Yeah, I butchered that one. A number of us have battled feelings of low self-worth since childhood. A brother named Adrian says, I have always felt worthless. Some of my earliest memories are praying that my family would make it into paradise, although I was sure I was not good enough to be there. Tony, who did not grow up in a Christian home, maybe it's Tony Morris, says, My parents never told me that they loved me or were proud of me. The message was that I could always do better. If we at times struggle with feelings of worthlessness, we can remember that in his own way Jehovah drew us to him. He sees the good in us that we may not see in ourselves, and he knows our heart. So we can trust him when he says that we are precious. Before learning the truth, some of us did things that may still fill us with guilt. Even uh, faithful Christians battle against sinful inclinations. Does your heart condemn you? If so, take comfort in knowing that Jehovah's servants, that faithful servants of Jehovah have struggled with similar feelings. For example, the Apostle Paul felt miserable when reflecting on his imperfections. Of course, Paul had repented of his sins and gotten baptized. Still, he referred to himself as the least of the apostles and the foremost sinner. Our Heavenly Father promises to forgive us if we are repentant. So, if we are truly sorry for the sins we have committed, we can take Jehovah at his word, he has forgiven us. We all want to serve Jehovah as faithfully as possible, fully as possible. However, some feel that they can never do enough to gain his approval. A sister named Amanda says, I tend to equate giving Jehovah my best with a constant need to do more. I often expect more of myself than I can give. When I fail, I assume that Jehovah is as disappointed with me as I am with myself. Well, Amanda, he is. How can we overcome the feelings? That, can never, that we can never do enough to please Jehovah? Remember that Jehovah is not rigid or inflexible. Huh? He never demands more of us than we can reasonably do. Huh? He appreciates whatever we do for him as long as we ab are doing our best. It's funny, whenever they make those sweeping assertions, it's never backed up by a scripture. It's really convenient how, like, the ways that they just plop scriptures in there. Also reflect on Bible examples of those who have served Jehovah whole-souled. Think of Paul. He exerted himself zealously for years, traveling thousands of miles and establishing many congregations. Yet, when circumstances limited his share in the preaching work, did he lose God's approval? No, he continued to do what he could, and, bless, and Jehovah blessed him. Similarly, what we can give to Jehovah may vary at times, but what matters to him is why we do it. Let us now consider some of the ways Jehovah expresses his approval of us. Through the Bible. Jehovah loves to... Oh, we got a picture. Uh, this guy looks like... He's sick and his kid is reading the scripture to him. I don't know. This lady just reading the... These pictures are like really mundane. The ones that aren't AI generated are just like, what is... I feel like there was a time when they tried to really teach some valuable lessons through their pictures but i just i can't see it i'm like I'm, I'm looking for it what what's what's the lesson here it just seemed really mundane anyway 
Jehovah loves to express warm approval for those whom he has affection. The scriptures report two occasions when he told Jesus that he was his beloved, approved son. Would you like to hear Jehovah reassure you of his approval? Jehovah does not speak to us audibly, but he speaks to us through the pages of his word. We can hear Jehovah's voice of approval when we read Jesus' words in the Gospels. Jesus perfectly reflected his father's personality, so when we read the that Jesus expressed his approval of his imperfect but faithful followers, we can picture Jehovah saying those words to us. Okay, so that's what that lady is doing. Jehovah is eager to help us, such as by providing for our material needs. At times, Jehovah may allow us to suffer hardships, as he did righteous Job. Trials do not mean that we have lost God's approval. Rather, they provide us with opportunities to prove the depth of our love for God and our trust in him. We will experience his loving care and support as he helps us to endure. Consider a brother in Asia named Dimitri. He lost his job and he could not find work for many months, so he decided to increase his share in the ministry, thus showing his trust in Jehovah. Months dragged on and he still could not find work. Then he experienced health problems to the point that he became bedridden. He began to doubt his worth as a husband and a father, and he wondered if he had lost Jehovah's approval. Then one evening, his daughter printed out a sheet of paper, the words found at Isaiah 30, 15, Your strength will be in keeping calm and showing trust. She brought it to his bedside and said, Daddy, when you feel bad, you can remember this scripture. Dimitri realized that, thanks to Jehovah, his family still had adequate food, clothing, and shelter. What I needed to do, he says, was stay calm and continue trusting my God. If you are facing a similar trial, you can trust Jehovah cares about you and will help you to endure. We've got a box here. It says, explore the nine-part series in the Watchtower to learn more about each aspect of the footage of God's spirit. That's a series from 2017 all the way to 2020. So, you could do that in your spare time, but... I am fairly confident that none of you will ever want to look at another Awake or Watchtower magazine ever again for the rest of your life, which is exactly what you should do. Jehovah uses our brothers and sisters to express his approval of us. For example, he may move others to speak encouraging words at the right time. A sister in Asia experienced the, this during a time of great stress. She had lost her job and had become seriously ill. Then her husband committed a serious sin and was removed as an elder. I could not figure out why this was happening, she said. I thought that perhaps I had done something wrong and I had lost Jehovah's approval. Our sister begged Jehovah to reassure her of his approval. How did he do so? She notes, the congreg every time in one of these stories, it's just, well, well, what happened? The elders, what happened? The elders, Jiminy Christmas, talked with me and assured me of Jehovah's love. Yippee. Later, she asked again asked Jehovah for help. That same day, I received a letter from a group of brothers and sisters in the congregation, she says. As I read their comforting words, I felt that Jehovah had heard me. Yes, Jehovah often expresses his approval through the kind words of others. It's done not often. Like, brother, Jehovah often expresses his approval? How else does he? How, how else does he, other than the words of the Bible or, or the expressions of other people? He only, in your guys' theology, expresses his words like that. This is hogwash. Jehovah also expresses his approval for us by using fellow believers to give us counsel <sighs> when we need it. For example, in the first century, Jehovah used the Apostle Paul to write 14 inspired letters to fellow believers. Those letters included firm but loving counsel. Why did Jehovah inspire Paul to include such counsel? Jehovah is a good father, and he disciplines his children whom he delights. So if we receive Bible-based counsel, we can see it as evidence that we have God's approval, not that we have lost it. What are other indications we have Jehovah's approval? Got ourselves another picture, another person in prison, another person uh, standing at a witnessing cart, and apparently if you drop some grapefruits, then someone's walking by and picks them up for you. That's how Jehovah is showing his approval of you. So just go to the grocery store or your local farmer's market, drop some grapefruits, 
if someone comes by to help you pick them up, you are approved by God. If not, sorry, you are shit out of luck. Jehovah gives his Holy Spirit to those whom he approves. We can ask ourselves, have I been able to display some aspect of the fruitage of God's Spirit in my life? Do you notice that you are more patient with others than you were before you came to know Jehovah? Actually, the more you learn to display the fruitage of God's Spirit, the more evident it will be to you that you have Jehovah's approval. See the box? Yeah, we already looked at that. Jehovah is pleased to entrust the good news to whom he approves of. Note how a sister named Jocelyn benefited from sharing the good news with others. One day, Jocelyn woke up feeling depressed. I feel as if I had nothing to give, she says. But I was pioneering, and it was my service day. So I said a prayer and went out in service. That morning, Jocelyn met Mary, a kind woman who accepted a Bible study. Some months later, Mary mentioned that she had been praying to God for help when Jocelyn knocked on the door. Oh my God, a brand new story we've never heard in a watchtower before. Reflecting on this experience, Jocelyn says, I felt as if Jehovah were telling me, I approve of you. Of course, not everyone will respond positively to our preaching work, but we can be sure that Jehovah is pleased when we try our best to share the good news. Jehovah applies the value of the ransom to those whom he approves, but what if our heart resists the idea that Jehovah approves of us even though we have faith in the ransom and are baptized? Remember, we can always trust our own feeling. We cannot always trust our own feelings, but we can trust Jehovah. He considers those who have faith in the ransom to be righteous in his eyes and promises to bless them. Meditating on the ransom helped Vicky. Hey, Vicky. One day, after thinking deeply about the ransom, she realized, Jehovah had been patient with me for so long, yet I was, in effect, saying to him, Your love is not great enough to reach me. Your son's sacrifice is not enough to cover me. Who the heck is Vicky, and why does anyone care? By, depend by meditating on the gift of the ransom, she began to feel loved by Jehovah. We too feel Jehovah, feel loved by Jehovah and his sense. I, I cannot get my head around like, yeah, there's this one person and here is a ultra truncated synopsis of something that they had to say one time that happened to them on a Tuesday afternoon. It's like, well, it's not necessary. It doesn't add any validity to it. They're just making up fake people. Although we may try hard to apply the above suggestions, we at times get discouraged and wonder if we have Jehovah's approval. If that happens, remember that he approves of those who continue loving him. So continue to draw close to Jehovah and to take note of his approval of you. Always bear in mind that Jehovah is not far off from each one of us. Bada bing, bada boom, another watchtower in the bag. April 2024. Study Article 14. Press on to maturity. Few events bring more joy to a married couple than the birth of a healthy baby. Yet even though parents love their precious newborn, they do not want him to remain an infant permanently. In fact, they'd be seriously concerned if he did not grow up Benjamin Button. Similarly, Jehovah is happy when we take our first steps as followers of Jesus, but he does not want us to remain spiritual toddlers. Instead, he wants us to become full-grown Christians. What does it mean to become a full-grown Christian? How do we grow to Christian maturity? What role does solid spiritual food play in our growth? And why should we avoid overconfidence? In this article, we will consider the answers to these questions. I'm looking forward to it. I'm taking in the most spiritual food anyone has ever consumed in any one time at any point ever. In the Bible, the Greek word translated full-grown can also mean mature, perfect, and complete. We become full-grown or mature as Christians when we grow out of spiritual infancy and become spiritual men or women. Of course, even when we have reached the goal, that should never stop advancing spiritually. We should never, uh, we should never stop advancing spiritually. All of us, including those who are physically young, can be spiritually mature. But what indicates that a Christian has grown to maturity? A mature Christian is someone who lives by all of God's requirements, not picking and choosing the ones he wants to follow. Of course, being imperfect, he will make mistakes. Still, he shows by his daily life and that he thinks and acts in harmony with God's will. 
He has put on the new personality and constantly strives to bring his thinking closer to God's thinking. He has trained himself to make wise decisions based on Jehovah's laws and principles, so he does not need a lengthy list of rules to govern his behavior. When he makes a decision, he has the self-discipline to follow through. On the other hand, a Christian who remains immature can easily be misled by trickery and deceptive schemes and be taken in by conspiracy theories and dun 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 apostates. He may be prone to being jealous, creating strife, taking offense, or yielding to temptation. A little picture here, immature Christians need to learn how to make wise decisions by applying Bible principles. Don't be like a little girl when you're crossing the street. You gotta look both ways, you dumb dumb. So let me teach you how to look both ways by ignoring apostates. What sound counsel? As mentioned earlier, the scriptures compare the process of growing to spiritual maturity to the process of growing to adulthood. A child lacks insight, so he needs the protection and supervision of an adult. To illustrate, a mother might ask her young daughter to hold her hand while crossing the street. As a girl grows older, the mother might allow her to cross the street on her own, but will still remind her to look both ways for traffic. When the child becomes an adult, she avoids such hazards on her own. Just as young children need help from young adults to avoid danger, just as young children need help from adults to avoid danger, immature Christians often need help from mature Christians to avoid spiritual dangers and to make wise decisions. By contrast, when mature Christians have to make a decision, they reason on Bible principles to get Jehovah's thinking on the matter and then follow through accordingly. Does this mean that a mature Christian never needs to help never needs help from anyone? No. Mature ones also need to ask for help at times. But someone who is immune immature may wow. But someone who is immature may expect others to tell him what to do or to make a decision that he himself should make. A mature Christian, on the other hand, will draw clo draw on the wisdom and the experience of others while recognizing that Jehovah expects him to carry his own load. Just as adults differ in physical appearance, mature Christians differ in spiritual qualities such as wisdom, courage, generosity, and empathy. Further, when two mature Christians face a similar situation, they might come to different conclusions that are both scripturally acceptable. That is especially true in matters of conscience. Recognizing this, they avoid judging each other over such differences. Instead, they focus on remaining united. Yeah, that's cute and all. But there's so few things that are a matter of conscience within the Jehovah's Witnesses that this doesn't really apply. What the, the, the comparison of things that are just, oh, well, everyone can just decide for themselves versus these are the things that Watchtower decides for you is like four things on one list and like 400 or 4,000 on the other. And so that's why people are going to be judgmental. There's just more things to be judgmental about. It's so rare that you come to a situation where it's like, well, I can't believe our conscience differs on matters like this. They just say that, but it's not real. We may grow to physical adulthood naturally over time, but no one grows to spiritual maturity automatically. For instance, the brothers and sisters in Corinth accepted the good news, got baptized, received Holy Spirit, and benefited from the personal instruction of the Apostle Paul. Yet, some years after their baptism, many were still immature. How can we avoid slowing down in our spiritual growth? To reach maturity, we must first cultivate the desire to become mature. Those who love inexperience, preferring to remain as spiritual infants, will fail to make progress. We do not want to be like those who are fully grown physically, but continue depending on their parents to make decisions for them. Instead, we want to take responsibility for our own growth. If you are still working to reach maturity, pray that Jehovah will give you both the desire and the power to act. Jehovah does not expect us to grow to maturity on our own. Those who serve as shepherds and teachers in the Christian congregation are prepared to help us in becoming full-grown in a spiritual sense, attaining the measure and of stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. Jehovah also provides his Holy Spirit to help us have the mind of Christ. Further, God inspired the writing of, our, of the four Gospels to show us Je how Jesus thought, spoke and acted during his earthly ministry. By imitating Jesus' way of thinking and acting, you can reach your goal of Christian maturity. 
uh, solid spiritual food teaches us how to make decisions that please Jehovah. So this guy's on Netflix, and instead of watching something cool, like some sci-fi or some, I don't, I don't know what those are supposed to be. He's like, let me watch a documentary about waves and the ocean. Which there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but it shouldn't be the only thing you watch. Broaden your horizons. In order to advance to maturity, we must also move beyond the primary doctrine about the Christ. That is, basic Christian teachings. Examples of such basic teachings include repentance, faith, baptism, and the resurrection. Such teachings form the foundation of Christianity. For though, for this reason, the Apostle Peter spoke of them when preaching to the crowd at Pentecost. We must accept these primary teachings to become disciples of Christ. For example, Paul warned that any who deny teachings of the resurrection reject the entire Christian faith. However, we must not be satisfied with just a basic knowledge of the truth. In contrast to the primary doctrine, solid spiritual food includes not only Jehovah's law, but also his principles, which help us to understand his thinking. To benefit from such food, we must study, meditate on, and carefully apply God's word. As we do, we train ourselves to make decisions that please Jehovah. Immature Christians often struggle when faced with situations that call for reasoning on Bible principles and applying them. If no Bible law exists, some might feel that they can do whatever they want. Others might ask for a rule when no rule is required. For instance, Christians in Corinth apparently asked Paul for a rule about whether they could eat food that had been offered to an idol. Rather than tell them what to do, Paul acknowledged the role of the conscience and the fact that each person has a right to choose. He reasoned on principles that would allow each individual to be at peace with his conscience and while not stumbling others. Paul was thus helping Corinthians to grow up spiritually so they could use their own powers of discernment instead of depending on someone else or simply looking for rules. Another picture over provides help to those who need to regain spiritual strength. These guys are studying. I like his little workshop. Very cool. <laughs> we learn a valuable lesson from what Paul wrote to the Hebrew Christians. Some had not continued to, go, to grow spiritually. They had actually gone back to needing milk, not solid spiritual food. They had failed to keep up with the truth, which was being progressively revealed, revealed to the congregation. For example, many Jewish believers were still promoting the Mosaic Law, even though some 30 years earlier... The law had been done away with on the basis of Christ's sacrifice. Surely it was not too much to ask Jewish Christians to adjust their thinking over a period of 30 years. Wow, that's pretty funny. Surely it was not too much to ask. Yeah, yeah. Anyone who has read Paul's inspired letter to the Hebrews can confirm that this book contains solid spiritual food. It was just what those Christians needed to strengthen their faith and the superiority of the Christian arrangement for worship and to give them courage to keep preaching in spite of opposition from the Jews. We must exert ourselves not only to reach maturity, but also to maintain it. This requires that we avoid overconfidence. We should keep testing ourselves to make sure that we are continuing to make progress. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul again highlights the need to remain mature. Even though they had become full-grown Christians, Paul warned them against being ensnared by worldly thinking. And Epaphras, who evidently knew those in the congregation well, prayed constantly that they might finally stand complete or mature. The point? Both Paul and Epaphras uh, understood that maintaining maturity requires personal effort and God's support. They wanted the Colossians to remain mature or full-grown Christians despite any challenges they were facing. Paul warned the Hebrews that a mature Christian could permanently lose God's approval. A Christian heart could become so hardened that is he is no longer able to repent and receive God's forgiveness. Uh, oh yeah, with unforgivable sin, old Ken Flodine taught about that, taught us all about that with the poison and the bread. Thankfully, the Hebrews did not fall away to that extent. What about those today who become inactive or disfellowship but later repent? Their hum humble repentance shows that they are different from those whom Paul wrote about. However, they return to Jehovah. They need to help. They need the help He provides. The elders may arrange for an experienced witness to help them regain their spiritual strength. 
If you are pressing on to Christian maturity, you can reach your goal, continue to take in solid spiritual food, and align your thinking even closer with that of Jehovah. If you have already become mature, remain steadfast as a full-grown Christian. Well, we're doing the experiment right now, right live in action. Solid food belongs to spiritual people. You need to press on to Christian maturity. If this were the case, then why does it feel that Watchtower has been dumbing things down? And if they are dumbing things down, then they are the ones they are the they are the ones they're arguing against, essentially. They're the ones providing milk and then getting mad and angry at people. Like, why aren't you guys more spiritually mature Christians? Well, you haven't been giving them the tools to become spiritually mature Christians. Could that also be the case? So we're here for it. Fifteen. Strengthen your appreciation for Jehovah's organization. Oh boy, we gotta speed run this article. This will just be a lot of yapping. Whenever Jehovah gives his people an assignment, he expects them to carry it out in an organized way. For example, it is God's will for the good news to be preached in all the inhabited earth. Jehovah has put Jesus in charge of that work. Jesus has seen to it that it is carried out in an organized fashion in the first century. As congregations were established in various places, elders were appointed to give direction and take the lead. In Jerusalem, a central body of elders consisting of the apostles and older men made certain decisions that all congregations were expected to comply with. As a result of their obedience to the instructions they received, the congregations continued to be made firm in the faith and increase in number. Jehovah continues to organize his people even today. Since 1919, Jesus has used a small group of anointed men to organize the preaching work and supply spiritual food to his followers. Uh, Jehovah is obviously blessing the work of that group. If we are not organized, we would not be able to accomplish the work Jehovah has assigned to us. Suppose, for example, there were no territory assignments. Everyone could just preach wherever they wanted. It's almost like God could just direct them with his Holy Spirit or the unaccountable number of angels that are supposedly helping people preaching and directing the preaching work. It's almost like that could actually happen. That thing that we say exists. <laughs> but suppose there was no territory assignments. Everyone would just preach wherever they wanted. It'd be total chaos. Some territories might be worked over and over by a number of different publishers, while other territories might be neglected entirely. Can you think of other ways we benefit by being organized? What Jesus did on earth set the pattern for how he keeps us organized today. In this article, we will consider the example Jesus set and how our organization follows that example. We will also discuss how we can show that we appreciate Jehovah's organization. Jesus learned from his heavenly father what to do and what to say. Following the example of Jesus, Jehovah's organization bases its moral teachings and its direction on God's word. We regularly receive reminders to read and apply God's word. How do we benefit from following this counsel? We benefit greatly when we study the Bible with the help of our Christian publications. For instance, we are able to compare Bible teachings with the direction we receive from the organization. When we see the guidance we receive is based on the scriptures, our confidence in Jehovah's organization grows. Jesus preached the good news of the kingdom of God. Also, Jesus commanded his disciples to preach the kingdom. Today, all who are associated with Jehovah's organization preach the kingdom message, no matter where they live or how much responsibility they have. I keep seeing all of these things in bold. Are these literally just the answer to the question? What is one way that we follow Jesus' example? Jesus learned from his way to... F Wait, what? What message did Jesus preach? And how can the organization follow his example? Jesus preached the kingdom message. How does the organization make God's name known? Jesus may, okay, maybe not. For a second, I thought everything in bold is just an answer to the question. Like Watchtower at some point in time decided to be the Zorro highlighter that most witnesses do. Mm. Anyway, uh, I guess we'll just go to nine. In prayer to his heavenly father, Jesus said, I have made your name known. In line with Jesus' example, Jehovah's organization does everything possible to help others come to know God's name. The New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures has played a significant role in this by restoring God's name to its rightful place. 
This Bible translation is now available in whole or in part in over 270 languages. In Appendixes A4 and A5 of this translation, you will find details regarding the restoration of God's name in the Bible. Appendix C, which is found in the Study Bible, provides extensive proof that God's name should appear in the Christian Greek scriptures. Like Jesus, we want to help as many as possible come to know God's name. On hearing that God has a name, a 76-year-old woman in Myanmar was moved to tears and said, This is the first time in my life that I have heard that God's name is Jehovah. You have taught me the most important thing I could ever learn. Well, apparently being able to read is more important than that because you wouldn't have been able to understand what God's name was if you couldn't be able to read. So, huh. as this experience shows, learning God's name can have a powerful effect on honest-hearted people. What is one way in which elders can show that they appreciate God's organization? When receiving direction, elders need to read it carefully and then apply it to the best of their ability. Throw away those AEDs, baby. For instance, they receive guidance not only on how to present meeting parts and how to offer prayers for the congregation, but also on how to care for Christ's sheep. Elders who follow organizational direction help those under their care to feel secure and loved. When we receive direction from the elders, we should follow it willingly. By doing so, we will make it easier for those taking the lead to do their work. The Bible encourages us to be obedient and submissive to those who take the lead. That can be a challenge at times. Why? Because these men are imperfect. However, if we focus on their negative qualities rather than their positive traits, we will, in effect, be aiding our enemies. In what way? We will be undermining trust in God's organization which is what our opposers have set out to do. What specifically can we do to identify and reject the negative propaganda of our enemies? God's opposers try to put positive aspects of his organization in a negative light. For instance, we have learned from the scriptures that Jehovah expects his worshipers to be clean physically, morally, and spiritually. He requires that any who unrepentantly pursue a course of uncleanness be removed from the congregation. We adhere to that scriptural command, but our opposers try to use that against us by accusing us of being intolerant judgmental, and unloving. Recognize the source of attacks. Satan, the devil, is behind false stories. He is the father of the lie, so we should expect that Satan will use his supporters to promote false stories about Jehovah's organization. This was evident in the first century. I gotta be completely honest, like, I don't see that many false stories being propagated, or at least, like, in a serious way. I and mean, maybe there's more of it than I realize, but, like, spreading salacious false stories, I just, I just don't really see it happening. I mean, I just don't know, like, they're arguing against ghosts. In the first century, Satan's supporters told one lie after another about the perfect miracle-working Son of God. For example, the religious leaders told people that Jesus' power to expel demons was given to him by the ruler of the demons. When Jesus was on trial, the religious leaders accused him of blasphemy and incited the crowds to call for his death. Later, as Christ's followers preached the good news, those who opposed them stirred up and wrongly influenced the people to persecute those Christians. Regarding Acts 14.2, the Watchtower of December 1st, 1998 explained, Not content with rejecting the message themselves, Jewish opposers embarked on a smear campaign, trying to prejudice the Gentile population against Christians. Satan did not stop lying in the first century. Today, he is still misleading the entire inhabited earth. If you hear negative stories regarding the organization or the brothers who are taking the lead, remember how God's enemies treated Satan and his first century disciples. Today, Jehovah's people are being persecuted and maligned exactly as the Bible foretold. False stories will not mislead us if we recognize their source and take immediate action. What action should we take? The Apostle Paul gave clear instructions on what to do if we are exposed to false stories. He told Timothy to command certain ones to pay attention, not to pay attention to false. This is the most convoluted. What are they doing? So there's partial scriptures from 1 Timothy 1, verse 3 and 4, and then 4 and 7. Timothy, he told Timothy to command certain ones not to pay attention to false stories and to reject irreverent false stories. Although a toddler might innocently pick up an object from the floor and put it in the mouth, a mature person who understands the danger would never do that. 
We reject false stories because we recognize the source of the information. We hold to the wholesome words of truth. We have considered just three of the many ways God's organization imitated Jesus. As you study the Bible, take note of the additional ways that the organization followed Jesus. Help others in your congregation to build their appreciation for the organization, Jesus. And continue to demonstrate your appreciation by serving Jehovah loyally and sticking close to the organization that he is using to accomplish his will. May we continue to treasure the privilege we have of being associated with Jehovah's loving and loyal people. We got the old good old false stories. We got something that says not JW.org. You got some podcasts. Ooh, scary podcast people. Anyway, I've talked about this before. I think we've even shown it in a video. So on to the next article. How to have more joy in the ministry. As Jehovah's people, we preach to others because we love our Heavenly Father and we want to help our neighbors come to know him. Many publishers really enjoy the preaching work, but others struggle to find pleasure in it. Why? Some may be very shy and lack confidence. Some feel uncomfortable going to people's homes uninvited. Some may fear being rejected. Some have been avoid or taught to avoid conflict with others. Despite loving Jehovah very much, these brothers and sisters find it hard to approach strangers with the good news. Yet they realize how important this work is, and they regularly have a share in it. How pleased Jehovah must be. Do you sometimes struggle to find joy in the ministry because of such feelings? If so, do not be discouraged. Your lack of confidence may indicate that you humbly want to avoid drawing attention to yourself and do not want to be in the middle of controversy. And no one wants to be rejected, especially when he is trying to do good for others. Your Heavenly Father is well aware of the challenges you face and wants to give you the help you need. In this article, we will consider five suggestions on how to deal with such feelings and how to cultivate joy in the ministry. Do you enjoy the preaching work? Yeah, pretty much uh, that. That lady sums it all up perfectly. She is prototypical Jehovah's Witness out in service. Throughout the ages, the message from God has strengthened his servants when they had a difficult task to complete. Take, for example, the prophet Jeremiah. He was hesitant when Jehovah gave him the assignment to preach. Jeremiah said, I do not know how to speak, for I am just a boy. How did he overcome this lack of confidence? He drew strength from God's word. He said, it became like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was ooh, and I was tired of holding it in. Although Jeremiah had a difficult territory, the message he was assigned to proclaim gave him strength, and he needed to do the work. I hate when they use terms like, he had a difficult territory, as if he thought about it in those kinds of terms. Christians draw strength from the message in God's word. When writing to the congregation in Colossae, The Apostle Paul said that taking in an accurate knowledge would motivate his brothers to walk worthily of Jehovah as they continued bearing fruit in every good work. That good work includes the preaching of the good news. So when we read God's word and meditate on it, our faith in Jehovah is strengthened and the importance of sharing the kingdom message becomes clear. To get the most out of the word of God, we should avoid rushing through our reading, study, and meditation. Take your time. If you come across a scripture that you have trouble understanding, do not skip over it. This is great advice, actually. Instead, use Watchtower Publications Index or Research Guide of Jehovah's Witnesses to find an explanation about the verse. If you take your time when studying, you will strengthen your confidence in the truthfulness of God's word. The more convinced you are, the more you will enjoy sharing what you have learned with others. This is my best advice to people Trying to wake up is just study the publications diligently, thoughtfully, and meaningfully. Think about what you're reading. Won't be long after that. If you prepare well for the ministry, you are likely to feel more comfortable when speaking with others. Jesus helped his disciples to prepare before he sent them out into the ministry. Because they put into practice what Jesus had taught them, the disciples felt a deep sense of joy in what they were able to accomplish. How might we prepare for the ministry? We need to give thought to how we can express the truth effectively in our own words. It is also helpful to anticipate two or three common reactions from those in the territory and have in mind how we will respond in each case. When we approach people, we can try to relax, smile, and be friendly. The Apostle Paul illustrated our role in the preaching work when he said, We have this treasure in earthen vessels. What is this treasure? It is the life-saving work of preaching the kingdom message. What are the earthen vessels? They represent God's servants who take 
the good news to others. I thought they didn't have types and anti-types. Apparently there's an anti-type or type right there. In Paul's day, merchants used clay jars to transport valuable goods, such as food, wine, and money. Similarly, Jehovah entrusts us with a valuable message of the good news. With Jehovah's backing, we can have the strength needed to deliver our message faithfully. At times, we may experience fear of man or fear of rejection. How can we overcome that challenge? Consider the prayer of the apostles when they were ordered not to preach. Rather than give in to fear, they asked Jehovah to help them to keep speaking his word with all boldness. Jehovah immediately answered their prayer. If fear of man affects us, sometimes we should pray for Jehovah's help. Ask Jehovah to help you conquer your fear of man with your love for people. So we're back to the fruit stands again. Yippee. So she was praying. Now she's praying or she's studying. She's filled with this Holy Spirit. Now she's ready to say, thanks for the oranges. Would you like to see some really big... <laughs> Would you like to see some really big melons in the future? Well, boy, howdy. Have I got the place for you. Go to jw.org. <laughs> it might be the greatest presentation anyone has ever come up with, ever. Holy. I'm losing it, guys. I'm losing it. Jehovah has appointed us to be his witnesses, and he promises to help us be courageous. Consider just four ways. He does that. First, Jesus is with us whenever we preach the good news. Second, Jehovah has appointed angels to help us. Yeah, this is what I talked about earlier. Third, Jehovah has given us his Holy Spirit as a helper to bring back our minds the things we have learned. Fourth, Jehovah has provided brothers and sisters to accompany us. With Jehovah's backing and the support of our loving brotherhood, we have everything we need to be successful. Yeah, see, I knew they would, at one point, they were going to say this. So, was it the last article where they're talking about, yeah, we need organization. Why do you need territory card maps? If you have Jesus, Jehovah's angels, and Jehovah's spirit all helping lead this work, are they not good enough to tell you where to go? <sighs> Do you feel discouraged when you find few people at home? Why not ask yourself, where are the people from my territory right now? Are they at work or out shopping? If that is the case, could you find more possible, find more people? By doing street witnessing, a brother named Joshua says, I have found opportunities to preach while walking through shopping plazas and public parking lots. I swear there is not a human being that says shopping plazas or public parking lots. This is uh, like AI generated. Hey, what was the nerdiest guy named Joshua? How would he say if he was a Jehovah's Witness looking for people? Well, look through shopping plazas and par public parking lots. He and his wife, Bridget, have also found more people at home when calling in the early evenings as well as on Sunday afternoons. If people show little interest in the message, try to determine what they believe in or are concerned about. Joshua and Bridget use the question found on the front of the tract in their introduction. Well, tell me more. For example, using the tract, how do you view the Bible? They say, some people view the Bible as a book from God. Others, not so much. What is your opinion? Uh, why are you here? Why are you talking to me? <laughs> this often leads to a conversation. Uh, oh, so she's not buying melons. But, I mean, I think you could do the same thing. Hey, thank you for the spicy peppers. You want to see something else spicy? Go to this website. <laughs> uh. Our success in the ministry does not depend on the result we obtain. Why? Because we have done what Jehovah and his son want us to do. We have given a witness. Even when we do not find anyone to speak with or when our message is rejected, we can have joy because we know that we are pleasing our Heavenly Father. We can also rejoice when another publisher finds an interested person in the territory. The Watchtower has likened our work to searching for a lost child. Many are involved in looking for him, covering one area after another. When the child is found, everyone, not just the individual who found him, has reason to rejoice. Similarly, the disciple-making work is a team effort. All are needed to cover the territory, and all rejoice when a new one starts attending meetings. We can increase our enthusiasm for the preaching work by focusing on our love for Jehovah and our neighbor. Just imagine how happy Jehovah is when he sees us do the work, how happy people will be when they start studying the Bible. Think, too, about the salvation that awaits those who respond to our message. 
Are you confined to your home for some reason? If so, focus on what you can do to show love for Jehovah and your neighbor. During the vid-19 pandemic, Samuel and Dania were confined to the home. Throughout the difficult time, they regularly did telephone witnessing, wrote letters, and conducted Bible studies over Zoom. Samuel witnessed to those he had met at the clinic where he was receiving treatment for cancer. He states, Hardships wear us down mentally, physically, and spiritually. We need to find joy in our service to Jehovah. In the midst of this, Dania fell and was confined to bed for three months. Oh, man. When she needed a wheelchair for six months, she says, I tried to do all that my circumstances allowed. I was able to preach to a nurse who visited, and I spoke to those who delivered things to the house. I also had good conversations on the telephone with the representatives of a medical firm. <laughs> Samuel and Daniel's circumstances limited their activity. They did not, but they did what they could uh, and found joy in doing so. The suggestion provided in the article work best when they are used together. Each suggestion is like an ingredient used in a recipe. When all the ingredients in the recipe are combined, you will have tasty results. So get in the kitchen and start cooking. By applying all the suggestions, we will be better equipped to deal with negative feelings and find more joy in the ministry. How frustrating is it that you have someone going through cancer treatment and his wife falls down and is in a wheelchair and their biggest concern is trying to find ways to make the organization happy so that way they don't get kicked out right before the end comes. Like, how how miserable is that? Ugh. Okay, 17. Never leave the spiritual paradise. Yeah, exactly. They can tell you all about it. They'll sacrifice everything. There is a paradise on earth today that is full of life and activity. It is teeming with millions of people who enjoy genuine peace. Those who are already, already in this paradise are determined never to leave it. They also want as many people as possible to join them in this unique setting. What is it? The spiritual paradise. Amazingly, Jehovah has created a serene environment in the midst of a world that Satan has turned into a ha hate field. Field wicked and dangerous place. Our loving God sees the damaging effects of this system of things and provides us the security that we need in order to flourish spiritually. His word describes the spiritual paradise as both a safe refuge and a well-watered garden. With Jehovah's blessing, those inhabiting this paradise are able to thrive during dif the, these difficult last days. By means of the prophet Isaiah, Jehovah described what it would be like for those who would dwell in the spiritual paradise. You can find the description in Isaiah 65, which had an initial fulfillment back in 537 BCE. At that time, repentant Jews were released from captivity in Babylon, and they returned to their homeland. Jehovah blessed his people and helped them to make the devastated city of Jerusalem beautiful again and to restore its temple as the center of true worship in Israel. Make Israel great again. <laughs> make, uh, sorry, make Jerusalem great again. They're wearing red hats, too. <laughs> I don't know why that cracks me up. They were campaigning for who's going to take, who's going to be the next high priest. Hanging out free hats, saying, make Jerusalem great again. Oh, golly. A second fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy began in 1919, when Jehovah's modern-day worshippers were set free from captivity to Babylon the Great. Then the spiritual paradise started to take shape throughout the earth. Zealous kingdom reclaimers formed many congregations and produced spiritual fruitage. Men and women who once exhibited violent animalistic tendencies put on the new personality that was created according to God's will. Of course, many of the blessings that Isaiah described will be fulfilled literally in the future new world, but even now there are rich benefits that we are enjoying. Let us see how the spiritual paradise affects us and why we should never leave it. Healthy and refreshed, Isaiah's prophecy draws a vivid contrast between what life is like for those inside of the spiritual paradise and what life is like for those outside. Jehovah abundantly satisfied the spiritual needs of his worshipers. We have his Holy Spirit, his written word, and an ample spiritual food so that we can eat dot 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 drink dot 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 brackets and rejoice. What in tarnation is happening with these scriptures? In contrast, yeah. <laughs> 
in sharp contrast, those who are outside the spiritual paradise go hungry, dot, 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 apostrophe, go thirsty, dot, 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 apostrophe, brackets, and suffer shame. Their spiritual needs need not be, are not being satisfied. In his prophecy, Joel used such examples of life as grain, wine, olive oil to show that Jehovah generously supplies his people with what they need, including spiritual food. He does so through the Bible and our Bible-based publications, our website, as well as our meetings, assemblies, conventions. We can partake of spiritual provisions every day. and As a result, we feel healthier and more refreshed. Well, instead of doing it every day, why don't you just take like one or two days and go through everything from an entire year, and then you're good to go. I think that's what we should do. The speed run route. Get it all over with. Then you have the rest of the time, the rest of the year. You're all filled up spiritually and gluttonous. You can just do whatever you want. Happy and content. God's people can shout joyfully because their heart overflows with appreciation. The upbuilding truths and comforting promises in God's word and our solid hope based on Christ's ransom sacrifice give us a condition of a good condition of the heart. Talking about these things with our spiritual brothers and sisters makes us truly happy. The love and the unity among Jehovah's people are two major characteristics of the spiritual paradise. This bond of union gives an idea of what life will be like in the new world, where Jehovah's servants will enjoy even greater love and unity than we do today. A Christian sister relates that she noticed what she noticed about Jehovah's people when she first met them. I did not know how to be happy, not even my family. The first time I saw love in action was among Jehovah's Witnesses. Anyone who wants to be truly happy and content needs to experience our spiritual paradise. No matter what this world thinks of Jehovah's servants, they have an honorable name or reputation with his universal family. It's strange. What do we got in this here picture? It is a blessing to enjoy the spiritual paradise as part of God's family. Young and old people on phones. If you're, yep, it's pretty boring. Relax and calm. Isaiah sixty-five fourteen says that those who choose to remain outside of the spiritual paradise cry out because of the pain of the heart, wail because of a broken spirit. You're going down a path I cannot follow. But what about all the things that have caused God's people pain and distress? Eventually those things will be forgotten and concealed from God's eyes. Jehovah will make our troubles go away, and in time the pain of such memories will vanish like a fart in the wind. Even now it is soothing to our nerves to be at our huh? Even now it is soothing to our nerves to be at our Christian meetings where we can relax and put behind us the stresses of this wicked world. Yeah, that's just something that's not true. People always like said that, like, oh, I was feeling all stressed out and crazy, and then I went to the meeting, and I felt so much better. And it's like, no, you probably just like had a little chunk of time where you had someone filling your head with a bunch of like nonsense, and it drowned out the noise of the things that you actually need to do, or all of the discomforts that you're currently in, or the situation that you're currently in, directly as a result from being a Jehovah's Witness. And then you see your friends and your family and you remember, oh, look, other people are suffering too. So it's not that weird. I don't think that is calming your nerves. I think that is just conditioning. What a blessing it is for us to be associated with God's organization. Those who remain in the spiritual paradise will see the complete fulfillment of God's promise of a new heavens and a new earth. Grateful and excited, Isaiah goes on to reveal why we have every reason to exult and be joyful in the spiritual paradise. This environment is a creation of Jehovah. No wonder he is using us to direct people away from the spiritually parched organizations of this old world and into our beautiful spiritual environment. We are excited about the blessings we enjoy because of being in the truth, and we are moved to tell others about them. Uh... We're also grateful for and excited about the hope we have as residents of the spiritual paradise. Just think of all that we will see and do in God's new world. The Bible promises, no more will there be an infant dot 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 who lives but a few days, nor an old man who fails to live without his days. We will build houses and live in them, and plant vineyards and eat their fruitage. 
We will not toil for nothing because we will be blessed by Jehovah. His promise, he promises us a secure, satisfying life with real purpose. Even before they call out, he will know each one's needs and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Don't you remember in like the last article? It's not like we have to, or God knows beforehand. He doesn't choose to use his foresight. Then how come even before they call out, he will know what each one needs? Hmm? With the help of God's Spirit, many who formerly had beastly personalities have been made remark have made remarkable changes in their life. They have tamed their former undesirable traits. Granted, God's people are still imperfect, so we will continue to make mistakes. However, Jehovah has united all sorts of people in an unbreakable bond of love and peace. This is a miracle that only the Almighty God could perform. Can people really change their personality? Consider the example. A young man who had been in and out of prison by the age of 20 was deeply involved in immoral and violent behavior. He had been jailed for car theft, burglary, and other serious crimes. He was ready to fight anyone. When he first heard the truth from the Bible and began attending meetings of Jehovah's Witnesses, he was convinced that he had found something to live for, the spiritual paradise. After becoming a baptized witness, he often thought, of how Isaiah 65, 25 applied to him. He had changed from being a lion-like violent person to being a lamb-like peaceful person. Isaiah 65, 13 begins with the declaration, This is what the Sovereign Lord Jehovah has says. Verse 25 ends with the words, Says Jehovah, His words always come true. The spiritual paradise is already a reality. Jehovah has created a brotherhood that is truly unique. Among his people, we can find relative peace and enjoy a safe oasis in a violent world. For these reasons, we want to help as many people as possible to join us in our Christian brotherhood. We can do this by focusing on making disciples. Each of us has an opportunity. Each of us has an important role to play in making the spiritual paradise attractive to others. We can fulfill this role if we imitate Jehovah. He does not drag people into his organization against their will. Instead, he gently draws people to himself. Good-hearted people who learn about Jehovah's loving qualities and appealing personality are irresistibly drawn to him. How can we, by our good qualities and fine conduct, attract people to the spiritual paradise? One way we can attract others to the spiritual paradise is by treating our fellow worshipers with love and kindness. When new ones attend our congregation meetings, we want them to come to the same conclusions as did the unbelievers who likely attended the meetings in ancient Corinth. They declared, God really is among you. Thus we must continue to heed the counsel to be peaceable with one another. We should always try to see our Christian brothers and sisters as Jehovah sees them. We do so by focusing on their positive qualities and not on their imperfections, which will eventually disappear. We can resolve any difference between us in a spirit of love by always being kind to one another, tenderly compassionate, freely forgiving one another. Then, the spiritual paradise will attract people who want to be treated in a similar way. Hey guys, we need this uh, whole thing to be attractive, so we're going to need you to stop being judgmental, supercilious jerks, tattle-telling on each other, and generally attempting to make each other's lives completely miserable. Uh, they left and came back. June, who stopped attending congregation meetings and became inactive, finally returned to the spiritual paradise. She says, What a wonderful feeling it was to be back with Jehovah's people. More than ever, I know that I cannot isolate myself or go at it alone. I am thankful that there was still time for me to come back. Hey, guess what, uh, June? There's going to be many more decades for you to come back. The end's not showing up. Kimberly was disfellowshipped for nearly 40 years. I had no friends who served Jehovah and no spiritual food, she relates. I felt depressed and lonely. But Kimberly repented and was reinstated in 2021. Now I know that Jehovah hears and answers my prayers, she says. And once again, I am surrounded by people I can trust. But depending on God's spirit and by regularly feeding on God's word, she is feeling stronger mentally and spiritually. The funny thing about stories like that is it's also going to piss Jehovah's Witnesses that have stayed the course 
and have made all of these different sacrifices, it's really going to piss them off. So Kimberly gets to be disfellowship, go off, do whatever she wants, have fun, build a whole life for herself with whomever she wants to build that life with, and then she comes back after 40 years and is in the exact same boat as the same as the people that have made all of these sacrifices. Like, yeah, it, it is truly irritating. It's like, I just want to have fun too. They seem to get away with it. John returned to the spiritual paradise after being disfellowshipped for over 20 years. He says, I had blocked the truth out of my mind along with the benefits of being with God's people. Now that he is reunited with his spiritual brothers and sisters and eating again from Jehovah's table, he says, there is no better life than one spent living among Jehovah's family in the spiritual paradise. Stay inside the spiritual paradise. How we appreciate our spiritual paradise. It is more beautiful than ever before, and it is inhabited by more praisers of Jehovah than ever before. May we be forever grateful for the paradise that Jehovah has created for us. Anyone who wants to be refreshed, content, calm, and safe must come into the spiritual paradise and never leave it. Beware, though, because Satan is trying his best to lure us away. We must not allow him to succeed. Let us victorious, vigorously protect the beauty purity and peace of the spiritual paradise life story my weaknesses have magnified god's strength when my wife and i arrived in columbia in 1985 the country was facing unprecedented violence the government was fighting drug cartels in the cities and guerrilla soldiers in the mountains in the area of median where we later served young armed gangsters patrolled the streets they sold drugs ran protection rackets and served as hitmen for public hire. None of them lived very long. We felt as if we were in a different world. How did two average people from Finland, one of the most northern countries on the globe, end up in South America? And what lessons have I learned over the years? Well, we're getting a life story, so at least this might be something even remotely interesting. It's we've been, We're at this for like seven hours now, and we get something that maybe doesn't sound like it was uh, just total AI-generated nonsense. I was born in 1955, the youngest of three boys. I grew up near the southern coast of Finland, in an area known as the city of Venta. My mother got baptized as one of Jehovah's Witnesses a few years before I was born. However, my father opposed the truth and did not allow my mother to study with us children or to take us to congregation meetings, so she would teach us basic Bible truths when my father was not around. From childhood onward, I took a stand for Jehovah. For example, once I, when I was seven, my school teacher became furious with me because I would not eat verilatiaya, finished blood pancakes. Wow, I am just eviscerated that word, but it eviscerated my brain. With one hand, she squeezed my cheeks to separate my closed lips. With the other, she tried to force a fork with a piece of the pancake into my mouth. I managed to knock the fork out of her hand. God, what kind of crazy teacher is this? Uh, in the 60s? When I was 12, my father passed away. After that, I could attend congregation meetings. The brothers in the congregation showed kind interest in me, and this motivated me to progress spiritually. I started reading the Bible daily and studying our Christian publications diligently. These good study habits were key to my getting baptized at the age of 14 on August 8, 1969. Nice. Soon after I finished my secular schooling, I started regular pioneering. Within a few weeks, I moved to serve where the need was greater in Pialavasi, near the center of Finland. Pialavasi... In Pialavasi, I met the girl who would become my dear wife, Circa. I felt drawn to her modest personality and deep spirituality. She did not seek prominence or material comfort. Both of us longed to serve Jehovah as fully as possible, regardless of any privileges of service. We married on March 23, 1974. Instead of going on a honeymoon, we left to serve in Kartula, where there was an even greater need for kingdom publishers. Jehovah cared for us. Oh, look, we got some pictures. There's him getting force-fed his blood pancakes. Nice bowl cut there, bucko. The car my brother left us. And the house we rented in Kartula, Finland. 
a cool hat. A little sound. Anyway, from the start of our marriage, Jehovah has shown us that he will take our material needs if we ask, or if we seek his kingdom first. For example, in Cartula, we did not have a car. At first, we traveled by bicycle. However, in, in winter, the temperatures would drop below freezing. To preach in the congregation's vast territory, we needed an automobile, but we did not have the money to buy one. Unexpectedly, my older brother came to visit us. He kindly offered us his car. The insurance had been paid. We only had to buy fuel. After that, we had the vehicle we needed. Jehovah showed us that he had taken on the responsibility to care for our material needs. Our job was to put kingdom interest first. <sighs> That was that thing I was talking about where, um, I forgot who was even giving the talk, but they're like, we basically give Jehovah a blessing by helping, oh yeah, it was in the last broadcast, um, by helping the disadvantaged ones, because that's really how Jehovah helps them and takes credit. It's like, why does it always have to be credit by proxy or, or assistance by proxy? I don't get it. Like, well, Jehovah doesn't help people ever, so I guess we don't have to either. While we were attending Pioneer Service School in 1978, Aramio Kukkanen, one of the... One of our instructors encouraged us to, my brain was looking for the word the, our instructors encouraged us to apply for Gilead School, so we started studying English with the goal of qualifying to attend. However, in 1980, before we could apply, we were invited to serve at the branch office in Finland. At that time, Bethelites could not apply for Gilead, but we wanted to serve Jehovah where Jehovah thought best, not where we thought best, so we accepted the invitation. Nonetheless, we kept studying English, just in case we ever had the opportunity to apply for Gilead. A few years later, the governing body extended to Bethelites the opportunity to apply for Gilead. We filled out applications immediately, but not because we were unhappy at Bethel. Quite the contrary. We just wanted to make ourselves available to serve where there was a greater need if we qualified. We were accepted to Gilead and graduated from the 79th class in September 1985. Our assignment was... Colombia. Colombian coffee crystals? In Colombia, we were first assigned to the branch office. I tried to do my best in my assignment, but after a year at the branch, I felt the need that we needed a change. For the first and only time in my life, I asked for a different assignment. Thereafter, we were assigned as field missionaries to the city of Nieva in the department of Julia. Julia. I have always enjoyed the field ministry. As a single pioneer in Finland, I would at times preach from early in the morning to late in the evening. As a newly married couple, Circa and I would also spend full days preaching. When working in distant territories, we would sometimes sleep in our car. This cut down on travel time and allowed us to get an early start the next day. As field missionaries, we once again felt the same enthusiasm we had earlier for the ministry. Our congregation grew, and the Columbia brothers and sisters were respectful, loving, and appreciative. The power of prayer. Not too far from our assignment. In Nivea were towns with no witnesses. I was very concerned about how the good news would reach those areas. However, because of the guerrilla warfare, these areas were not safe for non-locals. So I prayed that someone in one of these towns would become a witness. I thought that such a person would have to live in Nivea to learn the truth. Therefore, I also prayed that after the baptism, he would mature spiritually and return to his hometown to preach. I should have known that Jehovah had a far better solution than I did. Soon thereafter, I started a Bible study with a young man named Fernando Gonzalez. He lived in Alger Al Algiercus, one of the towns. Wow, yeah, that is that was that wasn't close. Uh, where there were no witnesses, Fernando would travel over 50 kilometers to Nivea to work. He prepared very well for each study and immediately started attending all the meetings. From the first week of the study, Fernando would gather others in his hometown and teach them what he had learned from the Bible study. Fernando got baptized in January 1990. Yeehaw! Year I was born. Month I was born. Let's go. Six months after he started studying. Thereafter, he became a regular pioneer. 
with one local witness in Allegris Allegri Wow. It was now safe enough for the branch office to assign special pioneers to that area. And oh boy. In February 1992, a congregation was formed in that town. Uh, there's a uh, Fernando right there. Good old, good job, Fernando. Did Fernando limit his preaching to his hometown? No. After he married, he and his wife knew, moved to San Vincent del Cajon, another town where there were no witnesses. There, they helped establish a congregation. In 2002, Fernando was appointed as a circuit overseer, and he and his wife, Olga, continue in the traveling work to this day. From this experience, I learned how important it is to pray about specific matters related to our theocratic assignments. Jehovah does what we cannot do. After all, this is his harvest, not ours. In 1990, we were assigned to the traveling work. Our first circuit was the capital in Bottega. The assignment intimidated us. My wife and I are ordinary people without any special talents. We are not used to living in a bustling metropolis. However, Jehovah fulfilled this promise found at Philippians 2.13. God is the one who, for the sake of his good pleasure, energizes you, giving you both the desire and the power to act. Later, we were assigned to a circuit in the area of Median, the city mentioned at the outset. People there had grown so accustomed to street violence that it no longer alarmed them. For example, one time while I was conducting a Bible study... A shooting began outside the house I was visiting. I was about to drop to the floor, but the Bible student continued reading the paragraph unfazed. When he finished reading, he excused himself and went outside. After a while, he came back with two little children and calmly said, My apologies, but I had to go get my kids. What in tarnation? That is crazy. We had other close calls. <laughs> On one occasion, while we were in the door-to-door -door work, my wife came running toward me. Looking somewhat pale, she said that someone had shot at her. That startled me. However, we realized that the gunman was not aiming at Circa. He was shooting a man who was passing right next to her. Damn. In time, we learn... <laughs> Did you just go up to the guy with the gun? Hey, we're... excuse me, sir. Were you shooting at my wife? Oh, my apologies. I... What a, what a misunderstanding we have on our hands here. You see, I was actually shooting the person out there in public right next to your wife. Did I, did I happen to hit her? Uh, no, everyone seems like, oh, okay, well, uh, here's my name and a number and a card. If you want a Bible study, just let us know. <laughs> like, what is the story? In time, we learned to cope with street violence. We were encouraged by the resilience of local witnesses who face situations like these. And worse, we concluded that if Jehovah was helping them, he would help us too. We always heeded the advice of local elders, took precautions, and left the rest in Jehovah's hands. Of course, some situations were not as dangerous as we suspected. Once I heard what sounded like two women screaming insults at each other outside the house. I was visiting. I was not interested in watching an argument, but the householder coaxed me over to the patio. As thing, things turned out, the argument was actually between two parrots who were mimicking the neighbors. That's kind of a cute story, actually, not going to lie. <laughs> in 1997, I was appointed as an instructor to the ministerial training school. I always appreciated attending theocratic schools, but never managed having the delight of priv the delightful privilege of teaching one. Later, I, I served as a district overseer. When the arrangement was discontinued, I returned to the circuit work. So for over 30 years, I enjoyed serving as an instructor and a traveling overseer. These assignments have been a source of... Of many blessings. However, it has not all been a bed of roses. Let me explain. I have a strong personality. This has helped me face difficult circumstances. However, at times, I have at times been overly zealous to in trying to correct matters in congregations. On occasions, I have energetically exhorted some to be loving and reasonable with others. Ironically, though, it was in these moments that I lacked the same qualities. Because of my failings, I have sometimes felt very discouraged. At one point, I told Jehovah in prayer that it would be best for me to leave the missionary service and return to Finland. That evening, I attended a congregation meeting. 
The encouragement I received there convinced me that I should stay in my assignment and keep working on my imperfections. To this day, I am touched by how clearly Jehovah answered that prayer. Additionally, I deeply appreciate how he has kindly helped me to overcome my weaknesses. Circa and I have Circa and I feel profoundly indebted to Jehovah for the privilege of having spent most of our life in full-time service. I am also grateful to Jehovah for giving me such a loving and faithful wife all these years. Soon I will turn 70 years of age and will relinquish my privileges as a field instructor and traveling overseer. However, this does not dishearten me. Why not? Because I firmly believe that what honors Jehovah most is that we serve him with modesty and we praise him from a heart overflowing with love and gratitude. To honor Jehovah, we do not look to be in the limelight. As I look back on the assignments that I have enjoyed, I realize that I did not receive them because I was more worthy than others, nor did I have these privileges because of any outstanding ability. Far from it. Rather, Jehovah extended these assignments to me because of his undeserved kindness. He granted me these privileges... Despite my weaknesses, I know that I have been able to fulfill these assignments only with Jehovah's help. In this way, my weaknesses have magnified God's strength. It's a, the personal story was a little bit more engaging, I would have to say, than the normal watchtower schlock. And speaking of watchtower schlock, why did foreigners serve in King David's army? Among the foreign warriors in David's army were men as Zelek the Ammonite, Uriah the Hittite, and Ithma the Moabite. David's forces also included the Cherethites, the Pelethites, and the Gittites. Uh, the Cherethites and the Pelethites were generally thought to be closely related to the Philistines. The Gittites originated from the Philistinian city of Gath. We could, why could David enlist foreigners in his army? He was confident that they were loyal to him, and more important, to Jehovah. For example, regarding the Carathites and the Pethites, the New Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible says, They remained loyal to David in the most difficult circumstances during his reign. How so? When all the men of Israel deserted King... They have so many quotation marks just quoting this book. What is happening? When all the men of Israel... I'm just going to read it like this. Quote, They remained loyal to David in the most difficult circumstances during his reign. End quote. How so? When, quote, All the men of Israel, end quote, Deserted King David to follow, quote, A troublemaker named Sheba, end quote, The Carathites, the Pelethites, Stayed true to David and helped to suppress Sheba's rebellion. I'm actually dumbfounded. Like, why quote that book if you're going to just chop it up that much? On another occasion, King David's son, Adonijah, attempted to usurp the throne. However, the Cherethites and the Pelethites remained loyal to David and helped to install Solomon, the one whom Jehovah had chosen as the king's successor. Another foreigner who remained fiercely loyal to David was Ittai the Githite. Ittai and his 600 warriors supported King David. When King's son Absalom rebelled and turned the hearts of the men of Israel against the king, David initially suggested to Ittai that because he was a foreigner, it was not his fight. But Ittai said, As surely as Jehovah is living, and as surely as my lord the king is living, wherever my lord the king may be, whether for death or for life, there your servant will be. Even though the Cherethites and the Pelethites and the Gittites were foreigners, they recognized Jehovah as the true God and David as Jehovah's anointed one. How grateful David must have been to have such loyal men on his side. That was actually remotely, I mean, if you're like a turbo Bible nerd, but it wasn't the most uninteresting thing ever because I don't think I have ever uh, picked up on that before. So now I have a new thing I know about the Bible. Yippee! Another watchtower down. May 2024. Trust in the merciful judge of all the earth. It was a conversation that Abraham never forgot. Through an angel, God foretold Abraham that he was going to wipe out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Oh, I forgot I had another copy. I had another copy. Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to get hype up in here. 
that faithful man was troubled. He asked, Will you really sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Dot, dot, dot. Will the judge of all the earth not do what is right? Question mark. Jehovah patiently taught his beloved human friend a lesson that benefits and comforts us all. God will never destroy righteous people. How can we be sure that Jehovah acts? Jehovah's acts of judgment are righteous and merciful? Because we know that Jehovah sees into the heart of people. In fact, he knows every human heart. That is an amazing truth. Jehovah's judgments are infinitely beyond our understanding. Fittingly, the Apostle Paul was inspired to say of Jehovah God how unsearchable his judgments are. Still, we may sometimes have similar questions to the ones that Abraham raised. We may wonder, is there any future hope for such people as those judged in Sodom and Gomorrah? Might any of them be included in the resurrection of the unrighteous? Let us review what we understand about the resurrection. Recently, we received a clarified understanding of the resurrection of life and the resurrection of judgment. This clarification has led to further adjustments, which will be discussed in this article and in the one that follows. Regarding Jehovah's righteous judgments, we will first consider what we do not know and then what we do know. In the past, our publications have considered the question of what happens to those whom Jehovah judges as unrighteous. We have said that for such individuals as those in Sodom and Gomorrah, there is no hope of a future resurrection. But further prayerful study has raised the question, can we really say that with certainty? Consider a number of related questions. Several Bible accounts describe Jehovah's judgments against unrighteous people, such as the unknown number who died in the flood, or the seven nations in the promised land that Jehovah ordered his people to devote to destruction. <laughs> they say that lightly. Uh, you mean the women and the children that were slaughtered? <laughs> or the 185,000 Assyrian soldiers slayed by an angel of Jehovah in a single night? In these cases, does the Bible give us enough information to determine that Jehovah sentenced all those to eternal destruction with no hope of a resurrection? No, it does not. Why can we say that? We do not know how Jehovah judged each individual, nor do we know whether those who were killed had an opportunity to learn about Jehovah and who and time to repent. In regard to the f time of the flood, the Bible does say that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but it does not say that while he was building a colossal ark, he was also attempting to reach every individual on earth who would face destruction in the deluge. Similarly, in the case of the nations of Canaan, we do not know if all those wicked people had an opportunity to learn about Jehovah and change their ways. What of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah? A righteous man named Lot lived in their midst. But do we know that Lot preached in all to all of them? No. They were certainly wicked, but did they all know any better? Recall that a crowd of men in the city sought to grape uh, grape Lot's guests. The Bible says that the mob ranged from boy to old man. Yikes. Do we really know that the merciful God Jehovah condemned each one to death with no hope of resurrection? Jehovah assured Abraham that there were not even ten righteous men in that city. So they were unrighteous, and Jehovah justly held them accountable for their actions. Can we say for certain, then, that none of them will rise in the resurrection of the unrighteous? No, we cannot say for sure. On the other hand, we also read in the Bible of righteous people who became unrighteous. King Solomon is an example. He was thoroughly instructed in God's ways and greatly blessed by Jehovah. Yet, he later turned to worshiping false gods. His sins made Jehovah furious and brought consequences that lasted for centuries. True, the scriptures do say that Solomon was laid to rest with his forefathers, including uh, such faithful men as King David. But was the manner of his burial a guarantee that he would be resurrected? The Bible does not say. Some might reason, though, that the one who has died has been acquitted from his sin. True, but this does not mean that all who have died will be resurrected as if a new life were, right, were a right that they have earned. Resurrection is a gift from a loving God. He bestows it on those whom he wants to give an opportunity to serve him forever. Will Solomon receive such a gift? Jehovah knows the answer. We do not. 
We do know, though, that Jehovah will do what is right. When it comes to the way he judges humans, Jehovah kindly reveals to us how he feels. The Apostle Peter was inspired to echo what the prophet Ezekiel wrote, saying that Jehovah does not desire anyone to be destroyed. In the light of that reassuring truth, we know that Jehovah is not quick to destroy people once and for all. He is profoundly merciful, and he shows mercy whenever possible. What do we know about the people who will be resurrected? That was a lot of adjustments to the chair, but uh, I'm trying to lean back a little bit, change up my sitting position. So what do we know? The Bible offers only a few examples. Jesus indicated that Judas Iscariot will not be resurrected. Jew Judas knowingly and willfully worked in opposition to Jehovah God and his son. Similarly, Jesus said that some of the religious leaders who had opposed him would die without a hope of resurrection. And the Apostle Paul warned that unrepentant apostates would not be resurrected. You always got to throw apostates under the bus. However, what do we know about Jehovah's mercy? How has he demonstrated that he does not desire anyone to be destroyed? Consider his mercy towards some who committed serious sins. King, King David got involved in a serious series of gross sins, including adultery and murder. Yet King David repented, so Jehovah mercifully forgave him. King Manasseh was profoundly wicked for much of his life. Even in that extreme case, however, Jehovah responded favorably to that man's repentance and found a basis for extending mercy and forgiveness. <laughs> Sorry, I just looked at this picture. It is This is people learning, and I suppose, after they've been resurrected. This guy is up here David Splain style, like, See? There was a rock. It was born from a... A, a, a mountain, and it knocked over a statue, and therefore you just woke up from the graves and had to dust out the larva from your eyeballs. These examples remind us that Jehovah shows mercy whenever he sees that there is basis for doing so. He will resurrect such individuals because they realize that they had committed terrible sins and they repented. We also know about Jehovah's mercy towards the Ninevites. God told Jonah, Their wickedness has come to my attention. But they, but when they repented of their sins, Jehovah kindly forgave them. He was far more merciful than Jonah was. God had to remind his angry prophet that those Ninevites did not even know right from wrong. Later, Jesus used that example to teach about Jehovah's justice and mercy. Jesus said that the repentant Ninevites would rise up in the judgment. In what judgment would the Ninevites rise up? Jesus taught about a future resurrection of judgment. He was referring to his thousand-year reign, during which both the righteous and the unrighteous will be resurrected. How how, how how do you know that's what he was referring to, Watchtower? Can you draw draw a, a diagram, give me some kind of graph that I can look at so I know that's exactly what he was talking about? For the unrighteous, this will be a resurrection of judgment. That is, Jehovah and Jesus will observe and evaluate their behavior and how they respond to divine teaching. If a resurrected Ninevite refuses to join in pure worship, his judgment will be one of condemnation. But for all those who choose to worship Jehovah faithfully, their judgment will be favorable. They will have the prospect of living forever. When speaking of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, Jesus said that they would fare better on judgment day. Then would the people who rejected him and his teaching? What did he mean? We might assume that Jesus was using hyperbole, hyperbole on this occasion. But that does not seem to be the case, any more than he was speaking of the Ninevites. Rather, it seems that Jesus meant what he said. It's so crazy that they have to have a sentence like, Rather, it seems that Jesus meant what he said. Because the only reason you're saying that is because so often... Watchtower is saying, well, I know Jesus said this, or we know that this thing is in the Bible, but here's what he actually meant. Here's the real meaning behind it. It's only because you do that so often 
that you get a situation where you can say a sentence, rather, it seems that Jesus meant what he said. Because it's so bizarre to anyone that isn't just going through the motions of being a Jehovah's Witness that this just there's something fishy. So there, it's a smelly smell that smells smelly. The judgment day he referred to in both instances was surely the same. Like the Ninevites, the people of Gautam, Gautam and Samora, wow, did bad things. Got him and Samora. <laughs> the Ninevites had an opportunity to repent. Further, remember what Jesus said about the resurrection of judgment. It will include those who practiced vile things. So it seems that there may be some hope for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. It is possible that at least some of these people will be resurrected, and we may have the opportunity to teach them about Jehovah and Jesus. That verse helps us to summarize what we do know. Jehovah has always been the one searching the heart, examining the innermost thoughts. When it comes to the future resurrection, he will always give to each one according to his ways. Jehovah will be firm when necessary, but merciful when possible. So we should not assume that a person has no hope of a resurrection unless we know that to be the case. What did Jude mean? Decades after Jesus died, his half-brother Jude wrote that uh, Gomorrah and Satan and the cities around them had undergone the judicial punishment of everlasting fire. What did Jude mean? Was he contradicting Jesus' message? Uh, well, you tell me, Watchtower. No, Jesus did not say that everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah would be resurrected. He suggested that there was a hope for at least some of them. It seems that the cities were themselves, rather than all the inhabitants, were everlastingly destroyed as a dramatic warning against immoral conduct. That message was obviously well received. What Jude wrote was in harmony with what the prophet Jeremiah has said. He explained that those wicked cities were just like ancient Edom and Babylon, which were destroyed forever, never to be rebuilt or inhabited again. Kind of like Damascus. Oh wait, my mistake. Damascus still exists. Additionally, both Jude and the Apostle Peter allowed for the possibility that some of those people whom God had destroyed will not be resurrected. Ever since Adam and Eve joined Satan and rebelled against Jehovah God, billions of humans have died. The enemy death has reaped an enormous harvest. What lies ahead for all those people? A limited number of 144,000 in all of Christ's faithful followers will receive a resurrection to immortal life in heaven. A vast number of faithful men and women who love Jehovah will be part of the resurrection of the righteous and they will live forever on earth. They remain righteous during Christ's millennial reign and during the final test. During, oh, also during the millennium, the unrighteous, including those who never served Jehovah or never practice, or who even practice vile things, will be given an opportunity to change their ways and become faithful. However, some humans were so wicked, so determined to rebel against Jehovah and His purposes that He has decided that there will be no resurrection for them at all. Do we have good reason for confidence regarding all of Jehovah's judgments, both favorable and unfavorable? Yes. As Abraham understood so well, Jehovah is the perfect, all-wise, merciful judge of the earth. He has trained his son and delegated all judging to him. Both father and son can read what lies in each human heart. In every case, they will do what is right. Let us be determined to trust that Jehovah knows best. We recognize that we are not qualified to judge, except that we do. So we confidently leave all the judging to ourselves and the governing body and his son and the king who perfectly reflects his father's justice and mercy. Stephen Lett. What, though, can we say about divine judgment relating to the great tribulation? What do we not know and what do we know? Our next article will take up those questions. Oh, don't leave me on a cliffhanger. We are living in exciting times. Each day, Bible prophecy is being fulfilled before our eyes. For example, we see the king of the north and the king of the south engaged in a struggle for world dominance. We see the good news of God's kingdom being preached on an unprecedented scale, with millions responding favorably. And we are receiving an abundance of spiritual food at the proper time. Jehovah continues to help us to have a clear understanding of the major events that lie just ahead. We can be certain that by the time the Great Tribulation starts, we will know all we need to know in order to endure faithfully and even prosper during that challenging period.
However, we must also, or we must recognize that there are some things that we just do not know about the near future. In this article, we will first discuss why we have reconsidered what we have said about some of those events. Then we will review some of the things that we do know about the future and the way that our Heavenly Father will act. Whoopsie! Oh, wow. That's an incredible picture here. Um, places under ban. Places where people will literally never hear about Jehovah's Witnesses or the entirety of the Middle East, I suppose. Because they don't really have a big presence there. In the past, we said that once the Great Tribulation be Oh, I'm, I am describing a picture that is on page 9 of this article. In the past, we said that once the Great Tribulation begins, no, unbeliever, un, wow. Okay, get it together. In the past, we said that once the Great Tribulation begins, no unbelievers will be able to take their stand for Jehovah and survive Marvin Geddon. We came to that conclusion because we understood that the account of the flood was a prophetic type. For example, we reasoned that just as Jehovah shut the door, of the ark prior to the start of the flood, he would, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation, shut the door on Satan's system of things, thus preventing any more people from being saved. Should should we view the account of the flood as a prophetic type? The answer is no. Why? Because there is no direct scriptural support for doing so. Watchtower, are you meaning to tell me that you were teaching something that wasn't based on the scriptures for decades? <laughs> that sounds crazy. I don't believe you would ever do such a thing. Jesus did compare the days of Noah to the time of his presence, but he did not imply that the flood was a prophetic type, with each person in each event having a corresponding antitype, nor did he say that the closing of the door of the ark had any prophetic significance. This does not mean, however, that we cannot learn from the account of the Noah and the Flood. I probably have that saved already, but just in case. When Noah heard Jehovah's warning message, he proved that he had faith by building the ark. Similarly, people who hear the good news about God's kingdom must act on what they hear. Peter called Noah a preacher of righteousness. However, as discussed in the preceding article, we do not know whether Noah led a preaching campaign to reach everyone living on earth before the flood. Today, we are involved in a global preaching work, and we endeavor to have a zealous share in it. Still, try as we might, we cannot possibly reach everyone on earth with the good news before the end comes. Why not? Consider what Jesus said about the scope of our preaching work. He foretold that the good news would be preached in all the inhabited earth, for a witness to all the nations. That prophecy is being fulfilled today as never before. The Kingdom Message is published in more than 1,000 languages, and by means of the JW.org website, it is available to the majority of the world's population. However, Jesus also told his disciples that they would not complete the circuit of the cities or preach to everyone before he would come. Jesus' words will prove to be true in our day as well. Millions of people today live in areas where the preaching work is severely restricted. In addition, hundreds of babies are born every minute. We do our best to reach people of every nation and tribe and tongue with the good news, but the fact is that we will not be able to share the good news with each individual on earth before the end comes. Thus a question arises. What about those who may have not had a chance to hear the good news before the Great Tribulation strikes? How will Jehovah and his son, whom he has entrusted to do the judging, deal with them? The theme text of this article states that Jehovah does not desire anyone to be destroyed. Instead, he wants all to attain to repentance. That said, we must acknowledge that Jehovah has not yet revealed to us what he will do in answer to this question. Of course, he is not obligated to tell us anything about what he has done or will do. In his word, Jehovah has revealed to some of us the things he will do. For example, the Bible tells us that the that Jehovah will bring back to life unrighteous people who have not yet had the opportunity to respond to the good news and change their ways. That raises other important questions. All every single question or every single answer that they give raises a host of other questions. Will all who die during the events of the Great Tribulation 
be destroyed forever with no hope of a resurrection. The scriptures make it clear that outright opposers whom Jehovah and his forces will destroy at Armageddon will not be resurrected. But what other but what about others, for example, who may die from natural causes, from accidents, or at the hand of other humans? Could some of these be among the unrighteous who will be resurrected in the new world? We simply do not know. I've got a picture here of uh, some lady on the on the telly on the news broadcasts. Looks like they are outlawing religion. Government orders shutdown of religious activities. This lady has got a letter from her parents or something. Uh, dad's checking out. There's some police across the street making sure that's hey, we're not religious here. We're just we're just having our daughter try her new panna cotta recipe. Oh, and the daughter has a tattoo. Ah, so you can clearly she see that she left the truth. Let's see, that's her right arm. Oh, okay, so she's hiding her tattoo now. Yeah, okay, don't get tattoos. Huh, I didn't actually notice that, I don't think, the first time I saw it. But that might be on some people's bingo card for the annual meeting, to be fair. Is, are they going to allow tattoos? But why would they specifically go out of their way to show it as being bad here if they're only going to change it a year later? I think they're going to stay on the tattoo trade. Oh. Okay. We do know several things about future events. For example, we know that at Armageddon, people will be dealt with on the basis of how they treated Christ's brothers. Those who judged as sheep will have shown their support for the anointed and for Christ. We also know that some of Christ's brothers will still be on earth after the Great Tribulation starts and will not be taken into heaven until shortly before the outbreak of Armageddon. As long as the brothers of Christ are still on earth, it is possible that honest-hearted individuals will have the opportunity to support them and the work they are doing. Why are those facts significant? Even after the Great Tribulation starts, it is possible that some who see the destruction of Babylon the Great will recall that Jehovah's Witnesses had long spoken of this event. Might some who see these events have a change of heart? This still, in my personal opinion, is the biggest change to any Watchtower doctrine in the last in my lifetime. So in the last 35 years, I think this is the big single biggest change. It just has to be. Such an outcome would be similar to what occurred in Egypt in Moses' day. Recall that a vast mixed company joined Israel in the Exodus, some of these individuals may have started to develop faith even when they saw Moses' warnings about the ten plagues came true. If a similar development should occur following the destruction of Babylon the Great, would we be disappointed that people were able to join us shortly before the end comes? Of course not. We want to reflect the personality of our Heavenly Father, a God merciful and compassionate, slow to anger, and abundant in loyal love and truth. At times we hear someone say, it would almost be better if my relative dies before the Great Tribulation begins, so that there is a hope for his resurrection. There are surely kind motives behind such expressions, but a person's eternal future does not depend on when he happens to die. Jehovah is the perfect judge. He renders just and righteous decisions. It's That is actually really irritating how they do that. At times, we hear someone say, it would be better if my relative dies. And there are, are surely kind motives behind such expressions. It's like, yeah, you silly little Jehovah's Witnesses. You know, we understand you have good motives when you're saying that. No, they are literally looking at your doctrine and looking at, hey, this is an actual loophole. Like, if my relative dies a day before the Great Tribulation breaks out, then they'll be resurrected and have a chance. Like, you were the one teaching it. So if you're going to, like, try and make people feel silly and stupid. Like, oh, I'm sure you were sincere when you were saying that. Uh, it's like, well, no, you guys are the one that was teaching it. Is it. It is reasonable to conclude that a person's eternal future does not depend on where he happens to live. It is unthinkable that Jehovah would automatically label as goats millions of people who have lived in lands where they never had an opportunity to respond to the kingdom message. The righteous judge of all the earth cares even more about these individuals than we could ever. We do not know how Jehovah will remove, maneuver 
events during the Great Tribulation, perhaps some of these people will have an opportunity to learn about Jehovah, put faith in him, and take their stand on Jehovah's side when he sanctifies himself before all nations. Through our study of the Bible, we have come to know just how much Jehovah values human life. He gave his son son's life so that all of us may have the prospect of living forever. We have all felt Jehovah's tender affection. He knows each of us by name. In fact, he knows us so well as individuals that should we die, he can recreate every unique detail and restore every memory that makes us who we are. Surely, we have good reason to be confident that our loving Heavenly Father will judge each individual in a perfectly balanced, righteous, and merciful way. These clarifications actually make our preaching work more urgent than ever. That is simply a load of hogwash. Why can we say that? And what motivates us to keep preaching? The good news without let up? We will discuss those answers in the next article. At the 2023 annual meeting, we received thrilling clarifications on some of our beliefs, and we heard some exciting announcements about our ministry. We learned, for example, that some individuals may have an opportunity to side with Jehovah's people even after Babylon the Great is destroyed. We also learned that as of November 2023, Kingdom Publishers would no longer be asked to report all the activity in the ministry. Do such changes make our ministry less important, less urgent than before? Absolutely not. Each passing day, our ministry becomes more urgent. Why? Because time is running out. Consider what Jesus foretold about the preaching work in the last days. According to Matthew's parable account, Jesus said that the good news would be preached in all the inhabited earth before the end comes. That expression refers to the complete end of Satan's wicked system of things. Jehovah has set the day and the hour for the events that will soon unfold. Each day brings us... One day closer to that time. Meanwhile, we must keep preaching until the end comes. As we reflect on our ministry, we do well to consider a soul-searching question. Why do we preach the good news? Put simply, love motivates us to preach. What we do in the preaching work reflects our love, our love for the good news, our love for people, and above all, our love for Jehovah and his name. Let us consider these one at a time. Can you recall how you felt when you received some good news? perhaps the birth of a new family member, or even the offer of a much-needed job. Then you turned it down because you wanted a pioneer. No doubt you were eager to share that good news with your friends and family. Did something similar happen when you heard the best news of all, the good news of God's kingdom? Think back to how you felt when you first learned the truth about God's word. You discovered that your heavenly Father loves you, and that he wants you to be part of his family of worshipers, that he has promised to end pain and suffering that you can hope to see your dead loved ones again back to life in a new world and much more. Those truths warmed your heart. You loved what you were learning and you could not keep those precious truths to yourself. Oh, what do we got in a picture? Old guy preaches to Peyton Manning, or at least that looks like him from a side profile. Uh, it's like Peyton Manning and Mark Zuckerberg had a baby. This is it. He's preaching to people when he's playing basketball and workmates or when he's out at a restaurant or somewhere i don't really know and he's even doing it to his mustached father apparently yeah, i think so and uh yeah you're excited i'm learning the truth and i'm gonna share it with other people <laughs> consider an experience a brother named Ernest was about 10 years old when his father died. Ernest call, recalls, I wondered, has he gone to heaven, or has he ceased to exist forever? I envied other children who still had a father. Ernest would regularly go to the cemetery, kneel at his father's graves, and pray, Please, God, I know, I want to know where my dad is. About 17 years after his father died, Ernest was offered a Bible study, which he readily accepted. He was thrilled to learn that the dead are unconscious as, in, as if in a deep sleep, and that the Bible promises a future resurrection. Finally, he found the answer to the question that had troubled him for so long. Ernest was very excited about the Bible truths he was learning. His wife, Rose, joined him in the study and shared his love for the kingdom message. In 1978, they got baptized. They eagerly shared the treasured beliefs with family, friends, and any others who would listen. As a result, Ernest and Rose have helped more than 70 individuals progress to baptism. 
Co- coincidentally, they have uh, 70 children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. <laughs> Clearly, when love for Bible truth takes root in our heart, we cannot keep silent. We feel like the first century disciples of Jesus who said, we cannot stop speaking about the things we have seen and heard. We love the truth so much that we want to share it with as many people as possible. Like Jehovah and his son, we love people. We feel deep compassion for those who are without God and who have no hope. They are drowning in life's problems, and we have the vest. Are we have the vest they need? The good news of the kingdom. Our love, our compassion for such ones motivates us to make every effort to reach them with the good news. That precious message can fill their hearts with hope, help them find the best life possible now, and give them prospect of the real life, everlasting life in God's new world. They just sound like pretentious, like we have the ultimate truths and we have to share it with those people. I had a picture where they're eating some beignets looking looking things. I don't really know what those are. And some cappuccinos. Anyway, our love for people also moves us to warn them about the approaching end of the wicked the wicked world. We have pity for our neighbors and our unbelieving family members. Many go about their daily lives unaware of what is coming. A great tribulation such as not occurred since the world's beginning until now, nor will ever occur. We want them to know what will happen during the time of the last of the judgment. False religion will be removed and the destruction of the entire wicked system will follow at Armageddon. We pray that as many people as possible will respond to the warning and to join us in pure worship now. But what about those who do not heed the warning at that time, including beloved family members? As explained in the preceding article, it may be Jehovah's will to save people who have a change of heart when they see the destruction of Babylon the Great. If so, then it is all the more urgent that we keep sounding the warning. Consider this. What we tell them now may give them something to remember then. Perhaps they will reflect back on the warning they heard from us and be moved to join us in pure worship before it is too late. Like the jailer in Philippi who had a change of heart only after a great earthquake occurred, perhaps some who do not respond now will have a change of heart after the world-shaking destruction of Babylon the Great. I will be one of them. If that happens tomorrow, then watch our arms. I'm signing up. I'm jumping ship. I'm on board, baby. The most important reason why we preach the good news is that we love Jehovah God and his holy name. We view our ministry as a way to praise the God we love. We wholeheartedly agree that Jehovah God is worthy to receive glory, honor, and power from his loyal worshipers. We give him glory and honor when we share with others the convincing evidence that he created all things, that we owe him our very existence. We give him power, our power. When we use, yes, we, you can give God your power. He really needs it. When we use our time, energy, and resources to share in the ministry as fully as our circumstances allow. Put simply, we love to speak about the God. We love. We also feel compelled to tell others about his name and what he stands for. Why? Our love for Jehovah moves us to sanctify his name. We want to have a part in clearing his name of the reproach that Satan has brought on it by his malicious lies. In our ministry, we are eager to stand up for our God, telling the truth about him to any and all who will listen. We want everyone to know that his greatest quality is love and that his way of ruling is righteous and just, and that his kingdom will soon end all suffering and bring peace and happiness to the human family. When we defend Jehovah's reputation in our ministry, we sanctify his name. We also have the satisfaction of knowing that we are living up to our name. How so? A picture you can preach in Africa, some air, d- d- desert. You can preach in a metropolis city with some buses or a light rail. And you can preach on a beach. That should be the title of this whole article. Just preach on the beach. Jehovah has called us to be his witnesses. Some years ago, a letter from the governing body stated, The greatest honor that any of us could enjoy is that of being called one of Jehovah's witnesses. Why is that so? Consider an illustration. If you need someone to be a character witness for you 
a court case, you would choose someone you know and trust, someone whose reputation would make his testimony trustworthy. By choosing to be his witnesses, Jehovah shows that he knows us well and that he trusts us to testify that he is the only true God, and we feel so honored to be his witnesses that we seize every opportunity to make his name known and to combat the many lies that have been told about him. By doing so, we live up to the name that we are so proud to bear, as Jehovah's Witnesses. What exciting prospects lie ahead of us? With Jehovah's blessing, we hope to see many more accept the truth before the Great Tribulation begins, also, we are thrilled at the possibility that even during the darkest time in human history, the Great Tribulation, we may still see more people turn away from Satan's dying world and join us in praising Jehovah. Meanwhile, we have work to do. We have the privilege of sharing in a never-to-be-repeated uh, never proclamation the preaching of the good news of God's kingdom throughout the earth. At the same time, we must keep sounding the warning People need to know that the end of the wicked system of things is rapidly approaching. Then, when that time of judgment arrives, they will know that the message we preach came from Jehovah God. What then are we determined to do? Motivated by love, love for the good news, love for people, and above all, love for Jehovah God in his name. We will keep preaching with eagerness, urgency, and zeal until Jehovah says, it is enough. 21, 21, 21, 21. How to find a potential marriage mate. Would you like to get married? While marriage is not essential for happiness, many single Christians, whether young or old, look forward to having a marriage mate. Of course, pursuing a courtship, you should be financially, spiritually, and emotionally ready for marriage. <laughs> that was a yawn and a half. So I'm getting a bit peckish a little peckish might need to get some food soon however it is not always easy to find a suitable marriage mate and even when you find someone who ooh, someone you would like to get to know better it may not be easy to start a courtship in this article we will discuss what can help single christians to find a potential mate and begin a courtship we will also learn about how others in the congregation can support those who want to get married. This will start with the picture. Pioneer sister. Uh, she's preaching. She's at a construction project. Tossing salad. You got uh, this guy. He's part of the crew. And he's counseling people. So he's uh, at least a ministerial servant. And he's he's laying some pipe. <laughs> She's tossing a salad and he's laying pipe. I'm not even joking. That's literally what's happening in this picture. Two single Jehovah's Witnesses that are about to get together. What should you look for? One who's tossing salad and another who's laying pipe. <laughs> oh, God. I bet these watchtowers are going to get funnier the more delirious I get, but... It's not too bad. It's only 4.30 p.m., so we're cooking. If you would like to get married, it is best to know what you are looking for in a mate before beginning a courtship. Otherwise, you could overlook a potential mate, or you could pursue a courtship with someone who is not well-suited for you. Of course, any potential mate should be bap a baptized Christian. Not every baptized person will be a good marriage mate for you. So you could ask yourself, what are my goals in life? What qualities in a marriage mate do I? I view as essential. Are my expectations reasonable? No doubt you have prayed about finding a mate if that is your desire. Of course, Jehovah does not promise anyone a marriage partner, but he does care about your needs and feelings, and he can help you with your process of finding a mate. So continue sharing your desires and feelings with him. Pray for patience and wisdom. John, a single brother from the United States, explains that he included in his prayers... I tell Jehovah the qualities I desire in a mate. I pray for opportunities to meet a potential mate. I also ask Jehovah to help me develop qualities that will make me a good husband. Tanya, a sister from Sri Lanka, says, While I look for a possible potential mate, I ask Jehovah to help me to stay faithful, positive, and happy. Even if you do not find a potential marriage mate right away, Jehovah promises to continue caring for your physical and emotional needs. The Bible encourages us to have 
plenty to do in the work of the Lord. As you keep busy in Jehovah's service and spend time with a variety of brothers and sisters, you will not only enjoy upbuilding association, but also have opportunities to meet other hot singles in your local area. Sign up now for free, no credit card required. Like you <laughs> are focusing on serving Jehovah. And as you do your best to please Jehovah, you will experience true happiness. A word of caution, don't enter your credit card information in no. Though, do not allow your search for a mate to consume you. True happiness depends not on your marital status, but on your relationship with Jehovah. And while you are single, you have more freedom to expand your ministry. Make the best use of your time. Jessica, a sister from the United States who married in her late 30s, says, I stayed busy in the ministry, and that helped me to be content despite wanting to get married. What if you think someone might make a good marriage mate? Should you immediately express interest in that person? The Bible says that a person... This does not count as a Mitch McConnell moment. There is a little net flying around on my screen. And it's really irritating. Well, this sucks. I wonder how, I guess we should give him a name because he's probably going to be in here a while. I will call you uh, Joffrey. Shout out to Joffrey, the fly. How could you go about discreetly observing the other person? At congregation meetings or at social gatherings, you may notice things about the person's personality, personality, and conduct. Who are his friends and what does he talk about? Are his goals compatible with yours? You might speak to his congregation elders or other mature Christians who know him well. You might, ask, you might ask about the person's reputation and qualities. As you observe this individual, be sure to avoid making him feel uncomfortable. Respect his feelings, privacy, and personal space. How long should you observe the person before you express your interest? If you approach someone too soon, you could come, cro come across as impulsive. <laughs> I love you. Do you want to get married? On the other hand, if you take too long, you could come across as indecisive, especially as if the other person has perceived your interest. Well, looks like you're just out of luck. Remember, oh, hey, Jeff, Joffrey. Remember, before approaching someone, you do not need to be convinced that you will marry that person, but you should be convinced that you're ready for marriage and that the other person could be a suitable mate for you. Ah, so now the salad tosser and the pipe layer are... Looking at each other from across the hall. Ooh wee. Oh boy. Oh, and she's wearing, they're wearing different outfits. So this is over the course of uh, many weeks, months, days. Not quite sure. Things are heating up here in the Jehovah's Witness Kingdom Hall. Somebody get a fire hydrant out here. Pipe is being laid. Remember before approaching someone, you do not, oh yeah, we got there. What though if you sense that someone is interested in you? If the feeling is not mutual, try to make that clear by your actions. It would be unkind to make the person think that there is a possibility of a relationship when that is not the case. In some lands, parents or other adults may be expected to choose a mate for their single relatives. In other lands, friends or family friends find a potential mate for a single person and then arrange for the man and the woman to meet to see whether they are compatible. If you are asked to arrange a courtship or a marriage, Consider the preferences and needs of both parties. <laughs> Once you identify a prospective mate, find out as much as possible about you can about the individual's personality, qualities, and above all, spirituality. A close relationship with Jehovah is much more important than money, education, or social status. Remember, however, that the single brother and the and the single sisters should make the final decision about whether to get married. If you would like to begin a courtship with someone, how might you go about expressing your interests? You could arrange to have a conversation with the person either in public setting or by telephone. Whew. Clearly, express your intentions. Hey, I want to date you. Would you like to date me? Even if, if needed, give the person time to think about how to respond. And if the person is not interested in pursuing a relationship, respect his or her feelings. It doesn't say her feelings. It only says respect his feelings. So apparently, if you're 
you can just not respect hers. I don't know. We won't go too far. What if someone expresses interest in you? It likely took courage for that person to approach you, so be kind and respectful. If you need time to consider whether you agree to start a courtship, say no. However, try to provide a response as soon as possible. If you are not interested, express the fact kindly and clearly. Note how Hans, a brother from Austria, responded when a sister approached him. I communicated my decision tactfully but clearly. I did so right away because I did not want to give her false hope. For the same reason, I was also careful about how I interacted with her afterward. So it was awkward and I changed congregations. And uh, yeah, that was the end of that. On the other hand, if you are interested in courting that person, discuss your feelings and expectations regarding courtship. Your expectations may dis differ from the other person's depending on your culture or on other factors. How can all of us support single Christians who want to get married? One way is by being careful about what we say. We could ask ourselves, do I tease those who want to get married? When I see a single brother and a single sister talking, do I assume that they have rom romantic interest in each other? Brother, in this article, you literally say, hey, if you have interest in someone, arrange to meet in a public place and express clearly your intentions. The rules of Watchtower, you can almost assume that if you see a, two single people talking, that they do have romantic interest in each other. Uh, you you have to have something like wrong to like write this and not see just how these articles make no sense. Additionally, we should never make uh, single Christians feel that they are somehow incomplete because they are not married. Hans quoted earlier states, Some brothers say, why don't you get married? You're not that young anymore. Such comments make single ones feel unappreciated and only increase the pressure they may feel to get married. How much better to look for opportunities to commend single Christians? Yeah, just be like, hey, congratulations, you're still single. Ah. And do it sarcastically. What if we think that a certain brother or sister would make a good couple? The Bible tells us to consider the feelings of others. Many single ones do not want others to introduce them to a potential mate, and we should respect their wishes. Others may appreciate some help, but we should not intervene without being asked. Some single ones prefer a less direct approach. Lydia, a sister, single sister from Germany, says, You could include the brother and the sister in a large group. Simply create the opportunity for the brother and sister to meet and leave the rest up to them. If you need to be told that, then uh, God help you. All of us, single or married, can live a happy and a satisfying lives. So if you want to get married but you have not yet found someone, continue focusing on your service to Yahweh. A sister from Macau named Sinyi says... Compared with the time you could spend with your spouse in paradise, the time being single, single is relatively short. <laughs> what? <laughs> Treasure that time and make good use of it. Oh, boy, that is really tragic. But what if you have found a potential mate and have had and you have begun courting? In the next article, we will discuss how you can have a successful courtship. Oh, boy. Can't wait to do some courting. I'm going to court it up. Courtship can be joyful, a, a joyful, exciting time. If you are currently in a courtship, no doubt you want it to go well. And for many couples, it does. Tissian, a sister from Ethiopia, Tissian, 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 a sister from Ethiopia says, One of the happiest times of my life was when my husband and I dated. We had serious discussions and we also laughed. I was happy when I realized that I had found someone I love and who loves me. However, Alessio, a brother from the Netherlands, says, it was enjoyable to get to know my wife when we were dating, but our court trip also had challenges. In this article, we will discuss some potential challenges and some Bible principles that can help couples to have a successful courtship. We will also consider how others in the congregation can support courting couples. Although courtship can be enjoyable, it is also a serious step that may lead to our ma lead to marriage. On their wedding day, a couple vow before Jehovah to love and respect each other for as long as they both live. Before making any vow, we should consider the matter very carefully. That is certainly true of the marriage vow. Courtship allows a couple to get to know each other and to make a good decision. Sometimes that decision is to get married. 
Sometimes that decision is to end the courtship. If a couple break up, this does not mean that their courtship failed. Instead, the courtship served its purpose. Help them come to a good decision. Why is it important to have the right view of courtship? When single people have the proper viewpoint, they will not date someone they have no intention of marrying. Single people, however, are not the only ones who need to have the right perspective. All of us should develop it. For example, some think that if a couple are dating, they must get married. How does this attitude affect single Christians? Melissa, a single sister in the United States, says there's a lot of pressure on witnesses who are dating. As a result, some courting couples avoid ending a relationship that is not working. Other single ones avoid dating altogether. The pressure can be quite overwhelming. If you are in a courtship, what will help you decide whether to get married or not? Get to know each other well. You likely learned some things about the other person before you began dating, but now you have the opportunity to get to know the secret person of the heart. This involves learning more about your prospective mate's personality, spirituality, and thinking. Over time, you should be able to answer such questions as, Will this person be a good marriage mate for me? <laughs> you should be able to answer these hard-hitting, serious questions. Will this person be a good marriage? <laughs> Can we fill each other's emotional needs? Can we live without each other's... Can we live with each other's shortcomings? <laughs> Thanks, Watchtower. You're really, really dropping some knowledge. As you get to know each other, remember, compatibility is largely determined not by how similar you are, but how adaptable you are to each other's differences. Long-distance courtships. If you are in a long-distance relationship, you can apply many of the suggestions in article virtually by phone. You can still focus on talking and listening to each other. You have literally nothing else to focus on. Nevertheless, it may be difficult to learn some things about each other without spending time together in person, so visit each other when possible. You also have additional factors to consider. For example, are you willing and able to move and possibly adapt to another culture or language? Can you handle the expenses of traveling to see each other during the courtship and visit the other person's family and friends even afterward? As you get to know each other, remember, compatibility is largely determined not by how similar you are, but by how adaptable you are to the other person's differences. Oh, wait, did I read that? Maybe, uh, what other matters should you learn about the other person during courtship? Before you become too emotionally involved, you may want to discuss some important matters such as the other person's goals. But what about such matters as health issues, financial problems, or past trauma? Not all topics need to be discussed at the beginning of the courtship. If you feel that it is too soon to answer some particularly personal questions, let the other person know. Nevertheless, in time, your prospective mate will need to know this information in order to make a balanced decision. So at some point, you will have to open up. They should make people read this when they go on The Bachelor. That'd be funny. A Jehovah's Witness version of The Bachelor would go pretty hard. What would you do in, in, instead of like fantasy suites? I think it would be like, you guys get to go cart witnessing together. <laughs> so do you want to do an eight-hour car, cart witnessing shift to see if we can stand each other? <laughs> really have some good deep conversations. How can you get to know what the other person is like deep inside? One of the best ways is to talk openly and honestly, to ask questions and really listen. To that end, you may find it helpful to engage in activities that lend themselves to conversations such as eating together, taking walks together in public areas, and preaching together. You can also learn about each other when you spend time with friends and family. Additionally, plan activities that will show you how the other person acts in different circumstances and with different people. Note that Ashvin from the Netherlands tried to do. He says about his courtship with Alicia. We looked for activities that would help us learn about each other. Often these were simple things such as preparing a meal together or doing chores together. During such activities, we had pillow fights and we saw each other's strengths and weaknesses. You can also get to know each other by studying spiritual topics together. If you get married, you will need to make time for family worship so that God is an essential part of your marriage. So why not schedule time to study together now, during your courtship? Of course, a courting couple are not a family yet, and the brother is not the sister's head yet. Nevertheless, by studying together regularly, you can learn about each other's spirituality. Max and Lisa, a couple from the United States, found another benefit. He says, early in our courtship, we started studying publications on the subject of dating, marriage, and family life. 
Those publications opened the door to conversations on many important matters that would not have come up naturally. Whom should you tell about your courtship? That is for you to decide as a couple. Early in the relationship, you may consider limiting the number of people you tell. By doing so, you may avoid unnecessary pressure and questions. However, if you do not tell anyone, you might end up isolating yourselves for fear that others will find out. This can be dangerous, so it would be wise to learn to inform those who can provide good advice and practical assistance. For example, you could tell certain family members, mature friends, or Christian elders. Oh boy, the elders are coming back. How can you keep your courtship honorable? As your feelings grow, you will naturally feel more attracted to each other. What can help you keep your moral yourselves morally clean? Avoid immoral conversations, being alone together, and heavy drinking. These things can arouse passion and weaken your resolve to do what is right. Why not regularly discuss together what measures you can take to keep your courtship honorable? Note what helped uh, DeWitt and Almez from Ethiopia. They say, We would spend time together in places where there were plenty of people or in the company of other friends. We were never in a car, alone in a car or a house. Thus, we avoided situations that could be tempting. What about displays of affection? Some may be appropriate as your relationship progresses. However, if your passions are aroused, you will likely find it hard to think objectively about the other person. Displays of affection can e also easily escalate and lead to misconduct. Therefore, earlier in your relationship, discuss what limits you will set in harmony with Bible principles. Ooh, footnote. It has the word fondle in it, so we should definitely read that. Fondling of another person's genitals is a form of sexual immorality, requiring that the congregation elders take judicial action. Fondling of the breasts an immoral conversation by text or telephone could also result in judicial action, depending on the circumstances. No fondling zone. You just hand out t-shirts at the Kingdom Hall. Okay, here's your new watchtower and awake. And here's your free t-shirt. No fondling zone. <laughs> As a couple, ask yourselves, how would you do... How would people view where... How would people where we live view displays of affection between us? Could these actions arouse passion in either of us? How can you handle problems and disagreements? What if you have disagreements from time to time? Would this indicate that your relationship is not working? Not necessarily. All couples have differences. A strong marriage is made of two people who can work together to overcome their differences. So how you work through problems now may reveal whether your marriage will be successful. As a couple, ask yourselves, can we discuss matters calmly and respectfully? Do we readily admit our shortcomings and try to improve? Are we quick to yield, apologize, and forgive? Nevertheless, if you constantly disagree or argue during courtship, the situation will not likely improve after you get married. If you realize that the other person is not right for you, ending the courtship would be the best decision for both of you. How long should your courtship last? Hasty decisions often bring negative consequences, so your courtship should be long enough for you to get well acquainted with the other person. However, you should not prolong the courtship unnecessarily. The Bible also says, expectation postponed makes the heart sick. Hey, Joffrey. Additionally, as the courtship progresses, it may be more difficult to resist sexual temptation. Instead of focusing on how long you have been dating, you can ask yourself, what do I still need to learn about the other person in order to make a decision? If we know a courting couple, how can we help them? We could invite them to join us for a meal, for family worship, or for recreation. Under those circumstances, they may get to know each other even more. Do they need a chaperone, help with transportation, or a place where they can talk privately? If so, could we offer to help? Alicia mentioned earlier recalls that she and Ashwin appreciated. She says, We found it heartwarming that some brothers said that we could visit them if we needed a place to be together but not secluded. If you are asked to chaperone, why not consider it a privilege? Be careful not to leave the couple completely alone, but also discern when they need time and space to talk privately. So basically just make sure you can be in the same room together, but make sure the door is open at least one reference Bible length and keep your ears up against the walls. 
We can also support courting couples by what we say or do not say. At times, we need, to, we need to control ourselves. For instance, we may be eager to tell others that a couple have begun dating, but the couple may not want to share the news themselves. We should not gossip about a courting couple or criticize them about personal matters. Furthermore, the couple may not appreciate comments or questions implying that they should or will get married. A sister named Elise and her husband recall, We found it awkward when others asked us about our wedding plans when we hadn't discussed them yet. What if the couple decide to end the courtship? Should we we should avoid prying into the matter or taking sides? A sister named Leah said, I heard that others had been speculating about why a brother and I broke up. I was really hurt. As mentioned earlier, a breakup does not necessarily mean that the couple failed. Usually it simply means that the courtship achieved its purpose. It helped the couple come to a good decision. However, that decision may still have caused them emotional pain may have left them feeling alone so we can look for ways to support them. As we have seen, courtship can have its challenges, but it can also be enjoyable. Jessica recalls, quite honestly, courtship was a lot of work, but it was 100% worth the time and energy. If you are a courting couple, continue working on getting to know each other well. If you do, you will have a successful courtship, one that will help you both make a wise decision. Another watchtower in the bag, and I'm going to go get a snack. Or, I guess I can go a little longer. I'll go a bit longer before I download these and get a food. Boom. See, the trouble with doing all of this is that it's just like a time thing because it does take a long time to download, like, the longer I record, so I have to, like, balance it. But it gives me a chance to stand up so I don't get heart disease, and uh, I do have to eat today. Uh, Maybe another coffee is in order, but I don't know if I can handle that energy. Anyway, I'm just yapping now, so... Let's run it. June 2024. That is a big-ass mountain. I'm guessing with faith you can, the size of a mustard grain, you can move a mountain or something. Jehovah's grand invitation to be his guests. Be his guests. What role does Jehovah play in your life? You may answer, Jehovah is my father, my God, and my friend. Are there also other titles or designations that you may apply to Jehovah? How do you view him as your host? Well, I'm kind of hungry, so serve up some food. King David compared Jehovah's friendship and his loyal worshippers to the relationship between a host and his guests. He asked, O Jehovah, who may be guest in your tent? Who may reside in your holy mountain? From these inspired words, we learn that we can become Jehovah's guests, his friends. Is this not a grand invitation from Jehovah? Before creation, Jehovah was alone. But at one point, he welcomed his firstborn son into his figurative tent. Jehovah took great pleasure in his new role as host. The Bible reveals that Jehovah was especially fond of his son. His first guest, in turn, rejoiced before Jehovah all the time. Jehovah then created other spirit beings, inviting them to be his guests too. His angels are called sons of God and are described as being happy in Jehovah's company. For some time... Uh, For some time, God's friendship was limited to those living in the spirit realm where he dwells. Later, he extended his tent to include humans on earth. In time, among those favored ones were Enoch, Noah, Abraham, and Job. Those true worshippers... Those true worshippers were described as God's friends or ones who walked with the true God. Throughout the centuries, Jehovah continued to invite his friends to be his guests. For example... From Ezekiel's prophecy, we learn that God truly wants his loyal worshippers to have a warm relationship with him. He promises to make a covenant of peace with them. That prophecy points to a time when those who have a heavenly hope and those who have an earthly hope will be unified, united under the figurative tent as one flock. That time is now. 
In Bible times, a person's tent was a place of rest and protection from the elements. A guest in that tent could expect to be well cared for. When we enter into a dedicated relationship with Jehovah, we become guests in his figurative tent. We enjoy an abundance of spiritual food and the companionship of others who have also become Jehovah's guests. His figurative tent is not confined to a particular location. You may have traveled to a foreign land, perhaps to attend a special convention, and met others who are blessed to be in God's tent. It can be found wherever his obedient worshipers happen to be. What about faithful ones who have died? Can we reasonably conclude that they are still guests in Jehovah's tent? Yes, we can say that. Because such ones are alive in Jehovah's memory, Jesus explained that the dead are raised up. Even Moses made known in the account about the thorn bush that he calls Jehovah the God of Abraham, the son of God of Isaac and of Jacob. He is a God not of the dead, but of the living, for they are all living to him. Just as a literal tent can be a place of rest and shelter from the elements, Jehovah's tent provides his guests with protection from spiritual harm and hopelessness. When we remain close to Jehovah, Satan can do us no lasting harm. In the world, Jehovah will continue to protect his faithful friends, not only from spiritual harm, but also from death. It is truly a great honor to be a guest in Jehovah's tent, to enjoy a personal and ongoing relationship with him. How should we conduct ourselves if we want to continue as his guests? If you were invited to someone's home, you would want to know what he expects of you. For example, he might expect you to remove your shoes before entering, and you and you would willingly comply. Likewise, we certainly want to know what Jehovah requires of those who want to continue to to continue being guests in his tent. Our love for Jehovah moves us to do everything in our power to please him fully. And while we view Jehovah as our friend, we realize that he is also our God and Father who is worthy of our respect. With that in mind, we should always be in awe of him, never forgetting who he is. Such reverence will help us to avoid conduct that would offend him. We certainly desire to walk in modesty with our God. Jehovah is impartial in his dealings with his guests. We can gain insight into Jehovah's impartiality from the way he dealt with the Israelites in the wilderness of Sinai. After he had delivered his people from slavery in Egypt, Jehovah appointed priests to serve at the tabernacle. Levites were assigned to share in other duties related to that holy tent. Did those who served at the tabernacle or who were encamped close it to enjoy better care for Jehovah than others? No, Jehovah is not partial. Everyone in the encampment had an equal opportunity to enjoy Jehovah's friendship regardless of any special appointment or where they lived in relation to the tabernacle. For example, Jehovah made sure that the entire nation was able to see the miracle, miraculous pillar, or cloud of cloud and wow. Was able to see the mirac- miraculous pillar of cloud and pillar of fire posted above the tabernacle. When the clouds started to move in a new direction, even those encamped farthest from the tabernacle were able to see that, assemble their belongings, dismantle their family tents, and keep pace with the rest of the nation. All could hear the loud, distinctive blast of the two silver trumpets trumpets signaling everyone the need to start moving. Clearly, living in close proximity to the tabernacle was not in itself evidence of a close relationship with Jehovah. Rather, everyone in Jehovah's newly formed nation could be his guests and count on his direction and protection. Similarly today, no matter where we live on earth, we can benefit from Jehovah's loving, watchful care. Some among God's people today live near world headquarters or branch office of Jehovah's Witnesses. Others actually serve at these facilities. As a result, such ones can share in many of the activities that take place at these locations and personally associate with those who take the lead. Some serve as traveling overseers or in other forms of special full-time service. 
If you are among the vast majority who do not presently enjoy such circumstances, rest assured that our host Jehovah loves all his approved guests. And he gives them all his personal care. All of God's people receive the spiritual nourishment, direction, and protection they need. Another example of Jehovah's impartiality as our host is that he makes the Bible accessible to people around the globe today. The Holy Scriptures were originally written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Do not do those who can read the original language have a closer relationship with Jehovah than those who cannot? No, they do not. Jehovah's approval of us is not dependent on our secular education or on our ability with languages. Rather than offer his wisdom only to the highly educated, Jehovah makes it accessible to people around the earth, whether they are highly educated or not. His inspired word, the Bible, has been translated into thousands of languages. Thus, people the world over can benefit from its teachings and learn how they can become his friends. It is a great privilege to be welcomed by Jehovah as his guests in his figurative tent. He is the kindest, most loving, most hospitable host imaginable. Furthermore, he is impartial, welcoming all of us regardless of our location, background, education, race, tribe, age, or gender. Yet, only those who meet his standards are acceptable as his guests. As recorded at Matthew 15, 1, David raised questions. O Jehovah, who may be a guest in your tent? Who may reside in your holy mountain? The psalmist was inspired to answer those questions. The following article will thus discuss some specific requirements we must meet to remain acceptable to Jehovah. Uh, a, that article was boring as hell. Obviously, far and away, the most boring article that we've had yet. Uh, two, my voice was getting a little, uh, was getting a little tough there. So we might need to uh, to talk a little quieter, but that's fine. That's fine. In the preceding article, we learn that Jehovah's. I'm gonna actually put my headphones on so I can hear myself and make sure I'm not talking too quiet, and then that should be okay. In the preceding article, we learn that Jehovah's dedicated servants can be guests in His figurative tent by cultivating a close personal relationship with Him. But how can we qualify for such a relationship? Psalm 15 has much to say on this subject. The psalm offers practical lessons that can help us to draw closer to God. Psalm 15 opens, O Jehovah, who may be a guest in your tent? Who may reside in your holy mountain? When mentioning Jehovah's tent, the psalmist David may have been thinking of the tabernacle, which was in Gibeon for a time. David also mentions God's holy mountain, perhaps referring to Zion in Jerusalem. There, several miles south of Gibeon, David pitched a tent to house the Ark of the Covenant until a more permanent resting place for it could be built. Of course, most Israelites were never allowed to serve at the tabernacle, much less venture inside the tent where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. But But all of Jehovah's faithful servants could be guests in his figurative tent by becoming and remaining his friends. That is something we all desire. Psalm 15 outlines some qualities that we need in order or we need to develop and to display to remain Jehovah's friend. Oh, this is a cute little picture. The Israelites in David's day could form a mental image of being a guest in Jehovah's tent. Hmm. Looks peaceful there. <laughs> like sitting here, I'm like it's getting kind of hot. Looks really peaceful there. Outside, flowers, that sounds nice. At Psalms 15, 2, a friend of God is described as the one who is walking faultlessly, practicing what is right. The terms walking and practicing imply action that is both constant and progressive. But what can we re- but can we really walk faultlessly? Yes. While no human is perfect, Jehovah will view us as walking faultlessly if we do our best to obey him. When we dedicate ourselves to God and get baptized, we are not starting on our journey with God. We are just we are just starting on our journey with God. Note that the Bible time note that in Bible times, 
Merely belonging to the nation of Israel would not automatically qualify a person to be a guest of Jehovah. Some called on him, but not in truth and righteousness. Since Israelites had to learn about Jehovah's requirements and follow them, similarly to enjoy God's approval today, more is required of us than getting baptized and associating with a Christian congregation. We must keep practicing what is right. What does that entail? In Jehovah's eyes, walking faultlessly and practicing what is right mean more than regularly sharing in some activities at a place of worship. We must strive to obey God in every aspect of our life, even when we are alone. It is important that we try to obey Jehovah even in relatively minor manners. Doing so shows that we are truly love him, which endears us to him. Hey look, it's Philip and Jesus, and they're welcoming you. Hey Philip, hey Jesus, thanks for welcoming me. Jehovah deeply appreciates what we have done for him in the past. However, past acts of faithfulness do not qualify us to remain as guests in Jehovah's tent. This is made clear in Hebrews 6, 10 through 12. Jehovah does not forget our past good deeds, but he wants us to keep rendering whole souled worship down to the end. He will reward us with eternal friendship, even if we do not, if, or if we do not tire out. Someone who wants to be an approved guest in Jehovah's tent must be speaking the truth in his heart. This means more than not lying. Jehovah wants us to be honest through and through. This is important for Jehovah detests a devious person, but his close friendship is with the upright. Those who speak the truth in their heart do not pretend to be obedient in public while breaking God's law in secret. They avoid acting deviously. A devious person may begin to doubt the wisdom of some of Jehovah's regulations. He may disobey Jehovah on matters that seem to him to be of little importance. Then if there then if there appear to be no consequences for his disobedience, he may be emboldened to violate God's law further and his worship would become hypocritical. We, however, want to be honest in all things. We can learn about the importance of having a sincere heart from Jehovah's first meeting with Nathaniel. When Philip brought his friend Nathaniel to meet Jesus, something remarkable happened. Although Jesus had never met Nathaniel, Jesus said, See truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Surely Jesus viewed his other disciples as honest, but Jesus saw in Nathanael an extraordinary sincerity. Like, Nathan, like us, Nathanael was imperfect, but there was nothing artificial or insincere about him. Jesus admired that and commanded Nathan, commended Nathanael for it. What an honor it would be if Jesus could point that out about us. Most of the requirements listed in the Psalm in Psalm 15 are now related to how we treat others. Psalm 15.3 states that a guest in Jehovah's tent does not slander with his tongue, he does nothing bad to his neighbor, and he does not defame his friends. Misusing our speech in such ways could cause serious harm to others and disqualify us from being guests in Jehovah's tent. The psalmist specifically mentions slander. What is slander? Generally, it is a false statement that can ruin somebody, someone's reputation. Unrepentant slanderers are removed from the Christian congregation. Psalm 15.3 also reminds us that Jehovah's guests do nothing bad to their neighbors and do not defame their friends. What might that involve? I've got a picture here. It is easy to spread negative information about others, perhaps bordering on slander. Hey, did you get a load of that guy? I hear he's been going out on a booze cruise. I don't know what they're saying. What could unintentionally defame someone by spreading negative information? For example, 1. A sister discontinues her full-time service. 2. Married couple no longer serve at Bethel. 3. A brother is no longer serving as an elder or ministerial servant. Would it be proper to speculate on the reasons why these adjustments were made and to share that opinion with others? There may be well, there well may be reasons for that change. 
that we are unaware of. Furthermore, a guest in Jehovah's tent does nothing bad to his neighbor, and he does not defame his friends. Okay, I can do this. Psalm 15.4 says that a friend of Jehovah rejects anyone who is contemptible. How can we do that? As imperfect humans, we are not qualified to determine whether someone is contemptible. Why? We might naturally be drawn to some people based on their personality traits and be annoyed by other people. Hence, we should reject on, we should reject only those whom Jehovah finds contemptible. This includes those who unrepentantly practice what is bad, disrespect our faith and beliefs, or try to undermine our spirituality. This guy. Conversely, Psalm 15.4 asks us to honor those fearing Jehovah. We accordingly look for new ways to show kindness and respect to Jehovah's friends. How? One way, based on Psalm 15.4, is that a guest in Jehovah's tent does not go back on his promise, even when it is bad for him. Breaking our promises could surely hurt others. For example, Jehovah expects his guests to live up to their marriage vow. He is also pleased when parents make earnest efforts to fulfill promises to make their children. They make to their children. Another way to honor God's friends is by being hospitable and generous. Leisure time with our brothers and sisters helps us to strengthen bonds of friendship with them and Jehovah. Moreover, by showing hospitality, we imitate Jehovah. We read that a guest of Jehovah does not lend his money on interest and he does not accept a bribe against the innocent. Why is money brought up in this short psalm? Because an unbalanced view of money can hurt others and ruin our friendship with God. In Bible times, some took advantage of the poor brothers by charging them interest on the money lent to them. Also, some judges accepted bribes and then judged innocent victims unfairly. Such practices are detestable to Jehovah. It is good for us to evaluate our personal attitude toward money. Ask yourself, do I often find myself thinking about money and what it can buy? If I borrow money, am I slow to repay it, concluding that the person who lent it to me does not need it? Does, it, does having money make me feel important but make it hard to be generous? Do I judge brothers and sisters as materialistic simply because they have money? Do I cultivate friendship with rich and show little interest in the poor? We have received a grand opportunity to be guests. We can protect the privilege by keeping our life free of the love of money. If we do, so Jehovah will never leave us. Psalm 15 ends with the promise, Whoever does these things will never be shaken. Here, the psalmist reveals the main objective behind God's requirements. Jehovah wants us to be happy. So he gives us direction that will bring us his blessing and protection. Jehovah's approval, approved guests can look forward to a bright future. The faithful anointed will have admission into many dwelling places, and they're prepared for them in heaven. Those with the earthly hope look forward to what Revelation 21.3 promises. Surely we all feel highly honored to receive Jehovah's warm invitation to be his friends, to be everlasting in his tent. Boop. And then we get another life story. A yippee ki -yay. All right. We are so back, baby. I took a shower. Uh, I didn't get more coffee, so I might save that for a little bit. It's like 6.30 p.m. And I'm going to be here all night, so maybe I'll pace myself a little bit. But uh, had some food, took a shower, feel clean and refreshed and ready to rock and roll. Most importantly, I gave myself like a little 45 or minutes, so almost an hour. A time just to rest my voice box, but I am ready to shake, rattle, and roll now. So let's get into this life story. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start here. As a 10-year-old boy, I looked up as the stars twinkling in the night. At the stars, I immediately messed up after my break. I was moved to get down on my knees and pray. I just learned about Jehovah, but I expressed my deepest concerns to him. That prayer began my lifelong journey with Jehovah God, the hearer of prayer. Let me relate why I prayed to God, I, to a God that I had only recently come to know. Oh, I gotta actually do this. I'm sure that will only affect I'm trying to edit that slightly. A life-changing visit. I was born on December 
1929 in Noville, a small hamlet of nine farms close to Bastogne in the Belgian Ardenne. I have two fond memories of my childhood, one of the farm with my parents, on the farm with my parents. My younger brother, Raymond, and I milked our cows by hand each day and helped to bring in each harvest. There was a deep sense of solidarity in our little village where we all pitched in to help one another. My parents, Emile and Alice, were devout Catholics. They attended Mass every Sunday. However, about 1939, pioneers from England came to our village and offered my dad a subscription to the Constellation magazine, now called Awake. I mean, pretty much now called nothing, am I right? My father quickly recognized the ring of truth and started reading the Bible. When he stopped attending Mass, our neighbors, who had been friendly, turned into fiery opposers. They pressured my father to remain Catholic, leading to many heated discussions. It pained me a lot to see my father under severe pressure. That prompted me to seek God's help in heartfelt prayer mentioned at the beginning of this article. When the opposition of our neighbors ebbed away, my heart swelled with joy. I became convinced that Jehovah is the hearer of prayer. Nazi Germany invaded Belgium on May 10, 1940, triggering an exodus of civilians. Our family fled to southern France. Along the way, we found ourselves caught in fierce battles between the German forces and the French forces. When we returned to our farm, we discovered that it had been looted of most of th our belongings. Only our dog, Bobby, was there to welcome us. Oh, they left their dog behind? Such experiences led me to wonder. Why do war and misery exist? I say, oh, they left their dog behind. <sighs> okay. Well, I'm officially starting to hear things now. I could have swore I heard someone pawing at the door. But that was absolutely uh, me hallucinating. So first hallucination, not bad. We're only seven hours in. Only another, like, 40 hours to go or so. No biggie. Around that time, we benefited greatly from the visits of our brother, Emil. Why am I so far away? I am just all over the place. I'll get locked in. Boom. Okay. That's better. Around that time, we benefited greatly from the visits of Brother Emil Schrantz, a faithful pioneer elder. He clearly explain, explained from the Bible why suffering exists and answered my questions about life. I developed a deeper relationship with Jehovah and became convinced that he is the God of love. Even before the war ended, our family enjoyed more regular contact with the brothers. In 1943, Brother Jose Nicolas Menet visited our farm to give a talk. He asked, who wants to get baptized? My dad raised his hand and so did I. We got baptized in a small river near our farm. In December 1944, the German army launched its major assault on its western front, widely known as the Battle of the Bulge. We live, I think the Battle of the Bulge is now known as that uh, Olympian that lost because uh, of his bulge <laughs> when it hit the, when he's trying to, I think, do a jump and his, uh, his bulge got caught on the pole. That's, uh, that's the new Battle of the Bulge. Too soon? Who knows? No one's even watching this anyway. We lived near where the battle was taking place, and we were confined to our cellar for about a month. One day, when I stepped out to feed the animals, artillery shells struck the farm, blowing away the barn roof. An American soldier in the stable near me cried out, Lie down! I ran and lay down near him, and he placed his helmet on my head to protect me. Oh, shoutouts to American soldiers. It's America. After the war, we managed to have regular contact with a congregation in Liege, some 90 kilometers north of us. In time, we were able to establish a small study group in Bastogne. I started to work in the tax administration and had the opportunity to study law. Later, I worked as a notary's clerk. In 1951, we organized a small circuit assembly in Bastogne. About a hundred people were present, including a very zealous pioneer sister, Ellie Rutner. She had cycled 50 kilometers to attend. Soon, we fell in love and got engaged. Ellie had received an invitation to attend Gilead School in the United States. 
she wrote to the world headquarters. So this is them on the farm with my family working on our farm. How many kids do they have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Jeez. That's a big old horse. Are these people short or is it, that horse really big? Huh. It's crazy. Anyway. There's Ellie. Nice and double breasted suit on their wedding day. Uh, anyway, okay. Um, she wrote to the world headquarters to explain why she felt that she had to decline the invitation. Brother Nor, who was taking the lead among Jehovah's people, kindly replied that perhaps one day she might attend Gilead with her husband. We got married in February 1953. That same year, Ellie and I attended the New World Society Assembly that was held at Yankee Stadium. I think my, if I remember correctly, my grandparents were there as well. While there, I met a brother who offered me a good job and invited me to immigrate to the United States. After taking Talking, taking the matter to Jehovah in prayer, Ellie and I decided to decline the offer and return to Belgium to support the small group of some ten publishers in Bastogne. The following year, we were blessed with a little boy, Sergei. Sadly, seven months later, Sergei fell sick and died. Oh, we shared our grief with Jehovah in prayer, and we were strengthened by the sure hope of the resurrection. In October 1961, I was able to find part-time work that would allow me to pioneer. That same day, though, I received a phone call from the branch servant in Belgium. He asked me if I wanted, if I was available to start serving as a circuit servant, now called circuit overseer. Couldn't we serve as pioneers first before accepting the assignment, I asked? My request was granted. After serving as pioneers for eight months, we began circuit work in September 1962. This guy's story is a little interesting because it's like he, it feels like he's actually like carving his own path slightly. It's like normally it's like, oh, they called and said, hey, we should go to Gilead. It's like, ah. Eh. Uh, maybe we'll just go back to Belgium. Uh, hey, why don't you get into circuit work? Hey, do you mind if we just, like... Seems like he's, like, a little more calculated, at least to some extent, in, uh, in doing it his own way. So, yeah, anyway, at least that's my observation. Two years into circuit work, we were invited to serve at Bethel in Brussels. We started serving in October 1964. This new assignment brought us many blessings. Shortly after, Brother Noor visited our Bethel in 1965. I was surprised to be appointed as branch servant. Later, Ellie and I were invited to attend the 41st class of Gilead School. Brother Noor's words spoken 13 years earlier had come true. After graduating, we returned to Belgium Bethel. It's funny how he is always referring to Brother Noor, Brother Noor, Brother Noor, because that would have been the watchtower he grew up in. Now it's the governing body, governing body, or organization, organization. But there, when there was a president, huh, it's funny. Over the years, I've had the privilege of using my legal background to help defend our freedom of worship in Europe and elsewhere. This brought me in contact with officials from more than 55 countries where our work was restricted or banned. Rather than emphasize my legal experience, I introduced myself as a man of God. I always looked for Jehovah's guidance in prayer, acknowledging that a king's or judge's heart is like streams of water in Jehovah's hand. He directs it where he pleases. You're sure about that? One experience that left a particular impression on me was my interaction with a member of the European Parliament. I had made multiple requests to speak to him, and he finally agreed to meet. He said, I'll give you five minutes, and one minute, or not one minute more. I bowed my head and started praying. The Parliament, the parliamentarian nervously asked me what I was doing. Raising my head, I said, I thank God because you are one of his ministers. He asked, what do you mean? I showed him Romans 13.4. He was a Protestant, so the, this Bible text caught his attention. The result, he gave me a half an hour, and we had a most productive meeting. He even expressed his respect for our work. Over the years, Jehovah's people have fought many legal battles in Europe regarding Christian neutrality, child custody, taxation, and more. It has been a privilege to share in many of them and see firsthand how Jehovah gave us success and victory. Jehovah's Witnesses have won more than 140 cases in the European Court of Human Rights. Is this, I was like, with Philip Brumley and Walter Fernetti during one of our visits to Cuba in the 90s. Look at you, old Philip Brumley. <laughs> oh, my guy. 
During the 90s, I worked along with Brother Philip Brumley from the World Headquarters and Brother, oh yeah, I already got that, from Italy to secure greater religious freedom for our brothers in Cuba, where our Christian work was restricted. I wrote to the Cuban embassy in Belgium and then met with an official appointed to handle our request. During our first meetings, we had little progress towards resolving the misunderstandings that had led to the restrictions. After seeking Jehovah's direction in prayer, we asked for and received permission to ship 5,000 Bibles to Cuba. The Bibles arrived safely and were distributed to the brothers, so we concluded that Jehovah was blessing our efforts. We then sought permission to send 27,500 additional Bibles. This too was granted. Helping our dear brothers and sisters in Cuba to have a personal copy of the Bible gave me much joy. I visited Cuba on many occasions to help improve the legal situation of our work. In the process, I was able to establish good relationships with many government officials. In 1994, more than one million people were slaughtered in a genocide against the Tutsis, against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Tragically, some of our brothers and sisters were also killed. Soon, a group of brothers were asked to arrange humanitarian relief for the country. When our group arrived in Kigali, the capital, we found the translation office and literature depot riddled with bullets. We heard tragic stories of brothers and sisters who had been murdered with machetes, but we also heard accounts of Christian love in action. For example, we met a Tutsi brother who had hidden in a hole underground for 28 days, protected by a family of Hutu witnesses. During a meeting in Kigali, we provided spiritual comfort to over 900 brothers and sisters. A book hit by a bullet at our translation office. Jesus. We next crossed the border to Zaire, now De Democratic Republic of Congo, to search for a large number of the Rwanda witnesses who had fled to refugee camps near the city of Goma. We could not find them, so we prayed, asking Jehovah to guide us to them. We then saw someone walking towards us, and we asked if he knew any Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, I'm a witness, he replied. I would be glad to bring you to the Relief Committee. After an upbuilding meeting with the Relief Committee, we met with some 1,600 refugees to provide them spiritual comfort and encouragement. We also shared the contents of a letter from the governing body. The brothers and sisters were deeply touched to hear the assurance, You are constantly in our prayers. We know that Jehovah will not forsake you. How those words from the governing body prove to be true. Today, over 30,000 witnesses are thriving in Rwanda. After being married for almost 58 years, I lost my dear Ellie in 2011. Jehovah comforted me as I shared my grief with him in prayer. I also drew comfort from sharing the kingdom news with my neighbors. Though being in my 90s, I still share in the Christian ministry each week. It was also a joy to assist the legal department here at the Belgium branch, to share my experience with others, and to shepherd young ones in the Bethel. Some 84 years ago, I, first, I said my first prayer to Jehovah, and it was the start of a wonderful journey that he has drawn me ever closer to him. How grateful I am. Throughout my life, Jehovah has paid attention to my prayers. Questions from readers. Do the words, you will guard them, found at Psalm 12, 7, refer to the afflicted? verse 5, or the sayings of Jehovah, or 6. The context indicates that this verse is referring to people. At Psalms 12, 1 through 4, we read, The faithful people have vanished from among men. Now consider 12, 5 through 7. The verse is involved in question. Because the afflicted are opposed, because of the sighing of the poor, I will rise up to act, says Jehovah. I will save them. From those who treat them with contempt, the sayings of Jehovah are pure. They are like silver refined in an earthen furnace, purified seven times. You will guard them, O Jehovah. You will protect each one of them f from this generation forever. Who would think that it's like protecting the sayings of Jehovah? What? Huh? Verse 5 presents... What? Verse 5 presents what God says regarding the afflicted. He will save them. Verse 6 adds that the sayings of Jehovah are pure, like refined silver. This is a sentiment that devoted Christians fully agree with. Now consider the next verse. You will guard them, O Jehovah. You will protect each one of them from this generation forever. To what does this refer? Because verse 7 follows a comment about the sayings of Jehovah, some might conclude them refers to God's sayings, and we know that God has guarded the Bible 
However, what is said in verse 5 is equally true. Jehovah has and will continue to help and save the afflicted and the oppressed. This is like, why are you, why are, why are you even talking about this? What, who, is this help, who is this helping? In 2024, the content of this psalm suggests that them refers to people. Psalms 12.1 brought up the situation of faithful people who may have been lied to. Thereafter, we find expressions that Jehovah will rise up against those misusing their tongue. The psalm assures us that we can trust God to act in behalf of his people because his sayings are pure. So verse 7 is saying that Jehovah will guard and protect them, that is, the afflicted victims of the wicked. The rendering of them reflects the Hebrew Masoretic text. The Greek Septuagint uses us twice in verse 7, which points back to faithful ones who are afflicted and oppressed. Finally, verse 7 says that each one... This is like their sad attempts at trying to seem like biblical smarty pants, like how they used to, but in the dumbest way possible. It's like, questions from our readers. Who do you think that you will guard them applies to? Literally, no one reading this scripture is going to draw that conclusion. Unless... There's like an old watchtower that says, no, Jehovah's going to protect his sayings. I, I feel like the only reason someone would even come to that conclusion would be because watchtower told them that that's what was correct. I don't think just reading that naturally on its own, that's where you'd get to. Uh, anyway, consequently, these perver- Okay, yeah, whatever. No one's reading this. Study Article 25. Remember that Jehovah is the living God. Critical times hard to deal with. That is how the Bible describes the days we live in. In addition to the challenges that everyone faces in the system of things, Jehovah's people have to deal with opposition and persecution. What helps us to keep worshiping Jehovah despite these problems? One main thing is that we have come to know Jehovah as the living God. We have to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> Jehovah is a real person who sustains us during our trials and looks for opportunities to support us. Viewing him as the living God can help us to face successfully any trial that comes our way. Consider how that was true of King David. David knew Jehovah had relied on him. When pursued by his enemies, including King Saul, David prayed for Jehovah's help. After God answered his prayer and rescued him, David declared, Jehovah is alive. With these words, David was not merely acknowledging that God exists. One reference work notes that David was expressing confidence in Jehovah as a living God, who constantly acts on behalf of his people. Yes, David knew from personal experience that his God was alive, and the conviction renewed his determination to serve and praise Jehovah. Our being convinced that Jehovah is the living God can help us to serve him with zeal. We will have the strength to endure trials and the motivation to continue working hard in his service. We will also be determined to remain close to Jehovah. We will be able to endure any trial, great or small, if we remember that Jehovah is alive, that he is there to sustain us. After all, any problem we face no ma- is no match for our God. He is the Almighty and he can give us the power to endure. We have every reason, therefore, to face our trials with confidence. Our experiencing Jehovah's support during smaller trials convinces us that he will also help us during greater trials. Consider two personal examples that increase David's confidence in Jehovah. When David was a young shepherd, a bear and a lion each carried off one of his father's sheep. On both occasions, David courageously chased after the animals and saved the sheep. He did not claim the victory for himself. He knew that Jehovah was behind it. David never forgot those experiences. By meditating on them, he gained confidence that the living God would strengthen him in the future. Later, likely while he was still a teenager, David visited the army camp of the Israelites. He found that the soldiers were terrified because a giant Philistine named Goliath had come out to taunt the battle line of Israel. The soldiers' fear was a result of their focusing on the giant and the taunts they heard on the battlefield. David, however, viewed the situation from a different perspective. He viewed what was happening as a challenge, not merely against the battle 
line of Israel, but against the battle line of the living God. David had forever David had Jehovah foremost in mind. David trusted that God that the God who had helped him when he was a shepherd would help him again in this situation. Certain of God's backing, David faced Goliath, and of course he won. We too can face trials successfully if we remember that the living God is ready to assist us. We can build our confidence in the fact in that fact by considering what he has done in the past. Read Bible accounts that remind you of how Jehovah saved his worshipers. Also, consider reports on our JW.org website that illustrate how Jehovah has supported our brothers and sisters in modern times. Furthermore, recall times when Jehovah has acted in your behalf. Do not worry if you cannot point to some spectacular experience such as fighting off a bear or lion. Why not? Because you've never fought off a bear or lion, mother sucker. The fact is, Jehovah has been involved in your life. He has drawn you another person in prison. He has drawn you into a relationship with him. Even now, it is only thanks to his help that you are still in the truth. Why not ask him to help you remember moments when he answered your prayers, gave you support at just the right time, or sustained you through a difficult situation? Reflecting on such experiences will strengthen your conviction that Jehovah will continue to act in your behalf. Seeing Jehovah as a living person will allow us to view our trials properly. How so? We begin to see our trials as part of a bigger issue between Jehovah and Satan. The devil claims that when we suffer hardships, we will abandon Jehovah. But when we deal with our trials successfully, we show our love for Jehovah and prove the devil a liar. Are you facing government oppositions, economic hardships, negative responses to your preaching, or some other trial? If so, remember that your situation gives you an opportunity to make Jehovah's heart rejoice. Remember, too, that he will never let you be tested beyond your limits. He will give you the strength to endure. Jehovah is the rewarder of those who worship him. He gives us the peace and contentment now and will give us everlasting life in the future. We can place our hope in Jehovah, convinced that he has both the desire and the power to reward us. And that conviction moves us to stay busy in our worship, just as faithful servants of God in the past were moved to do. This proved true of Timothy in the first century. Timothy put his hope in the living God. Therefore, he had good reason to work hard and exert himself. In what ways? The Apostle Paul encouraged him to make progress as a teacher and a public speaker. Timothy was also to set a good example for fellow believers, both young and old, and he was assigned some difficult tasks which, including giving firm but loving counsel to those who needed it. Timothy could be sure that even if at times his work went unseen or was not appreciated by others, Jehovah would reward him. Today, elders, too, can be certain that Jehovah sees the values their fine work and values their fine work. In addition to shepherding, teaching, and preaching, many elders support construction projects and disaster relief efforts. Others serve on patient visitation groups or hospital liaison committees. Elders who make themselves available for such work see the congregation as Jehovah's arrangement, not as a man-made institution. As a result, they are whole-souled in their assignments and have full trust that God will reward them for what they do. Not all can be elders, but all of us have something to offer Jehovah. Our God appreciates it when we do our best to serve him. He notices our contributions to the worldwide work. No matter how modest, he is pleased when we work hard to overcome our shyness and raise our hand to comment at meetings. And he rejoices when we overlook an offense and extend forgiveness. Even if you feel that you cannot do as much as you would like, trust that Jehovah values what you can do. He loves you for it and he will reward you. If Jehovah is real to us, we will find it easier to stay faithful to him. That was true of Joseph. He firmly refused to commit immorality. God was real to him, and he didn't want to displease him. Joseph is back already? Wow. For for Jehovah to be real to us, we need to make time to pray to him and study his word. Our friendship... Oh, wait. uh, Our friendship with him will thus grow... 
When, like Joseph, we have a close friendship with Jehovah, we will not want to do anything that displeases him. Those who forget that Jehovah is the living God can easily draw away from him. Consider what happened to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. They were aware that Jehovah existed, but they began to doubt that he would provide for them. They even asked, Is Jehovah in our midst or not? Thereafter, they rebelled against God. Surely, we want to avoid following their disobedient courts, which stands as a warning example for us. And we got some kids looking at a phone. This kid said, Nah, I like Android. You're not going to catch me in that Apple trap. So, ain't no way. Uh, The world makes it a challenge for (laughs) us to remain close to Jehovah. Many reject the idea that God existed. Often those who ignore what God requires seem to prosper. When we see that happen, our faith can be tested. While we would not deny that God exists, we could begin to wonder whether he will act in our behalf. The writer of Psalm 73 found himself wondering about this. He saw those around him ignoring God's law and still enjoying a life. As a result, he began to question whether it was worth serving God. What eventually helped the psalmist to correct his view? He meditated on what happened to those who forgot Jehovah. He also considered the benefits that come from serving God. We too can reflect on the blessings that Jehovah has given us. Contrast that with how our life would be if we were not serving Jehovah. Doing so can help us to stick to a faithful course and conclude, as did the psalmist, as for me, drawing near to the God is good for me. It's funny because I firmly believe every witness fantasizes about what it's like to not be a witness. Um, I know, like, just growing up and getting older, I would have, like, legit conversations with my friends about, you know, where would I be if I wasn't a Jehovah's Witness? You know, what, what career path would I what I have, you know, what would my hair look like? What hobbies would I have? Would I be into surfing? Would I be into, you know, snowboarding and skydiving? And it's, it's kind of sad, really, when you think about it, because it's like all of this wasted potential goes by, and they're like, contrast that with how your life would be if you were not serving Jehovah. Yeah, but people actually do that, and they like, it's not like a contrast with how much better it is. It's a fantasy about what could have been. We can face whatever challenges come our way during these last days because we slave for a living and true God. Our God is a real person who acts in behalf of those who worship him. He proved to be with his servants in the past, and he is with us today. We will soon face the greatest tribulation to occur on earth, uh, but we will not face it alone. May we all be of good courage and say, Jehovah is my helper, I will not be afraid. Make Jehovah your rock. We live in a world, or study 26, we live in a world where unexpected challenges can disrupt or even completely change our lives. How thankful we are that we can turn to Jehovah God for help. In the preceding article, we were reminded that Jehovah is the living God and that he is always ready to help us. When we receive his support, that experience reassures us that Jehovah is alive. However, right after making that declaration, David called God my rock. Why would he liken Jehovah, the living God, to an inanimate object, a rock? In this article, we will consider why Jehovah is referred to as a rock. I was like, isn't that um, the whole picture? We haven't actually gotten to the whole thing of like why the cover is this big old rock. I guess it's this last article. The Bible uses the term rock as a word picture to help us grasp qualities that Jehovah possesses. (laughs) He's stubborn, dull, (laughs) can be used as a killing machine. It often appears in passages that praise him as a God who is without equal. First reference to Jehovah as the rock is found at Deuteronomy 32.4. In prayer, Hannah said that, There is no rock like our God. Habakkuk called Jehovah my rock. The writer of Psalm 73 called God the rock of my heart. And even Jehovah referred to himself as a rock. Let us discuss three rock-like qualities that Jehovah displays and learn how we can make him our rock. Jehovah is a refuge. Just as a huge rock can be a person's hiding place from a threatening storm, Jehovah safeguards us when we face situations that threaten our well-being. 
He keeps us safe and prevents us from suffering lasting harm. And he promises even more. He will eventually eliminate whatever threatens our peace and security. One way to make Jehovah our rock, like refuge, is by praying to him. When we pray, Jehovah gives us the peace of God that safeguards our heart and mind. Consider the experience of Artem, a brother who was imprisoned for his faith. He was repeatedly interrogated by a harsh investigator who pressured and humiliated him. I found it stressful whenever the investigator summoned me. I always pray to Jehovah. I ask for peace in my heart and for wisdom, said Artem. The investigator's tactics did not work on me. With Jehovah's help, it was like I was standing behind a stone wall. Jehovah is reliable. Like a rock that is immovable, Jehovah is always there for us. We can trust him because he is the eternal rock. we got another guy sitting in prison. I don't know how many... Uh, I wish I was keeping track so I would have these statistics at the end. But this has to at least be the 10th person in prison. And we're only six months through uh, 2024. It's crazy. He will always be alive and keep his promises, hear our prayers, and give us the support we need. We can also depend on Jehovah because he is loyal to those who serve him. He will never forget what we do, and he will always reward us. Make We make Jehovah our rock when we rely fully on him. We trust that by obeying him, even difficult times, we will benefit. As we experience his support, our confidence in him will grow. We will then be better prepared to face trials that only Jehovah can get us through. Often during situations in which there is no one else to turn to for help, we come to realize just how reliable Jehovah is. The time I spent in the detention center was the very best period in my relationship with God, said Vladimir. I learned to have greater trust in Jehovah because I was all alone and had no control of the situation. Jehovah is stable. Similar to a massive rock, Jehovah is firm and stable. He is consistent in his personality and unshakable in his purpose. When faced with the rebellion in Eden, Jehovah did not waver. As Apostle Paul wrote, Jehovah cannot deny himself. This means that <laughs> no matter what happens or what others do, Jehovah will never deviate from his qualities, his purpose, or standards. With confidence in our stable God, we can look to him for salvation and for help to cope during turbulent times. We make Jehovah a rock by focusing on the kind of person he is and by keeping his purpose fixed firmly in our mind. Doing so can help us to remain stable emotionally while we endure trials. That was true of a sister named Tatiana who was placed under house arrest because of her faith. I found myself literally on my own, she said. It was challenging at first. I was often discouraged. However, when she saw her trial related to Jehovah and his purpose, she was able to cope and to regain... Uh cope and regain emotional strength she said understanding why this has happened to me to remember that it is for jehovah that i find myself in these circumstances that has helped me to stop thinking about myself in the days ahead we will encounter trials that will require us to lean on jehovah as never before now is the time to strengthen our conviction that he will provide whatever we need to endure faithfully faithfully how can we do that? Read Bible accounts and experiences of modern-day witnesses. Discern how God has displayed rock-like qualities to support his servants. Think deeply about those accounts. Doing so can help you make Jehovah your rock. When literal and figurative storms affect those in the congregation, elders are a refuge. That's not a boulder. That's a rock. That's not an elder. That's a rock. Yep. Pioneers used to ride these bad boys for miles. We have noted how Jehovah proves to be like a rock. Now consider how we can imitate his rock-like qualities. The better we do so, the better equipped we will be to build up the congregation. For example, Jesus gave Simon the name Cephas, translated Peter, which means a piece of rock. Cephas, translated Peter, which means a piece of rock. Peter the Rock. Peter's P Peter Rock. Cephas, also known as Peter Rock. 
I don't know, man. <laughs> this indicated that he would become a source of comfort and stability in the congregation. Congregation elders are described as the shadow of a massive crack. That illustrates how they protect those in the congregation. Of course, the congregation benefit when all brothers and sisters imitate Jehovah's rock-like qualities. Oh, do this little box. Uh, go for young brothers. Why not imitate Jehovah's rock-like qualities? Now, you will thus develop the qualities that you will need to serve as an elder, perhaps by the time you are in your early or mid-twenties. We're seeing that a lot. Be a refuge. Make others feel welcome at the meetings by talking with them. Show personal interest in older ones. Be reliable. Uh, all the things that we already read about. Be a refuge. At times, we may be able to offer brothers a little refuge from natural disaster, civil unrest, or war. As conditions in these last days get worse, we will no doubt have more opportunity to render aid to one another. We can also provide an emotional and spiritual haven for our brothers. One way we can do that is by making them feel welcome at the Kingdom Hall, contributing to the warm atmosphere in the congregation. We live in a harsh, cold, and stressful world. So when our brothers and sisters attend meetings, we want to do all we can to make them feel loved, refreshed, and secure. Elders can become a refugee, refuge to those in the congregation who endure literal or figurative storms. During disasters and medical emergencies, elders take the initiative to arrange practical assistance. They also offer spiritual help. Brothers and sisters will be inclined to approach an elder if he is known to be gentle, empathetic, and willing to listen. Such qualities help others feel cared for. Thus, it is easier for them to apply any Bible-based guidance an elder may provide. Be reliable. We want others to be able to count on us, especially during difficult times. How can we develop a reputation for being reliable? We can strive to display godly qualities consistently such as by keeping our promises and doing our best to be punctual. We can also offer practical help when there is a need. In addition, we can make sure that we complete our assignments according to the instructions we receive. Reliable elders are a benefit to the congregation. How? Publishers feel supported when they can readily contact elders, such as their field service group overseer. Publishers also feel cared for when they know that the elders are willing to help them. And as elders base their counsel on the Bible and the publications of the faithful slave, rather than on their own opinions, fellow worshippers trust them. Huh. And as the elders base their counsel on the Bible and other elders, <laughs> then people will have more confidence. It's like, uh, hey, trust th don't trust yourself. You're just an elder. But trust some other elders. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, be stable. We can be a good influence on others if we are firm for what is right and if we make decisions that are solidly based on Bible principles. As we grow in faith and accurate knowledge, we become more steadfast in the truth. We are not indecisive, unsteady, or easily swayed by false teachings and worldly thinking. Our faith in Jehovah and his promises keeps us balanced. And when we receive bad news, when we receive bad news, we also we are also able to assist those who may be facing trials. Elders are to be moderate in habits, sound in mind, orderly, and reasonable. These men are stabilizing influence on others and strengthen the congregation by holding firmly to the faithful word. By their example, their shepherding elders help publishers to be regular in their meeting attendance, field service, and personal study. When brothers and sisters face unsettling events, elders can do much by encouraging them to keep their focus on Jehovah and his purpose. After considering Jehovah's marvelous qualities, we can say, as did King David, may Jehovah, my rock, be praised. Jehovah will never fail to be a God we can rely on. Throughout life, even into old age, we have reason to declare, he is my rock, confident that he will always help us to thrive spiritually. And that is another article gone. I gotta say, like, the actual content, things you're learning about the Bible, diving into Bible stories, personal story situations, maybe it's just because I'm doing this experiment, and I guess that's why I'm doing it in the first place, is just, like, you start noticing things when you're fully engrossed, like, fully locked into something. 
and it's been so long since I was fully locked in as a Jehovah's Witness. Um, I got to be honest, like reading these back to back to back, there isn't that much. And I'm going to be really curious when I go back uh, to 19, I think I'm going to go like 1995 and just like read those, just how different it is about like getting into the Bible. Sometimes it's just, it's such a random little Parmesan cheese sprinkling of the Bible. I'm not even like sure. It's not like you're breaking down a whole story or an account like that one. It's like, okay, one scripture where they're saying something about being a rock or nothing. I don't know. Maybe things will change here soon. We shall see because we are in July 2024. 27. Be courageous like Zadok. Okay, here we go. Here's here's an actual like Bible example. Maybe we'll actually get something. Because that's at least gives my brain something to do other than just talking about trusting the elders, trusting the governing body, and the end being close. That just feels like the majority of what's happening. And then the three-pronged, what has Jehovah done in the past? What has Jehovah done in the future? Or what is he doing now? But like none of it's specific, I suppose. We'll see. Picture the scene. A crowd of over 340,000 men had gathered to make King David, David king over all Israel. For three days, the sounds of animated conversation, joyful songs of praise, and lighthearted laughter echoed throughout the rocky hills near Hebron. See what I mean? Immediately, this is getting into a story, and it already like has, like they're painting a picture here. Not painting the picture of, wow, our lives as Jehovah's Witnesses are miserable, let's talk about it. But like, you know, painting it from a biblical character. And we're all the way in July, I mean... That seems bizarre. Anyway, a young man named Zadok would not likely have stood out in the large crowd. However, Jehovah made sure that we knew we would know that Zadok was there. Who was Zadok? Zadok was a priest who worked closely with high priest Abithar. Zadok was also a seer who was able to discern the divine will and who was granted extraordinary insight. People would turn to Zadok when they needed wise advice. He was also a man of courage. It is this aspect of his personality that we will focus on in this article. During these last days, Satan is intensifying his attacks on God's people. We need to be courageous as we wait on Jehovah to put an end to Satan and his wicked system. Let us consider three ways that we can imitate Zadok's courage. Oh, what do we got for the picture? When others take sides in politics, what will you do? Sitting around having some, some coffee... Uh, you vote for the black guy. Hey, you vote for the white guy. But I'm Asian. Like, what is happening in this picture? (laughs) 64% of us are white. 36% of us are black. That doesn't leave a whole lot for me. (laughs) Oh, God. That's a... I don't think they thought that all the way through. Anyway. As Jehovah's people, we wholeheartedly support God's kingdom, but we often need courage to do so. For example, in this wicked world, we need courage to live by Jehovah's standards to preach the kingdom good news. And it often takes courage to remain politically neutral in this increasingly divided system of things. Many among Jehovah's people have suffered financial loss, have been physically abused, or have been imprisoned because of refusing to participate in political or military activity. Zadok did not go to Hebron just to celebrate David's kingship. He went there armed and ready for battle. He was willing to follow David into battle and to defend Israel from its enemies. What Zadok possibly lacked in experience as a warrior, he made up for in courage. Where did a priest like Zadok learn to be so courageous? He was surrounded by men who were strong and courageous. No doubt he benefited from their example. For instance, David David's example of courageously leading Israel on its campaigns moved all of Israel to support him wholeheartedly. David always relied on Jehovah for help against his enemies. Zadok had other inspiring examples right by his side, men such as Jehoiada and his warrior son Benaniah, as well as the 22 other tribal chiefs who rallied at David's side. These men all took decisive action to support David's kingship. 
Uh, David sent Zadok on a dangerous mission. Yeah, see, this is exactly what you get uh, from this picture, what you get in modern-day Jehovah's Witness uh, videos. You just have someone looking off in the distance. And that's, I mean, you you get just about the same content that you get in an eight-minute video from Watchtower is what you get just looking at this picture. You just don't get, like, the written stuff. Anyway. We gain strength and courage when we consider the examples of those who have courageously supported Jehovah's rulership. Our King, Christ Jesus, firmly resisted pressure to become involved in Satan's political system of things. He always relied on Jehovah for strength. We also have countless modern-day examples of young men who have taken a stand as conscientious objectors or who have refused to participate in political activities. Why not look some of their experiences up on jw.org? Jehovah's people love to help one another. However, at times it takes courage to do so. For example, when a war breaks out, the local elders realize that their brothers and sisters need encouragement, support, and perhaps spiritual or physical provisions. Oh, there's the Audi R8 again. For example, when a war breaks, oh, I already did that. Out of love for the sheep, the elders put their own safety at risk in order to provide what is needed. In this regard, they follow Zadok, Zadok's courageous example. David's life was in danger. His son Absalom was determined to steal the kingdom from him. David needed to leave Jerusalem at once. He called out his servants, Get up and let us run away for none of us will escape from Absalom. As the servants were leaving, David realized that someone needed to stay back and keep him informed of Absalom's plans. So he sent Zadok and other priests back into the city to serve as informants. They had to proceed cautiously. What David told those priests to do was risky and even life-threatening. Imagine what Absalom, an egotistical, vengeful, and treacherous man, would have done to Zadok and the other priests if he had found out the way they were spying on him to protect David? David worked out a plan that involved Zadok and Hushai, another loyal friend of David's. Following the plan, Hushai won the confidence of Absalom and recommended a military strategy. Wow, I actually George Bush that. Strategy that would give David time to prepare for an attack. Next, Hushai informed Zadok and Abithar of the plan. These two men were then able to send a message to David. With Jehovah's help, Zadok and his fellow priests played an important role in protecting David's life. If we are called on to help our brothers during dangerous times, how can we show courage like that of Zadok? 1. Follow direction. In such circumstances, it is important that we remain united. Cooperate with the direction from your local branch office. Elders should regularly review local arrangements for disaster preparedness as well as organizational direction on what to do when a disaster is imminent. To be courageous but cautious. Use common sense. Do not take unnecessary risks. Well, that was easy. How do you be courageous? Just use common sense. Don't be a bozo. Rely on Jehovah. Remember that Jehovah is deeply interested in the well-being of both you and your brothers. He can help you to assist your brothers safely. Consider Victor and Vitaly, two spiritual brothers who work to deliver food and water to their fellow believers in Ukraine. We looked everywhere for food, says Victor. Often there was shooting around us. One brother donated food from his store. This donation gave many publishers what they needed to survive for some time. As we were loading items into our truck, a rocket landed about 20 meters away from us. Throughout the day, I implored Jehovah to give me the courage I needed to continue to help the publishers. I'm guessing this picture here is Victor and Vitaly. Uh, yeah, it says see paragraphs 12 and 13. And that looks, uh, I don't know, I'm not an expert here, but uh, beyond the AI-generated backgrounds and what have you, it looks about 20 meters away. Uh, it called for a lot of courage, says Vitaly. My first trip took 12 hours. 12 hours? That's nothing. 
I'm about to sit here and read for two, I mean, it's going to be more than two days, two days straight, so I don't want to hear about your paltry little 12 hours. Talk to me when you're up for over 48 hours, buddy. I prayed to Jehovah the whole way. Vitaly was courageous, but he was also cautious. He adds, I kept asking Jehovah for wisdom and modesty. I drove only on roads approved by the authorities. I have benefited from seeing firsthand how the brothers and sisters work together. They cleared obstacles from the road, collected the loaded humanitarian aid, and provided us with food and places to rest along the way. Few trials can leave us feeling more discouraged than when a family member or a close friend leaves Jehovah. The closer our bond is with the person, the more important it can be to accept the situation. If you have had such a painful experience, Zadok's example of loyalty can strengthen you. Zadok remained loyal to Jehovah when his close associate Abithar chose to be disloyal. That bozo. This happened at the end of David's reign. As David lay on his deathbed, his son Adonijah tried to seize the throne that Jehovah had promised to Solomon. Abithar chose to support Adonijah. In doing so, Abithar was being disloyal not only to David, to David, but also to Jehovah. When you can you imagine how sad and disappointed Zadok must have felt? For some four decades, he and Abithar had worked closely together as priests. They had cared for the Ark of the True God together. Initially, both men had supported David's kingship, and so much more. So much more. Zadok remained loyal to Jehovah despite Abithar's choice. David never doubted Zadok's loyalty. When Adonijah's scheme was revealed, David turned to Zadok, Nathan, and Benaiah to anoint Solomon as king. Being with loyal worshippers of Jehovah, such as Nathan and other supporters of King David, must have strengthened and encouraged Zadok. When Solomon became king, he appointed Zadok the priest in place of Abithar. How can you imitate Zadok? If someone close to you chooses to leave Jehovah, make your choice clear. Jehovah will give you the strength and the courage you need. Rely on him through prayer and by staying close to fellow loyal worshippers. Jehovah treasures your loyalty and he will reward you for it. Consider the example of Marco and his wife, Saidze, whose two adult daughters left the truth. I mean, that's going to be like literally every single Jehovah's Witness. It'll be like, yep. Our kids left, our kids left, our kids left. Uh, Marco says, From the day our children are born, you love them so much. You would do anything to protect them from harm. So when they choose to leave Jehovah, it is heartbreaking. He continues, But Jehovah has been by our side. He has made sure that when I am weak, my wife is strong. And when she is weak, I am strong. Since he adds, We would not have been able to endure if Jehovah had provided us with the strength we needed. I was struggling with the feeling that it was my fault. So I told Jehovah how I felt. After a short time, a sister whom I hadn't seen for many years came up to me, laid her hands on my shoulders, looked me in the eyes, and said, Remember, said C, it's not your fault. With Jehovah's help, I have managed to maintain my joy in serving him. Or you could just go and have a relationship with your daughters. Alternatively, you know, that's that's also an option. Just throwing it out there. Oh, only 30 seconds. Jehovah once all his worshippers to be courageous like Zadok. However, he does not want us to rely on our own strength. He wants us to rely on him. So when you find yourself in a situation where you need courage, turn to Jehovah. You can be sure that he will make you as courageous as Zadok was. And then sing the song, Stay awake, stand firm, grow mighty. Oh, it wasn't 30 seconds. I have four whole minutes. But we'll just... Start the new one now. In, I don't remember saying this, or maybe I did say it. I can't remember. But every I can only record for thirty minute intervals. So if I'm making a fuss about I only have so much time left, it's because I can only record for thirty minutes, and then I have to stop and start a new recording. So anyway, that's what's going on with all of that. Now let's get into Do you recognize the truth? Jehovah's people love the truth found in God's word. We have built our faith on it. We have come to believe that Jehovah set up the Christian congregation as a pillar and support of the truth. And we gladly submit to those who are taking the lead among us as they explain the truth from the Bible and give us direction in harmony 
with God's word. However, after we have accepted the truth and the role of God's organization in providing reliable guidance, we could still be led astray. Satan would like nothing better than to cause us to lose confidence in the Bible or in the direction we receive from God's organization. This one's going to be spicy. Soon, the devil will use powerful propaganda to mislead entire nations into taking sides against Jehovah. We can also expect Satan to intensify his efforts to mislead Jehovah's people. Consequently, it is important that we train ourselves to see the difference between the truth and falsehood, to be obedient to the truth. Our survival during the Great Tribulation will depend on it. In this article, we will identify two qualities that are needed to help us recognize the truth and come that comes from the Bible and to accept direction from God's organization. Then we will consider three suggestions to follow in order to continue holding fast to the truth. Fear of Jehovah. When we cultivate proper fear of Jehovah, we love him so much that we would never do anything to displease him. We are eager to learn the difference between right and wrong, between truth and falsehood, so that we can gain Jehovah's approval. We must never allow our fear of man to become greater than our love for Jehovah, since what pleases humans often displeases Jehovah. Mm. Goose. Winston. Goose. Winston. That's too much horsing around. That's too much horse. Stop with all the horsing. Same. But no horse. This is a no horse zone. No, this is a no horse zone. That's. Look, you got a big scar on you. Do you, you see? You guys are horsing too much. Golly gee willikers, come here. Hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. Goodness gracious me. What are you guys doing? Okay, you go away. Oh, boy. I wasn't bleeding. Are you carrying battle wounds as well? Golly gee willikers. You too. I can't trust you guys. I can't trust you guys. <sighs> okay. Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. All right, now that that is all dealt with, we are eager to learn the difference between right and wrong, between truth and falsehood, so that we can gain Jehovah's approval. We must, we must never allow our fear of man to become greater than our love for Jehovah, since we want to please humans, since... What pleases humans often displeases Jehovah. If we were to fear humans more than we fear God, we could be led away from the truth. Or sorry, the truth. Consider the example of the twelve chieftains who spied out the land of that Jehovah had promised to give the Israelites. For ten of the spies, their fear of the Canaanites was stronger than their love for Jehovah. They told their fellow Israelites, we are not able to go up against the people because they are stronger than we are. From a human standpoint, the Canaanites were stronger than the Israelites. That part was true. Almost as true as the fact I have to sneeze. See, then it's interacting with the dogs. Interacting with the dogs means I have to sneeze. Means you have to sneeze, means I have to make more breaks, I have to take more breaks. It's a whole cycle. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh, couldn't be avoided. 
<sighs> oh, the cycle begins. Oh. Oh. But to say that the Israelites would not be able to conquer their enemies left Jehovah out of the picture. Those ten spies should have focused on what Jehovah wanted the Israelites to do. They should have also meditated on what had what he had done for them in the recent past, when they would have realized that the strength of the Canaanites was nothing in comparison to Jehovah's almighty power. Unlike those faithful spies, Joshua and Caleb wanted to have Jehovah's approval. They told the people, if Jehovah is pleased with us, he will certainly bring us into his land and give it to us to strengthen our feet. If I talk like that, maybe it doesn't make my nose itchy. To strengthen our feet. Like a Keebler elf. To strengthen our fear of Jehovah, we need to focus on pleasing him in every decision we make. As you read Bible accounts, ask yourself, if I had been in that situation, what decision would I have made? For example, picture yourself listening to as the ten Israelite chieftains gave their negative report. Would you have believed the report and given in to the fear of man, or would your love for Jehovah and your desire to please him have won out? An entire generation of Israelites failed to recognize the truth that Joshua and Caleb spoke. As a result, they lost the opportunity to enter the promised land. And that's the same story. We're hearing it another time. Humility. Jehovah reveals the truth to those who are humble. We humbly accept help to learn the truth. Still, we want to be careful not to become too proud. Being prideful could lead us to consider our personal opinions to be just as valid as scriptural principles and directions from Jehovah's organization. The same organization that has essentially admitted that its own personal opinions have gone above what's in the Bible itself. Like growing a beard, women wearing pants, turning in your field service time, uh, people being shut out before the... Or, at the beginning of the Great Tribulation. All of those things, now you're like, well, those things weren't scriptural. Which means you were letting your personal opinion supersede Jehovah's direction. <sighs> it's crazy. To maintain our humility, we need to remember our littleness when comparing to Jehovah's greatness. We can also pray to develop a humble, teachable spirit. Jehovah will help put his thoughts, which he provides through his word and his organization, ahead of our own. And our Bible-based in our Bible reading, look for points about how Jehovah loves humility and hates pride, arrogance, and haughtiness. Take extra time to remain humble. If you receive a privilege of service, that gives you a measure of prominence. So they do admit that there are certain things you can do that give you prominence. Interesting. Maintain confidence in theocratic direction. In ancient Israel, Jehovah used Moses and then Joshua to convey his instructions to his people. The Israelites were blessed when they viewed these men as representatives of Jehovah God. Centuries later, when the Christian congregation was first formed, the twelve apostles gave direction. Then that group was expanded to include other elders in Jerusalem. By following the guidance received from those faithful men, the congregations continued to be made firm in the faith and to increase in the number day by day. In modern times, we too are blessed when we follow theocratic direction from Jehovah's organization. But how would Jehovah feel if we were to refuse to recognize those whom he has appointed? We can answer that question by considering what happened when the Israelites were being led to the Promised Land. At one point in the Israelites' journey to the Promised Land, prominent men challenged Moses and the role that Jehovah had assigned him. They said, The whole assembly, not just Moses, is holy, all of them, and Jehovah is in their midst. Although it was true that in God's eyes the whole assembly was holy, Jehovah had chosen Moses to take the lead among his people. By criticizing Moses, the rebels were criticizing Jehovah. They did not focus on what Jehovah wanted. They focused on what they wanted, more power and recognition. God struck down the leaders of the rebellion as well as thousands more who sympathized with him. 
Today we can be sure that Jehovah disapproves of those who disrespect his organizational arrangement. I wonder if those people are going to be resurrected. Oh. I know. Ha ha he he. Wally blows his nose like an uncle. Yep, I sure do. Oh, boy. All right, well, at least the sneezing's over for now. Um, We can maintain our confidence in Jehovah's organization. When it becomes clear that an adjustment is needed in our understanding of a Bible truth, well, was it a Bible truth? Or in the way that the kingdom work is organized, those taking the lead do not hesitate to make the necessary changes. They do so because more than anything, they want to please Jehovah. They also do their best to base their decisions on God's word, the standard to which all of Jehovah's people must adhere. The old classic picture, the old YouTube. Hey, did you see this thing on YouTube? That was pretty funny. Anyway, uh, the standard of wholesome words refers to Christian teachings found in the Bible. Such teachings form the basis for everything we believe. Jehovah's organization has taught us to cling to that standard. As long as we do so, we will be blessed. What could happen if we deviated from the standard of wholesome words? Consider an example. In the first century, rumor was apparently circulating among Christians that the day of Jehovah had arrived. There had been a letter, supposedly written by the Apostle Paul, that made such an assertion. Without taking the time to check the facts, some Christians in Thessalonica believed the rumor and were even spreading it. They would not have been fooled had they remembered the things Paul had taught them when he was still with them. Paul's counsel, Paul counseled his brothers not to believe everything they heard and to believe them in the future. Paul concluded his second letter to the Thessalonians with these words, Here's my greeting, Paul's in my own hand, uh, which is a sign of every letter. This is the way I write. <laughs> What can we learn from Paul's words to the Thessalonians? When we hear something that does not harmonize with what we have learned from the Bible, or when we hear a sensational rumor, we need to use discernment. In the former Soviet Union, our enemies once circulated a letter that was allegedly from world headquarters. The letter encouraged some of the brothers to form a separate independent organization. The letter itself appeared to be genuine, but faithful brothers were not fooled. They realized that the message the letter contained did not line up with what they had been taught. Today, enemies of the truth sometimes use modern technology in an effort to confuse and divide us. Rather than be quickly shaken from our reason, we can protect ourselves by considering whether we hear or read is in harmony with the truths we have already learned. Remain united with those who are loyal to Jehovah. God wants us to be united in our worship. We will remain united as long as we cling to Jehovah. Any who deviate from the truth create divisions within the congregation. <laughs> so God warns us to avoid them. Otherwise, we ourselves could be drawn away from the truth. As we recognize the truth and hold firmly to it, we will stay spiritually safe and healthy. We will be protected from Satan's false teachings and propaganda. and We will remain secure in Jehovah's care during great tribulation. Keep holding firmly to what is true. The God of peace be with you. That is one of the few articles I actually read from cover to cover. <clears throat> 29. Study Article 29. Keep on guard against temptation. The spirit, of course, is eager, but the flesh is weak. With those words, Jesus showed that our imperfect condition. But his words also included a warning. Beware. 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 Beware of overconfidence. Early that very night, the disciples had confidently expressed their determination to stick by their master. Their motives were good. Still, they did not realize how quickly they could weaken under pressure. Thus, Jesus cautioned them, Keep on the watch and pray continually so that you may not enter into temptation. Sadly, the disciples failed to keep on the watch. When Jesus was arrested, did they stick by him or did they give in to the temptation to flee? Caught off guard, the disciples did exactly what they said they would never do. They abandoned Jesus. We cannot afford to be overconfident. True, we are determined to let nothing turn us away from Jehovah. Yet we are also imperfect and vulnerable to temptation. Without warning, we could find ourselves in circumstances that make the wrong course 
seem to be seem very appealing. We remain loyal to Jehovah and his son. We need to follow Jesus' counsel to keep on guard against the temptation to sin. This article can help us to do that. First, we consider in what areas we must especially be on guard. Then, we will discuss how to guard ourselves against temptation. Finally, we will consider how to remain on guard. Even sins that are relatively minor can weaken our relationship with Jehovah. Also, they can lead us to commit more serious sins. All of us face temptation to sin, but each one of us has areas of vulnerability, whether it is to commit a serious sin, to engage in some form of unclean conduct, or to fall prey to worldly thinking. For example, one person may be fighting temptation to commit sexual immorality. Another might be strongly inclined toward unclean practices, such as masturbation or viewing pornography. Well, I didn't know that they still actually, like, legitimately talked about masturbation as being wrong. I guess that's still 2024. Jehovah's Witnesses still still on, on that. Huh. Still, another may be struggling with fear of man, independent thinking, a quick temper, or something else. As James states, each one is tried by being drawn out and enticed by his own desire. Do you know in which areas you are most easily tempted? It does us no good to feel to fool ourselves by denying our weaknesses or concluding that we are too strong to fall into wrongdoing. After all, Paul indicates that even those who have spiritual qualifications might give in to temptation if they do not keep on guard. We must be honest with ourselves and acknowledge the areas in which we are not strong. Once we have identified those areas in which we are most susceptible to temptation, what should we do? Strengthen our resistance. To illustrate, in Bible times, the most vulnerable part of a city's wall was its gates. Therefore, the gates were the most heavily guarded. Similarly, we need to give special attention to any areas in which we know are we are especially weak. Uh, Jesus, Garden of Gethsemane, people falling asleep, run, run away, Jesus arrested. Boom. Narrated a picture for you. Done. How can we guard ourselves? Consider what we can learn from the young man discussed in Proverbs chapter 7. This was always an awkward one whenever they read it at the Kingdom Hall, I think. This was like usually what they talk about when they do the uh, inaugural, not inaugural, but the annual pornography talk uh, or whatever at the conventions or assemblies. Uh, anyway. Consider what we learn from, yes, he committed sexual immorality with an immoral woman. Verse 22 tells us that the young man went after her suddenly. But as the preceding, preceding verses show, he had taken several steps before this that gradually led him to sin. What led up to his sin? First, in the evening, he passed along the street near the immoral woman's corner. <laughs> I think it was a prostitute. Then he marched toward her house. Next, when he saw the woman, he did not turn away. Instead, he accepted her kiss and listened as she spoke of the communion sacrifices she had offered, perhaps in an attempt to make him think that she was not a bad person. Had the young man avoided the dangers that led up to the sin, he would have guarded himself from the temptation from the sin. Solomon's account illustrates what can happen to any worshiper of Jehovah. He might fall into serious sin and later feel that everything occurred suddenly. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Was that meme I like to use where it's like, uh, no, sex is not an accident. <laughs> or he might say, it just happened. And yet, if he thinks about what actually occurred, he will likely discover that he took some unwise steps that led to his transgression. Those steps might have involved bad association, unwholesome entertainment, or questionable or frequenting questionable places, whether in person or online. Perhaps he had also stopped praying, reading the Bible, attending meetings, or sharing in the ministry. Like the young man discussed in Proverbs, he may not have committed the sin so suddenly after all. What is the lesson for us? We need to avoid not only the sin itself, but also the steps that lead to sin. Solomon makes that very point after relating the account of the young man and the immoral woman. Referring to the woman, he states, do not stray onto her paths. He also says of 
such a wayward woman. Stay far away from her. Do not go near the entrance of her house. And of course, they're definitely talking about the entrance of her house. Yes, we got ourselves from sin by keeping far away from the circumstances that lead to it. This might include avoiding certain situations or activities that are not off limits for Christians in general, but that are known to lead us into temptations. To avoid situations that lead to sin, we will need to make a firm resolve. That is what Job did. He made a covenant with his eyes, never to look lustfully at other women. Adhering to that resolve would keep him far from committing adultery. We too can resolve to avoid anything that is likely to lead to temptation. We need to avoid anything that is likely to lead us to temptations. We got dudes sitting on a leather couch. That's where everything went wrong. He sees a girl at the workplace and then bada bing, bada boom. Hey, you want to go out for a, a Manhattan? Next thing, she'll ask you to go see your aquarium. <laughs> we must also guard uh, our thinking. Some believe that there is nothing wrong with fantasizing about improper desires as long as individuals do not act on them. But such thinking is wrong. A person who dwells on a wrong desire intensifies the desire. In a sense, he creates a temptation which he will now have to resist. Of course, wrong thoughts will at times come into our minds. The key is to reject these thoughts immediately and replace them with good ones. The, uh, when we do, we keep wrong thoughts from growing into a powerful desire that is hard to fight and we might even lead us to committing a serious sin. What else can we do to guard ourselves against temptation? We need to abso be absolutely convinced that we will benefit from obeying Jehovah's laws. We may on occasion struggle to bring our thoughts and desires into harmony with what God approves, but the peace of mind that we will experience will be well worth the effort. We need to cultivate right desires. If we learn to hate what is bad and love what is good, we will strengthen our resolve to do what is right and avoid situations that lead to sin. Proper desires will also fortify us to remain firm if we find ourselves in a tempting situation that we could not have anticipated or prevented. I feel like this is just like teaching people how to destroy their authentic selves. Hey, whenever you get the idea of, of being your authentic self, just try to drown that out with Jehovah's Witnessy things. <laughs> I turn the page and it's immediately, okay, make sure you're studying, make sure you're, you know, spending time drowning out that authentic self. Oh, golly gee willikers, the script writes itself sometimes. How can we cultivate right desires? We should be absorbed as much as possible in spiritual activities. When we are at Christian meetings or in the ministry, we are not easily tempted to do wrong. Instead, we build our desire to please Jehovah. By reading and studying God's word and meditating on it, we strengthen our love for what is good and our hatred for what is bad. Remember, Je Jesus told his disciples, pray continually so that you may not enter into temptation. As we spend time with our Heavenly Father in prayer, we take advantage of his help and strengthen our determination to please him. Likely, we can rid ourselves completely of some imperfect tendencies, but we might find that other inclinations continue to give us trouble. Consider the case of the Apostle Peter. He gave in to fear of man when he denied Jesus three times. Peter seems to have overcome that fear when he gave a bold witness before the Sanhedrin. However, some years later, fearing those of the circumcised class, he temporarily stopped eating with Gentile Christians. Peter's fear had returned. Perhaps he was never completely free of it. We might find ourselves in a similar situation. How? A tendency that we... A tendency that we thought we had put behind us might return to tempt us again. For example, one brother admits, I resisted pornography for ten years. Ten years, and convinced myself that my problem was over. But the addiction was lying dormant, waiting for the right circumstances to read its ugly head. Next thing you know, whammo! Commendably, he did not give up. He realized that he would need to put forth a daily effort to resist this vice, perhaps for the rest of his life, in this system of things. With the help of his wife and his congregation elders, he took stronger measures to resist pornography. How can we resist a persistent tendency so that we do not act on it? By following Jesus' counsel with regard to temptation. Keep on the watch, even during periods when we feel 
when you feel strong, continue to avoid situations that can lead to temptation. Keep applying the strategies that brought you success. Proverbs 28.14 states, Happy is the man who is always on guard. We can be certain that keeping on guard against temptation is worth the effort. Whatever temporary enjoyment sin may offer, living by Jehovah's standards will make us far happier. That is because we are designed to live according to his ways. Thus we will enjoy a clean conscience and keep ourselves in line for everlasting life. True, the flesh is weak, but this does not mean that we are helpless. Jehovah stands ready to give us the needed power. Note, however, that it is the power beyond what is normal that God provides. The normal power, the effort we put forth from day to day to guard from day to day to guard against temptation is our responsibility to supply. If we do our part, we can be confident that Jehovah will answer our prayers for added strength when we need it. Yes, Jehovah, with Jehovah's help, we can keep on, keep on guard against temptation. Might need to get a coffee soon. Eight more minutes. Okay. At least get through half of this one, I think. Important lessons from the kings of Israel. Ooh, maybe this will be something good. The Bible names more than 40 men who ruled as kings of Israel. That record candidly reveals intriguing details about some of them. For example, even the good kings did some bad things. Consider good king David. Jehovah said, My servant David dot 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 walked after me with all his heart, doing what is right in my eyes, except for cheating and murder and stealing a man's wife and plotting and killing. Yeah, he did what was right, though. Yet the man committed sexual immorality with a married woman and conspired to have her husband killed in battle. On the other hand, many of the faithful kings did some good things. Consider Rehoboam. In Jehovah's eyes, he did what was bad. Yet Rehoboam obeyed God's order to have ten tribes break away from his kingdom. He also benefited his nation by fortifying its cities. An important question arises. So now I know I have one of my camera batteries that will just die really quickly, randomly, and it won't even give me a warning message. So that's fun. I guess I should have put a little marker on it. Anyway, I guess I can still do that. Anyway, an important question arises. If Israel's kings did good and bad things, what basis did Jehovah determine whether a king was faithful in his eyes? The answer to that question will help us understand what Jehovah is looking for in us. We will discuss three factors, <laughs> everything is three factors, that Jehovah evidently took into consideration when evaluating the kings of Israel, their heart condition, repentance, and adherence to true worship. The kings who pleased Jehovah worshipped him with a complete heart. Good king Jehoshaphat searched for Jehovah with all his heart. Speaking of King Josiah, the inspired record says, There was no king like him prior to him who returned to Jehovah with all his heart. What about Solomon, who in his later years did what was bad? His heart was not complete. And regarding Abijam, another unfaithful king, the Bible record states, His heart was not complete with Jehovah. What does it mean? What does it mean to serve Jehovah with a complete heart? A person with a complete heart does not just go through the motions of worshiping God. Rather, he serves out of love and devotion. Furthermore, he maintains that love and devotion throughout his life. How can we imitate the faithful kings and maintain a complete heart? By avoiding bad influences. Unwholesome entertainment, for example, can divide our heart. So can bad association and materialistic thinking. If we detect that something is beginning to weaken our love for Jehovah, let us take swift action to remove it. We must not let our heart become divided. If we are not careful, we could fool ourselves into thinking that by increasing our spiritual activities, we need not reject bad influences. To illustrate, imagine yourself outside on a brutally cold and windy day. On arriving home, you turn on the heat. How much good would it do if you left the front door open? The cold air would quickly fill your house. The point? We need to do more than just take in spiritual food that warms our relationship with Jehovah. We must also close the door on unwholesome influences so that this world's cold air or ungodly attitude does not enter our heart and divide it. 
As noted earlier, King David erred seriously. But when the prophet Nathan confronted him about his sin, David humbly repented. Did he repent the first time, or didn't it take a couple tries? I thought it took a couple tries. I thought he denied it at first. From his expressions recorded in Psalms 51, we sense the sincerity of his repentance. David did not merely pretend to feel sorry in order to fool Nathan or to avoid punishment. King Hezekiah too sinned against Jehovah. The Bible record states, His heart became haughty, bringing indignation against him and against Judah and Jerusalem. Why did Hezekiah become proud? Perhaps he felt superior because of his riches, his victory over the Assyrians, or his miraculous cure from illness. It may have been pride that moved him to show off his wealth to the Babylonians, resulting in his being reproved by the prophet Isaiah. But like David, Hezekiah humbly repented. In the final analysis, Jehovah viewed him as a faithful king who kept doing what was right. In contrast, King Amaziah of Judah did what was right, but not with a complete heart. Where did he go wrong? After Jehovah helped him defeat the Edomites, Amaziah bowed down to their gods. Then, when confronted by Jehovah's prophet, the king stubbornly turned him away. What do we learn from these examples? We need to repent of our sins and do all we can to avoid repeating them. What if we receive counsel from congregation elders? Even on seemingly minor matter, we should not feel rejected by Jehovah or by the elders. Even the good kings of Israel were not above receiving counsel and reproof. When we receive correction, we should humbly respond, make the necessary changes, and move on with our wholehearted service to Jehovah. If we repent of our sins, Jehovah will forgive us. The kings whom Jehovah considered faithful adhered to true worship, and they encouraged their subjects to do the same. Of course, they had their shortcomings, as we have seen, but they were exclusively devoted to Jehovah and even fought vigorously to cleanse the land of idolatry. What about the kings whom Jehovah judged as unfaithful? Certainly, nothing they did was bad. Even wicked King Ahab showed a measure of humility and regret for his part in Naboth's murder. He also built cities and won victories for Israel. But Ahab was notorious for promoting false worship under the influence of his wife. For this, he never repented. Consider another unfaithful king, Rehoboam. As noted earlier, he accomplished a fair amount of good during his reign. But when his kingship was firmly established, he abandoned the law of Jehovah in favor of false worship. Thereafter, he wavered between true worship and false worship. Rehoboam and Ahab were not the only kings to deviate from true worship. In fact, by far, the majority of the unfaithful kings were guilty of supporting false worship in some way. Rehoboam and Ahab were not the only kings to deviate from true worship. In fact, by far, the majority of the unfaithful kings were guilty of supporting false worship in some way. Clearly, in Jehovah's eyes, adhering to true worship was a major factor in determining whether a king was good or bad. Why was the issue of worship so important to Jehovah? For one thing, the kings were responsible for guiding God's people in true worship. Also, false worship inevitably leads to other serious sins and injustices. Furthermore, the kings and their subjects were dedicated to Jehovah. Thus, the Bible likens their involvement in false worship to adultery. A person who commits literal adultery sins against his or her mate in a most personal way. Similarly, a... You're okay, buddy. A person who commits literal adultery sins against his or her mate in a most personal way. Similarly, a dedicated servant of Jehovah who engages in false worship sins against him in a direct and personal manner. When we receive correction, we should respond humbly, make the necessary change, and move on with our wholehearted service to Jehovah. Got a picture of this guy. He looks like he's been hitting the old bourbon whiskey. Some young, looks like, apparently, maybe some young elder, ministerial servant, maybe some young elder, who knows, he looks like he's 12, is counseling him and says, hey, bucko, you might want to cut back. And then they go preaching. Everyone uh, goes and takes a shower and everyone's happy. What lessons can we learn? Certainly, we must be determined to avoid false worship, but we must also adhere to true worship and remain active in it. 
The prophet Malachi stated plainly that in Jehovah's eyes distinguishes a good person from a bad one. What in Jehovah's eyes? He wrote, you will see the distinction between a righteous person and a wicked person, between one serving God and one not serving him. Therefore, we must not allow anything, not even our imperfections and mistakes, to discourage us to the point where that we quit serving God. To stop serving Jehovah is in itself a serious sin. If you are single and are considering marriage, can you see how Malachi's words about serving God have a bearing on your choice of a marriage mate? A person may have some fine qualities, but if that person is not serving the true God, he is not or she is he or she presently viewed as righteous in Jehovah's eyes? As a marriage mate, will not that one exert a positive spiritual influence on you? Consider, the pagan wives of King Solomon may have had some good qualities, but they were not worshippers of Jehovah, and they gradually inclined Solomon's heart towards false worship. Parents, you can use the Bible's record of the kings to instill in your children zeal for Jehovah's worship. Help them appreciate that Jehovah viewed a good king as either good or as bad, depending largely on whether that king promoted true worship. Teach your children, by word and example, that spiritual matters such as studying the Bible, attending meetings, and participating in the field ministry take priority over all other activities. Otherwise, your children might conclude that being one of Jehovah's Witnesses is nothing more than belonging to the family religion. As a result, they might put worship in second place or leave it entirely. And this is why you continue to get in trouble, Watchtower, is because it's not just the family religion. You even go out of your way to make that a point. You want people to be reminded, don't think about this as joining the family religion. Don't think about this as a result. They might put your worship in second place or leave it entirely. Oh my God, if they think about this as just the family religion, they might leave, which is within someone's right. If you baptize them when they are a child, they have the right to change their mind without consequence. <sighs> is someone be, is someone who has stopped serving Jehovah beyond hope? No, because he can repent and resume worship. To do so, he may need to swallow his pride and accept help from congregation elders. I wonder what it would take for me to actually be accepted back into a congregation. Like, legitimately 100%, like, what if I, like, went through everything? Like, I wonder what it would take for them to actually buy it. I, I'm I'm almost under the impression that it would be, like, zero nothing. I don't know. I guess that's probably not a video I want to find out. <laughs> what lessons, then, uh, have we learned from the kings of Israel? We can be like the faithful kings if we maintain a heart that is completely devoted to Jehovah. Let us learn from our mistakes, repent, uh, and make the needed corrections, and may we remember the importance of adhering to the worship of the one and only true God. If you personally stick to Jehovah, he will view you as someone who does what is right in his eyes. What's crazy is they used to like write books about the kings and really breaking down stuff. Now it's just this short little article. Huh. Meeting the challenge of adjusting to a new congregation. Like most of the watchtowers are just this I guess we'll see when we look back cuz maybe I'm wrong maybe I'm misremembering what it was what it was actually like so I guess we'll find out have you ever moved to a new congregation yes if so probably agree with Jean Charles who says it is a challenge to adapt to a new congregation while maintaining the spiritual balance of everyone in the family in addition to finding work accommodations and perhaps new schools Those who move may face the challenge of a harsher climate, a different culture, and a new witnessing territory. Nicholas and Celine, Celine faced a different challenge. They accepted an assignment from the France branch to move to a new congregation. They relate, The period following the initial excitement was difficult because we missed our friends. We did not yet have a sufficiently strong relationship with the brothers in our new congregation. In view of the challenges, how can you make a successful... Uh, Boy, a success of moving to a new congregation. 
What can others do to help? And what spiritual blessings might you receive and impart in your new congregation? Rely on Jehovah. Kazumi in Japan left the congregation she had been part of for 20 years when her husband received a job transfer. She, How did she commit her way to Jehovah? She says, I poured out my heart to Jehovah about all the panic, loneliness, and anxiety I felt. Each time I did so, he gave me the strength I needed. How can you increase your reliance on Jehovah? Just as a plant needs water and nutrients from the soil in order to grow, so your faith must be nourished to grow. Nicholas, previously mentioned, found that meditating on the examples of Abraham, Jesus, and Paul, men who had many sacrifices to do Jehovah's will, strengthened his confidence in Jehovah's spirit, a regular program of personal Bible study, will not only help you to cope with any changes in your life, but will also equip you with spiritual gifts, gifts that you can share with others in your new congregation. Avoid making comparisons. Jules encountered a wide culture gap when she moved from Benin to the United States. I had the impression that I had to relate my whole life story to each new person I met, he recalls. Because he was different from what he because this was different from what he used to, he started isolating himself from the congregation. After getting to know the brothers and sisters better, however, he changed his viewpoint. He says, I believe that wherever we are on earth, humans are the same. They just express themselves differently. Accepting people as they are is the essential. Is essential. I okay. I was reading that wrong. So avoid making comparisons with your former congregation, as one pioneer pioneer sister and Elise put it. I did not move to find what I had left behind. I moved in order to discover new things. Wow. Well, it must have been easier for her. She uh, she absolutely didn't like her old congregation. What the heck? What kind of quote was that? I did not move to find what I had left behind. I moved to find new things. Elders, too, need to avoid making comparisons with their former congregations. Different methods are not necessarily wrong. It is wise to get to know the local circumstances before making suggestions. It is easier to lead by example than to impose one's ideas, own ideas on a congregation. Yeah, also, there's I have witnessed firsthand situations where like someone's an elder. They move to a different congregation, or they're told by the circuit overseer to go to a different congregation, or something like that. And the new elder body for the congregation they're joining doesn't like them. And they get they don't get recommended to become an elder, not even a ministerial servant. And in one example I remember specifically, it was like three or four years. This guy wasn't even a ministerial servant, nothing. He moved to a different congregation, and within six months he was appointed an elder again. It was all just like this backbiting, bitter... Uh, politicking. It had nothing to do with Holy Spirit. It was just who do you, who who likes you, who are you friends with, and that was like the number one factor. Moving requires a lot of time and energy, but it is vital to attend congregation meetings in person if possible, right from the start. After all, if those in your new congregation never see you or rarely do, how can they support you? Lucinda, who moved with her two daughters to a large city in South Africa, recalls. I was advised to focus on getting deeply involved with the congregation, working with others in the ministry, and participating at the meetings. We also offered our home to be used for meetings for field service. Uh, Striving side-by-side in theocratic activities with the brothers and sisters in your new congregation is a fine way to contribute to the faith of the good news. Annalise, mentioned earlier, was encouraged by her elders to try to preach with everyone. The result? I quickly realize that this is the key to fitting in, she says. Also volunteering for such activities as cleaning and maintaining the kingdom hall will indicate that now you consider it your congregation. Yes, sir, Bob. Uh, the more you get involved, the sooner you will be accepted and feel part of your new spiritual family. Showing personal interest is the best way to make friends, so allow ample time before and after meetings to approach others and get to know them. Make a conscious effort to learn their names remembering people's names and being warm and approachable will attract others to you and no doubt lead to precious new friendships rather than worry about being accepted allow your new brothers and sisters to get to know you as you really are do as lucinda relates we have close friends now because of taking the initiative to invite others to our home uh got some pictures or we're cleaning and we're eating bread. 
Yep, that's what I got for you. Entering a kingdom hall full of strangers may be daunting for some, so how can you make it easier for the new arrivals? Welcome one another, encouraging, encourage the Apostle Paul, uh, just as the Christ also welcome you. By imitating Christ, elders can help new ones to feel welcome. However, in all the congregations, including the children, have a part to play in making new friends. Welcoming others includes showing hospitality, but may also involve offering practical help. One sister, for example, gave of her precious time to show a new arrival around town and explain the public transportation system. The sister's gesture really touched the new one and helped her to adapt. As a local, as, as a local, as a locust matures, it sheds its skin several times before its wings are capable of flying. Similarly, when moving to a new congregation, you need to shed any apprehension that prevents you from spreading your wings in Jehovah's service. Moving is excellent training, confirms Nicholas and Celine. Adapting to new people and different circum surroundings encourages us to cultivate new qualities. Jean Charles quoted at the outset comments on how his family has benefited. The change has allowed our children to blossom in the new congregation. After just a few months, our daughter accepted assignments in the midweek meeting, and our son became an unbaptized publisher. What if your circumstances prevent you from moving, for example, to where the need is greater? Then why not make a fresh start where you are and try to apply some... Wait, what? What if your circumstances prevent you from moving, for example, to where the need is greater? Then why not make a fresh start where you are? and try to apply while relying on Jehovah fully involve yourself in congregation activities by making arrangements to work with others in the ministry and developing new friendships or strengthening existing ones. Oh, okay. I got you. I thought they were saying like, Hey, um, why don't you try and just move congregations? Like, let's just do a congregation shakeup just for the heck of it. Cause that never goes very, goes over very well. They, they were trying to do that in my area one time and, because they were building a new hall, and all of the congregation territories were getting split up, and it was like uh, maybe a couple of years of people worrying, and like, oh, which congregation am I going to be part of? Are we going to be assigned to a different congregation? Am I going to have to move? I don't want to move congregations. I've been here my whole life, and just all of this drama surrounding it, so it is a pretty big deal. Uh, despite the challenges many Christians have made a success of moving to a new congregation, and so can you. Changing congregations help me to widen out, says Annalise. Kazumi is now convinced that by moving, you can experience Jehovah's support in ways you haven't before. And what about Jules? He says, the friendships I have made help me not to feel out of place anymore. I now feel such a part of my new congregation that I would find it hard to leave. What contributes to a successful move? This one is a box for the elders. Communicate with the elders of both congregations well in advance, providing them with the planned date of your move and your new address and contact information. Make sure that you know that you're the location of the Kingdom Hall and the meeting times. At your first meeting, introduce yourself to the elders and others. When the elder, What the elders should do. The congregation secretary of the former congregation should promptly forward a letter of introduction and the congregation publisher record cards to the new congregation. The congregation service committee of the new congregation should immediately assign the new arrivals to a field service group and encourage visit the group overseer will no doubt be much appreciated. Questions from readers. These ones I, I am fully convinced are not actual questions that people have asked. Because, like, the older ones, I guarantee when we go and read those are going to be things, like, that actually make sense. These are just cuckoo brain stuff. Who is the woman mentioned at Isaiah 60, verse 1? And does she arise and shed light? Like, this will be incomprehensible, even for a Bible nerd like myself. Isaiah 61 reads, Arise, O woman, shed light, for your light has come. The glory of Jehovah shines on you. The context shows that the woman was Zion, or Jerusalem, the capital of Judah at the time. The city stands for the entire nation. Isaiah's words raise two questions. First, when and how did Jerusalem arise and shed spiritual light? Second, are Isaiah's words have a greater fulfillment in our time? Oh boy. Jerusalem and its temple lay in ruins while the Jews were in exile in Babylon for 70 years. Oh, boy. But after Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians, Israelites f from all over the Babylonian Empire were free to return to their homeland and restore true worship. Beginning in 537, a faithful remnant from all 12 tribes did so. 
They began to offer sacrifices to Jehovah to celebrate the festivals and to rebuild the temple. Once again, like how they say, they began to return, but it's not until really all of them are... Anyway, this this whole thing is just all cooked. Once again, Jehovah's glory started to shine on Jerusalem. That is, God's restored people. They, in turn, became a source of enlightenment to the nations, which were in spiritual darkness. However, Isaiah's restoration prophecies were only partially fulfilled on ancient Jerusalem. The Israelites, in general, did not continue to obey God. Later, they... Rejected the Messiah, Jesus Christ, in 70 CE, Jerusalem and its temple were destroyed the second time. Jehovah foretold that tragic outcome. Clearly, it was not his purpose for earthly Jerusalem to fulfill every aspect of the restoration prophecies in Isaiah chapter 60. So, you tell people that uh, this thing is going to happen, but you know that it's not, and you just let them get excited about it for no reason, because you already know in advance that they are going to completely fail, and you have a secondary plan. (sighs) Are Isaiah's words have a greater fulfillment in our time? Yes, but in regard to another symbolic woman, the Jerusalem above, the Apostle Paul wrote about her. She is our mother. Jerusalem above is the heavenly part of God's organization, which is made up of loyal spirit creatures. Her children include Jesus and the 144,000 spirit-anointed Christians who, like Paul, have a heavenly hope. The anointed Christians make up a holy nation, the Israel of God. How did the Jerusalem above rise and shine light? I don't know, I'm going to guess in 1919. She did so through her earthly anointed children. Compare the experience... That was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 60. The only Christians had to arise because they had gone into spiritually dark state when the foretold weeds of the apostasy overwhelmed them in the 2nd century CE. They thus became captives to Babylon the Great, the world empire false religion. The anointed remained captive until the conclusion of the system of things, a period that began in 1914. Soon af- thereafter, in 1919, ding, 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 uh, they were set free and immediately began to shed spiritual light by throwing themselves in the preaching work. Baby, over the years, people from all nations have come to see the light, including the remaining ones of the Israel of God, the kings mentioned at Isaiah 63. In the future, anointed Christians will receive divine light in an even greater way. How so? When they finish their earthly course, they will become part of New Jerusalem, or Christ's bride of 144,000 fellow kings and priests. New Jerusalem will play a key role in fulfilling Isaiah 61. Just as earthly Jerusalem was set, was the seat of the government in ancient Israel, the New Jerusalem, and Christ will become the government of the new system of things. How does New Jerusalem come down from the heaven of God? By directing its attention to the earth, God-fearing people out of all the nations will walk by means of light. They will even be set free from sin and death. The result will be the complete restoration of all things, as Isaiah and the other prophets foretold. That grand restoration began when Christ became king and will conclude at the end of the thousand-year reign. Wow. And a picture of paradise. But this picture of paradise kind of super sucks. There are no koala bears, there are no panda bears, and there are no melons. So... Boo, this one sucks. One more watchtower in the bag, though. And we are in the August 2024 watchtower, the infamous one which all had us on the edge of our seats, wondering what sort of information would be contained in the pages of it. So let's uh, dive back in. What Jehovah has done to rescue sinful humans. Oh yeah, I have another cup of coffee. It is about 930 p.m. Uh, so there's that and that's about all I got for you. <sighs> Let's do it. Would you like to know how much Jehovah God loves you? Here's a good way for you to learn the answer. Study what he has done in order to save you from sin and death. Sin is a terrible enemy, one that you cannot defeat on your own. We all sin daily and we die because of sin. There is good news though. With Jehovah's help, We can defeat sin. In fact, our sin is absolutely certain. (laughs) Our sin. Well, our sin is absolutely certain, and our victory is absolutely certain. Jehovah God has been helping humans fight against sin for some 6,000 years. Why? Because he loves us. He has loved humans from the very beginning. Minor chair adjustment. 
God knows that sin leads to death. And he does not want us to die. He wants us to live forever. That is what he wants for you. In this article, we discuss three questions. It's always three questions. How did Jehovah offer hope to sinful humans? How did sinful humans in Bible times gain Jehovah's favor? How did Jesus come to the rescue of sinful man, humankind? Uh, and no, I'm not reading from the simplified version of the Watchtower. This is, if you can even wrap your mind around it, they have a simplified version that they put out every month uh, of this magazine. Simpler than this. It's crazy. When Jehovah created the first man and woman, he wanted them to be happy. He gave them a beautiful home, the gift of marriage, and a fascinating assignment. They were to fill the earth with their descendants, making the whole planet a paradise-like Garden of Eden. He gave them only one simple restriction, and, that, and he warned them if they broke out if they broke that command by deliberately rebelling against him, their sin would lead to death. We know what happened. An invisible spirit, one who had no love for God or for them, entered the picture and tempted them to commit that sin. Adam and Eve gave in to that bad influence. Failing to trust their loving father, they sinned. As we know, Jehovah's words proved true. From that day onward, they had to face the consequences. They began to grow old, and finally they died. Jehovah had that sad account recorded for our benefit. It helps us to understand why he hates sin so much. Sin separates us from our Father, and it leads to death. That is why Satan, the rebel spirit who instigated all this trouble, loves sin and seeks to promote it. He might have thought that he won a great victory in Eden, but he did not understand how loving Jehovah is. God never changed his purpose for the descendants of Adam and Eve. He loves the human family, so he immediately offered hope to all. Jehovah knew that some of those descendants would choose to love him and would seek his help in fighting against sin. And as their father and creator, he would give them a way to be set free from sin and draw close to him. What would Jehovah do to make all that possible? The first glimpse, glimmer of hope came when Jehovah pronounced his sentence on Satan. God foretold that an offspring would be the key to hope. This offspring would eventually crush Satan, undoing all the evil that he had caused. However, that offspring would suffer in the process. Satan would strike him, causing his death. That would hurt Jehovah most deeply, but the pain would all be worth it in the end because countless humans would be saved from sin and death. This is written by children for children. Through the centuries that followed, Jehovah gradually made it clear and clearer how sinful humans could draw close to him. Abel the second son of Adam. Should I double check if I didn't download? The, I feel like I should double check. Make sure. Nope, this is not the simplified edition. This is the real deal. Um, Abel, the second son of Adam and Eve, was the first human to put faith in Jehovah after the tragedy in Eden. Because Abel loved Jehovah and sought to please him and draw close to him, he offered up a sacrifice. Abel was a shepherd, so he took some of his young lambs and slaughtered them, offering them to Jehovah. How did Jehovah respond? He looked with favor on Abel and on his offspring. Jehovah expressed approval of similar sacrifices offered up by people who loved him and trusted in him, such as Noah. By accepting such sacrifices, Jehovah showed that he was a blood god that liked the sweet smell of goats, sheep, lamb, and who knows, maybe even people. Jehovah asked Abraham, a remarkable man of faith, to do something extremely difficult, to offer up his own son Isaac as a sacrifice. Abraham surely found this to be the most painful task imaginable. Nonetheless, he prepared to follow through with it. Again, he's a blood, if he's not a blood god, then why would he even... Why would this even be in the realm of possibility? Hey, go offer someone as a sacrifice. Still, that example teaches all people of faith a vital truth. Jehovah would be willing to offer his own beloved son as a sacrifice. Jehovah loves humans that much. Centuries later, the law given to the nation of Israel called for many sacrifices to atone for the sins of God's people. Such sacrifices pointed to a greater sacrifice, one that would completely save mankind from sin. God's prophets were inspired to explain that the promised offering, who turned out to be a special son of God, would have to suffer and be put to death. He would be slaughtered like a sacrificial sheep. Imagine, Jehovah would arrange for his own beloved son to be sacrificed in order to save mankind, including you, from sin and death. In the first century CE, God's servant, John the Baptist, pointed to Jesus of Nazareth and said, 
See, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. These inspired words identified Jesus as the long-foretold offspring. He would offer up the promised sacrifice. Now, more than ever before, there was a solid hope for sinful mankind, a complete victory over sin. Jesus focused Jesus focused special attention on people who felt weighed down by his sin and invited them to become his followers. He knew that sin was the root cause of mankind's ills, so he reached out to men and women who were known to be sinners. Using an illustration, he explained, Healthy people do not need a physician, but those who are ill do. He added, I came to call not righteous people, but sinners. Jesus lived up to those words. He gently forgave the sins of the woman who washed his feet with tears. He taught vital truths to a Samaritan woman at the well that he knew of her immoral lifestyle. God even empowered Jesus to undo the end result of sin, death. How? Jesus resurrected people, male and female, children and adults. It is no wonder that even people deeply caught up in sin were drawn to Jesus. He showed them compassion and empathy, and they felt consider comfortable approaching him. And Jesus commended and rewarded such ones for sowing faith in him. He provided a perfect living picture of his Father's mercy. By word and deed, he showed that his compassionate, merciful Father loves people and wants to help each of them to win the fight against sin. Jesus helped sinful people to want to change their ways and to follow him. Uh, Jesus is suffering for our sins. Those are the pictures. Carrying the torture stake, uh, all of that good stuff. Jesus, well, not good stuff, but you guys know what I mean. I say it as a turn of expression. Jesus knew what lay ahead of him. More than once he told his followers that he would be betrayed and executed on a stake. He knew that his sacrifice would take away the sin of the world, as John had proclaimed and the prophets had foretold. Jesus also taught that after offering his life, he would draw all sorts of men to himself. Sinful humans would please Jehovah by accepting Jesus as their Lord and by following in his steps. If they did so, they would finally be set free from sin. So Jesus willingly and courageously faced his terrible death. Jesus was betrayed, arrested, verbally abused, slandered, convicted, and even tortured. Soldiers laid him to the site of execution and nailed him to a stake. As he faithfully endured all that agony, there was someone, was capitalized for some reason, who felt even more pain. That was Jehovah God. Why is it like... There was someone who felt, I swear this has to be AI generated. He held back his infinite power and refrained from intervening. Why? What could move a loving father to act in that way? In a word, love. Jesus said, God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son so that everyone exercising faith in him might not be destroyed but have everlasting life. Jesus' sacrifice is the ultimate proof of how much Jehovah loves the descendants of Adam and Eve. It proves how much Jehovah loves you. He went, he went to great lengths, subjecting himself to the worst pain imaginable in order to rescue you from sin and death. Yes, he wants to help each one of us to fight against sin and to win. I'm gonna fight against sin to win, yeah, yeah. God's gift, the ransom sacrifice of his only begotten son, makes it possible for us to have our sins forgiven. But to receive God's forgiveness, we must do something. What is that? John the Baptist and then Jesus Christ himself provided the answer. Repent, for the kingdom of the heavens has drawn near. So repentance is key. If we truly want to fight against sin and draw close to our loving Father. But what is involved in repen being repentant and how does it help us combat our sinful condition? The next study article will provide the answer. Questions from readers. Is the marking described at 2 Thessalonians 3.14 an action taken by the congregation or by individual Christians? The Apostle Paul wrote to the Christian Christians in Thessalonica saying, If anyone is not obedient to our word through this letter, keep this one marked. Previously we said that this was a direction to the elders. If someone continued to ignore Bible principles in spite of repeated counsel, the elders might give a warning talk to the congregation. Thereafter, individual publishers would not socialize with the marked one. However, an adjustment is needed. Paul's counsel evidently refers to an action that individual Christians should take under certain circumstances. So there is no need for the elders to give a warning talk. Why the change? Consider Paul's counsel in its context. 
Paul noted that some in the congregation were walking disorderly. They were disregarding inspired counsel. During a previous visit, he gave this order. If anyone does not want to work, neither let him eat. Yet some were still refusing to work to support themselves, although able to do so. Also, they were meddling in the affairs of others. How were Christians to treat such disorderly ones? Keep this one marked, said Paul. The Greek word suggests taking special notice of this person. Paul addressed this directive to the whole congregation, not just the elders. So individual Christians might have noticed a fellow Christian disobeying inspired counsel would choose to stop associating with the disorderly one. Did this mean that the person was treated as someone who was removed from the congregation? No, for Paul added, continue admonishing him as a brother. So individual Christians would still associate with the marked one at meetings and in the ministry, but they would choose not to associate with him for social occasions or recreation. Why? That he may become ashamed, said Paul. As a result of the marking, the disorderly Christian might become ashamed of his conduct and change his ways. How might Christians today apply this counsel? First, we would want to make sure that the conduct in question is really actually disorderly, as Paul described. He was not talking about those who differ from us in matters of conscience or personal preference. He did not mean that those who simply have hurt feelings. Rather, Paul had in mind specifically those who deliberately chose to disobey. Clear, God-given counsel. Today, if we notice a fellow Christian who shows a such a dis- disobedient spirit, we will make a person. <laughs> we will make a personal decision not to associate with him for social occasions or recreation. It's so easy to say. You know, it's like you know, this is a personal decision, but we're going to tell you in advance what your personal decision is going to be. This absolutely isn't legal jargon that we're using to try and dodge and slip. Uh, out of a little bit of trouble that we're in when uh, governments are asking us, hmm, so what about all of these policies you guys have where you will literally stop talking to people? Ah, boy. And we would still associate with the individual at our meetings and in the ministry. When he corrects his course, he would then resume normal association. Jehovah wants all to repent. When we do something wrong, it is vital that we repent. In the Bible, a person who repents changes his mind about a certain kind of behavior, stops behaving in that way, and is determined not to repeat it. Every human alive needs to learn about repentance. Why? Because we all sin daily. As descendants of Adam and Eve, each of us has inherited sin and death. Not one of us is exempt. Even outstanding men of faith, such as the Apostle Paul, struggled against sin. Does this mean that we should be miserable all the time because of our sins? No. Jehovah is merciful, and he wants us to be happy. Consider the experience of the Jews in Nehemiah's day. Jehovah did not want them to be grief-stricken over past sins, but wants them to be joyful in their worship of him. Jehovah knows that repentance leads to happiness, so he teaches us about it. If we repent of our sins, we can be confident that our merciful Father will forgive us. Let us learn more about repentance. In this article, we will consider, guess how many, (laughs) aspects. First, we will learn what Jehovah taught Israel about repentance. Then we will focus on how Jehovah reached out to sinners in order to lead them to repentance. Finally, we will discuss what Jesus' followers learned about repentance. I haven't seen Joffrey in a while. I wonder where that little guy is. Maybe that sneezing fit I had a couple hours ago scared him away. When Jehovah organized the Israelites into a nation, he made a covenant, a formal agreement with them. If they kept his laws, he would protect and bless them. Regarding those laws, he assured them, Now this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it beyond your reach. But if they rebelled against him, for example, by choosing to worship other gods, he would withdraw his blessing, and they would suffer. Yet even then they could still regain God's favor. They could return to Jehovah their God and listen to his voice. In other words, they could repent if they did so. Jehovah would draw close to them and bless them once more. Jehovah's chosen people repeatedly rebelled against him. In addition to practicing idolatry, they carried out other degraded practices. As a result, they suffered. But Jehovah did not give up on his wayward people. He sent prophets again and again to urge his people to repent and return to him. Jehovah often used his prophets to warn and correct his people. For example, for example, God said through Jeremiah, Return, O renegade Israel, 
I will not look down angrily on you, for I am loyal. I will not stay resentful forever. Only acknowledge your guilt, for you have rebelled against Jehovah. By means of Joel, Jehovah said, Return to me with all your hearts. He had Isaiah declare, Make yourselves clean. Remove your evil deeds from my sight. Stop doing bad. By means of Ezekiel, Jehovah asked, Do I take any pleasure at all in the death of a wicked person? Dot, dot, dot. Do I not prefer that he turn away from his ways and keep living? I do not take any pleasure in the death of anyone, dot, 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 so turn back and live. Apparently you had to make those scriptures out of verses 23 and 32, because that's just what we do nowadays. Jehovah takes delight in seeing people repent because he wants them to keep living forever. So Jehovah does not want does not just wait passively for sinful people to change before he offers them help. Let's see some examples of this. Notice what Jehovah taught his people by means of a real-life example, that of Gomer, the wife of the prophet Hosea. After committing adultery, she left Hosea for another man. Was she beyond help? Jehovah, who had read heart, who can read hearts, told Hosea, Go once again, love the woman who is loved by another man and is committing adultery, just as Jehovah loves the people of Israel while they turn to other gods. Note that Hosea's wife was still involved in a course of serious sin, yet Jehovah told Hosea to reach out to her and offer forgiveness and reconciliation. This case was unique. Today, Jehovah does not require that an innocent victim of adultery remain married to the adulterer. In fact, Jehovah directed his son to make a provision for such victims of adultery to seek a divorce if they choose to do so. Similarly, Jehovah had not given up on his obstinate people. Even though they were caught up in terrible sins, he still loved them and continued to reach out and help them to repent and change their ways. Does this example suggest that Jehovah, the examiner of hearts, will reach out to an individual who is still involved in serious sin and try to let that one to lead that one to repentance? Let us see. Cain was Adam and Eve's first son. He inherited sinful tendencies from his parents. Additionally, the Bible says of him, his own works were wicked. Perhaps that explains why Jehovah did not look with any favor on Cain and on his offering when he offered up a sacrifice. Instead of changing his ways, Cain grew hot with anger and was dejected. What did Jehovah do next? He spoke to Cain. Note that Jehovah reasoned with Cain, offering him hope and warning him against the danger of sin. Sadly, Cain refused to listen. He did not let Jehovah lead him to repentance. After that negative response, did Jehovah stop trying to lead other sinners to repentance? Far from it. Jehovah dearly loved King David. He even called him a man agreeable to my heart. But David became involved in gross sins, including adultery and murder. According to the Mosaic Law, David deserved to die. Yet Jehovah kindly stepped in. He sent his prophet Nathan to visit the king, even though David did not yet show any signs of repentance. Yeah, so earlier in the magazine, it was like, oh yeah, and when he was corrected, he changed his ways. And I had, was like, yeah, but didn't he like not do that right away? And they're just confirming that. It's like, I feel like sometimes they don't even remember what they wrote just like a minute ago, which, I mean, that's fair enough. I don't remember a video from six months ago, but... So I figure if I was a billion dollar organization, I could keep better tabs. And I'm just one guy. Like, they have a whole squad. Nathan used an illustration designed to touch David's heart. Deeply moved, David repented. He wrote a heartfelt psalm that reveals his repentant spirit. That psalm has comforted countless sinners and motivated them to repent. Are we not glad that Jehovah lovingly led his beloved servant David to repentance? Not really. Jehovah hates sin, and he does not condone it in any form. However, he knows that we are all sinners, and out of love for us, he chooses to help us fight against sin. He is always trying to help even the worst of sinners to repent and draw close to him. How comforting it is to know that, as we reflect on Jehovah's patience and forgiveness, we are determined to stay faithful to him and to be quick to repent when we sin. Let us consider how the Christian congregation was further taught about repentance. In the first century CE, the time had come for the Messiah to arrive. As mentioned in the preceding article, Jehovah used both John the Baptist and Jesus Christ to teach people how important it is to repent. Throughout his ministry, Jesus taught his listeners about his Father's forgiving nature. 
Jesus did so in a striking way when he gave the pos the parable of the lost son. That young man chose to pursue a sinful life of for some time. Yet he came to his senses and returned home. How did the father respond? Jehovah said that while the son was still a long way off, his son, his father caught sight of him and was moved with pity, and he ran and embraced him and tenderly kissed him. The son intended to ask if he could become a servant in his father's household, but his father called him this son of mine and restored him to his place in the family. The father said he was lost and he has been found. When Jesus lived in heaven before coming to earth, he had surely seen his father show compassion towards countless repentant sinners. <laughs> I mean, surely he saw that, right? Right? <laughs> what a heartwarming and reassuring picture Jesus painted for our merciful Father, Jehovah. He also watched him kill millions of people for really, really, like, crazy stuff. Like, watched him send bears out to kill children. Yeah, that's my loving God. <laughs> The Apostle Peter learned a great deal from Jesus about repentance and forgiveness. Peter often needed forgiveness, and Jesus extended it generously. For example, after Peter denied knowing his Lord three times, he felt crushed by his own guilt. But after Jesus was resurrected, he appeared to Peter, apparently in private. No doubt, on that occasion, Jesus lovingly forgave and reassured his repentant apostle. Having had first-hand experience, Peter could now teach others about repentance and forgiveness. Some time after the festival of Pentecost, Peter gave a discourse to a crowd of unbelieving Jews, explaining to them that they had put the Messiah to death. Yet he lovingly urged them, Repent, therefore, and turn around, so as to get your sins blotted out, so that seasons of refreshment may come from Jehovah himself. Peter thus showed that repentance moves a sinner to turn around and change his wrong way of thinking and acting, and to pursue a new course, one pleasing to God. The apostle showed that Jehovah would blot out their sins or cause their sins to disappear. And decades later, Peter assured Christians, Jehovah dot 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 is patient with you because he does not desire anyone to be destroyed, but desires all to attain to repentance. What a beautiful hope for Christians when they commit sins, even serious ones. Few people have ever needed to repent and be forgiven more than Saul of Tarsus. He was a vicious persecutor of Christ's beloved followers. Most Christians likely viewed him as a lost cause, beyond any hope of repentance. Hey, maybe I do have hope, still. Yet the resurrected Jesus was far above such flawed reason, human reasoning. He and his father saw good qualities in Saul. Jesus said, this man is a chosen visible, visible to me. There's a good word for you. Jesus even used a miracle to lead Saul to repentance. After becoming a Christian, Saul later, known as the Apostle Paul, often expressed his appreciation for the way which he had been shown kindness and mercy. The grateful apostle taught, God in his kindness is trying to lead you to repentance. When Paul heard about a scandalous problem regarding immorality in the Christian congregation in Corinth, how did he handle it? He did, not, he did so in a way that teaches us a great deal about Jehovah's loving discipline and about the importance of showing mercy. We will consider an account in greater detail in the following article. Yeah, it's just hard, because, like, if you just stick with Jesus, I feel like that's the way to get to the repentance thing. But as soon as you're always, like, and Jesus was a perfect reflection, like, just don't, just don't go there. You know, you can, you, you'll just have an easier time if you focus on the character of Jesus and forgiveness and all of that stuff, and just leave all the Old Testament stuff behind. But they, they just continue to, to bring it up and... It's like, okay, so some people can commit a crime, like murder, and, you know, conspiring to, because he wanted to steal Bathsheba. And for one person, he would put that person to death on the spot right there, you know, give them some horrible disease, and boom, they were done so. Or for something much less serious. And yet for David, he's like, well, I got this all planned out and we don't want any continuity errors. So I'm just going to have to, even though he wasn't repentant initially, I finally got it out of him. It just, it's not consistent. And so just leaving that all behind, it just is such an easier time. But when you try and harmonize it, you'd end up just looking real silly. How the congregation reflects Jehovah's view of sinners. Study article 33. How the Congregation Reflects Jehovah's View of Sinners 
Jehovah created humans with free will. You use that gift regularly when you make decisions. The most important decision that any person can make is the decision to dedicate himself to Jehovah and to become part of his family of worshipers. Jehovah desires everyone to do so. Why? Because he loves people and wants the best for them. He wants them to enjoy a friendship with him and to live forever. However, Jehovah does not force anyone to serve him. He allows each individual to decide what he will do. What if a baptized Christian breaks God's law, commits a seri- committing a serious sin? If he does not repent, he must be removed from the congregation. Yet, even then, Jehovah fervently hopes that the wrongdoer will return to him. In fact, that is an important reason why he provided the ransom, to make forgiveness possible for repentant sinners. Our loving God warmly appeals to wrongdoers, urging them to repent. I forgot to do a mic check. Is the mic okay? Jehovah wants us to adopt his attitude towards wrongdoing and wrongdoers. This article will discuss the way we can do that. Do that. As you read the article, look for one, 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 one. The number one thing to look for is how a case of serious wrongdoing was handled in the first century. Congregation in Corinth. Number two, what direction the apostle, okay, I'm done. Apostle Paul gave when a wrongdoer repented and when the this Bible account reveals, what this Bible, Bible account reveals about Jehovah's attitude towards Christians who commit a serious sin. I think I'm getting delirious again. During his third missionary trip tour, Paul heard disturbing news about the newly established congregation in Corinth. A brother in that congregation was having sexual relations with his stepmother. Okay. <laughs> Such behavior was so- shocking and was not even found among the nations. The congregation not only tolerated his behavior, but also may have been rather proud of it. Perhaps some thought that it demonstrated how merciful and understanding God is towards imperfect humans. But Jehovah does not condone wrongdoing among his people. With such a brazen course, the man was surely damaging the good reputation of the congregation. He could also have been influencing other Christians who were associating with him. So what did Paul direct the congregation to do? Under the, under the direction, under the divine inspiration, Paul wrote a letter directing that the unrepentant sinner be removed from the congregation. How are faithful Christians to treat him? Paul told them to stop keeping company with him. What did he... What did that mean? Paul explained that his command included not even eating with such a man. Sitting down to a meal with someone can easily lead to having further association with him. Clearly then, Paul meant that the congregation should not socialize with that man. So what if you're in the same restaurant? Thoughts? Are you eating with them? What if the table's really big and you're at one side of the table and they're at the other side of the table? You can't even really talk to each other. Are you associating with them? Are you socializing? Thoughts? Thoughts? This would protect the congregation from his corrupting influence. Additionally, their avoiding close contact with the man might cause him to realize how far he had strayed from Jehovah's ways and he might feel shame, 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 and be moved to repent. After sending his letter to the Christians in Corinth, Paul began to wonder how the congregation would react to it. Eventually, Titus brought news that delighted him. The congregation had responded well to Paul's letter. They had followed his instructions. Furthermore, during the months that passed since Paul's letter sent that letter, the wrongdoer had repeated, repented of his sins full course. He had changed his conduct and attitude and had begun to follow Jehovah's righteous standards. It appears that the man discussed in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 was reinstated in a relatively short time after he was removed. What factors led to this conclusion? Consider when Paul's two letters to the Corinthians were written. He evidently wrote the first one during his third missionary tour during, or sorry, probably in early 55 CE. It seems likely that he wrote the second letter later that same year, perhaps in late summer or early autumn. Consider also that in Paul's first letter, he had given instructions on contributing to a relief effort for the Judean Christians who were suffering from famine. Because lives were at stake, Paul surely followed up quickly with his second letter. 
in which he asked the congregation to prepare their donations for delivery. Paul had another good reason to write his second letter as soon as possible. He had received a reports about the man's repentance. In those days, it would have taken some time for a letter to be delivered. So Paul likely wrote again soon in order to direct the congregation on what to do next. With such factors in mind, it seems reasonable to conclude that Paul urged the congregation to reinstate the repentant wrongdoer just a short time, perhaps only months after he had been removed from the congregation. Where has that been for the last 80 years or so? Well, not quite 80 years, but 70 years. After sending his letter to the... Oh, wait, I already did that. Jehovah's Righteous Standards. Oh, yeah, I'm right here. What would Paul now direct the congregation to do? Well, spoiler alert. <laughs> Paul noted that the rebuke given by the majority was sufficient for a man. In other words, the discipline had served its purpose toward him. What purpose? To lead him to repentance. Paul, therefore, directed the congregation, kindly forgive and comfort the erring brother and confirm your love for him. Note that Paul wanted the congregation to do more than merely allow the man back among Jehovah's people. Paul wanted them to assure the repentant man by their words manner and actions that they truly forgive, forgave him and loved him. They would thus make it clear that they welcomed his return to the congregation. Did some in the congregation feel reluctant to welcome the repentant sinner back into their midst? The account does not tell us, but it is possible. After all, his actions brought trouble to the congregation as a whole, and perhaps shame to certain individuals as well. Some might have felt that it was unfair that the man should be so... Well, warm, be so warmly accepted as a brother when they were the ones who had fought so hard to remain morally clean. Why, though, is it important for the congregation to show genuine love for the returning brother? Imagine what could happen if the elders refused to allow truly repentant... Is that not... Stay? I'm just... Okay. It just refuses. That's fine. Imagine what would happen if the elders refused to allow the truly repentant man back in the congregation, or if after his return the congregation refused to show him love. He could be swallowed up by excessive sadness. He could easily feel that his situation was hopeless. He might even give up in his efforts to repair his relationship with God. Even worse, if the brothers and sisters in the congregation refused to forgive the repentant sinner, they would put their own relationship with Jehovah in jeopardy. Why? because they would reflect not Jehovah's forgiving attitude toward repentant wrongdoers, but Satan's harsh and merciless attitude. They would, in effect, become tools that the devil could use to destroy that man spiritually. How, then, could the congregation in Corinth imitate Jehovah, not Satan? By following Jehovah's way of dealing with repentant sinners. Note that some Bible writers said about Jehovah, He is good and ready to forgive. Micah, said David, Micah wrote, Who is a God like you, pardoning air and passing over transgression? And Isaiah stated, Let the wicked man leave his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him return to Jehovah, who have mercy on him, to our God, for he will forgive in a large way. A picture. People are hugging. Open arms. Everyone's smiling. Good times. To imitate Jehovah, the congregation in Corinth had to welcome the repentant man back and assure him of their love. By following Paul's direction to welcome back the repentant sinner, the congregation showed their obedience in all things. True, only months had passed since he was removed, but the discipline had successfully led him to repentance, so there would be no point in delaying his reinstatement into the congregation. <sighs> I just, like, every time, like, I think about this, even, and about this change that they're essentially making, it's, it's got to be especially hard for people that have been kicked out and fought so hard, and there are a lot of people that have really tried their absolute hardest to come back to the, the congregation for, like, years, and, but because the elders don't like them. They never get recommended, so they have to just keep on being disfellowshipped for years and years and years. And now they're like, oh man, that is so terrible. Why would anyone who in their right mind would ever suggest such a horrible situation? We don't want people being overly sad. 
but you've been doing that to people for so long. It's just, yeah, it's irritating. The account about the way the case in ancient Corinth was handled was written and preserved for our instruction. From that account, we learn that Jehovah does not tolerate serious wrongdoing among his people. He does not take the view that wrongdoers who are unrepentant should be mercifully allowed to continue associating with his fellow worshipers. Jehovah is merciful, but he is not permissive, nor does he lower his standards. Indeed, to do so would be not merciful at all because it would endanger all in the congregation. Still, we learn that Jehovah does not want anyone to be destroyed. He wants to save people whenever possible. He shows mercy to people who have a change of heart and want to repair their relationship with him. Thus, when the man in Corinth repented and turned away from his sinful course, Jehovah used Paul to explain to the congregation that the man should be forgiven and welcomed back. Our review of the way the case in Corinth was handled has helped us to see Jehovah's love, righteousness, and justice in action. Are you not moved to give God added praise? After all, we are sinners, every one of us, and we need his forgiveness. Each of us has reason to be grateful to Jehovah for the ransom, which makes forgiveness possible. How comforting, how reassuring to know that Jehovah truly loves his people and wants the best for them. What then about handling of cases of wrongdoing today? How can congregation elders reflect Jehovah's desire to lead a wrongdoer to repentance? How should the congregation react when the elders decide to remove or reinstate a person? These three questions will be discussed in the following articles. Uh, in the preceding article, oh wait, sorry, study article 34. In the preceding article, we saw how the apostle Paul handled a case of serious wrongdoing in Corinth. The sinner was unrepentant and had to be removed from the congregation. However, as our theme text shows, some who have committed a serious sin can be reached. They can be led to repentance. How can elders help them to repent? Sorry, Winston Bear. Before the elders can help, they need to be aware of the matter. So, what should we do if we come to know if a, that a fellow believer has committed a serious sin, something that could result in his being removed from the congregation? We should encourage the wrongdoer to go to the elders for help. What, though, if the wrongdoer refuses to speak to the elders? Then we should go to the elders ourselves to make sure that the person will get the necessary help. That is, the loving thing to do, because we want to. We do not want to lose our brother or sister. If the wrongdoer continues in his course, he will further impair his relationship with Jehovah. He may also damage the reputation of the congregation. So we courageously take action out of love for Jehovah and for the wrongdoer. When someone in the congregation commits a serious sin, the body of elders selects three qualified brothers from among them who will serve as a committee. These men need to be modest and humble. While they will try to help the erring ones to repent, they recognize that they cannot do they cannot force someone to change. The elders acknowledge that all wrongdoers will respond in a pos not all wrongdoers will respond in a po positive way, as did King David. Some wrongdoers may choose to ignore Jehovah's admonition. Nevertheless, the elders' goal is to lead the wrongdoer to repentance, if at all possible. What principles guide them as they meet with the wrongdoer? The elders view of the wrongdoer as a precious lost sheep. Therefore, when they meet when they meet with the individual, they are not harsh in their speech, attitude, and approach, nor do they view the meeting as a mere routine in which they follow a set procedure. Instead, they display the qualities found at 2 Timothy 2, 24-26. The elders remain mild, gentle, and kind as they strive to reach the wrongdoer's heart. The elders prepare their own heart. They try to imitate Jehovah in all their dealings with a sinner, remembering Paul's words. God, in his kindness, is trying to lead you to repentance. The elders must remember that they are primarily shepherds under the direction of Christ. Before meeting with the wrongdoer, the committee will prayerfully consider their goal to lead the wrongdoer to repentance. They will do research in the scriptures and in our publications, and will pray for discernment. 
and they will consider what they need to know about the individual's background that may contribute to his thinking, attitude, and conduct. And we got a little sheep that's like, somebody, somebody, help, help me, please. That's what the sheep's saying. Yeah. This is the current status of my mind. Okay. Uh, They keep in mind how Jehovah dealt with wrongdoers in the past. For example, Jehovah reasoned patiently with Cain, warning him about the consequences of the sin and offering him hope for restoration. Jehovah admonished David by means of the prophet Nathan, who had an illustration that touched the heart of the king. And Jehovah kept sending his prophets again and again to the wayward nation of Israel. Luckily, I've already gone over. Okay, He did not wait for his people to repent before helping them. Rather, he took the initiative by urging them to repent. Elders follow Jehovah's example when they try to help those who do not get or who have gotten involved in serious sin. I might just lose track of the yawn counter. It might be too many. A study note on that verse says of such an elder, he would always need to show restraint patiently, appealing to the sinner's desire to do what is right. If the elder were to give in to annoyance or frustration, he might alienate or even stumble the sinner. The elders tried to determine the circumstances that led up to the sin. For example, did the Christian slowly become weak because he neglected personal study or the ministry? Have his prayers to Jehovah become infrequent or superficial? Has he been allowing wrong desires to guide him? Has he made unwise choices in his associations or his entertainment? How might such choices have affected his heart? Does he recognize how his recent decisions and actions have affected his father, Jehovah? By asking meaningful questions without being unnecessarily intrusive, the elders kindly draw out the wrongdoer and help him to reason on his course. In addition, they might use illustrations to help the person to reason and to see the wrongness of his actions, as Nathan did with Jesus. Perhaps during the first meeting, the person will begin to feel sorrow over the course he has followed. He may even repent. The elders strive to imitate Jesus. When dealing with Saul of Tarsus, the resurrected Jesus asked a probing question. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, man? Jesus thereby helped him to reason on his course. (laughs) In that case of the woman Jezebel, Jesus said, I gave her time to repent. That harpy. In imitation of Jesus, the elders are not hasty to conclude that a wrongdoer will not repent. While some may repent during the committee's first meeting with them, others may need more time, so the elders may arrange to meet with the sinner more than once. Perhaps after the first meeting, the erring Christian will begin to think seriously about what he has been told. He may approach Jehovah in humble prayer. Zizi? Zizi? I think he's okay. Thus, At a subsequent meeting, the sinner may have a different spirit from the one he showed at the first meeting. To help lead the sinner to repentance, the elders show empathy and kindness. They hope and pray that Jehovah will bless their efforts and that the wayward Christian may come to his senses and repent. If the sinner repents, that is a cause for great joy. Who deserves the credit? Do the elders recall what Paul wrote about sinners? Perhaps God gave them repentance. May gave may give them repentance. A study note on that verse comments. The credit for such a change in thinking and attitude goes not to any human, but to Jehovah, who helps the wayward Christian make this vital change. Paul goes on to mention some of the beautiful results of such repentance. It leads the sinner to a more accurate knowledge of the truth. It helps him come back to his proper senses and it enables him to escape from Satan's snares. When a wrongdoer repents, the committee will arrange for shepherding visits so that the person can continue to receive the help he needs to fight against Satan's snares and to make straight paths for his feet. 
Of course, the elders do not need to reveal anyone, to anyone the details of the sinner's course. About what, though, might the congregation need to be informed? Paul wrote those words to his fellow elder Timothy. Timothy. Oh, yeah. A uh, bearded man, bad attitude. Bearded man, slightly better attitude. Everyone's happy. Judicial committee. Bingo, bango, bongo. Works like a dream. In connection with how to handle those who practice sin. What did he mean? He did not necessarily mean that the whole congregation were the onlookers. Rather, he was referring to those who might already know of the sins. They could be eyewitnesses, or they could be of those of whom the wrongdoer confided in. The elders would discreetly make them aware that the matter was handled and that the sinner was corrected. In some instances, the wrongdoer may have wrongdoing may have become widely known in the congregation or it is likely to become known. In such cases, the onlookers would include the entire congregation. So, an elder would announce to the congregation that the brother or sister has been reproved. Why? Paul answers, as a warning to the rest not to fall into sin. What about baptized minors, who's under 18 years of age, who engage in serious wrongdoing? The body of elders will arrange for two elders to meet with the minor and the Christian parents. The elders will find out what steps the parents have already taken to help their child come to repentance. If the minor has a good attitude and the parents are reaching him, the two elders may decide that it is not necessary to take the matter any further. After all, if the parents, God-given responsibility to provide love and correction to their children. The elders will thereafter occasionally check with the parents to make sure that the minor is getting the help he needs. However, if a baptized minor unrepentantly persists in a wrong course, in that case, a committee of elders will meet with him along with his Christian parents. Elders who serve on committees have a responsibility for Jehovah to keep the congregation clean. They also want wrongdoers to be moved to repentance if possible. To that end, elders maintain a positive, hopeful outlook. Why? Because they want to imitate Jehovah, who is very tender in affection and merciful. Note how the aged apostle John showed such a spirit. He wrote, My little children, I am writing you these things so that you may not commit a sin. And yet if anyone does commit a sin, we have a helper with the Father, Jesus Christ, a righteous one. Sadly, there are times when a Christian refuses to repent, so he must be removed from the congregation. How do the elders handle such serious cases? We will consider the final matter in the fine in the matter in the final series article of this series. Eight minutes. Can we do it? Jehovah is not a permissive God. He does not condone sin. Uh, I've already talked. I made a whole video about that article, so that's why I wasn't commenting too much on it because I literally already made a video about it. He requires that we respect his righteous standards, which he has set forth for us in his word. Of course, Jehovah does not expect perfection from imperfect people. At the same time, he does not tolerate ungodly men who turn in turn his undeserved kindness into an excuse for brazen conduct. Indeed, the Bible speaks of the destruction of the ungodly at God's war of Armageddon. However, Jehovah does not want anyone to suffer destruction. As we discussed earlier in this series of articles, the Bible clearly states that he desires all to attain to repentance. Christian elders imitate Jehovah as they patiently try to help wrongdoers to change their ways and be restored to Jehovah's favor. However, not all wrongdoers respond favorably. Some continue in a wrong course despite the elders' repeated efforts to lead them to repentance. What is to be done in such a situation? When a wrongdoer is unrepentant, the elders have no choice but to follow the direction found at 1 Corinthians 5.13. Remove the wicked person from among yourselves. In a sense, the wrongdoer has chosen that consequence. He is reaping what he or she has shown. Why can we say that? Because he has refused to respond to repeated attempts by the elders to lead him to repentance. His actions show that he has chosen not to abide by Jehovah's standards. When an unrepentant wrongdoer is removed from the congregation, an announcement is made to inform the congregation that he is no longer one of Jehovah's witnesses. The purpose of that announcement is not to humiliate the wrongdoer, Rather, it is, it absolutely is, rather it is made so that the congregation can follow the scriptural admonition. Stop keeping company with that person, not even eating with him. That direction is given for good reason. The apostle Paul wrote, a little leaven ferments the whole batch of dough. Yes, it makes it fluffier and delicious. Unrepentant wrongdoers can weaken the determination of those who are trying to live by Jehovah's righteous standards. How then should we view a fellow believer 
Who is your move for the congregation? Although we do not socialize with him, we shouldn't we should view him as a lost sheep, not a lost cause. A sheep that has strayed from the fold may well return. Remember that the lost sheep dedicated himself to Jehovah. Sadly, he is not living up to that dedication at present, and that puts him in a dangerous position. Nevertheless, as long as Jehovah's mercy is available, there is hope that the person will return. How do the elders reflect that hope even toward a wrongdoer has been removed from the congregation? It is the individual who has been removed from the congregation, abandoned, left completely on his own to find his own way back to Jehovah. By no means. When informing an unrepentant wrongdoer that he will be removed from the congregation, the committee of elders will explain to him what steps he can take to return to the congregation. But the elders will do even more. In most cases, they will tell the wrongdoer that they would like to meet with him again after a few months have passed to see if he had a change of heart. If that wrongdoer is willing to meet with them, again, the elders will at the subsequent meeting make a warm appeal for him to repent in return, even if he has not had a change of heart. At that time, the elders will make periodic efforts to contact him in the future. The elders strive to reflect Jehovah's compassion as they deal with someone who has been removed from the congregation. For example, Jehovah did not wait for his wayward people in ancient Israel to take the first step. Rather, he took the initiative to reach out to them even before they showed any signs of repentance. As noted in the second article in this series, Jehovah illustrates his compassion by telling the prophet Hosea to offer reconciliation to his whore wife who was still sinning. In imitation of Jehovah, Christian elders genuinely want those whore wrongdoers to return, and they do not make it difficult for him to do so. <sighs> Sorry, lost, losing it. Recall Jesus' parable of the lost son, as discussed in the second article in this series. When catching sight of his re son returning home, the rather... The rather the Dan Mather, the Dan, the father Dan Mather ran and <laughs> embraced him and tenderly kissed him. Notice that the father did not wait for his son to beg for forgiveness. Rather, he took the initiative as long as, as a loving father would. The elders strive to show a similar attitude towards those who have strayed. They want these lost sheep to come back home. There is a joy in heaven when a sinner returns, and there is a joy on earth as well. From what have we considered so far, it is clear that Jehovah does not condone unrepentant wrongdoing. However, he does not turn his back on wrongdoers. He wants them to return. That's the end of the sentence. <laughs> Jehovah's feelings toward repentant wrongdoers are expressed in Hosea 14.4. I will heal their unfaithfulness. I will love them of my own free will because my anger is turned away. What a strong incentive for elders to respond to any signs of repentance. And what a strong incentive for those who have left Jehovah to return without delay. What about individuals who in the past were removed from the congregation perhaps many years ago? Such individuals may no longer be practicing the sin for which they were removed. In some situations, they may not even remember why they were removed. Uh, what, what did I even do? Whatever the case, the elders will try to locate and visit these individuals. During such visits, the elders will even offer to pray with them and make a warm appeal for them to return to the congregation. Of course, if a person has been away from the congregation for many years, he would no doubt be very weak spiritually. Therefore, if he indicates that he wants to return to Jehovah, the elders might arrange for someone to conduct a Bible study with him, even though he has not been yet been reinstated. In all cases, the elders would be the ones to arrange for the Bible study. In imitation of Jehovah's compassion, the elders want to reach out and help as many people as possible, that the door is open for them to come back. When a sinner manifests repentance and abandons his wrong course, he can be reinstated without delay. In certain circumstances, the elders need to be especially careful before reinstating someone. For example, if a person was guilty of a CSA or apostasy, or if he has schemed to end his marriage, the elders would want to be sure that he is truly repentant. They must protect the flock at the same time we need to realize that Jehovah will accept any wrongdoer who shows genuine repentance and stops engaging in any wrong conduct. So, although the elders exercise due caution with those who have dealt treacherously with others, they will not go so far as to say that certain types of sinners can never receive Jehovah's mercy. I'm in the clear. I could come back. How long it would it take? Only Jehovah truly knows, but hey, it sounds like it is at least possible. As discussed, I mean, I am brainwashing myself back again, so 
Yippee! As discussed in the preceding article, sometimes an announcement is made that a person has been reproved. In such cases, we can continue to associate with him, knowing that he repented and abandoned his wrong course. Huh. He is reproved. Oh, so if one's been marked, that's when they don't associate with them. I guess somehow I missed that in all of the hullabaloo going on around this. So if someone is marked, then basically that's a way, like, hey, don't associate with them. But if they're just reproved but not marked... Okay, I have got the new lore down. Okay, so it's tough to get... You have to be, like, turbo not wanting to be a Jehovah's Witness to get disfellowship. Like, you got to really go out of your way. Like, you're either an apostate or you just don't want to be there anymore. But if you just, like... Yeah, sorry, didn't mean to do that. My bad. They'll probably not disfellowship you, and you'll just get reproved. Oh. However, the situation is quite different with a person who has been removed from the congregation. We stop keeping company with that person, not even eating with such a man. Does that... Does what we have considered mean that we completely ignore a person who has been removed from the congregation? Not necessarily. Certainly, we would not socialize with him, but... Christians can use their Bible-trained conscience in deciding whether to invite a person who was removed from the congregation, perhaps a relative or someone who was close to previously, to attend a congregation meeting. What if he attends? In the past, we would not greet such a person. Here again, each Christian needs to use Bible-trained conscience in this matter. Some may feel comfortable with greeting or welcoming the person to the meeting. However, we would not have to extend an extended conversation or socialize with the individual. Some may wonder, doesn't the Bible say that a Christian who says a greeting to such a person become a share in his wicked works? The context of this scripture shows that this direction refers to apostates and others who actively promote wrong conduct. If a person is actively promoting apostate teachings or other wrongdoing, the funny thing is with this is after we get done with 2024, we're going to go back to 1995, and uh, I bet a good 30% of that would be considered apostate teachings now. It's crazy. Of course, there is hope that we will come to, he will come to a census. Until that happens, though, we would neither greet such a person nor invite him to attend a congregation meeting. Was it 1995 or 2004? I can't remember. What have we learned in the, this five-part series? Jehovah does not want anyone to be destroyed. He wants sinners to be reconciled to him. That is why, throughout history, Jehovah has repeatedly urged his wayward people as well as wayward individuals to repent and return to him. Congregation elders are privileged to be fellow workers with Jehovah as they strive to lead wrongdoers to repentance. Imagine the joy in heaven when sinners repent. Only our Heavenly Father, Jehovah, personally experiences the joy every time one of his lost sheep returns to the congregation. Our love for Jehovah continues to deepen as well as we meditate on his compassion, mercy, and undeserved kindness, baby! I kind of I kind of got lost in the sauce there, I'm not going to lie. September, wake me up. When September ends, September, the Watchtower announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. Become doers of the word. Jehovah and his dear son want us to be happy. The writer of Psalms 119 says, Happy are those who observe his reminders, who search for him with all their heart. Jesus gave further assurance, saying, Happy are those hearing the word of God and keeping it. As Jehovah's worshippers, we are happy people. Why? We have many resource reasons, but not to be overlooked is that we regularly need God's word and endeavor to apply what we learn. There are several ways in which we benefit when we become doers of the word. For one thing, we know that this is a key step in our pleasing Jehovah, realizing that makes us happy. As we put into practice what we read in God's inspired word, we improve our family life and build strong friendships with fellow believers. This is likely proved to be true in your life. Moreover, we avoid many of the problems that come to those who do not follow Jehovah's ways. Indeed, we agree with King David. He's back. 
After mentioning in uh, in song the law, orders, and judgments of Jehovah, he concluded, in keeping with them, there is a large reward. Realistically, it is not always easy for us to become doers of God's word. We must make time in our busy schedules to read and study the Bible in order to understand what Jehovah wants us to do. Let us review some suggestions that can help us to read it regularly. We also consider what will help us think about what we read and ways in which we can apply what we learn in our life. Most of Jehovah's people leave... Oh, wait, we got a picture. We've already talked about this picture in uh, before somehow. Most of Jehovah's people leave very busy lives. We spend a great amount of time caring for our various scriptural responsibilities. For instance, most of us work secularly to provide for ourselves and for our families. Many Christians look after sick or elderly relatives. And all of us need to care for our own health, which takes time. In addition to these responsibilities, we have assignments in the congregation. A key responsibility is to have a zealous share in the preaching work. With all the obligations that you personally have, how can you find the time to read the Bible? Regularly meditate on what you read and apply what it says. Bible reading is one of the more important things for us as Christians, so we need to make it a priority. Regarding the happy man, the very first psalm says his delight is in the law of Jehovah, and he reads it in an undertone day and night. That suggests setting time aside for such reading. When is the best time to read the Bible? The answer may differ, be different for each of us. Put, but put simply, it would be a time when you can do so regularly. A brother named Victor says, I like to do my Bible reading in the morning, even though I'm not a morning person. Well, that's pretty cool for you, Victor. Oh yeah, the bearded man. Uh, each person, there are a few distractions in early hours. My mind is clear and I can focus better. Might this be true in your case? Ask yourself, when is the best time for me to read the Bible? The reality is, though, that we may consistently read a lot of material without really absorbing it. Absorbing it. Well, the shocking thing is, is we are, what, um, probably something like 10, 12 hours into this thing. And I feel like my retention is still strong. I I think you can cram this stuff. I, I think they're underestimating people. Uh, I, I'm following everything. I, I could take an exam right now. Okay, damn it. Give me, an, give, give, give me the exam. I got this. The reality is, though, that we may have consistently read a lot of material without really absorbing. Have you ever read something and shortly afterward couldn't recall little of what you read? Nope. We all have had that happen. Not me. Sadly, this can be the situation with our Bible reading. Never me. Perhaps we set a goal to read a certain number of chapters of the Bible each day. Never me. That is commendable. We should set goals to strive and strive to stick to them. However, Bible reading the Bible is a start. A good start, but only a start. More if needed, more is needed if we are if we are to benefit fully from reading God's word. Wow. I completely cooked my brain with that last one. Think of this comparison. Water often in the form of rain, is essential to life. But if too much rain falls, within a short amount of time, the ground may become oversaturated. When that happens, more rain will not be beneficial. The soil needs time to absorb the rain that has fallen and make it available to the vegetation. Likewise, we should avoid reading the Bible in a hurried manner. That is, so quick that we fail to absorb the message and use what we read. Have you ever found that on occasion you were merely speed reading the Bible? What should you do? Slow down. Make the effort to think about what you are reading or have just read. Make the effort to think about what you are reading or have just read. Make the effort to think about what you are reading or have just read. <laughs> this does not have to be daunting. If the encouragement to meditate seems the, that way to you, perhaps you could view meditation as simply thinking about what you have read. You may decide to lengthen your study period to include time for such thinking or meditation. 
On the other hand, you may choose to read fewer verses and use the remaining time to think about what you have read. I keep my Bible reading short, maybe one chapter, says Victor, quoted earlier. Because I read early in the morning, I'm able to keep reflecting throughout the day on what I read. I'll go toe-to-toe with you, Victor. Let's see who really knows the Bible there, buster. Whatever method you use, it is vital to read at a pace that will allow you to get the most out of your read. Regardless of when you do your Bible reading and how much time you spend doing it, be sure to look for ways to apply what you read. As you go over a portion of God's Word, ask yourself, how can I apply this information now or in the future? To illustrate, let's say that your Bible reading included 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 18. After reading these two verses, you could stop and think of how often and how deeply you pray. Also, you could reflect on things for which you are grateful. Maybe you determine that you will thank Jehovah for three specific things. It's always three. I think the, the, the perfection isn't seven anymore for them. I think it's three. Even within a few minutes of such focus attention, you will, to some extent, become a hearer and a doer of God's word. Think of how you would benefit by repeating this process each day with other portions of the Bible that you read. You will grow as a doer of God's word. What, though, if it seems like there are so many things that you need to work on? Set modest goals when you read the Bible and look for ways to apply its guidance. You may at times feel overwhelmed. Think of this scenario. Today, your Bible reading includes counsel against showing favoritism. You see that you could improve on how you treat others, so you decide to make some changes. Excellent. Then tomorrow you read a passage that highlights the importance of controlling your speech. You realize that on occasion, your speech has been somewhat negative. My speech is a little bit negative. I need to be more positive. So you determine that you will be more positive and upbuilding. Your Bible reading the next day includes a warning about becoming a friend of the world. You notice that you need to be more selective in your choice of entertainment. By the fourth day, you might feel rather overwhelmed by all these things you need to work on. If you need to make a number of changes or improvements, do not be discouraged. This is evidence that you have a good heart condition. A person who is humble and honest with himself reads the scriptures with a view to seeing what he needs to work on. Remember, too, that putting on the new personality is an ongoing process. What will help you to keep being a doer of God's word? Instead of trying to apply everything you read all at once, set a modest number of goals. You might try this approach. Keep a list of the things you need to work on, and then select one of the two of these to work on first, leaving the other items to be pursued in time. Where should you start? You may decide. Wow. Okay. There it was. I think my brain literally shut off for that one. That was a true McConnell moment. (sighs) And we got an M&M. I had been doing pretty good for a while. You may decide to start a goal uh, that is easier for you to reach. Or you might choose to work on an area you feel needs the most improvement. Once you have identified your goal, do research in our publications. Pray about your goal, asking Jehovah for both the desire and the power to act. Then put into practice what you have learned. Having made progress on your first goal, you will likely feel more motivated to work on another one, and another one, and then another one, and another one. In fact, when you improve in one aspect of Christian living, or on one Christian quality, you will probably find it easier to do so in other areas. Hallelujah, amen, praise Jesus. Some people claim to have read the Bible dozens of times. Yep. But do they truly believe in the Bible? Nope. Have they applied it or allowed it to affect their course of life? Absolutely. Sadly, often the answer is no. I mean, I was like 75%. 66%, sorry. Uh, A contrast with Jehovah's people. Like first century Christians, we accept the Bible just as it truthfully is the word of God. Moreover, we strive to demonstrate that it is at work in our life. It's not always easy to read and apply God's word. We may struggle to find time to read, or we may tend to read at a very rapid pace and not absorb much of what we read, or we may feel overwhelmed by all the improvements we need to make. May we be determined to accept his help and become not forgetful hearers, but doers of the word. Without a doubt, the more we read God's word and apply it in our life, the happier we will be. Just so happy now. 
a letter that can help us endure faithfully, faithfully to the end. Hebrew Christians living in Jerusalem and Judea went through hard times in the years following Jesus' death. Soon after the Christian congregation was formed, intense persecution arose against it. Then some 20 years later, Christ's followers faced serious economic hardships, possibly caused by a famine that had previously afflicted the land. However, about 61 CE, oh Lord, Christians were experiencing a time of relative peace compared with what was to come. During the period, they received an inspired letter from the Apostle Paul, a letter that would prove to be very timely. The letter to the Hebrews was timely because the peace that the Christians were experiencing would not last. Paul provided practical counsel that would help those Christians to endure the tribulation that they would soon face. The destruction of the Jewish system of things which Jesus had foretold was approaching. Of course, neither Paul nor his Christ, nor the Christians in Judea knew exactly when that destruction would occur. Nevertheless, those Christians could use the time remaining to prepare themselves by building up such qualities as faith and endurance. We are about to face a tribulation far greater than the one experienced by the Hebrew Christians. So let us consider some of the practical counsel. I want three. Give me three things to consider. Damn it. I got so comfortable with the three the three tiered thing. I feel lonely now. I need a hug. Christians of a Jewish background faced a big challenge. At one time, the Jews had been chosen Jehovah's chosen people. Jerusalem was the earthly seat of God's kingdom, and the temple was the center of pure worship. All faithful Jews followed the Mosaic Law, as explained by religious leaders. Those teachings govern their diet, their view of circumcision, and even their association with Gentiles. However, Jehovah no longer accepted the Jewish sacrifices after Jesus' death. That presented a challenge for Jewish Christians who were used to following the law. Even mature Christians, such as the Apostle Paul, struggled to adapt to some of these changes. Because of their new beliefs, these Christians became a target of the Jewish religious leaders. The Hebrew Christians were challenged by opposers on two fronts. One thing, For one thing, there were the Jewish religious leaders who were treating them like apostates. In addition, some professed Christians were insisting that followers of Christ continue practicing various aspects of the Mosaic Law, perhaps to avoid persecution. What would help faithful Christians to stick to the truth? I don't know, they didn't have the Watchtower magazine, like, how are they supposed to do it? In this letter to the Hebrews, Paul encourages fellow believers to dig deeper into God's word. Using the Hebrew scriptures, Paul reasoned with his brothers on the superiority of the Christian way of worship over Judaism. Christians number one, Judaism is no fun. Well, that was their picket line. It's a little known fact. It's a scripture in the Bible that you guys probably forgot about. But uh, hey, I'm, I'm just doing God's work out here. Paul knew that an increased knowledge and a deeper understanding of the truth would equip those Christians to identify and reject false reasonings so that they would not be led astray. Like the Hebrew Christians, we are confronted by information and reasonings that go against Jehovah's righteous standards. Opposers often attack our Bible-based beliefs on morality, claiming that we are intolerant and cruel. The attitudes and opinions of the world are becoming ever more distant from God's perfect view of matters. We therefore must strengthen our ability to identify and reject ideas that opposers use in an attempt to discourage us or even lead us astray. We do well to take to heart the counsel Paul gave the Hebrew Christians to oppress, to press on to spiritual maturity. That includes acquiring a deep knowledge of the truth and adopting Jehovah's way of thinking. This process continues even after dedication and baptism. No matter how long we have been in the truth, all of us must regularly read and study God's word. A good routine of personal study will help us to strengthen quality that Paul emphasized in his letters to the Hebrews, faith. The Hebrew Christians would need strong faith to survive the approaching tribulation in Judea. Jesus had warned his followers that when they saw Jerusalem surrounded by encamped armies, they should flee to the mountains. Two minutes. 
His counsel applied to all Christians, whether they lived in the city or in the open countryside. People back then who were threatened by an invading army would normally seek protection in a walled city like Jerusalem. Fleeing to a mountain would seem illogical and would have taken great faith. The coffee is gone. Hebrew Christians would also need to trust those whom Jesus was using to direct the congregation. Those taking the lead likely gave specific instructions to help all in the congregation to follow Jesus' direction at the right time in an orderly manner. With, I think, every single one of these uh, watchtowers that I've read, they have all made specific references to following specific direction, following the direction of the congregation, following the governing body, listening to the elders, or basically talking for Jesus. I'm going, I am curi- very curious if it is so organization governing body centric in their older stuff. The Greek word used at Hebrews 13, 17 for be obedient implies that someone is persuaded to obey because he trusts the person who is giving the direction. That involves more than simply obeying him because he is authorized to give direction. So the Hebrew Christians needed to build trust in those taking the lead before the tribulation came. If during times of peace, Christians obediently followed the instructions of those taking the lead, it would be much easier for them to do so in times of crisis. Today we need faith, as did those who first received Paul's letter. We live at a time when most people reject and even ridicule the Bible's warnings about the end of the system of things. Additionally, although the Bible reveals a number of details about how the Great Tribulation will unfold, there are many things that we do not know. We need to have strong faith that the end of this system of things will come right on time, and that Jehovah will care for us. We must also strengthen our faith in the channel Jehovah is using today to guide us, the faithful and discreet slave. When the Great Tribulation begins, we may receive specific life-saving instructions, as the Hebrew Christians may have received when the Romans came. Now is the time to strengthen our trust and confidence in the direction we receive from those taking the lead in Jehovah's organization. We cannot expect to follow their direction confidently during the Great Tribulation if we struggle to follow it now. While they waited for the signal to flee, the Hebrew Christians also needed to keep a simple life, rejecting the love of money. Some of them had been through hard times of famine and poverty. Even though they were once willing to endure hardships for the sake of the good news, some might have began to see wealth as indispensable for the protection, but no amount of money would protect them from the coming destruction. No, no, no. In fact, any who loved material things would likely find it more difficult to flee, leaving behind their homes and possessions. We will be motivated to reject the materialism if we have strong faith that the end of the present system of things is imminent. People will, in effect, throw their silver into the streets because they will realize that neither their silver nor their gold will be able to save them in the day of Jehovah's fury. Rawr. Rather than focus on accumulating as much money as we can, we need to make decisions that help us keep a lim- live a simple, lit, balanced life. That includes resisting the temptation to take on unnecessary debt or to get bogged down carrying over many material things. We also carefully avoid becoming overly attached to the possessions we already have. Our faith may be tested with regard to material things and other matters as we wait for the end of the system to come. Okay, six minutes. Lock in. Hebrew Christians would have to endure tests of faith as conditions in Judea deteriorated. Although some Hebrew Christians had faced intense persecution, many had accepted Christianity during a period of relative peace. Paul mentioned that although they had endured difficult tests of faith, they had they had not thus far suffered as Jesus did, that is, to the point of death. With the spread of Christianity, however, the Jewish opposers were becoming increasingly bitter and fanatical. Just a few years earlier, Paul's appearance in Jerusalem stirred up a riot. More than 40 Jews bound themselves with a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink until they had killed Paul. Despite such a climate of religious fanaticism and hatred, those Christians would still need to meet for worship, preach the good news, and keep themselves strong in the faith. What would help the Hebrew Christians to endure the opposition they faced? Paul knew that they needed to have the right view of their trials. He thus explained that God may allow tests of their faith as part of a Christian training. 
Such training can help one to cultivate the refi and refine vital Christian qualities by focusing on the end result of such trials. Those Hebrew Christians would find it easier to endure. Paul urged the Hebrew Christians to endure trials with greater determination. He was in God's position to write to them about this. As a former persecutor of Christians, he knew that when they were up against, they, he knew what they were up against. He also knew how to endure persecution. After all, he experienced various forms of opposition after becoming a Christian. So, Paul could speak with conviction about what it takes to endure. He reminded those Christians that when enduring trials, they need to rely not on themselves but on Jehovah. Paul could say with courage, Jehovah is my helper, I will not be afraid. Some of our brothers are enduring persecution right now. We can loyally support them by means of our prayers and at times in practical ways. The Bible clearly says, however, that all those desiring to live with godly devotion and association with the Christ Jesus will also be persecuted. For that reason, all of us need to be prepared for what lies ahead. Let us consider, continue to trust Jehovah, a fool in Jehovah, confident that he will... Help us endure any trial that may come our way. In due time, he will bring relief to all his faithful worshipers. No doubt, Paul's letter to the Hebrews helped first century Christians to prepare for the tribulation that they would face. Paul urged his brothers to gain a deeper knowledge and understanding of the scriptures. Doing so would equip them to identify and reject teachings that would undermine their faith. He encouraged them to strengthen their faith so that they would promptly follow the direction of Jesus and of those taking the lead in the congregation. And he helped Christians to build endurance by having the right view of trials and seeing the trials as an opportunity to be trained by their loving Father. May we too apply this inspired counsel. We will then be able to endure faithfully to the end. Faithfully. Life story, a rewarding journey in Jehovah's service. Oh, I'm so far away. In 1951, I had just arrived in Ruyin, Ru, Ruyin, Ryu, Ruyin, a small town in the Canadian province of Quebec. I knocked on the door of the address I had been given. Marcel Felito, a Gilead trained missionary, came to the door. He was 23 years old and tall. I was 16 and shorter. I showed him my pioneer assignment letter. He read it, looked at me, and said, Does your mother know that you are here? <laughs> well, I had a good old time. Uh, I was born in 1934 to Swiss immigrants who settled in Tim, 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 Timmins, a mining town in Ontario, Canada. About 1939, my mother began to read the Watchtower magazine to attend meetings of Jehovah's Witnesses. She brought me and my six siblings with her. Soon she became one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Father was not happy with her decision, but mother loved the truth and was determined to stick with it. She did not even she did so even during the nineteen early nineteen forties when the world of Jehovah's Witnesses was banned in Canada. Jehovah's Witnesses were banned in Canada? Canada banned something? That's crazy. She was always treated uh she Wow. And she always treated father with kindness and respect, despite his verbal abuse. Her excellent example helped me and my siblings to accept the truth, too. Happily, father's attitude softened in time. He began to treat our family more kindly. During the summer of 1950, I attended the Theocracy Increase Assembly in New York City. I was very moved, motivated to do more in Jehovah's service after meeting brothers and sisters from around the world and listening to exciting interviews of Gilead graduates. I became more determined than ever to enter the full-time ministry. As soon as I got back home, I applied to become a regular pioneer. The Canada branch office wrote back, suggesting that I got baptized first. I did so on October 1st, 1950. One month later, I became a regular pioneer and received my first assignment in kep uk -asing. <laughs> Okay, that town was many kilometers away from where I was living at the time. In the spring of 1951, the branch office invited witnesses who could speak French to consider moving to the French-speaking province in Quebec. The need was great there. I grew up speaking both French and English, so I answered the call and was assigned to Ryan. I did not know anybody there. All I had was an address 
as I related earlier, but things worked out well. Marcel and I became good friends, and I enjoyed serving in Quebec for the next four years, eventually as a special pioneer. While in Quebec, I was thrilled to receive an invitation to the 26th class of Gilead School in South Lansing, New York. Graduation day came on February 12, 1956, and I was assigned to what is now Ghana, West Africa. But I could not go. I had to return to Canada for a few weeks until my travel documents were ready. I ended up waiting seven months in Toronto for those documents. During that time, I was kindly housed by the Cripps family. Oh, okay, I see you, Cripps. <laughs> and then I came to know Sheila, their daughter. Oh, well, boy, that's a situation. Um, all right, I guess. We fell in love. When I was about to just propose my to propose marriage, my visa came in. Sheila and I perfectly decided that I should go to my assignment, but we would keep corresponding to see if if and when a future marriage might be possible. That was not an easy decision, but as matters turned out, it was the right one. After a month of traveling by train, cargo ship, and plane, I arrived in Accra, Ghana. There was assigned to serve as district overseer. That included traveling throughout Ghana as well as neighboring uh, Ivory Coast, now called Cote d'Ivoire, and Togoland, now called Togo. Most of the time, I traveled alone in the branch-provided jeep. I enjoyed every minute of that time. On the weekends, I served circuit assemblies. We had no assembly halls, so the brothers would build temporary roof bamboo poles covered with palm branches to provide shelter from the hot sun. Because there was no refrigeration for the cafeteria, live animals were kept on hand and butchered as needed to feed the attendees. Well, look at that. We had some amusing experiences at those assemblies. Once Herb Jennings, a fellow missionary, was giving a talk when a steer escaped the cafeteria. It bolted between the platform and the audience. Herb stopped talking and the animal seemed totally disoriented. But four strong brothers managed to restrain it and carry it back to the cafeteria to the cheers of the audience. The days between assemblies, I showed our film The New World Society in Action in nearby villages. That is an interesting movie that I actually just recently watched. To do so, I would project the film onto a white canvas sheet strung between two poles or two trees. The village loved it. For many, it was the first movie they had ever seen. Now you can understand why they loved it. They applauded with great vigor when they watched the scenes of people getting baptized. That film really helped those who sought to realize that they were a united worldwide organization. After some two years in Africa... I was excited to attend the 1958 International Convention in New York City. What a joy to see Sheila, who came down from Quebec, where she was serving as a special pioneer. We had been corresponding by letter, but now that we were together again, I asked her to marry me, and she accepted. Here we go again. I wrote Brother Noor and asked whether Sheila would attend Gilead and join me in Africa. He agreed. Sheila arrived in Ghana. We were married in Accra on October 3rd, 1959. We felt that Jehovah had truly blessed us for putting him first in our lives. In 1961, we were assigned to the country of Cameroon. Being asked to help establish a new branch office, I was very busy. As a new branch servant, I had a lot to learn. In 1965, we learned that Sheila was pregnant. I admit that the thought of becoming parents took some time to get used to, but... Just as we were getting excited about the new responsibility and making plans to return to Canada, we experienced a devastating loss. Sheila suffered a miscarriage. The doctor informed us that our unborn child was a boy. That was over 50 years ago, but we never forget it. Although deeply saddened by what happened, we remained in our foreign assignment, which we dearly loved. Brothers in Cameroon often faced persecution because of their political neutrality. The situation was particularly tense during elections, presidential elections. Our worst fears were realized on May 13, 1970, when Jehovah's Witnesses were officially banned. The beautiful new branch facility, which we had moved into only five months earlier, was confiscated by the government. Within a week, all the missionaries, including Sheila and me, were expelled from the country. It was hard to leave the brothers and sisters behind because we cared so much for them, and we worried about how they would fare in the days ahead. We spent the next six months at the branch office in France. There, I continued to do all I could to care for the needs of our brothers in Cameroon. 
In December of that year, we were assigned to the to the Nigeria branch, which began looking after the work in Cameroon. The brothers and sisters in Nigeria received us warmly, and we received we enjoyed serving there for several years. A difficult decision. In 1973, we had to make a very difficult decision. Sheila had been coping with some serious health problems. While we were in New York for a convention, she broke down and told me, I just can't go on. I'm exhausted, and I'm sick so much of the time. She had been serving with me in West Africa for over 14 years. I was so proud of her faithful service, but we needed to make some changes. After discussing our situation and praying long and hard about it, we decided that we should return to Canada where we could get better care for her health. Leaving our missionary assignment and the full-time service were by far the most difficult and heart trend heart heart trending decisions. Heart trending? Heart rendering heart rending. Heart rend heart heart rend, heart rending. I don't know why have I never seen that word before? Heart rending decisions we ever had to make. I think I'm just tired. After arriving in Canada, I obtained employment with a longtime friend who ran a car dealership in town north of Toronto. We rented an apartment, bought a second-hand furniture, and were able to make the move without going into debt. We wanted to keep our life simple, hoping that one day we might be able to get back into full-time service. To our surprise, that hope was realized sooner than we ever thought possible. I began to volunteer on Saturdays at the construction site of a new assembly hall in Norville, Ontario. In time, I was asked to serve at the as the assembly hall overseer. Sheila's health was improving, and we felt that she could handle this new assignment. So, this, uh, we, so we moved. Well, okay, there was a uh, Joe Biden moment. (laughs) I was just scat there for a second. (laughs) What incarnation was that? Holy. (laughs) Can you? I cannot make heads or tails of anything I just said. Jiminy Christmas. Two years later, we were able to accept an assignment in the circuit work. The circuit was located in Manchinoba, a Canadian province known for its frigid winters. However, we thoroughly enjoyed the warm fellowship of the brothers and sisters there. We learned that it does not really matter where we serve. The key is to keep on serving wherever we are. After several years in the circuit work, we were invited in 1978 to serve at Canada Bethel. Not long after, I learned a painful but important lesson. I was assigned to give a one and a half hour talk in French at a special meeting in Montreal. Sadly, my talk did not hold the audience's attention, and a brother from the service department offered me counsel about it. Frankly, I should have realized then, as I have since, that I am not the most gifted speaker, but I did not take that counsel very well. Our personalities seemed to clash. I felt that he was overly critical and he did not offer any commendation. I made the mistake of judging the counsel based on the way it was given and the way I perceived the person who was giving it. A few days later, a member of the branch committee spoke to me about the matter. I admitted that I did not respond well to the counsel and expressed regret. Next, I spoke to the brother who had counseled me. He graciously accepted my apology. That experience became an object lesson in humility that I will never forget. I was hoping that it would be like, yeah, well, let's settle this the way we do and get some Canadian whiskey and it will be fisticuffs between you and me. You've hurt my honor. I have now been at Canada Bethel for over 40 years and since 1985, I have had the privilege of serving on the branch committee. In February 2021, my dear Sheila fell asleep in death. In addition to coping with her loss, I am facing my own health limitations. But Jehovah's service keeps me so busy and happy that I hardly notice the passing days. Although my days have had some challenges, the joys have far outweighed them. Putting Jehovah first in my life and enjoying 70 years in full-time service has been truly rewarding. I pray that our younger brothers and sisters continue to put Jehovah first too, for I am convinced that they will enjoy a rewarding and exciting life that is only possible when we serve Jehovah. Sadly, I know the the stories of like the cows running through the assembly hall are kind of funny. Uh but you know they're going to look at this and see a story of someone who constantly was waiting for something that never happened that spent his entire life made all of these sacrifices, health problems, everything 
and uh, yeah, I never did anything. And all the people that were bored out of their minds because your talks super sucked. That's kind of a funny, funny thing that's uh, come up in a in a magazine though. When Jesus instituted the Lord's evening meal, were there seventy disciples with whom he had sent out to preach? Had they abandoned him? Oh, that's a funny question. We need not think that just because they were not present when Jesus instituted the Lord's evening meal. The 70 disciples were disapproved, were, so disapproved or abandoned him. Jesus simply wanted to be with his apostles on that occasion. He approved of both the 12 and the 70. Jesus first chose from many, his many disciples, 12 men whom he called apostles. He was in Galilee when he called the twelve and sent them to the, to preach the kingdom of God and to heal. Later down in Judea, Jesus designated 70 others and sent them out by twos. Consequently, Jesus had followers in various areas in which his message was being preached. Jews who had become Jesus' disciples would still hold the annual Passover, likely along with their families. As the time for his death approached, Jesus and his apostles went to Jerusalem, but he did not call for a large Passover gathering of all his disciples from Judea, Galilee, and Perea. Clearly, Jesus wanted to be with the apostles on this occasion. He told them, I have greatly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. There was good reason for that. Jesus was soon to die as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was to happen in Jerusalem, where sacrifices to God who had been offered, where sacrifice to God had long been offered. Jesus' death would provide a liberation grander than what had become available through the lamb eaten by the Israelite families on the night of Exodus from Egypt. What Jesus did allow for the twelve to become the foundation members of the Christian congregation. Interestingly, the holy city Jerusalem has twelve foundation stones. That have written on them 12 names. Names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Yes, the faithful apostles. Well, didn't. I mean, you have the 12, but then uh, Judas Iscariot popped off. So then they had to add in, like, Matthias, right? From Acts, like, chapter 1 or something. Something like that. Anyway. Yes, the faithful apostles were to have a major role in fulfilling God's purpose. It is thus understandable that Jesus wanted to have them with him for the final Passover and for that immediately following the Lord's evening meal. The 70 and the other disciples were not at the meal with Jesus. Still, all disciples who proved faithful would benefit from what Jesus instituted, the Lord's evening meal. All who in time became anointed Christians would enter into the covenant of the kingdom and with Jesus mentioned to the apostles that night. Are you heeding the warnings? We live in climactic times. Soon, Jesus will judge every living person. Jesus described the time leading up to his judgment by giving his faithful disciples a prophetic sign of his invisible presence and of the conclusion of the system of things. This prophecy is recorded in Matthew chapters 24 and 25 and in the parallel accounts of Mark chapter 13 and Luke 21. Jesus provided helpful warnings by means of three parables. These are the parables of the sheep and the goats, the discreet and the foolish versions, and the talents. Each parable helps us to understand how a person's behavior will affect the way he will be judged. As, a, as we review these parables, let us identify the lessons and how we can apply them. The first parable we will discuss is that of the sheep and the goats. Okay. In the parable of the sheep and the goats, Jesus described the judgment of people who have the opportunity to respond to the good news and support his anointed brothers. During the Great Tribulation, we will render this judgment right before Armageddon. Just as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, Jesus will separate those who loyally support his anointed followers from those who do not. Bible prophecy shows that Jehovah's appointed judge, Jesus, will be righteous in his judgment. He observes the conduct and speech of people, including how they treat his anointed brothers. Jesus will know who gave support to his anointed brothers and their work. One of the primary ways the specific 
the specific, the sheep-like ones, support Jesus' brothers is by assisting them in the preaching work. Those who provide this support will be judged as righteous and will have the prospect of everlasting life on earth. What a marvelous reward for those who keep their integrity. Simply marvelous. By remaining faithful during the Great Tribulation and beyond, they keep their names in the Book of Life. Prove yourselves faithful and loyal. Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats focuses primarily on those who have the earthly hope. They express their faith not only by assisting Christ's brothers in the preaching work, but also by loyally accepting the lead of the small group of anointed brothers whom Jesus has selected. But those with a heavenly hope also need to heed the warning message of the parable. Why? Because Jesus takes note of their conduct, attitude, and speech. They too must prove faithful. In fact, Jesus related two other parables that contain specific warnings for the anointed. We also must find these parables in Matthew chapter 25. Let us next discuss the parable of the discreet and the foolish virgins. In the parable of the virgins, Jesus spoke of ten virgins who went out to meet a bridegroom. They all hoped to accompany the bridegroom to his marriage feast. Jesus described five of them as discreet and the other five as foolish. The discreet virgins were prepared and vigilant. They were ready to wait for the bridegroom as long as they needed, even if they arrived late at night. Thus, they brought oil lamps to provide light in the dark. They even brought extra oil in case the bridegroom should delay. So they were prepared to keep their lamps burning. When the bridegroom arrived, the discreet virgins went in with him to the wedding feast. In like manner, anointed Christians who have proved ready by remaining vigilant and faithful until the coming of Christ will be judged worthy of the king of joining the bridegroom, Jesus, in his heavenly kingdom. What of the five foolish virgins? Unlike the discreet virgins, the five foolish ones were not ready when the bridegroom arrived. Their lamps were about to go out, and they brought no extra oil with them. When they learned that the bridegroom would soon arrive, they had to go buy oil. They had not returned when the bridegroom came. Bridegroom came. At that time, the virgins were not ready. Who were ready and went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Later, the foolish virgins came back and entered. Wanted to enter. The bridegroom told them, "I do not know you. Those virgins have not been prepared to wait for the bridegroom as long as necessary." What is the lesson for anointed ones? And you can have multiple wives when you enter into heaven. Uh, okay. Each of us does well to take seriously the warning of the parable of the virgins by being prepared and vigilant. That's what we're doing. We are trying to prepare for the end of the world. I am doing my due diligence. I want to know if this is the truth. And by hook or by crook, I will do it until I have sufficiently brainwashed myself. Even if it takes 48 hours straight of reading nothing but watched hours. Maybe my worst idea ever. <laughs> Prove yourselves prepared and vigilant. Jehovah was not foretelling that there would be two classes of the anointed. One that was prepared to wait until the end of the system of things and one that was not. Rather, he was explaining that he would happen that what would happen to anointed ones if they were not prepared to endure faithfully to the end? In that case, they would not receive their reward. That is sobering. Whether our hope is heavenly or earthly, we all should take to heart the warning from the parable of the virgins. Each of us must keep on the watch and be prepared, ready to endure to the end. After relating the parable of the virgins to emphasize the need to be prepared and vigilant, Jesus related the parable of the talents. The parable highlights the need to be industrious. In the parable of the talents, Jesus spoke of two slaves who were faithful to their master and one who was not. The two slaves proved faithful by working hard to increase their master's interests. Before traveling abroad, he entrusted them with talents, a large amount of money. The two faithful slaves were industrious and used the money wisely. The result? When the master returned, they had doubled the amount he had given them. The master commended them. They entered into the joy of their master. A lot of slaves and virgins. Marriage feast going on around here. The, sir, the third slave received one talent but was sluggish. His mother, expect, his mother, his master, expected him to use the talent wisely. Instead, he buried it in the ground. When the master returned, this slave had nothing. 
additional to give him. The slave did not have a good attitude. Rather than apologize for his failings to increase the master's belongings, the slave unjustly called the master a demanding man. This slave did not receive his master's approval. More than that, the talent was taken away from him, and he was cast out of the master's household. You good-for-nothing slave! The two faithful slaves represent faithful anointed Christians. The master, Jesus, invites them to enter into the joy of their master. They receive their heavenly reward, the first resurrection. Yikes, what a mishmash of scriptures that is. On the other hand, the bad example of the sluggish slave provides a warning for anointed ones. How so? Prove yourselves industrious and diligent. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jesus is interested in seeing anointed prove themselves industrious and diligent. So, this person's preaching. Yippee. In the parable of the talents, as in the parable of the virgins, Jesus was not predicting that the anointed would become sluggish. Rather, he was explaining what would happen if they did lose their zeal. They would fail to make their calling and choosing sure for themselves, and they would not be permitted to enter into the kingdom, the heavenly kingdom. Jesus' parables about the virgins and the talents make it clear that all anointed Christians must be prepared and vigilant as well as industrious and diligent. But did Jesus say anything else that serves as a warning for the anointed? Yes, he did. Jesus' comments found at Matthew 24, 40 and 41 also relate to the final judgment of anointed ones. Before relating the three parables, Jesus described a final judgment of the anointed that would reveal who was approved. He spoke of two men working in a field and two women working at a hand mill. In each case, the two appeared to be doing the same work, but Jesus said that one would be taken along and the other abandoned. He then urged his followers, keep on the watch, therefore, because you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Jesus said something similar after relating the parable of the virgins. Are these comments connected? It appears so. Only genuine, faithful, anointed ones will be taken along, received by Jesus into the heavenly kingdom. Prove yourselves watchful. Any anointed ones who do not remain spiritually alert will not be gathered with the chosen ones. By extension, all of God's people, regardless of their hope, should view Jesus' words as a warning to keep on the watch and remain faithful. We have come to know Jehovah well, so we trust his judgment. We are not concerned if Jehovah has chosen to anoint some faithful ones in more recent years? <laughs> we already talked about this. We recall that Jesus said about the 11th hour workers in his illustration of the vineyard. What? Those who are invited to work in the vineyard later in the day receive the same wage as those who began working in it earlier. Likewise, no matter when anointed ones are selected, they will receive the heavenly reward if they are judged faithful. What have we considered? For those who hope to live forever on earth, the parable of the sheep and the goats highlights the need to remain faithful and loyal to Jehovah now and during the upcoming Great Tribulation. At that future time, Jesus will judge faithful ones as being worthy of departing into everlasting life. We also review two parables that provide warnings for the anointed. In Jesus' parable of the discreet and foolish virgins, five of them proved to be wise. They were prepared and vigilant, ready to wait for the bridegroom as long as needed, but the foolish virgins were unprepared, so the bridegroom refused to allow them into his marriage feast. We too must be prepared to wait for however long it takes until Jesus brings an end to the system of things. Also in Jesus' parable of the talents, we consider the two faithful slaves who were industrious and diligent. They worked hard in behalf of their master and earned his approval. However, the sluggish slave was rejected. The lesson? We must keep busy in Jehovah's service right up to the end. Finally, we considered how anointed ones must remain watchful in order to be taken along by Jesus to their heavenly reward. With great anticipation, such ones look forward to being gathered together to Jesus in heaven. After the warm of Armageddon, they will share as Jesus' bride in the marriage of the Lamb. Though judgment is fast approaching, there is no need for us to be afraid. If we remain faithful, our loving Heavenly Father will give us the power beyond what is normal so that we may succeed in standing before the Son of Man. 
Whether our hope is heavenly or earthly, we will please our Father if we heed the warnings found in Jesus' parables. Through Jehovah's undeserved kindness, our names will be found written in the book of life. Enjoy the greater happiness that comes from giving. When Jehovah created humans, he des designed them with the ability to find more happiness in giving than in receiving. Does this mean that do we do not gain any happiness from receiving? No. We know from experience that we feel good when we receive a gift. Still, we feel even greater happiness when we are the giver. And really, it is our benefit to our benefit that Jehovah made us this way. Why? By creating us that way, the way he did, Jehovah allows us to influence our happiness. We can increase our joy by looking for additional opportunities to give. Is that not a wonderful aspect of how we are made? The scriptures assure us that giving brings happiness, so it is little wonder that the Bible describes Jehovah as the happy God. He is the original and greatest giver. Because of him, we have life and move and exist, as the Apostle Paul stated. Indeed, every good gift and every perfect present comes from Jehovah. All of us would probably like to experience even more of the happiness that comes from giving. We can do so by imitating Jehovah's generosity. As we consider this, let us note that what we can do if we feel our giving is not appreciated. These reminders will help us to remain or help us to maintain and even increase the joy we get from giving. What are some ways that Jehovah shows generosity? Consider a few examples. Jehovah gives us material things. We may not always have luxuries, but thanks to Jehovah, most of us have what we need. For example, he makes it possible for us to have food, clothing, and shelter. Does Jehovah provide for our physical needs merely out of a sense of obligation? Not at all. Why does Jehovah do this for us? Put simply, Jehovah provides for our physical needs because he loves us. Consider Jesus' words found at Matthew 6, 25 and 26. Jesus uses examples from creation. Speaking of birds, Jesus says, they do not sow seed, reap, or gather into storehouses. However, notice what he says next. Just read the thing. Just you know. However, notice what he says next. Why? Why do that? Just, just, just show the scripture. Sorry, that was an irrational <laughs> flashing. Your heavenly Father feeds them. <laughs> then Jesus asks. Are you not worth more than they are? The point? Jehovah views his worshippers as far more valuable than any animal creation. If Jehovah creates the need, cares for the needs of animals, we can be sure that he will provide for us. Like a caring human father, Jehovah provides for his family out of love. Like Jehovah, we too can give materially out of love. For example, are you acquainted with a fellow believer? Did I say acquainted? With a fellow believer who is in need of food or clothing? Jehovah can use you to give him something to fill that need. Jehovah's people are generously known for showing generosity when disaster strikes. For instance, during the COVID-19 pandemic, brothers and sisters shared food, clothing, and other supplies with ones who were in need. Many also made generous contributions to the worldwide work. That helped fund relief efforts around the globe. How much, Watchtower? I want to know how much did you take in? How much did you spend? What did you get from governments? Show me the... I want to see the stats. Jehovah gives power. Jo Jehovah is happy to share his limitless strength with his faithful worshipers. I am hungry. It is 11.42 and I need to eat some dinner. Have you ever prayed for the strength to resist temptation or for the power to endure a difficult trial? You may also have prayed simply for enough energy to keep going one more day. I'm going to need to start praying to do this. When your prayer for strength was answered, you could agree with the Apostle Paul who wrote, For all things I have the strength through the one who gives me power. Though we are imperfect humans, we can imitate Jehovah's generous use of power. We cannot literally impart strength or energy to others, but we can use our power in behalf of in their behalf. For example, we might run errands or do household chores for an elderly or infirm Christian. If our circumstances permit, we could volunteer to help with the cleaning and the maintenance of the kingdom hall. Our use of power in such ways benefit others who worship Jehovah. 
do not forget, too, that these words have power. Can you think of someone who would benefit from sincere commendation? Mm, me. Drop a comment. Now. Do it. Do you know anyone in need of comfort? In either way, why not take the initiative to reach out to the individual? You can visit in person, call on the telephone, perhaps in a card, an email, a text message. What you say does not have to be eloquent. A few simple words from the heart may be exactly what your fellow believer needs to remain faithful for another day or feel better about his situation. Jehovah gives wisdom. The disciple James wrote, If any one of you is lacking in wisdom, let him keep asking God, for he gives generously to all without finding fault. As these words indicate, Jehovah does not ignore the picture at the top of the screen, because it says we can use our power in behalf of others. Hey, look, they're picking him up for the meetings in their Honda Accord. That's super cool. As these words indicate, Jehovah does not... <laughs> Hoard his wisdom, he generously shares it with others. Notice too that when Jehovah gives wisdom, he does so without reproaching or without finding fault. He never makes us feel bad for admitting that we need his guidance. Actually, he urges us to seek it. What about us? Can we imitate Jehovah by sharing our wisdom? Jehovah's people have many opportunities to share what they have learned. For instance, we often train new ones in the ministry. Elders patiently help ministerial servants and baptized brothers to learn how to handle their assignments in the congregation, and those with experience in construction and maintenance help train less experienced ones to do work in other theocratic facilities. Those who provide training do well to imitate the manner in which Jehovah shares his wisdom. Recall that Jehovah gives wisdom generously. Likewise, we freely share our knowledge and experience with those who are learning. We do not withhold some of our knowledge out of fear that the learner may eventually replace us, nor do we take the view, no one trained me, let them learn on their own. Such an attitude has no place among Jehovah's people. Rather, we gladly impart not only our knowledge, but also our very selves to those we train. We hope that they, in turn, will be adequately qualified to teach others. In that sense, we can be part of the ongoing cycle of generosity that results in in the cycle of happiness. When we are generous, especially towards our brothers and sisters, they often express appreciation in return. They may say, send a thank you note or express their gratitude in another way. Receiving such expressions of appreciation adds to our happiness. Realistically, though, some may not always show or express appreciation. On occasion, we may give of our time, energy, or resources, but thereafter wonder if the recipient even cared about what we did. If that happens, how can we avoid losing our joy or becoming bitter? Remember the words of our theme scripture, Acts 20.35. Our happiness in giving does not depend on the response. We can choose to enjoy giving even if others do not seem appreciative. How? Consider a few ways. Focus on imitating Jehovah. He gives good things to people, whether they appreciate it or not. Jehovah promises that when we likewise give without hoping for anything back, our reward will be great. Anything might include an expression of appreciation. Whether we receive it or not, Jehovah will always repay us for the good we do to help others for our cheer, cheer, being cheerful givers. As to maintaining the right focus when giving, we find valuable principle at Luke 14, 12, and 14. It is not wrong to show hospitality or to be generous in other ways with those who you can do similar something similar for in return. However, if we notice that we have been giving, at least in part, because we hope to receive something in return, we would do well to try what Jesus suggested. We can be hospitable to someone who does not have the means to show us hospitality. Then we will be happy because we are imitating Jehovah. The same outlook will also help us to keep our joy when others do not express appreciation. Avoid questioning others' motives. If others do not express appreciation, we could ask ourselves, are they truly unappreciative or did they simply forget to express appreciation? Perhaps there are other reasons why they do not respond as we may have hoped. Some may feel deep gratitude but have difficulty expressing it. That they might be embarrassed to receive help, especially if it in the past, they were the ones helping others. 
Whatever the case, Christian love will move us to make allowances for our fellow believers and to keep finding joy in given. Picture time. We have this lady who's writing a card. And this lady who's working hard, ironing some pleated thing. I don't, what, what, what is she actually ironing? I don't know. And she's making dinner. She's working hard on the phone. And she receives the card. Aw, she's super grateful. Makes her feel good. She received the card in return, probably. The cycle of The cycle of love. With regard to being generous, wise King Solomon wrote, Cast your bread on the waters, for after eve, for after many days you will find it again. As those words indicate, some may respond to our generosity long after the fact. After many days, consider an experience that highlights this truth. Many years ago, the wife of a circuit overseer sent a heartfelt note to a newly baptized sister, urging her to remain faithful. About eight years later, the sister replied in a letter, saying, I felt I just had to write and tell you of the help you have been to me over the years without your really being aware of it. She went on, your note was very warm, but it was a scripture that reached my heart and I never forgot it. After explaining some of the challenges she had faced, the sister said, at times I wanted out, out of the truth, out of responsibilities, just out. But that scripture you wrote would tug at my heart and I would keep going. What a shame. She had a no single thing and all those eight years had such an effect on me. Just imagine how happy the circuit overseer's wife was to receive this letter after many days. We, too, may receive expressions of appreciation long after we have given ourselves in some way. As mentioned, Jehovah created us with a special ability. Although we enjoy receiving, we gain even greater happiness when we give to others. We feel good when we are able to help our fellow believers. We are able to help when they express their appreciation. Yet... Whether the receiver expresses appreciation or not, we can be glad that we did the right thing. Never forget that whatever you give, Jehovah has the means to give you much more. We simply cannot outgive Jehovah. And there is no greater joy than to be repaid by Jehovah himself. Let us be determined then to continue imitating our generous Heavenly Father. <laughs> Amen. The Watchtower announcing Jehovah's Kingdom. October 2024, baby. 1924, 100 years ago. It is a good time at the beginning of the year for every consecrated child of the Lord to look for wider opportunities of service, stated the January-ish 1924 issue of The Bulletin. Now our Christian Life and Meet Meeting Workbook was The Bulletin? I mean, I know what the bulletin is, but is that, that's not exactly what it was. Oh, anyway, it doesn't much matter. I'm just not, my, as the year unfolded, Bible students applied that counsel in two ways, by pursuing bold initiatives and by fearlessly preaching. The brothers at Bethel had been working for more than a year to build the WBBR radio station on Staten Island, New York City. After clearing the land, they constructed a large home for the workers and a separate building for the equipment. When this work was completed, the brothers began to assemble the equipment necessary to go on the air, but they would need to overcome several obstacles. The brothers found that installing the main antenna for the station proved difficult. The 91-meter-long antenna needed to be hung between two wooden masts, and they were 61 meters tall. The first attempt failed. Trusting in Jehovah's help, the brothers finally succeeded. I bet they trusted in Jehovah's help the first time, and then maybe they actually just used, I don't know, the help of math or engineering. That was probably infinitely more helpful than their prayers. Anyway, Calvin Prosser, who worked on the project, observed, If our first attempt had succeeded, we would have patted ourselves on the back and said, Hey, look at what we did. The brothers credited their success to Jehovah, but their problems were not over. I promise you, man... 
If it would have gone up the first time, you would have still given praise to Jehovah. Radio broadcasting was in its infancy, and commercially built equipment was not readily available. So the brothers obtained a used, crudely built 500 watt transmitter that was available locally. Instead of purchasing a microphone, they used one from an ordinary telephone. Uh, one night in February, the brothers decided to test all this makeshift equipment. They needed a program to broadcast, so the brothers sang kingdom songs. Ernest Lowe recalled with amusement that while the brothers were singing, they received a call from Judge Rutherford, who heard their singing on his radio in Brooklyn, about uh, 25 kilometers away. Stop that racket, quipped Brother uh, Rutherford. You sound like a bunch of cats. Slightly embarrassed, the brothers quickly shut down the transmitter, but they were confident that they were ready for their first broadcast. What a jerk. Hey, they're out there building your little radio station, and you're like, hey, shut up. You sound like a bunch of cats. It's kind of a mean. Well, kind of mean. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it. You know what? I don't like Rutherford. He's kind of a jerk. On February 24th, 1924, during the first official broadcast, Brother Rutherford, the meanie, dedicated the radio station to the interest of the kingdom of the Messiah. He stated that the purpose of the station was to enable the people to understand the light of the Bible, regardless of creed or denomination, the meaning of the times in which we are living. The first broadcast was a success. For the next 33 years, WBBR served as the hub of the organization's radio broadcasting efforts. I went somewhere. In July 1924, the Bible students assembled for a convention in Columbus, Ohio. Delegates came from all over the world. They heard talks in Arabic, English, French, German, Greek, Hungarian, Italian, Lithuanian, Polish, Russian, the Scandinavian languages, and Ukrainian. Portions of the program were broadcast over the radio, and plans were made for the Ohio State Journal to carry daily reports of the convention. On Thursday, July 24th, hey buddy. More than 5,000 conventions participated in a service day. They placed almost 30,000 books and started thousands of Bible studies. The Watchtower called this day the happiest part of the convention. Another highlight of the convention came on Friday, July 25th, when Brother Rutherford read an indictment, a bold proclamation against the clergy. In the style of a legal document, the indictment charged political religions and commercial leaders with keeping the people in ignorance of God's provisions for blessing them with life. Additionally, the indictment noted that these men had endorsed... Uh, I think I, I have a copy of that somewhere. Endorsed the, legal, the League of Nations and declared it to be the political expression of God's kingdom. The Bible students would need bold persistence to take this message to the people. Summing up the effect of the convention, the Watchtower stated, This little army of the Lord assembled at the Columbus Convention went away strengthened in faith, dot, 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 invincible to any power or fiery darts that the enemy may launch against them. We left the assembly feeling enthusiastic about disturb distributing the indictment in our territory. In October, the Bible students began distributing millions of copies of the track Ecclesiastica. Indicted, 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 indicted yeah. And the printed version of the what Brother Rutherford had presented in the small town of Cleveland, Oklahoma. Frank Johnson finished distributing the track 20 minutes before he was to be picked up by other publishers. He couldn't just wait in the open because men from the town who were angered by his preaching work were looking for him. Brother Johnson decided to hide in a nearby church. Finding it empty, he left copies of Ecclesiasticus indicted in the preacher's Bible and at each seat. He exited the church as quickly as he had come. It 
two minutes to midnight. My brain's turning to mush. He had some time, so he visited two more churches following a similar pattern. Frank rushed back to the spot where he was to be picked up. He hid behind a fuel station, keeping an eye out for the men who were after him. The men drove by, but they didn't see him. As soon as they were gone, Frank's fellow preachers, who had been witnessing nearby, arrived to pick him up, and they all drove off. As we were leaving town, one of the brothers recalled, We passed by three churches. There were as many as fifty people standing out in front of each church. Some of the people were reading the tract, others were holding it up to the preacher to see. Well, we had a very close call, but we thanked Jehovah our God for his protection and the knowledge to outwit these enemies of the kingdom. Little goofballs running around. In other countries, the Bible students followed a similar pattern of bold witnessing. In northern France, Joseph Kret preached to immigrant Polish mine workers. He was scheduled to deliver a talk entitled The Resurrection of the Dead Soon. When invitations were delivered to residents of the town, a local priest warned his parishioners not to attend. His warning had the opposite effect. More than 5,000 people attended the lecture, including the priest. Brother Kret invited the priest to defend his beliefs, but he refused. Hey, watch how I invite you to defend your beliefs. See, I want they need to go back to the heyday of Watch Hour where people actually defended their beliefs. Now they just go and cry in a corner by themselves. Brother Kret invited their, oh yeah, Brother Kret uh, placed all the literature he had, nothing that the people had witnessed to had thirst for God's word. Noting In Africa, Claude Brown brought the good news to the Gold Coast, now known as Ghana. His lectures had the literature that he distributed helped to spread the truth quickly in that country. John Blankson, Blankson, what a name, who was studying to become a pharmacist, attended one of Brother Brown's lectures. He quickly realized that he had found the truth. The truth made me buoyant, John remembered, and I talked freely at our pharmacy school. One day, John visited an Anglican church. Whew, okay. One day, John visited an Anglican, Anglican church to question the priest about the Trinity, which John now understood clearly to be unscriptural teaching. The priest chased him away, shouting, You are not a Christian. You belong to the devil. Get out of here, heathen. When he got home, John wrote a letter to the priest, inviting him to defend the Trinity at a public gathering. The priest responded by summoning John to the office of the pharmacy school principal lecturer, where the lecturer asked him if he had indeed written to the priest. I did, sir. John replied. The lecturer demanded that John write the priest an apology. So John wrote, Sir, my instructor has asked me to write an apology to you, and I am prepared to write the apology provided you will admit that you teach false doctrines. Incredulous, incredulous the lecturer asked uh, Blankson, Is that what you meant to write? Yes, sir. That is all I can write. You are going to be dismissed. How can you speak against the priests of the government's church and hope to remain in the government's employ? But, sir, dot, 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 when you give us lessons and there are points we do not understand, do we not ask you questions? Of course you do. Well, sir, that is all that took place. The gentleman was teaching us the Bible, and I asked him a question. If he is unable to answer that question, why should I be made to write an apology to him? Blankson was not dismissed. No apology was sent. It's kind of a cute story. It's kind of funny, like, how they've gone full circle. It's like, man, they used to be out there. It's like, hey, I'm I'm ready to debate you anytime. Come on, let's do this thing. Where's that enthusiasm now? That is dead and gone. Summing up the year's activity, the Watchtower stated, We can truly say with David... Thou hast girded me with strength unto the battle. The year has been one of great encouragement because we have observed the hand of the Lord. Dot, dot, dot. His truly consecrated ones, dot, 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 have been joyfully given a witness. Late in that year, the brothers made plans to expand the radio ministry. Work began on another radio station near Chicago. This new station had the appropriate call sign, Word, Using a 5,000-watt transmitter, Word, would transmit the kingdom message for hundreds of miles, even to the north in Canada. Oh, unlocked a memory. The year 1925 would soon bring exciting flashes of spiritual light, clarifying the Bible student's understanding of Revelation chapter 12. 
It would be a stumbling block for some. Oh, the year 1925 would bring exciting flashes. Oh, yeah, 1925. Yeah, this was... It would be a stumbling block for some. Yeah, because there's a failed freaking prophecy. It's not a stumbling block. It's called a lie. A lie that you all told. Many others, though, would welcome this insight into events related to the invisible heavens and the impact this understanding would have on God's people on earth. Jehovah heals the brokenhearted. What does Jehovah see when he looks at his servants on earth? He is aware of our joys and our sorrows. When he sees that we are serving him to the best of our ability, despite coping with painful emotions, how pleased he is. More than that, he is eager to support and comfort us. In Psalm 147.3 says that Jehovah binds up the wounds of the brokenhearted. Jehovah is here pictured as tenderly caring for those who have been injured emotionally. What do we what must we do to benefit from Jehovah's care? Consider an illustration. A skilled doctor can do much more to help an injured person to heal. To benefit through the injured person, though the <laughs> though the injured person must carefully follow the doctor's instructions. In this article, we will see what Jehovah says in his word to those who are suffering emotionally, and we will consider how to apply his loving advice. We live in a world devoid of love, and sadly many people have been made to feel that they have little worth. A sister named Helen says, I grew up in a loveless family. My dad was violent and drummed into us daily how useless we were. What a piece of garbage. Perhaps, like Helen, you have been mistreated, frequently criticized, or made to feel unlovable. If so, you may find it difficult to believe that anyone genuinely cares about you. Even if others have mistreated you, you can be certain that Jehovah loves you and values you. He is close to the brokenhearted. If you feel crushed in spirit, remember that Jehovah saw good things in your heart and personally drew you to him. He is always ready to help you because you are precious to him. Listen. We can learn about Jehovah's feelings by considering Jesus' example. During his earthly ministry, Jesus took notice of those who looked down on others who looked down on by others, and he treated them with compassion. When a woman hoping to be healed of a grievous sickness touched his garment, Jesus comforted her and commanded her commended her for her faith. Jesus perfectly reflects his father's personality, so can so you can be certain that Jehovah values you and takes note of your good qualities, including your faith and love for him. What can you do if your doubts about your worth persist or reoccur? Read Bible verses that assure you of your value to Jehovah and meditate on them. If you have failed to reach a goal or are just discouraged because you cannot do as much as others, do not judge yourself harshly. Jehovah has reasonable expectations. If you suffered abuse in the past, do not blame yourself for what the abuser did. You did not deserve such treatment. Remember that Jehovah holds the wrongdoer accountable, not the victims. Except... <clears throat> huh. Sandra, who was abused as a child, says, I regularly asked Jeho to Jehovah to help me see myself in a balanced way, the way he sees me. Never doubt that Jehovah can use you to help others. He has given you the honor of being his fellow worker in the Christian ministry. Your life experiences have likely given you empathy for others and insight into how they may feel. You can do much better to help them. Helen quoted earlier, received help and is now better able to help others, she says. Jehovah has turned his n this nobody into someone who feels loved and useful. Helen is happy to serve as a regular pioneer. Some of Jehovah's servants are deeply troubled by regrets over their past actions, either before or even, bef either before or even after baptism. But we all do well to remember that Jehovah provided the ransom because of his deep love for us. Surely, he wants us to accept his gift. Jehovah assures us that after we have set matters straight with him, he no long longer holds our sins against us. How loving of Jehovah not to remember our past sins. At the same time, he never forgets the good we have done. From personal experience, um, this is uh, not true at all. 
uh, Jehovah does not remember our past sins. Well, if Jehovah forgets them, the congregation sure remembers. Because if you get hauled before some elders about a matter, they will uh, bring up your whole track record. Everything you've ever done or said or that was a little weird or any time they had a gri gripe with you before, they'll lay it all out there on the table and remind you of every single little thing. So, yeah. I don't know what that sentence is all about, but maybe they're trying to change how they're doing things but the watchtower i remember there is a reason they always kept a file and in that file they would keep notes about you and they would keep records about every time that they had to counsel you about something so if god doesn't remember then why are the elders taking notes if you are troubled by regret about the past do your best to focus on the present and on the future rather than on the past consider the example of the apostle paul he regretted that he had once viciously persecuted Christians, but he knew that Jehovah had forgiven him. He did then con did he then continue to mull over the sins of the past? He no doubt refused to do so, just as he did not dwell on his former accomplishments as an adherent of Judaism. Instead, Paul zealously cared for his ministry and looked ahead to the future. Like Paul, you cannot change the past, but you can honor Jehovah in your present circumstances and look ahead at the wonderful future that he has promised you. You may be troubled by some of your past actions that have hurt others. What can help? Do what you can to repair the damage, including offering a sincere apology. Ask Jehovah to come to the aid of those affected by your actions. He can help you and those who have hurt, who you have hurt to endure and to regain peace. Learn from past mistakes and be willing to let Jehovah use you in whatever way he chooses. Note the example of the prophet Jonah. Instead of traveling to Nineveh as God had commanded, Jonah fled in the opposite direction. Jehovah disciplined Jonah, and he learned from his mistake. Jehovah did not give up on Jonah. God gave him another opportunity to go to Nineveh, and this time Jonah promptly obeyed. He did not let regret over his past mistakes prevent him from accepting this assignment from Jehovah. By means of his Holy Spirit, Jehovah comforts us when we suffer trauma or loss. Consider the experience of Ron and Carol. Tragically, their son took his own life. They say we had gone through difficult trials before, but this was by far the worst. We prayed during many sleepless nights. I'm not trying to be insensitive here, but didn't did they use this like earlier this year? If you are coping with a heartbreaking trial, you can pour out your heart to Jehovah in prayer as often and for as long as you want. Ask Jehovah repeatedly for his Holy Spirit. He will never ignore your requests. He has he has a has a di wow. There you go. Oh boy. That was a rough one. He who a e a u a u a u wapu nap has a distressing ordeal left you weak, Holy Spirit can empower you to continue worshiping Jehovah faithfully. Consider the example of a sister named Flora uh, and Fauna. She and her husband Fla <laughs> were serving together as missionaries when her husband became unfaithful to her, and they divorced. She says, The anguish I felt because of his betrayal consumed me. I prayed to Jehovah for his Holy Spirit in order to persevere. Jehovah gave me what I needed to heal and to cope with something that in the beginning seemed insurmountable. Flora feels that God has helped her to grow in confidence and that he will sustain her in all trials. She adds, the words of Psalm 119.132 applied to me. I will eagerly pursue the way of your commandments because you make room for it in my heart. How can you work in harmony with your request for Holy Spirit? Share in the activities that will allow God's Spirit to operate on you. These include attending meetings and witnessing to others. Fill your mind with Jehovah's thoughts by reading his word every day. As you read, take note of the Bible characters who experience trials and meditate on how Jehovah helped them to endure. Sandra quoted earlier, suffered a series of severe hardships. Who's Sandra? Sandra, Sandra, Sandra. Is my retention finally going kaputs?
She says, the account of Joseph really touched me. He did not let the trials and injustices he suffered weaken his relationship with Jehovah. When we are suffering, our fellow believers can be a source of great comfort. Our brothers and sisters are truly a living expression of Jehovah's love for us. Fellow believers can comfort us by us by listening empathetically, or they may support us with their presence. They may share a reassuring Bible verse or say a prayer with us. At times, a brother or sister may remind us of Jehovah's thinking and thus help us remain. Wow, that's a lot of us. Maintain our balance. Maybe it, all those us's weren't there and I was just saying wrong words. Okay, those are giving me a headache. Uh, follow Christians can also give practical support, such as by providing meals when we are in distress. To receive support from others, we need to ask for it. Our brothers and sisters love us and want us to help. They, But they may not know how we feel or what we need. If you are hurting emotionally, be willing to share your feelings with mature friends. Let them know what would help you. You might choose to confide in one or two of the elders with whom you feel at ease. Some sisters have found it comforting to speak with another mature sister. Resist the urge to isolate yourself because of painful emotions. You may not feel like interacting with others. I swear that this just feels like actually rewriting some of the ones from earlier this year. Does no one else notice this? Do not let such challenge and like even some of the stories like people are nameless and then they have someone in the exact same situation but then they give their name. Are they taking one letter and using bits of it and dropping those throughout all of their so like okay hey we received this letter from person X and then they just use bits and pieces of it to make it sound like they're getting all kinds of letters and stories and everything where in reality they're just taking like six or seven or ten or twelve different letters and then extending bits and pieces of those because like sometimes like oh and one sister from this place uh said and they quote like six words from from that person and you're like well why did you even bring that up well maybe that's what they're doing that actually would make a lot more sense do not let such challenges prevent you from receiving encouragement you need an elder named gavin who suffers from depression says keep Keeping in touch with friends is often the last thing I feel like doing. Nevertheless, Gavin does not give in to his feelings. He ha and he benefits from his association with others. A sister named Amy, because of my past experiences, I have difficult trusting people, but I am learning to love and trust my brothers and sisters as Jehovah does. I know that this makes Jehovah happy, and it makes me happy too. We can confidently look to the future knowing that Jehovah will soon heal us completely of all physical and emotional pain. At that time, the hurtful things we have experienced will not come up into the heart. As we have seen, Jehovah binds up our wounds even now. Take full advantage of Jehovah's loving provisions to bring, com to bring you comfort and relief. Never doubt for a moment that he cares for you. It is nice in 1633 CE. Jesus' disciples are numb with grief and paralyzed by fear. Two of them leave Jerusalem and head for Emus, a village about 11 kilometers from Jerusalem. These men are dedicated because Jesus, the man they had been following, had just been put to death. Dedicated? How about dejected? Their hope for what the Messiah would do seems lost, but the men are in for a surprise. A stranger approaches and walks with them. The disciples relate their disappointment about what happened to Jesus. The stranger then begins a life-changing discussion with them, starting with Moses and all the prophets. He explains why the Messiah had to suffer and die. My air conditioner just turned on. I mean, like the house air conditioner, not like the portable one I keep in here because it gets extra hot. Anyway, not that anyone cares about this. When the three men arrive at Emus, the stranger reveals who he is. The resurrected Jesus! We can only imagine the disciples' joy on learning that the Messiah was alive. Jesus appeared to his disciples a number of times throughout his final 40 days on earth. 
During that time, Jesus' grief-stricken and fearful followers were transformed into joyful, confident, and courageous army of kingdom preachers and teachers. Oh, the footnote. The Gospels and the other Bible books record multiple occasions when the resurrected Jesus appeared to others, such as Mary Magdalene, to other women, to two disciples, to Peter, to the Apostle Thomas, the Apostles including Thomas, to seven disciples, blah, 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 blah. And they just throw in there. Other appearances may have gone unrecorded. Oh, that was a waste of time. Oh, we're back to the three, baby. We are so back. We can benefit from studying about this thrilling period in Jesus' life. In this article, we will see how Jesus used this time to encourage his disciples to deepen their understanding of the scriptures and to train them to take on greater responsibilities. In each case, we will see how we can imitate Jesus' example. Jesus' disciples needed encouragement. Why? Some had left homes, families, and businesses to follow Jesus full-time. Others were treated as social outcasts because they had become his disciples. They made these sacrifices because they believed that Jesus was the promised Messiah. But when Jesus was executed, their hopes were dashed and they became downhearted. No doubt, Jesus saw his disciples grief not as a sign of spiritual weakness, but as an understandable response to a terrible loss. So on the very day that he was resurrected, he began encouraging his friends. For instance, he appeared to Mary Magdalene while he wept at his tomb. He also appeared for the two disciples described at the outset of this article, and he appeared to the Apostle Peter. What can we learn from Jesus' example? Consider what happened during his first appearance. Read John 20. Early on in the morning of Nias and 16, a number of loyal women went to the place where Jesus had been lying lifeless. Let us focus on the experience of one of the women, Mary Magdalene. When Mary arrived at the tomb, she found it empty. She ran to tell Peter and John, and then followed them as they raced to the tomb. After confirming that the tomb was empty, the men returned home, but not Mary. She stayed there, weeping. Little did she know that Jesus was watching. He observed this faithful woman in tears and was deeply moved. So he appeared to Mary, and then did something simple that greatly encouraged her. He spoke to her and gave her an important assignment to share the news of his resurrection with his brothers. How can we imitate Jesus? Come back from the dead. Use your force powers to become a force ghost. When you become a force ghost, give someone a side quest. Imitate Jesus protocol initiate. We can do much to motivate our brothers and sisters to keep serving Jehovah. If, like Jesus, we are aware of their distresses and speak to them with empathy, Consider the experience of a sister named Jocelyn. See, this is the second time we've heard from another Jocelyn, whose sister died in a tragic accident. For many months, I was in a constant state of deep grief, she says. However, a brother and his wife invited her to their home, listened to her empathetically, and reassured her of her value in God's eyes. Jocelyn said, I felt as if Jehovah had used them to pull me out of a dark, stormy sea and into a lifeboat. They helped me regain my desire to keep serving Jehovah. We, too, can encourage others by listening attentively as they pour out their heart and by speaking empathetically with a view to strengthening them in their service to God. Jesus' disciples accepted God's word and tried hard to apply it in their life. Still, Jesus dying as a criminal on a torture stake confused them. Jesus realized that their doubts stemmed not from a bad heart, but from a lack of understanding. So he caught them. He taught them to reason on the scriptures. Consider how he did not. He did that when he appeared uh, to two of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Notice that Jesus did not immediately tell the men who he was. Instead, he asked questions. Why? Perhaps he wanted them to express the what was on their mind and in their heart. And they did. They told him that they had expected Jesus to deliver Israel from Roman oppression. After they clearly expressed their concerns, Jesus used the scriptures to help the men to understand what had happened. Later that evening, Jesus spent time assuring the other disciples of these truths. We can learn from this account. What can we learn from this account? First, when teaching Bible students asked Tactful questions that will draw out what is in their mind and heart. 
Once you understand their feelings, show them how to find specific scriptures that apply to their circumstances, then resist the urge to tell them what to do. Instead, help them to reason on scriptures and discern how they can apply Bible principles in their life. Consider the experience of a brother in Ghana named Nordi. Hey, Nordi. When Nordi was 16 years old, he began to study the Bible. Soon, though, his family opposed him. What helped him to remain firm? His Bible teacher had used Matthew chapter 10 to explain that true Christians will be persecuted. So when the persecution started, Nordy says, I was convinced that I had found the truth. His teacher also helped him to reason on Matthew 16.10 so that he could be cautious and respectful when discussing religious matters at home. After his baptism, Nordy wanted to pioneer and his father expected him to go to university. Rather than tell Nordy what to do, his teacher drew him out with questions and helped him to reason on scriptural principles. The result? Nordy decided to enter full-time service. His father made him leave home. How does Nordy feel about these events? I am convinced that I made the right choice. When we too take time to help others reason on the scriptures, we can help them become solid Christians. Isn't that the same story that they told earlier? But maybe with with like a girl? And she was... I could swear that we have already heard this story. What is happening? While on earth, Jesus perfectly cared for the work his father had given him to do. But Jesus did not have the right attitude, or have the attitude, if you want something done right, you must do it yourself. During his three and a half year ministry, oh, I see, three, three and a half, seven Jesus, focusing on Jesus, go away from seven, move to three, everything happens in threes now. Hmm? Thoughts? Before returning to heaven, Jesus entrusted his disciples, some of whom may have been in their 20s, with the... Uh, describe a picture. Man throwing away Christmas decorations, bearded bald guy sitting with man. I feel bad that he's throwing away his Christmas decorations. Why not donate them? someone else could actually use those. Why throw them in the garbage? That makes absolutely no sense. Responsibility of caring for Jehovah's precious sheep and taking the lead in the preaching and teaching work. How did Jesus use his final 40 days to help these dedicated, loyal, and hardworking men to qualify to become gifts in men? Jesus gave his disciples frank but loving counsel. For example, he noticed that some of them had the tendency to doubt, so he counseled them. He drove... He drove home the need for them to put greater emphasis on the shepherding work than on their secular careers. He reminded them not to become unduly concerned about what privileges others might receive in Jehovah's service, and he corrected some wrong ideas that they had about the kingdom and helped them focus on getting the good news preached. What can elders what can elders learn from Jesus? How can elders imitate Jesus? They must train and assist men, including those who may be relatively young, to qualify for greater responsibilities. Elders do not expect those whom they train to be perfect. They should give them loving counsel so that these young brothers can gain experience and see the need to be humble, faithful, and willing to serve others. Consider how a brother named Patrick benefited from counsel. As a young person, he tended to speak harshly and to act unkindly even towards sisters. Mature elder noticed Patrick's weaknesses and gave him kind but straightforward counsel. I'm glad he did, he did, says Patrick. I used to get discouraged when I discouraged when I saw other brothers receiving privileges of service that I wanted, but the elders counseled the elders counsel helped me see the need to focus on humbly serving my brothers and sisters instead of on receiving some position of privilege in the congregation.